the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will continue its examination of the budget estimates for 2021-2022 and will hear from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet as listed on today's program. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the budget estimates 2021-2022 hearings are conducted in a COVID safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. The committee has also scheduled further hearings to examine the finance portfolio tomorrow and Thursday 27th of May, as well as the cross portfolio on Indigenous matters on Friday the 28th of May. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. The committee would appreciate if senators could please provide any written questions on notice to the Secretariat by Friday the 25th of June 2021. However, reminds all senators as well as departments and agencies that written questions on notice can be provided any time prior to the tabling of the budget estimates report on the 13th of July. The committee has fixed Friday the 16th of July 2021 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone and other devices or turn them to silent. Officers are requested to keep opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into the Hansard. Finally, the committee has agreed to allow media into the hearing room. In doing so, the committee reminds the media that they must follow the directions of the committee and the secretariat and remain within those areas clearly marked for the media. In addition, recording must not occur from behind the committee or between the committee and the witnesses, and computer screens and documents belonging to senators must not be filmed, photographed or recorded. Witnesses are reminded that they can object to being recorded at any time. The committee thanks the media in advance for maintaining a COVID-safe approach while in the hearing room. It being after 9am, I welcome the Minister for Finance, Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister, Mr Phil Gachin, Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Ms Stephanie Foster, Deputy Secretary, Governance and APS Reform, and other officers of the Department. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? Good morning, Chair, and good morning, Senators. Thank you for the opportunity, but no thank you. Mr Gachin, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, Chair. Ms Foster, do you wish to make an op opening statement? I didn't think so. I will give the call to Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr Gatchins, I have some questions in relation to the inquiry that you're conducting into the Prime Minister's office in relation to what the Prime Minister and his office knew and when about the alleg alleged sexual assault in the ministerial wing. And I think you commenced that inquiry on the 17th of February. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. And I'm was sorry. paused... Philip Gatchin, Secretary, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Thank yes, you. Senator. So it started on the 17th of February. You paused it on receipt of advice from the AFP Commissioner on the 9th of March. Does that align with your timeline? 
Uh, correct, Senator. Okay. Um, the Prime Minister told Parliament the inquiry recommenced on Monday the 10th of May. Is that correct? Uh, that's when I received a letter from the AFP Commissioner uh, stating that I could resume, yes. Okay. Could you table that letter from the AFP Commissioner? Uh, I could. I don't think I have that with me, but I'll arrange for it to be tabled okay. as soon as possible. Oh, okay, thank you. So you were given that advice by the AFP Commissioner by letter on the 10th of May? Yes, Senator. What reason were you given um, that you could recommence? Senator, it'll be in the letter, but I think it's along the lines that they're that this at the they were at a stage of the of their investigations where they were not concerned about intersections between their investigations and my inquiry. Okay. Um, so we'll get a copy of that as soon as possible, hopefully. When did you um, communicate this fact, the fact that you got this letter and your inquiry was going to recommence to the Prime Minister in his office? Uh, on the 11th of May, Senator. On the 11th of May? Yep. Okay, and did, was that to Mr Morrison directly or to his no, staff? No, I advised the Chief of Staff uh, and also emails to the PMO staff that I had been questioning and also to Ms Higgins. Okay. So you sent an email to the Chief of Staff, um, staff you've spoken to in terms yes. of interviewing, and to Ms Higgins on the 11th of May? Yes. Saying that you were now recommencing? Correct. Okay. Um, so can you maybe update the committee on the status of your inquiry? So in particular, you know, when is it going to finish? Uh, it'll finish as soon as possible. Senator, I can't give you a correct time because I'm relying on people to return uh, statements and, and issues like that, but there's nothing that I think will be um, a, a delay of, of any significance, and I would certainly expect it to be in probably weeks, not days, and certainly not months. Weeks, not days. So I think on the 9th of March you said to the COVID inquiry that it wouldn't take much longer, but here we are. You know, towards the end of May, and you still don't have an end date for this inquiry? Well, again, that, that included a period of cessation and, and pause from the, at the advice, the strong advice of the AFP Commissioner. Uh, we are now finalising receiving the documentation, and it will be repairing a report and providing it to the Prime Minister. It's been, my, my calculation is that this inquiry has been underway for 97 days to find out what the Prime Minister knew and what his office knew and when. Is it seriously that hard to get an answer to that question? I mean, there were some that said the Prime Minister could just ask his staff who knew what when. But here we are nearly 100 days later and we are none the wiser. Uh, two months of that period, Senator, were a period of a pause at the strong advice of the AFP Commissioner. Um, I, am, I have no powers of compulsion. Uh, so I am just, as I said, in the process of getting the uh, documentation and then we'll prepare the report and provide it to the what Prime Minister as soon as I can. You have no powers of compulsion? I'm performing a, a, an administrative inquiry. Right. I don't I have any powers of compulsion Prime, to do anything. I assume that the direction from the Prime Minister to his staff is to cooperate fully and frankly with your inquiry, and so no power of compulsion would be necessary. Is that right, Senator Birmingham? Mr Gage needs to comment in terms of, uh, of the extent of cooperation, but yes, Senator, there is an expectation of cooperation. And there have been no signs of non-cooperation, Senator. Okay, so have you interviewed um, all the staff that you need to interview? Senator, again, I'm not going to go into the details of a report that is not finished. Um, if I talk about, well, in my view, if I talk about people who have or have not been interviewed, one, it will be um, against the undertaking I took at the start of this that those interviews would be confidential. Two, I think, going into it at this stage when uh, it has not finished will go to the nature okay. of people in future inquiries not oh, probably hang on, cooperating. Hang on. Mr Gaitchen's Thirdly, I would like to say that 
this also includes some highly personal information and uh, I think that would invade the privacy of those people that I have looked at, so I'm not highly going personal. to go into the details wow. of an unfinished inquiry. Well, a few points about that. What we are talking about <coughs> is an inquiry into what the PMO knew and what staff did. I know what the yeah, inquiry is about, Senator. Hang on. Um, uh, the first point I make is Senator Gallagher has simply asked, have you interviewed anybody? And you were putting up the shutters straight away before you even answer that. It's hardly an open and transparent inquiry. All of this being done, by the way, because the Prime Minister won't ask his Chief of Staff to work it out and, and tell the Parliament. But leave that aside. But the second point is when you say, and you gave an undertaking as to confidentiality. Did I hear you right? You did, Senator. So you have said to staff in an inquiry that is about the transparency of the PMO that you will keep an interview with them confidential. For the purposes of the report, Senator. Right. So how, how, is, how is Ms Higgins and the public supposed to know who knew what when if you've given an undertaking as to confidentiality at the outset? Senator, this is an inquiry that I'm doing for the Prime Minister re with reference to his staff. Yeah. Yes, we whether it that. is made, Whether that report is made public is not up to me, it's up to the Prime All Minister. Right, so <laughs> it might not be made public. I'm glad you've made that clear. So it's secret that's, interviews that's not into in a my... secret report. <laughs> into That's what, what you've told us this morning. It is not my report to make public, Senator. Senator Birmingham, will the Prime Minister undertake to make this report public? Senator, the Prime Minister hasn't received the report yet. So you and won't give that undertaking today? I'd ask you to get advice you. on that, because I'm seeking an undertaking that the findings of a report into who knew what when in the Prime Minister's office will be made public to the, and certainly at least to the Parliament. Well, Senator, Senator Wong, I will take that on notice. Thank you. Uh, the, as I said, the Prime Minister has not received the report yet. I'll draw a distinction as well between the findings of a report and the full content that may exist in the report in relation to, uh, of course, the fact that the report does involve interviews with a number of staff. Um, uh, full publication of such information may well compromise privacy or other factors. Privacy of the Prime Minister. No, Senator. Is there anything? Well, he got he got asked a question. The reason we've got this inquiry is because he refused to answer a question about who knew what when in his office and what they did. And oh, so, because no, he couldn't no. or wouldn't answer that, he then commissioned right. Mr. Gaitchens to do a review. And a hundred days later. We now find out that there's confidentiality commitments given to staff to participate, and we have no idea if actually we're going to find anything from this report. Yeah. That's what we've Sen been told this morning. Senator, the reason we've got this inquiry is because questions were asked, and the and Prime Minister, to make sure a full and thorough process, independent of his office, was undertaken, uh, asked the Secretary of his department to do so. That's the reason why the inquiry is being undertaken, so that it is undertaken at arm's length from his oh, office. Come on. It's been, it's, um, it's been Gaitchen's, undertaken Gaitchen's because the Prime Minister already... refuses to answer a question in the Parliament. Let's Mr. be clear, it is part of a cover-up and yeah. a deferral of being clear with the Parliament. He could have just answered the question. He could have walked over to the, to the advisor's box and asked his, his chief of staff. But instead, we've got this inquiry. And, and Senator Wong, if he had done that, you would have said it was inadequate and lacking independence. So you know, he is undertaking a process uh, that is an independent process. Senator Gallagher, you made the assertion again in relation to the timing, as Mr Gaitchens has made clear, around two months of that time frame was a cessation of his work at the request uh, of the AFP on their advice. There was, a, there was three weeks before the suspension or the pause where surely this answer could have been provided. I mean, does it really take 100 days for the Prime Minister to get advice on who knew what when in his office about something. And, I mean, and, it's not that hard. Or if it is that hard, tell us why it's that hard, and, Mr Gaitchen. Tell us why it's taking this long. And once again, Senator Gallagher, I'm sure that if Mr Gaitchen had had a few informal conversations and reported quickly, uh, you would have said it was an inadequate investigation, uh, lacking the thoroughness that such a serious issue deserved. Well, 
Let me go back to the question I asked around uh, the conduct of the inquiry. What have you completed in terms of the inquiry, Mr Gaitchens? Uh, Senator, we are still at the stage of receiving material back from those people I've interviewed. From most people, did you from say? From some people. I'm not going to get into most individuals. I thought you said most people. I thought that's, I was putting back what you were saying. Um, okay, so in terms um, of... People I have interviewed. Okay, so in terms of people uh, working, employed in the PMO, have you interviewed all of those relevant people? I'm not asking you to name them. I'm asking whether you have completed the interviews into staff who work in the Prime Minister's office or who did at the time. In my view, I have interviewed all relevant people, Senator. You have interviewed personally all relevant people? Personally, correct. Okay. Um, and that includes uh, staff in the Prime Minister's office? Does it include staff in other ministerial offices? Senator, the inquiry I was asked to inquire, and I think this goes to some of the previous comments, the Prime Minister was told, I think it was on the 14th or 15th of February, was told by his office when they knew about this event, he has asked me to verify that. So it's not as if he hasn't asked his staff. He has asked his staff and he wants me to verify So this is a verification inquiry? So yes. you've started with so you've started knowing what the Prime Minister's office knew and you're just checking it now. No, that's not correct, Senator. Well that's, a, well, that's, that's what you verification, just said. eh? You I say have verified. If you'd allow me to finish. Sure. Please do. The Prime Minister said he was informed, and this is in the media, well, I haven't got the media clips here, that his staff told him uh, on a particular date, which I I can't remember, I don't want to get it wrong, so that's all in the media as well. I was asked then to verify, and there was a media article about three days later, I think, which I was also asked to include in my inquiry, because that made assertions about some people receiving text messages about things as well. So that I have included in my inquiry as well. Okay. So the Prime Minister... So, okay, this is new information, that it's a verification of of what the Prime Minister has told you. So what has he told you? That he knew on the, I think it was, on the 15th? Did no, he tell you... No, a, no, he did not tell me that, Senator. Well, hang on. So, okay. Senator Gallagher, Mr, no, Mr Gaitchens is, is referencing the fact that on the public record there are statements about when people in the Prime Minister's office were informed. Again, I would expect that you would expect Mr Gaitchens to verify whether those public statements are accurate or not. Okay, so I'm asking two things. So you're not, you're not investigating the date the Prime Minister became aware. You are focusing on the other public statements about staff within the office and what they knew and when. Is that correct? Well, that is... The, na the, the subject of the inquiry, Senator, is to yeah. I'm just trying to be very clear what here. The staff said, said to the Prime Minister. My my view then is to ask them questions relating to this issue that confirmed, in my view, that the Prime Minister was told by his office when they told him. They told him. That's <laughs> okay. All right. So let's. Let's unpack that a little bit more. So the, the, were you given terms of reference or anything by the Prime Minister? Is there any sort of document that exists that clearly spells out what you've been asked to do? Senator, I think I covered that in the last hearing. Uh, there was, uh, I was asked by phone to do this and I think we have actually provided, I said this last, the last time I appeared with a summary of that and then the nature of the inquiry. Okay, and who have you been dealing? Who who have you been dealing with? Who's your contact in the prime minister's office? Do you brief him directly on how the investigation's going, or are you doing that through his chief of staff? Senator, it's an independent inquiry. I do not brief him at all. So you've I not. I think there just needs to be a bit of clarity about this. 
I'm not brute. No, I have no. Investigations of clarity would be excellent. I have no point. A bit of clarity would be excellent. If you don't mind, Senator. Yes, a bit of clarity would be excellent. I think the public would appreciate it. When you're finished. I have no point of contact in the Prime Minister's office. I am inquiring and asking questions of staff. This okay. is not something that the Prime Minister's office is wrangling. This is something that I am doing. And I have no point of contact in the Prime Minister's office. And so you're no not updating of... the Prime Minister at all on the... No. Well, he seems to know when things start and stop. I only updated him when I was told to pause, and then I told him through his Chief of Staff when I was... Uh, again, when the Commissioner wrote again to say I could resume. OK. And then... So, in terms of... I think what you just said, which got me a little bit confused, it was in my view that they knew when they said they knew. So, that is what your inquiry is focusing on, is it? It's verifying what media reports were provided about staff knowing something in the Prime Minister's office? I was finding out when staff knew about that event and then from what the Prime Minister had said, are they telling me, if you like, the same thing in terms of timing that they told the, the Prime Minister? OK. What did they tell the Prime Minister? That's in the media, Senator. We're asking you, you, you. You've just given evidence to Senator Gallagher. I would have to just go back. Just let me finish now. I will take no, let that me on finish notice. now. I hadn't finished the question before you take it on notice. Mm. You've just told Senator Gallagher uh, that you are verifying, that you understand your remit, remit to be verifying what the Prime Minister's staff told him. So, what do you understand the facts to be that you're verifying? Uh, Prime Minister, Senator, I'm. I'm I'm going to take that on notice because you, you I want. You don't know. You don't know what you're supposed to be Senators verifying in this inquiry. Allow the witness to respond. I want to make sure I have not, because that relates back to events <coughs> in the middle of February, and I'm not going to just talk about this from the top of my head. I do not want to either mislead or provide wrong information. That I will find out. It's all in the media, so it's not. not well, I we're be asking. Providing you're the any secretary. You'll find out. You're the head of the investigation. <laughs> you'll find out. I'll you didn't find come out prepared what the correct for this? information is, Senator, and I'll provide it to the committee. Sorry, before I, just one more question before mm. Senator Gallagher returns to hers. I, I, I would like to be really clear about what you understand the remit of your inquiry to be. Are you examining or verifying what staff knew or what they told the Prime Minister? Are you verifying that or are you verifying both? I'm verifying what well, I think I need to do. Well, I am doing both, Senator, because you need both to fulfil, I think, the remit of, of my inquiry. OK. How many interviews have you done and are you doing all of them yourself, Mr Gaitch? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to talk about the number of interviews, but I have done Why? them by myself and I've done them with Ms Foster with me. Why aren't you? Because, Senator, I think if I go in that and people say, oh, well, there's X interviews, so tomorrow there will be a list of names of that many or more who it's may or may I'm not asking. be involved, and I'm not going to give rise to that situation. OK, so what are you... Are you refusing to answer that question? Yes. OK. On what grounds? On the grounds of personal privacy and releasing information well, that is, in some cases, highly personal. What, what's highly personal? I'm not going to answer that, sir. Well, no, no. So, I'm, so, I'm, <laughs> okay. We get to ask the questions. Well, it, you, you are the head of the public service, so you should at least appropriately take a PII claim and, mm. and, and go through the proper process. Is that so do you, wanna, do you want to adjourn and we'll extend your... Are you going to do it properly? I'm happy to take it on notice and, and speak to the minister. Wow. So Somebody should brief you about do you how know to do what, PII You know claim. what you're doing you a are, PII exa claim on? You're example to the public service. You're doing a PII claim on how many interviews you've conducted. Not, we're not asking for personal information. But, but Senator, Senator Birmingham. Senator, Senator, it is a reasonable expectation uh, that uh, in hmm. a relatively small cohort of, uh, of potential people, if Mr. Gaitchen's well, it's goes not and that says small. he's undertaken the Prime Minister's a certain office number is quite of large. interviews, Senators, please that allow. will result in extensive Mr. speculation Mr. about who those individuals are. No, that's not the misception. It's appropriate for Mr. Gaitchen's to be able to conclude his report independently. 
without that type of uh, potential inference or otherwise for media reporting identifying different individuals. So as not to uh, hold up the committee, uh, I would request, I assume that despite the fact he hasn't done so, that Mr Gagens is referring the PII claim to you and I'd ask that you provide that in writing to the committee for its consideration. I don't want to hold up the rest of the day, but it should be done appropriately. Leave the government, the Senate, Secretary PM and C could at least take a PII claim appropriately. Thank Sir, you. Certainly, Senator, I'll take your request on board. I think Mr Gatchens is, uh, is being very clear there. He wants to be able to complete. No, he's being clear that he doesn't want to tell the order. He wants to be it's able order. to complete he hasn't actually, his, his cover-up. Please allow it's, the it's witness cover-up. It's, 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 it's a cover-up of the cover-up. Of the cover-up. It's like a triple cover-up. Order. Like you cannot no, order. Of Please allow Senator Birmingham to answer the question. There are 60 people working in the Prime Minister's office. How can you, indicating how many interviews you've done for this inquiry, constitute personal information or a privacy breach? Like I just, it, Mr. Gage, can you answer that? It is, it's it, just unbelievable. It is inevitable that if Mr. Gaitchens provides that, there will be extensive okay. speculation about the individuals and likely publication of individual names from there. Have any of your former staff been interviewed, Senator Birmingham? Uh, to well, your knowledge? Well, Senator Wong, uh, I'm not aware of any of the details of who Mr Gaitchens has interviewed. As he has made clear already, he is conducting this investigation at arm's length. He's not briefing the Prime Minister's office. He's not briefing me. He is conducting these investigations uh, appropriately, independently of ministerial offices. So just while we're clear, you are refusing to, uh, you're taking on notice the facts that you're verifying. You're refusing to tell Senator Gallagher and the committee how many interviews with Prime Minister staff you have undertaken, and you can't give us a date by which you're going to give the report. And you can't, Senator Birmingham, tell people that the report will be made public. That's where we are this morning. Mm. Senator Wong, the report, as I say, has not been completed yet. The content of it, therefore, is, uh, is not yet clear as to what would be appropriate or not to make public. Do you think Ms Higgins deserves for this matter to be finalised as soon as possible? I mean, we have this young woman who's gone through a very traumatic event here, and we have, yep. you know, a hundred days later to answer a simple question about who knew what when in the Prime Minister's office, and it's dragging on like this. Do you think it's fair? I think she deserves to have it finalised as soon as possible, but mm -hmm. also thoroughly and independently. Have you interviewed Ms Higgins, Mr Gaitchens? Uh, not yet, Senator. Uh, it's scheduled uh, shortly. Why haven't you been able to speak with her? Uh, because this interview has been arranged uh, with her at a time convenient for her. Are you going to be able to give her any answers? Or are you inquiring into Miss Higgins and what she knew? Uh, Ms Higgins actually approached us to be involved, um, Senator. Um, I won't speculate as to what I can, uh, what that interview will, um, uh, what form it will take, but she asked to uh, be involved and we have facilitated that. Okay, can I ask some questions around um, what happened with uh, your communication with the AFP Commissioner. We know now that following your last appearance here, um, you picked up the phone and, and called the AFP Commissioner on the 22nd of March this year, is that correct? Uh, it is, Senator. Okay. And did you discuss him putting out a media statement that he issued at 2.01pm on that day? I'm not sure we actually discussed the media statement. We certainly discussed the uh, interpretation of the evidence uh, and then talked about how we might actually clarify that confusion, let's put it that way. 
So the evidence that you gave here and the evidence he gave in another room, so talking about that? Well, I think, to be accurate, Senator, there were messages going between committees and I was asked about what he said. Um, there were, uh, I think the questions was, were, were along the lines that people were saying, he was saying different things to what I was saying. So I think it's no surprise that I called him after the event to see if we could clear things up. Get your story straight. Is that what happened? Um, I don't understand what you mean. We were both giving evidence under oath in a Senate committee, so I don't... So why did you ring him? What, what was the because purpose? Because there were it different wasn't interpretations of the evidence. OK, so whose interpretation was right? Well, I'm sticking by my interpretation, and I think what the Commissioner said at a hearing after the event, that he sticks by his interpretation as well, because he thinks he was saying in slightly different language the same thing. And did you have any discussion about how to, um, how to manage what was appeared to be conflicting information? No, I think it was just... So you said I said this, he said I said this, and then you hung up, did you? I, I can't remember the actual detail of the conversation, but as a result of that, he, he and I can't tell him to do things, oh. he put out a statement around about two o'clock. And the media statement that magically appeared at 2.01 on that day, you didn't have any knowledge of that? You didn't have any discussion about how to manage the evidence and the confusion that had arisen publicly? No, the discussion was about the confusion and how we could actually clarify it. Oh, and how, okay, so you did have a discussion yes. about how to clarify it and how, yes. what, what agreement was reached on that? Well, the agreement was, I think we did understand that there was a bit of confusion, so in the end, the Commissioner decided to put out a press release. So he told you that on the phone? Um, I can't remember those exact words, Senator, but he put Did the you know out. the That's press release was coming before it was put out? Uh, not when I was giving evidence. No, no that wasn't that question. After the, after the phone call. Yes. Um, yes, I, I expected a press right. release Did you discuss okay. with the Commissioner at two o'clock? Yeah, you know, that question time was at two o'clock and the release needed to be out. Was there any discussion about the timing of the release in that phone call? Uh, the timing would have been as quick as possible just to resolve things. No, not would have. I'm asking you about your recollection of what was discussed in the phone call with the AFP Commissioner about the timing of the press release. Correct My recollection was to put something out as quick as possible. OK. That was the undertaking that you had got from the AFP Commissioner, that it would be him no, issuing a statement. No, I did not get an statement. undertaking, Senator. I can't... What, you, left that you left that phone call knowing that there would be a press statement issued as soon as possible to clarify what was confusing evidence between the two of you? Oh. Yes or no? Look, the press release was, was put out, whether we had actually, again, it wasn't an undertaking or an agreement, I think. It's what that, he'd resolved that's the best way to do it. He resolved? Are you kidding me? Well, I can't tell him what to do, Senator. So you had it, you picked the phone, you left here, you picked the phone up, and all of a sudden a media release appears just before question time. So you Is that, would prefer are you seriously to have conflicting evidence? Us, are you seriously asking us to believe that you didn't have a hand in that? That you didn't I spoke to the Commissioner, I'm quite happy of course I spoke to the Commissioner. Because there was clear differences in the way evidence Correct. was being interpreted. But you didn't issue a statement, did you? He did. No, I didn't issue a statement. OK, so he issued a statement after a discussion with you and just before question time, and you had prior knowledge that that was going to happen? Yes, but prior knowledge by, what, a matter of... I can't remember when I left here, but it would have been... Uh, after, the, after the phone call was a... Yeah. Did you I, make a file note of the call, Mr Gaitchens? No. You had a discussion with the AFP Commissioner about conflicting evidence before the Parliament in relation to an alleged rape and the circumstances around inquiry as to that, and you say you made no note of the call. The conversation was about differing interpretations at different Senate committees about evidence. And how to clarify that. Yes. You've already volunteered that. Yes. And it was clarified. Why would I need to keep a file note? 
kind of useful. It's a, it's a, a process useful phone call. It's not a process phone call, well, Mr. Gates. I disagree, Senator. Really, it's a process. You regularly ring the AFP commissioner because the two of you have given conflicting evidence to the parliament. No, I don't. No, it is. I don't recall a time when it's happened. It probably has at some point in history, but I've been here a fair while. I don't remember this happening. And you made no file note. Well, Senator, I would be very surprised if any public servant giving evidence to a Senate who became aware that there were differing interpretations or confusing evidence elsewhere would not seek to actually clarify that. I did exactly clarify that. Clarify it and record it. You're the head of the public service talking to the AFP commissioner about an, you know, a, an inquiry into an alleged rape in this building. Like it's, it's not a simple process. It's, it's a, a matter of national importance and national interest and the head of the public service doesn't make file notes anymore. Well, Senator, it was clarified and put on the public record through the AFP Commissioner's no, public the, statement. The, the question that is obvious in people's minds is what occurred in that phone call between the head of Mr Morrison's department and the AFP Commissioner that led to the statement. Now, that is an obvious set of questions for the public. And in terms of ensuring that people perceive the, in, the integrity of the process, being transparent about how that conversation took place, what happened in that conversation and what led to the AFP Commissioner's release just before question time, it is in the public interest. Senator Wong, the AFP Commissioner holds an independent statutory office. Yes, we're aware He of makes that. his decisions. We're not the ones that rang him to make sure he put a statement out. No, you were, you were some of the ones saying that there were inconsistencies there, in the interpretation was, of the was. AFP no, advice. No, 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 hang on. Even no, Mr. Gage, no, come on, Senator Birmingham, please. Even no. Mr. Gaitchens acknowledges there was, he uses the words conflicting or, or, or you know, the confusing, but there was inconsistent evidence. That was not a political point. We had and, one answer in one committee, another answer in another. And the questions that were being asked related to what the AFPs advice and position on the matter was. So it was entirely appropriate that the AFP clarify that. Mm. And that's what the AFP After Commissioner did. After a bit of encouragement did. from Mr Gaitens, it appears. You, well, it, you would have rather it wasn't clarified, Senator. I would have rather people just... I'd rather people be honest them. about what went on. We, everybody is, Senator. And oh, big call. the AFP Commissioner big Well, there's call. no file provided. note. And Mr Gaitchens can't specifically recall what happened, which is also assisted by file notes. Well, Mr Gaitchens has clearly detailed what happened. They had a conversation about the fact that there were different interpretations out of different Senate committees about the advice the AFP was providing. And as a result of those different interpretations, the AFP Commissioner took the step of issuing a clarification. When Mr Kershaw proposed to correct his evidence about contact with you, Mr Gaitchens, and um, answer a question on notice to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee um, that you called him on that day and not the other way round, how did you become aware of that? Um, I, look, I think it's when I saw the actual correction. So Mr Kershaw didn't ring you and say that I'll be providing this answer to the committee or anyone in your office? I don't think so. Can I just confer? Sure. Excuse me. Sorry, Senator. Um, Ms Foster, tells me that there was discussion between the AFP and her as to the issuing of a correction. Right. I cannot remember at all. It's all very cosy, isn't it? Speaking to the Commissioner. You don't recall speaking to the Commissioner about it? No. Sorry. Is the evidence that Ms Foster has just advised you that you did speak to the Commissioner but that hasn't jogged your memory? No, Senator, or, that's no, not No, hang on, hang on. Let me just give you the two options. Or is she saying someone else spoke to the Commissioner? Which of the two is it? Is it you or someone else? I did not speak to the Commissioner okay. about this. What I, what so, I said so earlier, M as far Foster as I'm aware, is that Ms Foster was told, and I don't think it was by the Commissioner, that 
a correction would be. Was okay, going to we'll be go to that after the end of your evidence. Sure. So, Ms. Foster, if you can yep. ensure that you're briefed on who, what, when, and how. Thank you. So, you said, Labor you Senators, just just quickly, um, I'm aware that Senator Waters has a couple of questions yep. for this That's witness. Fine. If we could yep. try and wrap this up quickly, yep. that would be appreciated. So, you said you didn't recall speaking to the commissioner, but you're now saying that you didn't speak to the commissioner about that's, the clarification. That's my recollection, Senator. Okay. There's an, sorry. Do you so I just, I, I forgot to ask this question earlier, Mr. Gagins. Um, you've refused to answer how many people you've interviewed, but you have said you have interviewed people in the Prime Minister's office. Um, have you uh, had to deal with any legal uh, representatives of any members of the Prime Minister's staff? Uh, Senator, it is, uh, I think, open um, for people to be represented legally. Um, again, I do not want to get into I, a position... I haven't given you number. I haven't asked our numbers. I haven't asked who. I'm simply asking whether or not you have been dealing, had to deal with, any legal representatives of members of the Prime Minister's staff in the context of your inquiry. All interviews were done with the staff members. No. Were, were they legally, were any legally represented? Uh, Senator, uh, I'd like to take that on notice for the reason, again, um, I just have the view that if, if it is revealed at this stage without the completeness of the report that some people wanted to have legal advice and some people didn't, that could I, I assume asked, that other people I, okay, are more I, guilty. I, we have I, un, I well, hang on, hang on, Mr Gagins, I, have, I understand that point. I don't agree with it, but I understand the point you're making. But I'm not asking that question. I'm not asking who or how many. I'm just asking, are any of the Prime Minister's stars legally represented for, represented for the purpose of your inquiry? So I'm, Again, Senator, can I, I'd like to take that on notice, but Seriously? does that mean that... Well, we know what the I'd, answer is. So the answer's yes. The answer's yes, because otherwise you'd say ask, no. Just for complete Order. clarification about that question, are you asking if I had, for in some cases, to speak to legal representatives no. and not staff members, or that they just had legal no, representatives with Please them. don't construe the question in a way that suits you. No, I just want to know what yeah. you're really asking. I want to know so. if any of them lawyer, have lawyered up. I want to know if any of the PMO have lawyered up in relation to your inquiry. And you know what? I reckon people want to know that. I will take that on notice. Yeah. Are you able to answer it now? I will take it on notice. Because you don't want to answer it? I have given reasons why I don't want why, to answer why, it. Why do you need to take that on notice? The officials are entitled to because take that on notice. No, I'm asking, and I'm entitled to ask why. Yeah, because I want to get to further explain. clarification about what I can say on that. But you believe people are entitled to get legal representation for this, the purpose of this sort of inquiry. I think you started this. I think they're able to get legal representation yeah. whenever they want. You don't have any problem with that, Mr. Senator Birmingham? If the staff have lawyered up for the purposes of the inquiry that's about transparency to the parliament and to Ms. Higgins? Uh, Senator, this matter does also intersect, um, as everybody is aware, with a criminal investigation that the AFP is undertaking. Oh, God. Um, You're doing your best it, to ensure it does. It is. Uh, if individuals believe, uh, potentially uh, uh, for this or for, um, or for their engagement uh, with assisting the AFP in their investigations, that uh, uh, legal assistance is helpful to the compilation of statements or otherwise, that's a matter for individuals. I have just a couple more uh, questions. One, um, the letter from Mr Kershaw, which he's provided to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, is a copy of a letter he wrote uh, to you, Mr Gaitchens, on the 4th of March. It was responding to a letter from you of the 22nd of February. I'd ask that you uh, table that letter for the committee, the letter that you wrote to, to Mr Commissioner Kershaw on the 22nd of February. If you'd like to take that on notice, that's fine. But in that letter, it's the, from the AFP Commissioner, it has a sentence which says, I will correspond with the senators you have identified with a view to ensuring that any potential for adverse impact of the AFP's criminal investigation is also appropriately addressed. So which senators did you identify, Mr Gaitchens, and why? 
Uh, I'd have to go, I'd have to take that on notice. Seriously? So, yes. I mean, did you prepare for today? Yes, I did. Uh, well, I did not prepare for every sentence and every piece senators? of correspondence. Well, if you're naming so you're... senators to the Commissioner of the Australian There's only Federal 76 Police, of us. I presume it's not a government senator. Why are you naming senators? Who were the, tro who were the senators you wanted Mr C Commissioner Kershaw to speak to? Uh, I would have to check with my original correspondence if I mentioned names. What? Senator? Well, he says, he, he I says will it. correspond with the senators you have identified. So you have identified senators. We'd like to know who they are. And why do you identify them? Uh, well, why is the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department writing to the AFP Commissioner identifying senators that the Commissioner should speak to? It's a pretty reasonable question. Senator, I think those, again, the senators referred to, uh, look, rather than me just off the, off the cuff, I want well, to... Well, we'd like it off the cuff. Like, you get to disappear from here in I 10 will... minutes and we don't see you again. And we can't will... ask these questions. It is pretty important information if you are naming senators that you'd like the AFP Commissioner to have a word with in what seems to be a pretty cosy arrangement, frankly, that's going on here, and you can't name them. Uh, I can, Senator. I'm just refreshing okay. my memory now. The, mm -hmm. in, the senators referred to were those, in fact, conducting reviews at Parliament House with respect to... Uh, so Commissioner Kershaw's letter was about the number of reviews going up, being underway at Parliament House, uh, and two senators were mentioned in respect to the reviews that they were responsible or responsible for the inquiries. And? So they were? Um, let me confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so uh, no. So uh, one, was, uh, one was me, Senator. Right. Uh, so in fact, contrary to the question that there weren't government members, they in fact were both government members. Okay. Um, so it, uh, it was in relation, it would appear, I haven't seen this letter before, but on quick glance it would appear it was in relation to my work in establishing the, what is now known as the Jenkins Review. Yep. Uh, at that stage, that was still in an early stage and uh, clearly there were some questions as to whether there would be in that work any intersection uh, with, uh, uh, with the AFP investigation. Obviously, as we worked cooperatively to establish those terms of reference, there wasn't. Uh, the other was not a senator, but was, uh, was uh, Celia Hammond, uh, who at the time as well had been asked by the Prime Minister to do some work with the Liberal Party. Um, uh, again, that work has been folded into, uh, into the process of the Jenkins Review. Okay, so not two senators. There was you and, and the Hammond. member of the House. Correct. Okay, and did you did did Commissioner Kershaw contact you and speak to you? Um, I think there was. Uh, I've not spoken directly to the commissioner about this. Uh, I think there was some communication, and I have to take the details of it from on notice. But some communication between my office and the AFP about the work we were doing to establish the Jenkins review, uh, and obviously uh, from that, given what preceded. Uh, as distinct from what occurred with the Gaitchen's review, uh, the AFP were comfortable that uh, there was not an intersection with their investigations. Just going back to staff legal costs or lawyers, can a question for you, Senator Birmingham, are any um, staff legal costs being covered for the purposes of this investigation? Senator, there are processes uh, under the uh, Legal Services Direction for MOPS Act staff to be eligible for uh, certain legal costs to be covered. Um, and they're matters that, uh, that obviously we can canvas in relation to... I'm asking uh, you now. No, um, no, we go, and Senator, let me finish, that, uh, that we can canvas how all of those processes work I when the right officials work. are at the table. Um, uh, it is a long-standing convention not to identify I haven't asked individual identif circumstances. I'm not, hang on, hang on. I'm not asking who, I'm asking you are any staff members' legal fees being covered by public funds? So, Senator, it's a long-standing convention not to identify circumstances or staff uh, <laughs> where 
I think uh, the those media can legal take services that directions. I think everyone can take that. Labor the Mops Act uh, are replied. Do you know how much this whole Order, inquiry is Labor costing? Senators, I do want to pass the call on to sure. Senator Waters at some point. We are going yep. a little over time here. Well, I'm not asking for the names. I'm pressing. The answer is, 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 is it's, it's, a, it's a very simple question. Anybody's costs being covered for the purposes of this inquiry? I'm not asking who, not asking how much even. Yeah, I might ask that. I'm just asking. Don't, don't, don't you think people are entitled to know that? So, Senator, uh, I'm conscious of, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, there's a long-standing set of practices that exist around uh, the application of uh, those uh, rights for staff under the Members of Parliament Staff Act and the application of the legal services direction and the conventions. On what? Uh, but it's the, the <laughs> That the Honestly, that have seriously, existed well, the cover-up well is these, unreal. You won't well even tell people if you're paying for their legal costs. Well, before it's unbelievable. These I'm not even asking who. You won't even tell people if you're paying for the legal costs of staff to deal with Mr. Gatchin's well, inquiry. Well, Senator, you're asking for uh, you're asking for me. Order. It's public uh, to money. Break with. Uh, a long-standing practice not? that's not. applied across I've been the finance minister. Please I know that. I, to to I have question. not asked you who. That would be, a, I have to say, I think staff, but that's a different issue. But I'm not asking you who, I'm asking if. Is, anybody, uh, is anyone's legal fees being paid? And, and, and by default, uh, because of uh, the nature of the investigations, uh, <coughs> it immediately then identifies uh, the office of the Member of Parliament in question. Answer. Labor Senators, I'm going to give the yep. call to Senator okay, Waters. Right. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Mr Gatchins. Hi, Minister. Um, the Prime Minister met with Brittany Higgins on the 30th of April. Mr Gatchins, were you at that meeting? I was not, Senator. Um, who was present at that meeting? Uh, I think the only person, I'm sure, I think with the Prime Minister and Ms Foster. And other than those, I'm, I'm not aware. I think... Um, my memory of Miss Higgins coming out is she had someone with her as well, but I don't know the names. Okay. Oh, and I was not there. Okay. Following that meeting, did the Prime Minister give uh, you or anyone else in the department directions regarding workplace reviews or reforms? Uh, certainly do, did not give me, Senator. It, it might be best to raise that with Ms Foster. Okay. Um, were you tasked with any actions flowing from the meeting that the Prime Minister had with Brittany Higgins on 30th of April? Not, not in particular, no. no. Okay. Um, and did you receive a list of outcomes or commitments made from that meeting? No, I did not. Okay. Are you aware whether there were any outcomes or commitments made at that meeting? No, the only feedback I got was a very high level um, a response from, Senate, from Ms Foster saying that the meeting basically went well and that was there was there was no detail from the Prime Minister's made aware perspective. Of. No, from well Ms. Foster did not say from the Prime Minister's perspective. I think she just gave me her read out of the meeting that it went Okay, thank you. I'll ask well. Ms. Foster about that when, when her um, when she joined us at the table. Um, in relation to the recommencement of your uh, investigation, I was in another committee but I understand that you've said that the AFP uh, told you on the 10th of May that it could resume and you then told the Prime Minister the following day. Is I, that correct? I sent emails to the people I have been interviewing in the Prime Minister's office, including the Chief of Staff, and asked the Chief of Staff to inform the Prime Minister. On the 10th or the 11th? Uh, the 11th, Senator. Okay. So what circumstances changed that allowed the review to recommence? Uh, Senator, that uh, letter is going to be tabled, uh, and I, I said in an earlier answer, it was along the lines of uh, the commissioner advising me that the, inve the police investigations had got to a stage where they were um, comfortable, and I, but, so that's not a quote, but comfortable basically that there was no um, intersection between my inquiries and their inquiry. So they were happy for me to, to proceed. Okay. Was the resumption of the review one of the commitments made in the Prime Minister's meeting with um, Ms Higgins? I'm unaware of that, if it was, Senator. Okay. Um, and which ministers have you spoken with, if any, in relation to your review? Uh, none with respect to interviews. Um, it's a, the, the review is about the Prime Minister's staff. Yes. And with respect to other types of engagement, not interviews as such? 
No. It's, it's an independent inquiry and basically it's been between me, Ms Foster and um, the staff involved. Okay. Um, and just confirming the time frame for when you expect to complete that report? Again, Senator, I would think as, well, as soon as possible and I think that's going to be, sorry, weeks, not days and not months. Okay. And will it be made public? Uh, that's not up to me, Senator. Who's It'll that up, up to? to the, the Prime Minister. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I've got some other questions that don't pertain to you, Mr Gaitchen. So right. in the interest of ensuring everyone has a chance to ask Mr Gaitchen, then I will leave it there, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Waters. Any other questions from Labor senators before we dismiss Mr okay, Gaitchen? So I just want to confirm what we've learnt um, this morning on the investigation is we, you don't have an end date, but you hope that it will be weeks, not months. Is that correct? I will be seeking to achieve that outcome, not hoping. I will be actively working to get that outcome. OK. Um, but we, you're not prepared to tell us how many interviews you've done? You're not prepared to tell us whether you're covering legal costs? We don't have an end date. I mean, is it seriously this hard to work out who knew what when in the Prime Minister's office? I mean, it just looks to me, Senator Birmingham, like you're trying to just kick this can down the road as far as you can go from the events of February this year and, frankly, March 2019, and hope that people forget it. Senator, it was two weeks ago yesterday that Mr Gaitchens received advice from the AFP Commissioner that he could recommence uh, the investigations that had been paused a couple of months or so ago. Uh, he has indicated he expects to conclude them within a matter uh, of weeks and that that is what he is working towards, uh, that he is doing this work uh, independently uh, and thoroughly uh, and, uh, and he will clearly work to achieve um, against those outcomes. But, you know, a, a young woman was allegedly raped in a minister's office. The Prime Minister has asked what he knew when. Do you feel no shame, Senator Birmingham, about the way in which this has been dragged out and the extent to which you are going, as the man representing the Prime Minister here, along with Mr Gatons, uh, to, prevent, to, to, to prevent answers to the simple question of who knew what when. Do you feel no shame about that? Senator, Senator Wong. Uh, look, I get, this, no. I get the politics, but really? No. You know, we've got staff lawyers, we've got no compulsion, uh, confidentiality agreement, people being lawyered up, nobody, uh, no, no agreement to disclose it, not even telling people who was interviewed, and no indication as, the end of, as to when this is being uh, made public. But leave aside all the politics. This is about something awful that happened in this building and whether the leader of the country knew and whether his office knew. Do you really think this is what politics should be about? Senator, I, I think that Brittany Higgins deserves to have a thorough process answers. completed. A thorough Not process completed. Not obfuscation and cover-up. Answers. Wong, please allow the witness to answer the question. I think Senator Wong, that Brittany Higgins deserves to have a thorough process completed, one that is uh, of integrity. Um, she deserves word. that. She deserves that in relation to the police investigation that we would all hope can lead uh, to uh, an ultimate uh, potential prosecution and conviction if the evidence is there. She deserves that in relation to the work that Mr Gaitchens is doing, which is why it's important that it is done thoroughly and independently. Mm. She deserves indeed to have um, those answers, as she deserves to see the type of reforms uh, to culture, uh, to standards, uh, to practices in relation to uh, support and reporting and complaints handling in this place uh, that we are uh, all working to achieve. She deserves all of those things, Senator Wong. Yeah, no, no power of compulsion, no co a confidentiality agreement with PMO staff, lawyers for PMO staff, no end date, no commitment to release the report. Do you really think this is how government should operate? Because all of that, all of that, and all of this contest, just to find out <laughs> whether the PMO knew. Senator really? Wong, 
You and, so many, much, you, and you and many others have asked questions. There's a lot of effort going into so not much effort any is, information. That's exactly that Mr. Right. Gatens is seeking independently and thoroughly to answer. No, it, what it looks like mm -hmm. is exactly as Senator Gallagher said that there's an incredible amount of effort going into not providing those answers. Senator Wong, that's, uh, that's not the case. Uh, as Mr. Gatens has Black made clear this points. morning, the bulk of the time that he has been tasked to do this work, he was asked not to be doing it uh, uh, or advised not to be doing it by the AFP. He has recommenced in the space of the last 15 days. Uh, in those 15 days, he has re-engaged uh, with the uh, staff in the Prime Minister's office. He has re-engaged with Brittany Higgins. Uh, if you were serious about getting this done, it, it would have weeks. been done, frankly. Like, I, I hear Sen what you're saying, Sen Sen Senator Birmingham, it's a lot of words, well, but of words. if you wanted to get this done, if the Prime Minister wanted to get this done, don't tell me that when he wants to know something that it takes a hundred days to tell him something. Like, if he wanted to know who knew what, when, and what did they do about it, that answer would have been provided well before the inquiry even paused. The pause is a convenience, but we know two years on from this woman's experience, DPS haven't changed anything. Mr Gaitchen's inquiry is ongoing and Mr Kunkel's inquiry is ongoing and nothing has been resolved. And this young woman is left battling the system that's been created to confuse, confound, to apologise and to move on. Well, we're not going to allow it. We're not going to allow it. So, so An answer should have been given this morning. So, so Senator Gallagher, what is absolutely important is that the AFP investigation is able to proceed this and that it was not this compromised, that this is able to proceed and proceed with independence and with thoroughness. As I observed earlier, if this had all been completed in the space of a couple of weeks with Mr Gaitens having a few conversations true. with individuals, it's a convenient you would have sat order. here that and is said not true. that it lacked thoroughness and it lacked integrity. I think it should be a matter of days to find out the order. proper process and from that proper process okay. will reach I'm his conclusions independently. No. I, I think everyone watching knows what you're doing. Well, Senator Wong, everyone Mr. Gaitens watching has knows what you're doing. Everybody watching this knows what you're doing. And, and that there are some and things I've, that there are actually some things that should be beyond politics. And I would have thought this incident is one of them. Well, anyway, let's I, leave I that. I might ask. Of politics I, I, I'm asking this morning, a question about legal fees. You'll probably take it on notice, but I want to know this. Leaving aside the legal fees for staff under the uh, enterprise bargaining arrangements, I think it is, or the MOPS Act arrangements, has, P has PMC commissioned any legal advice or retained any lawyers in relation to this matter? That's a question for you, Mr Gaitchens. Sorry, Senator, you were talking to Senator Birmingham before. I'm asking... Oh, <laughs> Has Prime Minister, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, PMNC, retained, uh, utilised, obtained any legal advice, retained any lawyers, utilised any lawyers in relation to your investigation? No, Senator. What about internal advice, legal advice? You've got, you've got a legal section. In just, this is in addition to AGS, but you've got legal. Yeah, we've got. Yeah, and have you engaged with those parts of your department or individuals uh, in your department? I've asked some questions about process, um, Senator, just to, to make sure that, right. uh, again, I, I, I think my inquiry has to follow a process that can uh, withstand scrutiny, uh, and I've asked about that right. given that I'm not a lawyer, and how can I best... Have you incurred fees? Has PMNC incurred any fees in the context of progressing this inquiry? Are there any... What my, costs? My immediate response would be no, Senator, but I will also take that on notice just in case there's... Any PMNC costs associated with this inquiry whatsoever? Uh, again, just in case there's something way down in the detail, I'll, I'll take that on notice, Senator. But nothing um, you know, of, of a uh, large scale. Uh, and what legal costs? I want to know how much has been spent on legal costs um, for members of the Prime Minister's office. Well, certainly nothing from PMC. No, I'm asking. 
We'll come back to that in finance, but I'm asking you to take that on notice, Senator Birmingham. And that is public money. I'll take it on notice, Senator. Okay. I just have a couple more questions. Mr Gaitchins, are you uh, retiring soon? Um, well, let me, in someone else's vernacular, I'd put that as fake news at the moment. Okay, so there's quite a bit of fake news going around, including in the government's own journal, The Australian, then. Are we meant to believe that? <laughs> You can believe whatever you like, Senator. Well, there's an article in The Australian which usually seems to be fairly accurate when it comes to um, this government and its administration. So you're ruling out retiring any time soon? No, I didn't say that. I don't put words in my mouth, Senator. Sorry, well, answer the question news. then. I'm you asking you, are you retiring soon? I you think said I did. It's fake news. And then, and now you're saying. Question, I'm answered the question, Senator. I think, it, yeah. What's the answer? answer? So it's fake Governor. news you're retiring, but you're not going to rule out retiring soon. Well, that your evidence? Who knows what might happen in a week's time, a month's time, that I have no control over? It's a serious question. You're the head of and the I've public service. You well, you're answer. not treating it seriously. The highest paid public servant in the country. Are you retiring? Have you had discussions with the Prime Minister? No. About retiring? No. Okay, so all these little articles that are appearing everywhere, you, you, where would they be coming from? I would not have a clue, Senator. There is a lot written about me which is untrue, false. Um, I don't know where they get it from, and I don't worry about it. I'm sure everybody sitting around the table would relate to that at one time or another. Okay. Any other questions for Senator, um, for Mr Gaitchins, rather? No? In that case, Mr Gaitchins, thank you very much thank for you, coming Chair. along today. You are dismissed. And then we will move on to the uh, body of PMNC with Ms Foster at the table. Okay, great. Welcome, Ms Foster. Uh, you did foreshadow when you were sitting back there at the start that you uh, might have something to say at some point. Did you want to provide a statement to the committee now or later? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Stephanie Foster, Deputy Secretary, Governance, Head of APS Rapport in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The members of PMNC's executive in attendance for this session to answer your questions are Simon Duggan, Deputy Secretary, Economic Industry and G20 Sherpa, Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy. Caroline Miller, Deputy Secretary, National Security and International Policy. Paul Grigson, Deputy Secretary, Vaccine Strategy Integration. James Larson, Climate Coordinator. And Tom Gilmartin, Chief Operating Officer. And other senior officers will be available to assist as required. There have been no changes to the executive since the last estimates. And as usual, I have PMNC's current organisation chart here to table for the committee. Thank you. Ms Foster, was that the extent of the statement uh, that you was, wish Senator. to provide at this point? Thank you very much. I'm looking for guidance from Labor Senators. Senator Gallagher, I get the thank call you. to people being very generous. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Birmingham, there are two inquiries into the conduct of Mr Morrison's office in relation to the um, alleged sexual assault of Ms Higgins, and we've discussed the first one, the Gaitchens inquiry. The second one concerns uh, the backgrounding against Ms Higgins' family by Mr Morrison's media office. Um, can you let the committee know whether the government can rule out having backgrounded against Ms Higgins? Are you in a position to do that today? Uh, Senator, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, as I've said before, of that having occurred. Um, I understand uh, Dr I'm asking Campbell you to rule it out. 
Well, Senator Aiken, you can rule it out as far as my knowledge. Sorry. But you're representing the Prime Minister here today. Yes, I think he's been clear that he had no knowledge of any such activities either. But we've got the Kunkel investigation underway. What can you let us know about that? I understand Dr Kunkel has, uh, has worked through uh, a process. I'm not aware of the details of that process, Senator. You haven't been briefed on it? No, Senator. In preparation for today? No, Senator. Well, I have a series of questions about it, so um, I'm going to just work through them. Is there anyone who can assist the committee today around the Kunkel inquiry? Senator Wellmans asked the questions. It's, uh, as I understand it, internal to the PMO, so it's, uh, it's not likely that, uh, that the department uh, will be able to. Um, so on the 25th of March, Mr Morrison told the House of Representatives that his Chief of Staff had received information that day from a primary and direct source regarding these matters, and he'd asked his Chief of Staff to, quote, commence a process. That process started some 62 days ago, so where are we up to with it? I have to say that on notice, Senator. So you didn't... You weren't given any advice in preparation for today about the Kunkel investigation before your appearance in estimates? What Nobody. I, well, you, you represent the Prime Minister here. So my suggestion is a series of questions is likely to be asked now. You're here till quite late tonight, and perhaps you can take the opportunity to consult with the Prime Minister or Mr Kunkel about the answers to those questions and can come back after one of the breaks. I, I can seek what information I can during the day, Senator. I think that's probably... Shall I keep working through? Because I think you're just... I've got a, a number of questions. Uh, yeah. OK. Let me just have a look at how I can... So I'm, you're telling us you have no state of knowledge about the Kunkel investigation at all? I have no detail uh, of, that, uh, of that with me, Senator. At, like, OK. Has Mr Morrison asked any of his own staff if they backgrounded against Ms Higgins? I, uh, I'm not aware of the conversations uh, the Prime Minister's had with Could uh, you take it on notice staff, and Senator? ask the Prime Minister and come back to advise the committee? I'll take it on notice if, uh, if you wish, Senator. Well, these are within the Prime Minister's knowledge. You represent the Prime Minister in the Parliament and in this Senate here, estimates hearing. So my suggestion is that Senator Gallagher put a series of questions to you. If they are not in your knowledge, I'm requesting that you, as Leader of the Government in the Senate and representing the Prime Minister here, go away and come back and provide us with whatever answers you are able. OK. Has Mr Kunkel... Um, he commenced a process on the 25th of March. Do you have any knowledge about his dealings with Miss Higgins in relation to this inquiry? Uh, no, Senator. OK. Has, do you know if Mr Kunkel has interviewed people in the Mr Morrison's media office? I don't have uh, details in relation to that, Senator. Wait. It just... Honestly, this... This is a pretty important inquiry, right? We've got a, a young woman who went public about an alleged rape in this building, and in the same week that she was going public with that, we had stories of the Prime Minister's own media unit walking the press gallery, backgrounding against her loved ones. That's, that's where this, this whole thing started. 60 days ago, I mean, your answers today would lead me to believe that nobody is taking this seriously and it's another exercise in kicking the can down the road and no one taking responsibility for what went on in this building and the aftermath of it. I mean, I can't believe that you hear, here representing the Prime Minister at estimates when this is a live matter and nobody is bothered to brief you on it would indicate to me that nobody is really taking this seriously at all. Senator, I'm sure that's not the case, but uh, as I said, I will, uh, I will provide what information I can. Well, we are going to have to come back to this, because I, I mean, I can keep putting questions to you. Um, 
but if you're going to take everything on notice, it might be more useful, I think, if we get you briefed and then we come back to these questions. I just because all I can take at the moment is no one. It, this is the Kunkel inquiry is a joke because nobody knows what's happening for 60 days. You're the responsible repping minister and you have no idea. We're not going to get very far, are we? Well, Senator, as I say, it's a matter internal to the PMO, but I can seek what information I can. I think, do we want to go somewhere else? Because I, I just think we're going to have to, I mean. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask? <coughs> uh, Minister Birmingham, <coughs> just in relation to the, uh, notion that there is uh, public expenditure and, uh, related to legal costs for either members of the public service or staff. You mentioned a convention, <clears throat> a long-standing convention, uh, which seems at odds. Just recently, the, uh, the attorney made it very clear he wasn't, his um, <clears throat> action against the ABC was not funded by the public. Uh, in answers to questions on notice in the Senate, just recently you and I had an exchange about the Commonwealth paying Naval Group's legal costs. Um, uh, um, uh, you would be well aware of the Corman, <coughs> Corman motion in relation to public interest immunity. I've just gone looking through it. There is no convention as a, as a, refu as a proper refusal to answer a question. It's a simple question. Uh, it doesn't go to anything that prejudices any any particular um, uh, investigation that might be going on, simply a matter of is, yeah, has, has there been an approval in respect of public funding for public servants in relation to the investigation? I don't understand how that prejudices, it prejudices anything and long-standing convention is not an accepted PII. Senator, Senator Patrick, um, uh, and matters in relation to the administration of the Legal Services <coughs> Directive that, uh, that applies to staff employed under the Members of Parliament mm. Staff Act um, are administered by the Department of Finance. So it's, uh, it's a matter that, uh, that um, in terms of the detailed administration and, uh, and approaches to that uh, can be um, uh, best be further explored when finance is at the table. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the long-standing approach uh, to not uh, detail the uh, individuals uh, or I'm not the matters after, after individuals, uh, minister. Uh, uh, individuals or the matters uh, that uh, that, um, that that access um, assistance uh, consistent with that legal services directive. Um, uh, that uh, that convention exists in relation okay. to to matters of privacy. Um, I'm uh, not after any, I'm not after any names. Senator Wong is not after any names. I refer I, you to the Corman motion. I appreciate Mr. that, Senator. Although Senator. the 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 issue is that um, the mere fact of going to what the issues are that those it's not going to any issues, not asking for any advice. Well, you, well, you are you are asking in relation to a specific issue, question. Senator Patrick. No, not no, not, well, not sorry, to a personal. Well, sorry, issue. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Is your question has anybody accessed? Uh, find, have any staff under the Members of Parliament Staff Act accessed support or, uh, consistent with the legal or services? Or has there been direction? an approval for, for support, legal support, where the costs are funded by the Parliament? That's the extent of the question. No, if that, I'm, not if, after, I'm not after any individual, um, ju just it's a matter relating to public expenditure. That's the extent of the question. I'm sure even if I asked you the costs, yeah. there would be no invoices at this point in time. Um, so, I mean, in in taking that question as a any access to that program, um, regardless of the issue that it applies to, sure. the answer to that is is yes, Senator. Okay, now, details you. of that, that's as I, I say, in the process around that are matters for finance. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Patrick. Uh, Labor senators. Okay, um, <coughs> Senator Birmingham. When do you think you can get briefed on the Kunkel inquiry? Like, how long will that take? Would you be able to come back after um, the morning tea break to provide an update on that inquiry? Yeah, well, the morning tea break is pretty short, Senator Gallagher, so um, I, uh, I don't imagine uh, much opportunity for briefing in that time. So what... I'll, I'll seek what information I can during the course of the day for you. Okay. Perhaps if I just continue with the questions and then 
um, we can come back to it. But I'd like to know how many people work in Mr Morrison's media office. I'd like to know whether Mr Kunkel's interviewed them. Um, I'd like to know why it's taking so long to have this um, inquiry um, concluded. I'd like to know when it's concluded. Um, it's been put to me that Mr Kunkel is seeking the names of uh, journalists uh, as part of his inquiry, that he has asked Ms Higgins to provide the names of journalists so that he can conduct his investigation and that uh, it seems to me that the responsibility has been put on Ms Higgins uh, to come up and basically demonstrate that this did happen. Um, so I'd like to know whether that's the case, that she's been asked to out journalists, otherwise the investigation will be compromised. It seems to me to be a pretty rough position to put Ms Higgins in, considering she complained about the backgrounding that was happening. She's now being asked to that. justify the backgrounding actually occurred or demonstrate that the backgrounding occurred, and I'd like to know uh, whether that's the case. It's been put to her and she has provided to Mr Kunkel the names of three staff that she believes were responsible for the backgrounding that was occurring. I'd like to know if those three staff have been spoken to and I am prepared to name those staff if need be after careful consideration. So I'd like to know whether that's the case, whether those three senior press secretaries in the Prime Minister's office have been spoken to and what Mr Kunkel has found from there. Senator, as I said, I'll get what information I can for you during the course of the day. And we will come back to it. Because again, from where I sit, this looks like an attempt again to, to push back on Ms Higgins very strongly and it seems extremely unfair to me to be polite about it. That you would ask someone who's a, the victim of an alleged rape in this building to then demonstrate that the backgrounding that occurred or was, met, was said to have occurred by the Prime Minister's office that she has to now demonstrate that it did happen for the investigation to reach a conclusion. Oh, Senator, you're, you're making an assertion or uh, drawing a conclusion. Well, that's why I'd there. like you to come back with some answers on that because it's pretty serious, in my view, that that's what's been asked of Ms Higgins by and, Mr Kunkel. And, uh, and Senator, as I said, I will come back with what information I can, including, uh, including uh, if I can, the nature of what information Ms Higgins has been offered the opportunity to provide? Offered the opportunity. It's been requested. My understanding is she has been asked that without her naming journalists herself, because a journalist that did come forward is no longer prepared to see the investigation through for whatever reason, the one that, the one that came forward independently and actually tipped or forced the hand of the Prime Minister to commission this inquiry has withdrawn, that it's now up to Miss Higgins, <laughs> the victim of the backgrounding, to actually out the journalists that have told her who was backgrounding so that she so that Mr Kunkel can complete a thorough investigation. Which seems absolutely ludicrous to me and again is a pushback on Miss Higgins by this government. You know, that's what it looks like to me. I said, Senator, I'll get what information I can for you to provide back and, to you. And again, 62 days later, we still, we've got the Chief of Staff in the Prime Minister's office interviewing presumably people he works with every day. Like, it seems to me that it would have been a simple question I mean, I want to know, was Mr Kunkel, did Mr Kunkel tell them to go and background? 
and now he's head of the investigation into looking into whether they did background. Like, I mean, it seems a, a, a very inadequate process that's now taken so long and now it's all on Ms Higgins to actually demonstrate that it happened. Can I ask a question which Senator Gallagher may have gone to? If we accept Ms Higgins' advice to Senator Gallagher that she's been asked by Mr Kunkel to name journalists, which you'll get advice on at some point today, can you tell us why? Tell us why she's been asked to do that. Well, Senator Wong, again, I'll get what information sure. I can. Uh, that may include information in relation to what opportunities Ms Higgins has been provided to uh, to provide information to insist with the uh, with the inquiries? Four minutes. Can I just go back while Senator Gallagher is just checking where we're up to? And I might have missed some very useful questions from Senator Patrick. But do do I understand that you did indicate that there has been an approval for funding under the Legal Services Direction? In, uh, in the generic Senator Wong, uh, a question about that. Yes, I did indicate that, uh, that the um, legal services direction has been accessed without, uh, without going to matters uh, for which it has been accessed or individuals uh, to right. whom I it has been accessed I haven't asked the individuals, by. but uh, no. did, you, did you indicate that, that it has been, uh, you know, the process set out in the direction, including approval, has been undertaken in the context of the Gaitons inquiry? No, I did not indicate that, Senator. So what is the date of the most recent approvals under the relevant legal services direction? No, well, as I said to Senator Patrick, to go through processes around the administration uh, yep. of, uh, of that direction uh, are really matters for us to, uh, to work through with finance. Yes. See, you just keep deferring. You just keep kicking oh, it off. Well, it's certain, certain, I mean, I mean certain, yeah, look, fair certain, enough. Certain, yeah, no, it not. is, it is, it is. You're right, but you are the finance minister. You're sitting here sure. as the member, as representing the prime minister. Uh, you're being asked whether or not what uh, around when the approval under the legal services direction for legal costs associated with this matter occurred. And you don't want to answer it. You want to kick it off till next week. It's just that it is that it is the default in every way in everything you're doing dealing with this matter. It is the default. Not to be upfront, but to defer, to obfuscate, to make it hard. Well, Senator, Senator Why? I, don't, I don't accept that, but uh, the Department of Finance are appearing tomorrow. Um, got one more question. They, uh, okay. they are the agency that administer the legal services direction. I've been clear in relation to the privacy limitations and conventions uh, that apply. Senator Patrick asked a generic question about approvals under that direction overall. Uh, without reference to particular cases or matters, uh, and I indicated to him that yes, there have been approvals overall, um, without uh, without crossing the line in uh, in relation to uh, compromising uh, privacy or other considerations under that legal services direction. Ms. Uh, Senator Birmingham, just uh, in terms of prep preparing for co the comeback and for us to ask more questions, I would ask that you provide an answer as to whether uh, Mr Carswell, Mr Leambrugan and Mr Creevey have been interviewed by Mr Kunkel. Um, we would like an answer on that uh, because Ms Higgins' understanding is they are the staff that were um, backgrounding against her loved ones during that week, um, that it was those three staff. I'd like to know if they've been interviewed by Mr Kunkel as part of his investigation. Well, Senator, uh, as I've already said a few times, I'll seek what information but specifically, I can. Specifically, I would like to, uh, well, I, to know I, that. I, I, I note you've, uh, you've named those staff. I'll seek what information I can. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, it being 10.30, the committee will now suspend for morning tea. Thank you. The committee will resume its questioning of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I will give the call to Senator Waters.
Uh, hi, Ms Foster, thanks for joining us at the table. Uh, just some questions firstly about the Prime Minister's meeting with Brittany Higgins on the 30th of April. Uh, Mr Gaitchen said that you were at that meeting as well, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Okay. And following that meeting, did the Prime Minister give any directions to you or anyone else in the department regarding workplace reviews or reforms? So, Senator, um, I should say at the outset that I um, had an exchange with Ms Higgins yesterday um, to see whether she was comfortable with me talking about our interactions mm -hmm. um, over the past few weeks, and she indicated that she was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the focus of both our interactions and, in fact, the meeting with the Prime Minister was around the, the reforms mm -hmm. um, that Ms Higgins has been talking about, and she actually articulated them quite clearly in some of the press that she put out after the meeting. Um, because the issues that she raised um, were already being covered, um, either in, in the report that I've been doing, in the review that I've been doing, or in the Jenkins review, um, there wasn't a need to say, go and do this, because the work is already underway. Um, and so I've, I think, Subsequent to the meeting with the Prime Minister, I had a, a quite detailed teleconference with Ms Higgins about the nature of the, the reforms that I was proposing mm. and um, uh, to ensure that uh, they, were, they were consistent with the kinds of things that she was seeking. There are some longer term things which will be more appropriately considered in the Jenkins review, mm. um, but there was a kind of alignment, Senator, between the, the reforms that Ms Higgins was looking at and the work that's already tasked. Did the Prime Minister say sorry to Brittany Higgins? Senator, I don't recall that being raised in the context of the meeting. The Prime Minister needs someone to tell him when he needs to apologise? No, he wasn't I'm able just to just apologise because it was the right thing to do? I don't remember a discussion in the meeting that went specifically to that. Okay, so <clears throat> the Prime Minister finally met with Ms Higgins after um, years after her alleged rape uh, in this building and he didn't take that opportunity to apologise either for the incident or for the bungled response to it. I'm not surprised, but I'm, I'm, I'm still disappointed. So, Senator, my... Did you advise him that he should apologise to Ms Higgins or perhaps did, did his wife suggest that he do so? So, Senator, um, my memory is, and I'll just ask someone to quickly look at the material for me, is that Ms Higgins said after the meeting that she believed that he had um, understood um, the uh, experience that she had been through. All the more reason to apologise for, for his role in creating the circumstances that led to it. But okay, well, thank you for, um, for confirming, the, uh, sadly, the, the lack of human decency uh, in the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned that uh, no commitments were made because, in your words, the work is already underway. Um, can I take you to that? And I want to ask you some questions about your review, which I understand is now in the public domain. Um, but in fact, only reviews are underway. The actual work hasn't yet been begun. So did the Prime Minister make any commitments that he would implement the results of either your review or the Jenkins report? Was there any actual commitment made by the Prime Minister to Ms Higgins to do anything other than the reviews that were already on foot? So um, after the, the meeting, the Prime Minister um, put out a statement saying, I'm committed to achieving an independent process to deal with these issues. That was, as you know, has been one of Ms Higgins' um, mm. uh, primary um, requests, focuses, that there be a process independent of the employer mm. to both support and, um, and deal with serious incidents in the parliamentary workplace. Mm. Um, and well, did so, the prime, sorry, you finish? <clears throat> um, you, you know, I think that's a, a specific um, uh, commitment 
to implementing that. And what time frames were given for that commitment for an independent complaints body um, by the Prime Minister? Senator, the Prime Minister was um, at that stage had received neither my report nor obviously the Jenkins report, which won't which won't um, come out until later this year, and so uh, was not in a position to say. I will do something by a particular date because he didn't have a, a concrete proposal in front of him. So he's made a commitment to do something in future when someone else tells him what that should be? Well, Senator, the Prime Minister has asked for advice on how to improve the processes. That was the focus of what I was trying mm. to do. Well, let's, let's come to that. Um, and I haven't had the benefit of reading your entire um, review. Are you able to, to table that for this committee? Is that in the public domain? So, Senator, it's been provided to the Prime Minister. He has um, issued a media statement. Yes, I've seen his statement, but I'm interested in whether your review is, is in the public domain. So, um, not at this stage, Senator. What the Prime Minister has said, I believe... He'll take it to Cabinet is that he will and, take then act, it to and then cabinet, decide what to do. And then he will engage with all parties and parliamentarians yes. on implementation. OK, so will your report be made public? Well, Senator, that will be a matter for the Prime Minister. Has he given any indication as to whether he will make your report public? Uh, Senator, at this stage, we've simply talked about the next steps, which is, which is cabinet and then consultation. Okay, now, the, one of the recommendations, as I understand it, from the Prime Minister's press release um, about your, your report's recommendations is for an independent confidential complaints mechanism for serious incidents, quote, unquote. Um, Brittany Higgins has called for this. Many others have called for this. This has been a long-standing desire for many, many years. So I'm pleased to see that it's a recommendation of your report. I think it's long overdue. Um, the Prime Minister has said he will take your report to Cabinet. The Prime Minister seems incapable of setting timeframes on actually taking action to address these issues. When will we see an independent complaints body for sexual assault and other serious workplace incidents? in Parliament House? Senator, it would be my expectation that we're in a position to have discussions with other parties um, and other parliamentarians during the course of this parliamentary session, uh, and obviously dependent upon um, all of those discussions that will take place, um, both across parties and within parties, um, we hope to be able to, uh, to achieve um, agreement around the type of model that can be put in place. Assuming that agreement is able to be reached, because I understand everyone can see the clear need for an independent body, um, how soon could it be up and running if there was any level of commitment by the Prime Minister to actually deliver better workplaces for women? Yeah, I, I think, as, as Ms Foster just indicated to me, uh, uh, once, um, uh, and assuming agreement um, across Parliament, um, then it, you know, it is something that should be able to be established uh, you know, within you know, or within weeks. Um, yeah, parts of it may take uh, longer in terms of the uh, you know, full recruitment of individuals or otherwise who might be necessary for uh, um, you know, to fill roles that may uh, may exist under such a process. Um, but uh, but in terms of the processes, uh, you know, we have undertaken this work with Ms Foster um, and with Ms Foster engaging with the Commissioner Jenkins in a desire to be able to put in place no regrets reforms now that, um, that um, exist before Commissioner Jenkins' report uh, and upon which Commissioner Jenkins' report no doubt uh, may suggest enhancements or improvements, but, uh, but which, thanks to the work that, uh, that Ms Foster has been doing in engagement with Ms Jenkins, should be consistent, at least, with the direction of, um, uh, that we would expect in that report. Um, and so clearly the intent is to have it operational, um, certainly before Commissioner Jenkins reports. OK, so you won't wait for the Jenkins review uh, to operationalise the independent confidential complaints mechanism? That's correct, Senator. Okay. Are there any other um, reforms that will be delivered prior to the receipt of the Jenkins uh, review recommendations? So I think um, I think as Ms. Foster's outlined, there's there's the 
support services for uh, staff, uh, which have already been stood up um, yes. in an enhanced format. Um, there's an education and training piece of work um, that, uh, uh, for which um, Ms Foster has um, been working and looking at implementation arrangements for that. And then there's the complaints and independent mm. assessment process. So mm. the intention is to have all of those um, at a level of operation in advance of, uh, of Commissioner Jenkins completing her work. Okay. Um, just to the, back to the complaints body itself, will it be retrospective? So, Senator, um, the, um, the details of the implementation and exactly what the scope will be is something that I hope we will work through. Um, obviously, first of all, it needs to go to Cabinet, but I, that's something I hope we will work through through the consultation process. Mm. Um, there are... What I've sought to do in my review is focus on things that can be done immediately and or, or you know in the very short term um, and uh, in the context of your particular question around its its scope like what it would apply to um, there are some complexities around the nature of this workplace where there are significant changes for example at with at election periods and it's particularly difficult to um, manage complaints where, for example, an office no longer exists, the parliamentarian is no longer in parliament or whatever. And so what I'm seeking to do is say, how can we get this up and running um, and operating on um, a basis that um, uh, is, is implementable in the short term while Jenkins looks at the longer term issues. And so that might mean that we, we look to limit how far back such a, such a system could go. Okay, so that discussion about retrospectivity is yet to be had, but you're implying that from a sort of practical perspective, you expect it would be fairly limited in its retrospectivity given some MPs might not be MPs anymore. Um, Senator, it, I guess what I'm thinking is if we have an initial phase of operation mm. where we're focused on, for example, offices that still exist, that would be the most sensible mm. first step, I think. Mm. Okay, is there anything in the budget for um, the establishment of this independent uh, confidential complaints mechanism and body? There are some budget items that relate to um, our response uh, to, uh, to Ms Foster's work, mm -hmm. um, which I think include um, provisions for, uh, uh, for this element of it as well. How much was allocated for this element? Uh, I'd have to just check there, Senator. I don't know how much it's disaggregated across the different components. Um, it's been announced because the recommendations haven't been put forward at the mm. time that we were doing it. Mm. I, just have, I'll, I have to take that on notice, uh, Senator Waters. Mm. Um, I think there's, because Ms Foster hadn't reported, mm. I think there was some provisioning undertaken, mm. um, uh, some of which would, uh, would sit in the contingency, um, mm. but, uh, but other parts uh, of which uh, I think were announced in, uh, in the budget. So I just need to, uh, to disaggregate that uh, essentially for your question. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to there being able to be consequences for members of parliament that are engaged in sexual harassment or assault or other serious workplace um, incidents. How will this independent complaints body apply to MPs and senators? I'm sorry, Senator, could you do, do the first part of the question again? How will the complaints body have any ability for there to be consequences for MPs where they are the abuser rapist, harasser, bully, the full gamut of workplace behaviours that are unlawful? Um, so, Senator, um, the, the um, model envisages uh, a process whereby Parliament itself would make decisions around um, uh, parliamentarians in respect of the sovereignty of 
parliamentarians, but those are all details which we will, the government will want to consult on with parliamentarians and with um, other parties. So presumably when a government, which by definition has the numbers in a parliament, they won't wish to sanction one of their own. So, so there are no so, parallels at all to so, the current so. composition of the ministry and the allegations that surround certain sitting ministers who have retained ministries, albeit different ones. Okay. How can the public have confidence that where the MP is the abuser, that well, anything will be done to sanction well, that person? Well, Why is it always the victim that has to suffer the consequences? Well, 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 Senator, Sen Sen Senator Waters, um, uh, a, a few things there. Um, in terms of, and particularly just in terms of the, the language you used at the end in relation to the abuser, it is important to be mindful that in relation to criminal matters, clearly those are not matters for a parliamentary process or, uh, or otherwise. They remain matters always for the police in terms of their handling. But in relation to allegations of bullying, harassment and, mm. uh, and the types of things that, uh, uh, that rightly we should have clear standards and, uh, and protocols on. Uh, as I've indicated, it would be my expectation that, uh, that we'll shortly be in a position to consult with other parties about how the parliament is able to handle this. Uh, and I do distinguish the parliament from the government in that regard. And I would anticipate uh, that, uh, that we may, as a result of Ms Foster's work and then those consultations, wish potentially to have conversations through privileges committees or otherwise about the types of processes that can be put in place by the parliament as distinct from the government. Mm. So ultimately it might come down to the votes of Pauline Hanson's One Nation, who if she votes with your government, no, um, no. Could, you could pass that through the well, Senate. No, well, so no, do Senate. we really want to put Pauline Hanson in charge of uh, whether or not well, sexual harassers should be well, uh, disciplined well, or well, not? Senator, well, Senator, Senator Waters, I, I'm not sure what alternative you're proposing. I'm suggesting that, it, uh, that you know, we have been trying to look at the fact that Members of Parliament enjoy a constitutional position. Mm. They are elected by the people mm. and they serve their turn. Now, they are subject to certain uh, expectations of this Parliament. For example, expectations in relation to providing your financial disclosures, expectations in relation to making citizenship declarations. Uh, there are expectations that the Parliament, rather than the government, places upon members and senators and for which then there are processes such as those of privileges committees uh, to be able to seek to enforce those. Uh, now, there are discussions that, just as we had good faith um, discussions in establishing Commissioner Jenkins' report, it is my hope that with you and the Greens, uh, with Senator Gallagher and others in the Labor Party uh, and with other representatives across the parliament, we will be able to take Ms Foster's recommendations and have similar good faith discussions about how we may best be able to implement those in a way that do try to try to address the issue that you're raising. Will there be a code of conduct in scope for consideration that applies to all MPs, not just a ministerial code of conduct, which frankly is frequently ignored anyway? It, will that be part of the toolkit considered for ensuring there are consequences for abusing MPs, or rather MPs who are themselves abusers? Well, Senator, we've just got, uh, we've just received uh, Ms Foster's report. Um, as uh, the Prime Minister's indicated, we'll go to Cabinet, we'll have the consultations with other parties, um, and, uh, and through that process, clearly we will share what, uh, what Ms Foster has recommended. Uh, but what we've particularly been talking about is, um, is a uh, independent complaints process. Uh, now, an independent complaints process uh, is, uh, is one that will look at such issues of allegations of uh, bullying, harassment or, or serious you know, workplace misconduct. Um, there are standards in place already in relation to, uh, to, um, to those sorts of practices that should not occur in offices. Mm. Yes, except unfortunately they do. Um, you mentioned, can I go now to the preventative aspect of your um, reviews uh, recommendations, Ms Foster, you mentioned um, that there'd be uh, an education and training piece of work, or rather that you had suggested that there be such. Um, is that being progressed and will that be compulsory and will it apply to MPs? Uh, so, Senator, um, we have made um, 
significant progress in um, developing what an appropriate training um, package, which really covers three primary elements. Um, one is around um, bringing up the level of, of understanding and awareness, knowledge about workplace health and safety um, obligations and rights. Could you speak a little louder? Please? I will, sorry. Thank you. Um, also to um, being able to appropriately respond, well, first of all, identify and appropriately respond to serious misconduct, to, to sexual harassment, um, to serious and systemic bullying and harassment, um, and also uh, a sort of element which uh, will go to uh, how to actively create healthy, safe, respectful workplaces. Um, the Prime Minister has indicated um, previously that he would expect that to be compulsory for coalition um, staff, and I, I think that the uh, where that goes to from here will also be subject to the consultations that take place once the PM's taken the report through Cabinet. Um, but he certainly indicated that where, where he has that control, he intends to make it mandatory. Okay. Was the Prime Minister saying it was only for staff? Has the Prime Minister not said that his own MPs should receive this training? Uh, Senator, it's my understanding that um, the, there will be an expectation that MPs will undertake it. Will it be um, a mandatory requirement for MPs to undertake this training for, to keep their workplaces safe? Senator, I think that's one of the issues that we'll work through in the consultation process and, and as, we, as we work out the details of the implementation. Okay, so the Prime Minister thinks that this is only a mandatory problem uh, for staff and hasn't yet decided whether MPs will also be obligated to receive training. I, I'm, no, I'm no, flabbergasted. No, 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 no. Please Senator, correct. I'd like to be wrong. Please correct well, me if that's not the S case. Senator Waters, I think the Prime Minister's expectations in relation to um, his own party uh, are clear. Now, he is not, without consultation, uh, going to set expectations in relation to yours or other parties. The distinction is not between parties, and I would hope all parties um, agree it should be mandatory. The question I was raising is whether or not it's a distinction is being drawn by the Prime Minister as to who should receive this training. And Ms Foster, you said he had so far indicated it would definitely uh, need to be undertaken by staff. Has the Prime Minister said anything about whether members of parliament should receive this training? Senator, I can say that, uh, that the Prime Minister's expectation is that, uh, that members of parliament should, um, and, uh, and I'm sure that that is what he will be discussing um, with members of parliament as he takes Ms Foster's report that, uh, that he has just received through the consultation process. Well, if he's going to ask them nicely to do it, uh, that's not enough. Um, I would hope that the Prime Minister makes this training mandatory. And can I just ask the nature of the training? There's been various um, attempts at primary prevention, which in my view are utterly inadequate, and they amount to a, a one-hour online tutorial effectively. Is this the nature of the training that's being under discussion, or is it actually going to be substantial expert-drafted, expert-delivered training that's not just a one-hour online portal where your portal crushes half the time anyway? Um, so, Senator, again, it, it will be up to the Prime Minister in the consultation process to agree, but certainly the um, advice I've received and the advice I've provided um, uh, is very strongly that the training needs to be face-to-face -face and personalised um, and engaging. And did the Prime Minister give any sense of agreement to that suggestion? Yes, Senator. In fact, I think he's already said publicly some months ago that um, he's expecting that's what I'll recommend and that, and that that's what I think he said publicly that he's committing to face-to-face -face training. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one, can I just segue back briefly and then, Chair, I think I'm finished. Uh, and I just have one clarification oh, to sure. um, Senator Waters. Um, someone's just checked the notes for me and reminded me that um, in the meeting with the Prime Minister, 
he indicated to Miss Higgins that he was terribly sorry about the experience that she had had. So he did indeed okay. apologise. Um, My apologies But you were in the meeting and you wrong. didn't recall it. What, are, the, are the notes an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yes, they are, Senator. Who took the notes? Um, we had an um, officer um, with us, Senator, who oh, was Oh, right. I asked notes. you before who was at that meeting. Um, so it was the Prime Minister, yourself, Ms Higgins. She had an accompanying support person. And who were the other people at that meeting? Um, the Prime Minister's Senior Advisor for Women was there. Is that person from the Office for Women or not? No, the, the Prime Minister's advi senior advisor, so someone from his office. OK. Is that person actually a woman? She is. OK. Well, that's a relief. Um, and, and so that person took the notes of and the meeting? No, and we also had um, a, a lawyer from Australian Government solicitor um, who was also a woman, and she took the notes. OK. So the Prime Minister asked for a lawyer to be present at his meeting with Ms Higgins? Uh, no, Senator. Um, that was, in fact, I think, my suggestion um, on the morning of the meeting. Ms Higgins had indicated that she was being accompanied by two lawyers, and I thought it might be useful if there needed to be any Okay, so she didn't have one legal. support person, she had two support people and they were lawyers? Uh, Senator, I hadn't said that she had one support person. Sorry, Mr Gaitchen said that, um, but I'm happy to be corrected, or um, for him to be corrected. So. Um, Ms Higgins was accompanied by four people, Senator. Okay. Um, and can you tell me, uh, you said the words were terribly sorry? Is that correct? That he was terribly sorry about the experience that she had had. Or, I'm terribly sorry about the experience you have had. Sorry, could you speak a little louder? <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry about the experience you have had. Okay. Did he apologise for the uh, very poor uh, response? to the incident? Senator, Did he apologise what, for what he was actually responsible for or was he just sorry that she had a bad experience, as in was raped in this building? Um, Senator, I'm trying to remember what was said in the meeting and what the Prime Minister has said elsewhere, mm. but certainly he has been very clear um, that the system let Ms Higgins down and his regret about that. And his focus, of course, with both my review and Ms Jenkins, Commissioner Jenkins' review on addressing those issues in the system which were not um, appropriate to respond to a serious incident of the nature of Ms Higgins. Mm. Did he give any explanation to Ms Higgins on why um, sitting ministers, uh, albeit with different portfolios, <coughs> remain sitting ministers who have been involved in the bungling of the response to Ms Higgins' rape? I don't recall that issue being raised, Senator. And the Prime Minister didn't raise it of his own volition? Not to my recollection, Senator, mm. but... Um, but we're meant to accept that he really wants to do something about this now, except he's not going to do anything for um, several weeks and um, you're not able to tell me how much money has been allocated. Um, and we don't know yet the scope of the training um, or whether or not it will be mandatory for MPs. So, Senator... Um, I think the recommendations to respond to processes and procedures, which is what I was tasked for, um, have been delivered in a timely way. Um, and as, the, as Senator Birmingham indicated, once, the, once we have agreement to move forward, I believe we can implement that very quickly. Um, so I don't think that is a a lengthy um, uh, or a delayed response in terms of how we can how we can fix processes and procedures. And as you know, um, where I could do things immediately um, or recommend things immediately, they were done. Um, and I understand that again, as soon as we can, um, the prime minister can take the review through the. Cabinet and consultation process will be in a position to uh, roll out with the education program. And I think I gave quite a detailed scope of what that would cover. 
Mm. Okay, this is, I've got this one yeah, last one question. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Uh, just segueing back to the Gaetjens uh, inquiry, um, there's been some discussion about whether uh, folk interviewed by Mr Gaetjens have had lawyers um, or you know been, been availing themselves of legal advice. My question is whether or not um, PMO staff have been able to have a union rep in those discussions. Senator, I'm not conscious of, of that issue being raised. Uh, does that mean yes or no? Sorry, I don't understand. Well, you asked, were they able to have access to a union rep? Yes. I'm not conscious that anyone has requested No such. one's asked for that. And was that would, that would that have been permitted or not permitted? S Senator, that's a hypoth... It's, it's not a question that we... Um, addressed, so not a question that Mr. Gaitchen's addressed, so I don't know how he would have responded. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you very Chair. Much. Senator Waters, I'm looking for Senator Gallagher taking the call. To Senator Wong. Um, Senator Birmingham, I'm just wondering whether there, you're in a position to answer any of the questions I asked about the Kunkel inquiry. Uh, no, Senator Gallagher. I, uh, I did indicate during the break that uh, uh, that I wanted to try to receive some further information during the course of the day, as I committed to you earlier, and uh, and I passed that message on during the short break. And I will return to uh, to see what uh, further information I can provide the committee okay. uh, um, uh, during the lunch break. Okay. So we could perhaps revisit that at, after the lunch break. Um, I'll, I'll that... do my best, Senator. Okay. So, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> can I just go back to um, the evidence Mr. Gaitens gave about your engagement with the AFP, Ms. Foster? So, as I understand it, we've had a number of corrections. The one I am referencing is the correction which was um, uh, provided by Commissioner Kershaw by way of letter to Ms. Senator Henderson on the 6th of May, uh, where he corrected evidence given to Senator Keneally in April in the same committee, in which he said Mr. G he, that he, the commissioner, had made contact with Mr. Gaitchens to discuss his testimony between the time, so this is where they had inconsistent evidence, and then a, a media statement was put out just at the commencement of question time that day. We asked some questions of Mr. Gaitchens about that. Um, the Commissioner has now said, actually, contrary to what he said in April, it appears that Mr Gaitchens um, spoke to him, so he initiated the call. And I think the evidence earlier today was a little confusing because there were two corrections, was that you had had, you or a member of your staff had had some contact with the Commissioner prior to that interaction. So can you just tell us what happened? That's correct, Senator. Okay. So that was the correction that I was advising Mr Gaitchens right. about. Um, and um, I made contact with, I called the Chief Operating Officer at the AFP um, on the 20th of April um, to ask um, whether or not well, to, to verify that the AFP had in hand the issue of um, correcting the record in relation to that matter, because Mr Gaitchens had indicated to me that he had made the phone call, and right. they assured me that, yes, they did have the matter in hand, and that was the extent of the phone call. OK. So, uh, at any point... Are you aware of, well, so you called, let's start from the beginning. You called the Chief Operating Officer of the AFP on the 20th of April, uh, essentially to say, what do you, who, who is that person? It's a, a person called Charlotte Tressler. Okay, and it, it, her rank? Um, so it's a Deputy Secretary equivalent, you know, the AFP. Yeah, I just wanted what I call her, that's all. I just wanted uh, what I had it. Ms. Ms. Tressler. Tressler. Okay, Tressler. T R E W -S, S L E R. Okay, so you spoke to Ms. Tressler, who's the Chief Operating Officer. That's correct. At that stage, you had already become aware there was um, the evidence that Commissioner Kershaw had given in April was not correct? That's right, Senator. Right. How did you become aware of that and when? So, um, after you asked me to be 
prepared for these questions, Senator, I went back um, to see if I could recall exactly who brought it to my attention, and I'm afraid I can't. Um, but certainly both Mr Gaitchens and I were aware, and we had had a discussion where he said, have you spoken to the AFP? And I said, not yet, I'll call them. Right. So at some point prior to that, though, you and Mr Gaitchens both either separately or, you know, individually or together are advised that or become aware that the evidence was incorrect? Someone must have brought the evidence to our attention, Senator, because neither of us was watching right. the spillover no, estimates. No, because the evidence given here was different. Um, now, did Mr Gaitens tell you that the evidence was incorrect? That's, that's what I was trying to recall, Senator. Right. I know that we discussed the fact that it was incorrect, but I don't know whether... What was your state of knowledge? I mean, did you know before all of this was given evidence about, did you know Mr Gaitens had called the AFP Commissioner on the day in question when a, a statement clarifying was put out before question time or at question time? Yes, I did, Senator. How did you know that? Um, I'm just trying to recall, Senator. Um, I believe we discussed it at lunchtime. So, you know, I was still at Senate Estimates that day. Um, and I think there was a phone call between me and Mr Gaitchens um, about the fact that the evidence had been confusing. Inconsistent. I mean, it's not just confusing. Sing. Something was said in one committee which was contradicted in another committee. They were actually different answers. So, Senator, my understanding is that the, the, the apparent conflict arose from the fact that um, Commissioner Kershaw was indicating that he hadn't directed Mr Gaitchens to cease because he has no, 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 no power no, no. to do that. The question is, um, did, were you contacted by an interview from the PMO or PM, from PMNC, from Mr Gaitchens, to discuss your testimony between the time you finished giving it and when you put out the statement? Oh. Commissioner Kershaw, no, I made that contact. Senator Keneally, you made that contact. Who did you contact? And he goes on, yes, I advised the Secretary I was putting out a media statement. So it's not... Sorry, Senator, I thought you were referring back to the original estimates testimony. All right, conflict. so the other, the other conflict in yeah. the evidence. Okay. This, on this one, sure. I agree it's, it's clear. Clear. Okay. Mr Gaitchens made the call. Mr Kershaw mistakenly sure. recalled okay. that he had made the call. Right. And then he corrected that evidence. At the time you made the call... Well... To Ms Tressler? No. I'm going back to the lunchtime call after the day on which the contradictory evidence was given in the two committees. Right, where you and Mr Gaitchens, you said you, you did have knowledge that a call had or was being made to the AFB Commissioner about that evidence, and yes, you said Senator. you had that knowledge around lunchtime on that day, Yes, correct? Senator. Um, at any point, uh, did you become aware of any contact from the Prime Minister's office in relation to that matter? So, Senator, the Prime Minister's office had also um, contacted me during the break to say, um, essentially what's happening, there appear to be two different stories, and I simply noted that I understood um, what Mr Gaitchens to have said to be correct. just want to find the statement that was actually issued. The statement that was issued by the... Yeah, the... <clears throat> so who contacted you from the Prime Minister's office? So, Senator, it... It was either the Chief of Staff or the Senior Advisor who deals with corporate and governance issues. I don't okay. recall which one. So the Prime Minister's office, either the most senior person in the office, uh, or one of the most senior people in the office, contact you directly to raise the question about the two different pieces of evidence. Is that 
your evidence? Well, well Senator, I, I said it was either the Chief of Staff or the Senior Advisor. Sure. I can't recall which. Sure, sure, either, yeah. Contacted you prior, at lunchtime, was it? Yes, Senator, that's happening. my recollection. Did they message you as well or did they just ring you? I think it was just a phone call, Senator. Right. And what did they say? Um, as I said, Senator, they said, we, you know, we've had different evidence um, in two different committees. What's the story? To which I responded, my understanding is that um, Mr Gaitchens is, is accurate in saying that the Commissioner had strongly advised him to pause the conclusion of his inquiry right. pending further advice. Did you discuss or w was there any discussion in that phone call that we, you, and you can't recall with whom that was? Sorry, rewind. You say it was either the Chief of Staff or... The Senior Advisor senior responsible advisor. for corporate and yeah, so or, a or the Senior Advisor. Uh, you can't now recall which. I can't, Senator, no. Can you, did you take a file note or have you checked with them? Uh, no, I didn't take an, a file note, Senator. Presumably there's a mobile record. Was it on your phone? It, We're pretty clear. We know the day, we know the time, don't we? Can you check? I can check, Senator. Yeah, OK. Did they, um, in that discussion or um, any related discussion, well, certainly in that discussion, did they indicate to you that, that the Commissioner would need to put a statement out before question time? No, Senator. Was there any discussion about this needing to be clarified before question time? Not to my recollection, Senator. When did you become aware the Commissioner would be putting a statement out? So it was all over the same period, Senator, because there was only a, you know, a, whatever it is, one hour break um, when I wasn't at the table. Um, and as I said, there was a, I also had a phone call with Mr Gaitchens in which he told me, I think, that he was talking to the Commissioner to, to clarify the evidence, to clarify the, the, the conflict. Sorry, I just got, can you repeat that answer? So Senator, as I said earlier, um, during the same lunch break, mm -hmm. I had a phone call with Mr Gaitchens in which um, he, must have indicated to me, because this could be the only way that I would have known, that he was speaking with the Commissioner um, about sorting out the, the confusion between the two committees that morning. When did you become aware? Well, let's put it this way. Were you aware that the Commissioner would make a public statement before question time? I don't believe so, Senator. Are you sure? Well, I, I'm trying to recall, Senator, um, they were conversations in the middle of an estimates day. Um, obviously, I knew after the fact that the Commissioner has issue, had issued a statement. I don't recall whether I knew that he was going to issue a statement. Did you know he was time. going to be asked to clarify it before question time? I, I don't believe, Senator, that I knew anything other than the Commissioner and the Secretary were going to speak to resolve the confusion. But and you told the PMO that? Uh, Senator, I'm just struggling to remember the sequence of phone calls. Um, uh, I want to know where the idea of the Commissioner getting a statement out before question time or at question time came from. I want to know, and I'm asking you as a senior public servant, to your knowledge, was that at the Prime Minister's office's suggestion? We know from your evidence today, and it's the first time this has been made clear, the PMO intervened on that day, called you, very senior person in the Prime Minister's department, to, and intervened in order to try and resolve this conflict of evidence. Right? We know that. I now want to know who, uh, at whose request or who was urging the Commissioner to get it out before QT that day. So, Senator, um, two points. My memory is that the Prime Minister's office was asking me for clarity, for information, um, because they had heard two different things over the course of that morning. Um, 
I don't know because I wasn't present during the conversation between the Commissioner and the Secretary um, who actually proposed that a statement be issued, right. whether that was the Commissioner's initiative or whether they discussed it. And I, my understanding from Mr Gaitchen's evidence earlier no, this he, morning... No, he, he said they did want to get the statement out, but I want to know where it came from. Because so what it looks like from the outside is that you've got two different bits of evidence which are problematic for the PM. Prime Minister's office ring, you intervene, and a statement's issued by the AFP before question time. Senator, it is the expectation of Senate estimates committees uh, that where evidence needs clarifying or correcting, it should be done so as quickly as possible. Now, I understand the Commissioner has made his own statement uh, to the other committee this morning, outlining uh, the sequence of events and the decision making uh, and the fact that he decided uh, to issue a statement uh, that he saw that as being the most sensible thing to do uh, to clarify the potential for any misunderstanding. Did um, the PMO, anyone from the PMO contact the Commissioner directly? Not to my knowledge, Senator. But the PMO or presumably did contact PMNC about it? PMO, as, uh, as Foster has indicated, had a conversation um, about the reported inconsistencies, uh, which, uh, which indeed were being highlighted by opposition senators uh, and, uh, and for which, uh, not unreasonably, uh, you would expect officials to deal with those inconsistencies and correct any misunderstanding uh, as quickly as possible. And that's what uh, the police commissioner did. And I'm wondering, was it only done through Mr Gaitchen's fire? Was it only done via PMNC, so PMO calling Ms Foster and then Mr Gaitchen speaking to the Commissioner, or was there any direct contact? Oh, as I said before, I'm, I'm not aware of there being any Senator, and, uh, and, okay. uh, and certainly the Commissioner's statement that he has made only references his conversation with Mr Gaitchens. I'm asking you if the Prime Minister or his office and, called him. And I have told you that I'm not aware that there yeah. was any contact. I'm, no, happy, you're to, not. I'm happy to confirm sure, that just, on notice if, as if, well, If the answer Senator. is something different, come back to me. Sure. OK, can we go back to your timeline, um, Ms Foster? So can you tell me why... I'll just open that, please. Um, you said that you contacted the COO at the AFP on the 20th of April. Um, how long before that were you aware that um, the evidence was incorrect? The evidence to Senator Keneally was incorrect? So, Senator, um, I can't recall, as I said before, I can't recall who brought it to my attention, nor can I recall when it was. I do know that it was probably, my memory is that it was probably at least a couple of days um, beforehand, like I, I don't recall there being a sequence where somebody said this has happened and I jumped on the phone. Um, yeah, so so you knew before the twentieth of April that's correct. That it was correct, but you can't tell me now how long before you knew. No, Senator, because I can't recall who drew it to my attention and when. Okay, you didn't keep any notes of this. No, Senator. Really. I mean, it is incorrect evidence. I mean, I appreciate the note taking takes a while, but this is like incorrect evidence to a Senate committee involving the federal police and the secretary of the department. Like, it's not a minor matter. I'm surprised that nobody appears to have taken any notes. No, no one took notes. Okay. All right, um, I, I'm assuming the answer is no, that you, you're not aware of any notes being taken. At any point through all of this, we've got Prime Minister's office, into, you've got two pieces of evidence from the most senior federal police officer in the country, the most senior public servants, servant in the country. Um, uh, we then have uh, Prime Minister's office, most senior staffer, or one of the most senior staffers contacting you to, to, to basically get it, get it fixed up. Uh, you then have a statement put out before question time so that the Prime Minister, you know, can make, can answer the question without the inconsistent evidence um, standing. And no one kept a note? 
Senator, it's like amazing. <laughs> Senator Wong, the matters you're talking about did all occur within a relatively short period of time of officials concurrently providing information to Senate committees. Yeah, yeah, OK. It was, not have a lot? It was then yeah. relatively widely commented on that there were um, uh, inconsistencies in relation to yeah. the way their language was being interpreted. And uh, as is commonplace after nearly every estimates at some stage or other, uh, officials correct a record yeah, no, no, or clarify no, a statement on. That's or not what we're talking about, and you know it. And can we just... Let, that's and not... We're, no, we're gonna, no, well, it's not. We're talking about something that happened pretty damn fast in order to make sure the evidence was fixed up or dealt with, the, the inconsistency was dealt with before question time. I'm just asking, what is the threshold for taking notes? Oh, but, uh, well, what do you take notes well, about? Senator, Senator, like, if it, you don't take... The, the, I'm asking Ms Foster. Mr Gachins doesn't take note of a call with a federal police commissioner. You don't take notes about a call with a PMO or a call with the federal police, correct? But what's the threshold these days? So, so Senator, if I'm actioning something immediately and that action is on the public record, I typically won't take a note of it as well. I'm sorry? So, Senator, if I'm actioning something immediately and that action is recorded elsewhere, um, Where was it recorded? I.e. by the fact of it happening, then um, there's there, from a practical perspective, um, there's no requirement for me to... Well, that's not correct, is it? Make that's your judgement. Of I mean, the requirement here is justice being seen to be done as well as being done. And it is unusual to have the Commissioner of Police, Federal Commissioner, being called after the PMO, Prime Minister's Office, has called you, and then a call is made by the Secretary of the Department to the Police Commissioner before question time. That is not a normal run-of-the-mill event. So it's, it is being sure and being clear about what the nature of those conversations were and the nature of what you were being asked to do. But you have no note. Senator, I've been very clear that the nature of the call from the PMO was to ask me um, what the... To fix it up. ..what the balance was between the two. OK. <clears throat> Can we go back? COO is called... You called COO AFP 20th of April to basically ask them where it's at. There's also no note of that, is there? I don't believe so, Senator. Yeah. And... Uh, but you know the date. How do you know the date? Um, Senator, I asked the Chief Operating Officer um, if she could recall the date. I knew right. roughly when it was. So she took a note? Um, she recalled what she was doing at the time I okay. rang her. Um, but that was only today you checked that? I think it was over the weekend, Senator. OK, and you, yeah, I think your evidence today is you followed up because as yet that evidence hadn't been... That's correct, clarified. Senator. So okay. it was obviously not our evidence to correct. And and. What prompted you to do that, you can't recall. So what I do recall, Senator, is Mr Gaitchens and I discussing the fact that the evidence was correct, him asking me if I had called the AFP and me saying, not yet, but I will do so. Did you and... Um Did you discuss with anyone, PMO, Mr Gaitchens, anyone at the AFP, the particular wording of Mr Commissioner Kershaw's statement? This correction to the record? The 22nd of March statement that was published at 201. No, I didn't, Senator. Was there any discussion when PMO called you about the importance of getting this done before, estimate, uh, before question time? Not that I recall, Senator. Not that you recall? That's correct, Senator. And that, my question hasn't jogged your memory. So, Senator, as I said before, um, it was lunchtime on an estimate. It, it was lunchtime on an estimate's day. Um, there are a lot of things that you yeah. try and do in a break. I'm Try not trying to prevaricate. I'm just just explaining the context. And you understand why I press this. It's about the perception of it, which is the government 
engaging with the independent police in order to resolve a political issue. Now, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into a political argument about it, but I'm saying that there is a perception here that needs to be dealt with. Um, did you have any text messages or email exchanges with anyone in relation to the issue, this, the issue of the statement on the 22nd of March? Uh, no, Senator. Um, the, the substance of that statement was dealt with between the Commissioner and the Secretary, and I didn't, I wasn't involved right, so in the, that. So the, the Secretary did see a draft or a version thereof? I don't know, Senator. Um, well, you just said the substance was dealt with between the Secretary and the Commissioner. So in terms of the um, interaction that led to the statement being issued, mm. I was not a party to that. Okay. Can I... Um, I want to make this very... I want to set this out very clearly. You called the um, COO at the AFP on the 20th of April, at which point you made it clear that the evidence that Commissioner Kershaw had given was incorrect. Is, is that correct? Senator, my recollection is that it was more along the lines of confirming that they were aware that the information was incorrect and that they were taking action to right. correct it. Okay, so let's talk about those two points. Did you confirm they were already aware? Yes. So as at the 20th of April, the Australian Federal Police are already aware that evidence given to the Senate Estimates Committee was not correct? That's my recollection, Senator. So are you able to cast any light on, as, on why it took until the 6th of May for that evidence to be corrected? Uh, no, I'm not, Senator. And as at the 20th of April, was it your impression that they had been aware the evidence was incorrect for some time? Or was it a recent knowledge? I don't believe we went to that, Senator. I was simply interested in ensuring that there was action underway. Sure, no, I just wondered. I, I don't recall, Senator. You don't, you, there was nothing said to you that, that made you know, that enabled you to become aware as to when they, whether they'd known for a while or, or not. That's correct, but, Senator. But and was that it, was sorry. my first contact with them in relation to right, this. Right, but it was not the case from that call that you were the first person advising them of that. Senator, my recollection is that I was not telling them something they didn't know. Thank you. Because, okay. because obviously, if they could reassure me that there was action in hand. Okay. So did you... Um, and then the second point, so the first point is to confirm that they knew about it, which they did, and they already did. That's your evidence. That's a reasonable summation of your evidence. And the, that's, that's my recollection, Yeah, yeah Senator. No, 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 I understand that. And the second thing is, what are you going to do about it? Confirming they're going to do something about it, correct? That's correct, and my memory is that Ms Tresler indicated that um, there would be a formal correction to the record. Did she give you a time frame around that? No, Senator, not to my memory. Okay. I had nothing... I might see if I need to come back to that, but I actually wanted to go to the Foster report, which the Prime Minister put a press release out as we were sitting here. Yes, Senator. Um, and I know Senator um, Waters asked a few questions about this, but I do have some myself. So, uh, my first question is, um, and I don't know, I, I, I was being, I had a few things on, so I, I listened to it, but I didn't catch every question. But I just wanted to confirm whether on what the date when you finished the report, the date you finished it and the date it was provided to the Prime Minister? It was yesterday, Senator. Only yesterday. <clears throat> and this was finished and provided on the same day? That's right. Okay. Uh, and late yesterday, early yesterday? It was actually quite late by the time I finished it, Senator. Sure. About? Uh, eight o'clock. Okay. So last night. Finished yes, last Senator. night. Okay. And was this the timeline you previously had agreed with the PMO, or had you not agreed a timeline? So initially, Senator, I had hoped to do it within um, quite a considerably shorter time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and I identified fairly early in the process that there were three issues that I wanted to tackle in this process. Firstly, um, provision of 24-7 trauma-informed support. Secondly, um, tailored 
education and support. And thirdly, um, an independent complaints mechanism process. Um, the first was relatively quick and easy. The education conceptually is relatively straightforward, though quite difficult to make sure that it's actually right and it hits the mark and it drives behavioural change. But the third, the complaints mechanism, is really complex. And yeah, so no, I, I, I asked for some additional time um, and the Prime Minister agreed to that. And he made that public um, oh, probably six, seven weeks ago that yeah. I had asked for more time and he had agreed. And I understand that. I, I actually just wanted to understand when you... So the original timeline was what date and then you, and then you extended it until when? Um, and so I think the original timeline was... Um, I think I was tasked in February and it was in late March. Right. And, and obviously I reported yesterday. Um, what I've tried to do in that process is rather than just say somebody should do something, I've tried to actually... Say what they should do. Exactly yeah, no, no, I accept that. I, I accept that. I'm actually just trying to get... Understand. So it was late March and then you sought additional time. Yes. Remind me when that was? Before the, before the end of March, wasn't it? Yeah, I'll get someone to check the date. That yeah. the and then did you agree? J just check. I just want to get... So late March, you then sought additional time. When you sought additional time, did you indicate a different time? What was the new date? Was that by end of May or...? He's... Mr um, Reid's jumping up and down. He's well, got to hide the date. Pause. We're not <laughs> jumping. It's all right. Moving um, in his chair. So, Senator, at the time... I actually wasn't sure um, how long it was going to take me. Um, and so what I committed to the Prime Minister was that I would do it as quickly as I could and that I would um, keep his office updated on my progress. Um, and so I didn't have a second deadline. Okay. It was actually... I was just driving to do it as fast okay. as I could. OK, OK, that's fine. Um, and did you discuss... Did, did you indicate to PMO that you would be providing it last night? And if so, when? Um, yes, so uh, I had actually um, last week, I had hoped to be able to complete it um, uh, last week, but as is often the case with these things, the sort of last minute editing and making sure that everything was perfect meant that it took me into um, Monday. Sure. I'm just asking, and, and were you aware uh, that it would be relieved, the Prime Minister would announce that he'd received it today? Was that expressed, communicated to you? Uh, last night, that last was communicated night. to me. Okay. Um, did you discuss, who did you deal with with the PMI? Um, mostly on this issue, Senator, I've dealt with the senior advisor responsible for, I'm not sure of the exact title, but corporate and governance. Okay. Uh, have you spoken to the Prime Minister about this issue? Uh, yes, I have, Senator. When did you do that? So, um, let me just see if I've made a note. Um, the first discussion I had was shortly before the 1800 APH support line was announced, um, which was... I'll have, to, I'll have to find yeah, that Yeah, that's fine. This, I, then, I actually just wondered, have you spoken to him since the report's been finalised? Or No, so I spoke with him um, prior to the first deadline yep. um, to tell him where I was at yep. and, and, and essentially since? why I would need more time. I then spoke to him again about a week, ten days ago, okay. um, to, to update him on where I was at and the, the, the fact that I was coming to close to concluding. Okay. Uh, have you and the Prime Minister discussed the release of the report? No, we haven't, Senator. So the Prime Minister himself says um, that he's given a commitment in his press release to consult across the Parliament, but the report's not been released, so it's difficult to see how it can be, we can be consulted on something we haven't seen. Are, are, are you... Are you of the, uh, do you understand that the report itself will be released publicly? 
So I, I don't know the answer to that, Senator, but um, uh, what I know obviously is what the Prime Minister has, has said. Has anyone from his office discussed with you the public release of the report? Senator, I think I have, um, I have probably raised that issue. I'm just trying to think um, uh, of the of the process um, in the in the course of preparing the report. Um, I have indicated um, uh, that I think it would be um, valuable if the report were able to be released, but that's obviously not my call. So you think you, you have a recollection of indicating that there is value in releasing it um, to the PM or to the PMO? To the PMO, I think, okay. Senator. Uh, and um, Senator Birmingham, is the Prime Minister proposing to release the report? Uh, Senator, um, I, I don't know whether the Prime Minister's had time to look at the full content of the report uh, yet. Um, he's indicated in, uh, in this public statement that, uh, that he intends to um, uh, brief the Cabinet on the well, that will give you cabinet and confidence, won't it? I mean, wh and, why, why would you not release this? Well, Senator, it's just, just it's amazing. Senator, the, Senator, the, the, like the, the the focus on making sure things don't get out. Why won't you release this report? It's a report into how we can improve things in and, this building. And, and Senator, I'm, I'm not prejudging um, what the decision on that will be. Uh, I fully anticipate um, sitting down with Senator Gallagher and other representatives of, uh, of the opposition to talk through the recommendations of the report, and no doubt that will require sharing those recommendations and findings of the report. What is, what, what is released, Senator Wong? I don't know yet. We only got the report last night. Well, you've got the Deputy Secretary of PMNC who's been prepared to say, and I give her credit for this, that she has indicated that it would be valuable. I don't want to misquote mm. you, Ms Foster, but whatever she said, which I think was, there would be value in public release, mm. will you release it? Senator, it's not my decision to make no. sitting here. Um, well, you're representing I, the Prime Minister, so it's a question in your representative capacity. Sure. And I'm, I'm happy to take it on notice, but Senator, it is my full expectation that the findings in relation to this report um, will become public as they are shared across the parliament and we work through its implementation. Well, it's not just parliamentarians, it's their staff. It's our staff. Because, yes. I mean, it goes to inter alia, my recollection of the terms, it also goes to what are the appropriate procedures and support arrangements for staff, etc. cetera, on what circumstances complaints, how complaints should be managed, those sort of things. So this is highly relevant to staff. So surely it should go to staff as well, not just uh, parliamentarians. Yeah. Yes, Senator, and just as, uh, just as in establishing Commissioner Jenkins's review, I engaged with staff and sought to ensure that, uh, that it was so an that, inclusive look, that process. Does, that's not cover for it this, is, Mr it Senator Birmingham. It it's Senator not Wong, cover Senator Wong, for this. I just finish, please? It would be my intention exactly the same types of engagement uh, to occur with staff as we work through how we implement these findings, which will require clearly sharing those findings. Uh, with uh, with parties right across the board, not just political parties. Right, I'm going to for formally ask that the report be tabled. And I'll, I'll take that on notice, Senator. Yeah, and, and, and if, and if it aware. is not, I would like to understand why. Sure, Senator. Yeah, like, just explain why you don't think that something that is ostensibly um, about trying to improve this workplace and make it safer for the people who work here, why you wouldn't make that public. Now, if yes, there's Senator. a compelling reason, tell well, us. Well, Senator, we want in good faith to work with all parties across this parliament. Well, it's not in good terms faith of if you won't release a report. In terms of implementing this? Uh, sure, sure, Senator Wong. You, yeah, you, you might, in another scenario, argue that it would be bad faith for us to publish it um, before we'd even shared it with you, for example, in terms of what it is that it is recommending that is not just for government action, but entails action oh, come and responsibilities on. I love for that. all I members love of that. parliament. So you commission a report that at the moment you're not releasing publicly, but suddenly it's our responsibility to deal with this. No. That's no, brilliant. No, no, That's no, impressive. No, 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 Senator Wong. I, I just, 
there would absolutely be scenarios where you would say, why haven't you shared this with you, us as well? You're the government. Well. Can you stop? Like, like it, you know, we're, we're the opposition. We sit on this other table. You're the government. You have all the resources of government. This occurred in a minister's office. We, we have all talked about how we can make things better. You commission a report that is supposed to go to that whole point of how we can make this a safer and better place to work. And now you are justifying, at this stage, not releasing it by reference to some hypothetical action that I no. may or may not no, take no, down. No, so, I mean, so, that is like so, 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 an so, extraordinary so, displacement of responsibility. So, 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 Senator Bad Wong. me, yeah. So, so, Senator in the Wong. future, you might do this, Penny, so therefore we won't do this. No. So, so, Senator Wong, I want us to engage in implementing sure. actions from this report in good faith across the parliament, okay. as notwithstanding all of the political issues and legitimate concerns that exist around all of the issues that we've dealt with this year, I have tried in terms of working uh, on the reforms that are necessary for the future to do that in a way in good faith with other political parties. And I want to do the same in relation now to the recommendations well, the PM from says, Ms Foster. The PM says, I intend to take this report to Cabinet and respond no, on behalf of the government. Following this, I will seek to engage with all parties and parliamentarians to implement the response, i.e. the government's response. Yeah. So that, that is not what you're saying. It's not, no. let's work it out, let's get a report out, let's have a process for engagement with staff, process of engagement across the parliament. No, we'll go to Cabinet, we'll work out what we want to do with it, and then we will talk to you about how we do it. Mm. Anyway, I think it's clear. Okay. Well, I maintain my request. You can come back to that. And I, I would again emphasise that, and it is unusual for a public servant to actually make clear that she did discuss the value in releasing it. And I would say to you, I think there is value in it. Now, if there's parts of it that, for some reason, people feel need to be redacted for confidentiality or other reasons, that's something that can be discussed. But the whole purpose of this is trying to change complaints, processes, support, etc., in this building and in, presumably in electorate offices as well. Senator Birmingham, when did you know that the Prime Minister would be releasing the press release that we're discussing? Releasing the press release. Um, uh, I think early this morning, Senator. Did you, did you discuss whether or not, uh, how did you become aware? I think I was told, um, I was told in preparation for coming here, uh, coming here this morning, largely in my um, I'm trying to remember who passed the message on to me. Um, possibly my chief of staff or my media advisor. Right. Did you express a view about the timing of the media release? No, Senator. I was obviously uh, um, expecting that, uh, that you would ask questions about Ms Foster's work. Um, and... Uh, and uh, and the media release provides um, an indication from the Prime Minister about the nature of that work, the fact that he's received it. Um, did you, have you ever expressed a view to the PMO or to the PM about release of the pu report publicly? Um, I'm just trying to think through conversation, Senator, but look, I mean, regardless, uh, uh, if I'm expressing a view to the Prime Minister, that's a view that I would express to the Prime Minister. Um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not one. Do you uh, think it should be released publicly? Senator, I too want to, uh, want to have a chance to, uh, to look at the review. Um, I think that uh, in terms of successfully implementing it, with support across the parliament, with support across staff, uh, then clearly um, findings uh, from the review uh, will need to be shared. Now, as you said before, I don't know whether some of its content uh, may or may not be appropriate for release. I haven't seen it yet. Um, so, Ms Foster, I think you met with two, Mr. Um, with the Prime Minister twice, you said, in relation to this. Did you meet with uh, former, or, uh, you've also given evidence you've met with Ms Higgins. That's I think correct, you've, Senator. yeah. So I don't need to retraverse that. But I'm just ask, wondering, did you meet with any other former or current staff? Uh, yes, I did, Senator. How many? So um, it was around about the sort of 15, 
20 mark. Some of those were um, people who had had um, experience with the current system. Oh. And experience in. So had experienced some sort of an incident How did you, themselves. How, did they self-identify or? So um, if I could go one step back, yeah. Senator. I'm not asking, I don't, I don't want to. I, I understand. Yeah, I'm not asking for names, I'm not actually asking for details, but I'm just trying to understand how they yeah. came to be people to whom you spoke. So um, I was conscious of two things. First was my initial short time frame, mm -hmm. and the second was the knowledge that the Jenkins Review was going to do a broad consultation process, and I didn't want to cause confusion about who should I talk to, where should I go. Um, but I did want to have to test the, um, the proposals that we were coming up with with people who had had direct experience of the system or people to whom people had reported their experiences. Right. Okay. And so the so, 10 to 15 would be both complainants and people who received complaints, would that be? Or people, um, some of them were just MOP staff who approached me to say, can I please talk to you about um, uh, what you're doing? because I care passionately about this okay. and I really want you know, to, to yeah. provide my views. In terms of um, identification of people who didn't approach me, so um, I worked actually with um, Minister Birmingham's Chief of Staff because um, she has been assisting Ms Jenkins in the setup of her inquiry, so mm. a number of people have come to her to ask her if she could um, approach people mm. who might be willing to speak with me. Mm. Um, one of those people had actually come forward to the Chief of Staff to say, I would like to contribute to Miss Foster's review. Um, uh, I also spoke with um, a former whip who identified a couple of people um, for me to speak to. It was actually quite a difficult thing to do um, because obviously, particularly people who have been through um, very difficult experiences, the last thing I wanted to do was re-traumatise them sure. by approaching them insensitively, Absolutely. which is why I worked through intermediaries. Yeah, no, and what I found, um, even with a relatively small number of people with direct experience, that the themes coming through were consistent um, and, and supported the kind of conclusions that I've been coming to, which had been derived a lot from talking to um, organisations who provide support to people who've been through experiences um, like Ms Higgins, um, and to experts and academics and NGOs and other organisations who have tackled these issues um, over recent years, like sporting codes, mining companies, to, to find out how the different um, organisations and individuals would view best practice in this field. I also talked um, to other jurisdictions, both within Australia and overseas, um, about who had been through similar reviews or experiences over recent years mm. to find out the lessons that they had learned. And then essentially, was testing those propositions with staff. And, and, and Senator Wong, I'm sure, as you would appreciate and the committee would, it's important to draw the distinction between Ms Foster's consultation and engagement there, which, as she's described, was a little more organic and self-identification um, versus the open approach for submissions and participation that Commissioner Jenkins yeah, is undertaking, understand. for which Commissioner Jenkins has the legal protections the Parliament's accorded for her process the support services in place to be able to assist people and uh, and is a more appropriate vehicle for encouraging complete access and, uh, and participation. Yeah. As I, I think the words I used to Senator Waters before were, Ms Foster's work is trying to provide some no regrets actions that we can undertake uh, whilst Commissioner Jenkins does her work and no doubt her work will perhaps provide recommendations that, uh, that hopefully build upon what Ms Foster has done given the effort Ms Foster has made to ensure her recommendations are hopefully consistent with the direction that, uh, that that independent review will take. 
Um, <clears throat> so did, I had two questions. Um, did Commissioner Jenkins know that the media release would be issued this morning and that the report, and or that the report was complete? Um, I told her, Senator. When did you tell her? This morning. When did you become aware it would be released this morning? Late last night. So before Senator Birmingham? It would appear so. Yeah. Um, and at any point in any discussion with you, um, did, was there, uh, did anybody suggest to you that it would be a good thing to finish this report before this estimates hearing? Uh, Senator, that was probably self-motivated. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's still not an answer to my question, but you can answer that question at that point first. Well, for good reasons, because I wanted to be able to talk sure. about it. Okay, I rather get that, than but say, that wasn't my question. Could you answer my question? Uh, no, Senator, it was me who was driving the timing. So no one from PMNC, no colleague, no one from PMO, no public servant colleague said to you, you better get it done before estimates, or version thereof? No, Senator, not in a kind of directive way. No, oh, okay, I didn't ask that. But I didn't ask that. Did, did, did the um, timing of estimates and the release of your report, was that a subject matter, a subject that you discussed with a colleague or a member of the Prime Minister's staff? I think probably, Senator, um, <laughs> both my colleagues and the Prime Minister's staff have been aware um, of my desire to finish it. So yes, it's it's not some it's something I discussed quite freely. Um, and Senator, I wonder if before we leave this, um, if I could just put on the record my enormous appreciation for the staff who did talk to me and who showed the courage and um, and confidence to share their stories with me to help um, ensure that the recommendations were sound. Okay. Um. Thank you for that, um, Ms Foster. I might flick to someone else for a minute. Do you want to do this one? I'll just do one set and then um, Senator Kitching will take over. I just want to confirm, um, the Prime Minister indicated that there's been public reporting that um, the Prime Minister Morrison met with Ms Higgins in Sydney on the 30th of April. Um, on the 21st of April, uh, Ms Higgins indicated that despite the Prime Minister offering to meet with her many weeks earlier, she hadn't heard anything from the PMO since the 6th of April. So my question to you, Senator Birmingham, which Ms Foster can assist with, is why it, had, why it took so long for the PM to meet with Ms Higgins? Um, Senator, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of the process of engagement between the PMO and, uh, and Ms Higgins in terms of the timing of setting up uh, that meeting. Uh, I'm happy to, to take that on notice uh, for you, Senator Wong. Well, come back after lunch. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't think it's a, an acceptable exercise of accountability for you to just go, I don't know, you are here in before the parliament representing the PM, so I'm asking the question, if you could come back and talk to us about the timeframes, that would be useful. If I can, Thank if you. I can secure some information, I will say um, uh, the news reports indicated that the min Mr Morrison was accompanied by senior government advisers and a representative from the Solicitor General's office. Um, can you tell me, Ms Foster, were you present at this meeting? I was, Senator. Yeah, who else was present? Um, so the Prime Minister's senior advisor for women and um, a lawyer from the Australian Government Solicitor, not the Solicitor General's office. Why was the lawyer present? At whose request was the lawyer present? Um, so, Senator, that was my suggestion on the morning of the meeting. Um, Ms Higgins had indicated that she wanted to bring, um, she, in her party was her personal lawyer, but she also wanted to bring in an additional lawyer. And I thought it would be prudent in case there needed to be some discussion, if anything, 
if anything was raised at the meeting that needed to be discussed between lawyers for, uh, for us to have an AGS lawyer present. Um, so sorry, how many, three, so four people? Prime Minister, his senior advisor, women, person from um, Australian Government solicitor and yourself. That's correct. Any other lawyers? Um, so Ms Higgins sure. was accompanied by four other people. Right. Um, did you take a file note of that meeting? Uh, no, I didn't, Senator. The AGS lawyer took a note because um, the Prime Minister wanted me to be able to participate in the discussion, which is obviously difficult to do if you're note-taking. And was the senior advisor women the only person from the PMO present? That's correct, Senator. So Mr Kunkel wasn't present? Dr Kunkel wasn't Dr. there. Dr. Um, obviously there's been some public reports about this meeting. Um, did Ms Higgins seek and principal support from Mr Morrison for change? She did, Senator. The, the the whole focus of the meeting um, was on reform and and change to the system. And did Ms Higgins seek his support to, to change things? Um, she did, Senator, and, and one of the specific things, as, as we know, that she has been focused on is an independent process. Um, and in his statement after the meeting, the Prime Minister made public his commitment to achieving an independent process. So this is what was reported publicly um, from uh, news.com re reported that after the meeting, Ms Higgins said, so I'm just reading off a report, it, it became quite tense when it came to actually delivering on anything beyond what has already been announced and the reviews in place. I said I was disappointed and that's why the meeting went for an hour and a half. Is, does that accord with your recollection of how the meeting went? So certainly, Senator, um, uh, Ms Higgins expressed her disappointment and the Prime Minister then prolonged the meeting in order to be able to explore that with her. And she was disappointed because there's been a lot of announcements about reviews but not, no, no changes yet. Is, is that a reasonably accurate summation? I, I think, for example, Senator, um, when um, we were discussing my review, for example, Ms Higgins was keen to see action um, and, as you know, that's what I've been trying to deliver sure. through this. Sure. I mean, you can understand why she feels like this and why many people might feel like this. What we've learned this, mo this morning is the Gaitchen's inquiry is incomplete and secret. The Kunkel re backgrounding review, incomplete and secret. Foster review, complete but still secret. Mm. Is there so any wonder that Ms Higgins and other others uh, are questioning as to whether there's actually any uh, real desire to implement change. So, Senator, um, following the Prime Minister's meeting, um, as I was explaining to Senator Waters, I had an extensive um, discussion with Ms Higgins about the kinds of um, proposals um, that I was making, again, to test with her um, uh, whether or not they made sense to her in the light of her experience. Um, uh, and that was in part um, okay, well, to ensure that, you know, this, this, that, that Ms Higgins um, understood that this was not a, a desktop review, that it was actually something coming up with practical, concrete suggestions that would make a difference. Did she, did she, um, did Ms Higgins put forward any proposals for change? So, Senator, Ms Higgins... Or um, raise any, any the, the need for change? 
Um, certainly, yeah. one of the issues that was discussed was around um, an independent complaints process. Okay. And has, and has the Prime Minister asked you to advise on an independent complaints process? So, Senator, that was a fundamental element of, of right. my review. Right. And that, oh, sorry, that is in the press release. And it's in the press release. Right. One of the issues that has been, Ms Higgins has, according to media, raised is also the transparency around the role of the Government Staffing Committee. Has the Prime Minister received any advice on that? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Ms Senator Birmingham. Um, I don't. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of conversations directly with the Prime Minister about uh, about the GSSC. You don't recall any discussion about it. Sorry, was that not, your evidence just now? Yeah, yes, Senator. So there's no suggestion. There's no consideration by government as to greater transparency around the role of the GSC. Um, and so that, uh, that wasn't what I said. I said I wasn't aware of discussions uh, directly with the PM uh, okay. about it. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's certainly, uh, in relation to uh, the work that, um, uh, that is happening by Commissioner Jenkins and more broadly, uh, discussions that, uh, that I and others have had inside government about um, uh, the type of human resources um, support and functions that exist uh, in relation to, uh, to government staff and, uh, and thinking through um, what uh, can be done uh, that is still consistent with the way the MOPS Act operates uh, to, uh, to provide for um, internally uh, uh, better supports and processes that, uh, that may also uh, be able to uh, further support or add value to, uh, to what Ms Foster's recommendations will do across parliamentary staff uh, more generally. So was the issue of the staffing committee raised in the meeting you attended, Ms Foster? Not to my memory, Senator. Okay. So I just going back to the, my summation of the evidence this morning, Senator Birmingham, we know the Gaitchen's inquiry is incomplete and secret. The Kunkel backgrounding review is incomplete and secret, and Ms Foster's review is complete but still secret. Um, I think yesterday DPS said there'd be no changes for the last couple of years. So I am asking you why so much secrecy and why so little change? Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Wong, we've canvassed uh, individual issues on the way through this morning and, uh, and they're uh, obviously have been issues in relation to the timeliness of some work associated with, uh, with following federal police advice. Uh, there are issues in some cases in relation to um, personal privacy protections and standards. In relation to action, uh, the government has put in place uh, the enhanced support and counselling services and systems for parliamentary staff. Uh, the government has been working uh, already in relation to the education and cultural training uh, standards that, uh, that Ms Foster uh, is recommending changes to, to seek to be in a position to implement those as quickly as possible. We have taken uh, decisions and provided contingencies in the budgets to be able to implement um, uh, and act on recommendations from the report received last night. I've given a commitment that I expect uh, to be working with other parties in this parliamentary session uh, to, uh, to try to advance those recommendations. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, Commissioner Jenkins' work, uh, which uh, we have stood up, uh, for which legislative and legal protections have been provided, uh, for which she has now completed, and the AHRC has completed uh, the ethics processes to be able to move to a public submission stage. But uh, we're not waiting uh, for that report. Uh, there will be actions following Ms Foster's report that we take in advance of, uh, of Commissioner Jenkins and, uh, and have already taken and begun to implement in some areas. Um, are you a member of the... Sorry, so you said you didn't, uh, Senator Birmingham, I think you said in answer to another question, you weren't aware of any um, 
public discussion about the government staffing committee. I'm, I'm, I'm reading from a report. I think this one is from The Guardian. Uh, the former staffer also wants more transparency on the so-called star chamber that governs the appointment of government staff. Um, Perhaps we can have some of that transparency now. Are you a member of that committee? Yes, Senator. Yes. What's its role? Um, uh, so, uh, so its role essentially, Senator, is to uh, uh, is to uh, handle um, and uh, and approve requests from ministers uh, related to the appointment of their personal staff. Can I? Who are the members? Um, so, uh, so uh, the members, uh, Senator, I want to make sure I got it completely right. But, uh, but uh, Mr. Coulton uh, and myself, uh, the uh, Prime Minister's uh, Chief of Staff, my Chief of Staff, um, uh, and I think the Prime Minister's PPS. But uh, I'll, I'll double check in terms PPS. of making sure. Uh, principal private principal secretary. private secretary. Yeah. So three staff members and two MPs. Uh, Senator Wong, I'll, I'll double check. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that okay, you do that. How often does it meet? Um, as required, uh, Senator Wong, it, uh, it often um, um, you know, deals with uh, deals with matters by exception, if you like. If there is a need to meet and discuss something, uh, otherwise, as you would imagine. Most recommendations from ministers for uh, an appointment um, are relatively routine. Does it meet in the cabinet room or does it meet in offices? Uh, uh, offices, Senator, meeting rooms. And, and are cabinet staff, P PMNC cabinet office staff in attendance? No, Senator. Okay. Um, do non members attend meetings? Uh, where required, Senator. Was this committee involved in the decision to terminate the employment of Ms Higgins' alleged rapist? Uh, I don't believe so, Senator. Can you find out? I, I will. You, that would have predated your term no, on, on it? No, no Senator, it, uh, it wouldn't have, but I, I don't believe in terms of the decision around termination that, uh, that it was. So you were on that committee back in March 2019, were you? Yes, Senator. As? So, so I was answering Senator Gallagher's question. I, I was a member of that committee then. In March 2019? In what capacity? And I, and I don't, uh, I've chaired the committee for some period of time, Senator. But I, I, I do not Senator believe as, mm. as, Senator as, Cormor as minister. Senator Cormor was still finance minister then. March 2019. Mm. So it's not a finance. You're not there as as a, a sh as the minister for finance. No, Senator. What? How are you? What are you there as? Um, uh, well, Senior moderate. No, uh, on nomination of uh, of the prime minister. Right. So the former prime minister had uh, had appointed me to the role. Ah, so you were there because Mr. Turnbull had appointed you. No. That's uh, well, yes, right. Senator. And you had originally. stayed there. Right, OK, got it. And so terminations don't go to that committee, is that what you said? For serious uh, incidents or anything like that, you, that committee doesn't look at those? Um, not, uh, uh, not necessarily, Senator, not unless somebody is seeking uh, advice uh, per se. Um, and I think Senator Reynolds uh, has been clear about the termination of that staff member and, uh, and the decision that was taken there. For serious misconduct. So, if a person gets terminated in the government staffing um, pool for serious misconduct, the staffing committee doesn't get advised or doesn't consider that at all. Um, so, uh, uh, the committee uh, would uh, would know of a vacancy in terms of it being filled um, and the recommendation of, uh, of an individual to uh, to fill it. Um, as I said, it is essentially a function just uh, of, uh, of ensuring the appropriateness of the recommendations to, uh, to, uh, to fill a role, which overwhelmingly are you know, fairly straightforward recommendations from ministers for appointment of their personal staff as, as members of parliament across the building do. Mm. Just 
Just in um, terms of um, what we've learnt this morning again, so if a similar set of circumstances arose now as what arose in March 2019, so the circumstances that led to the situation of um, Ms Higgins and um, her reported rape in this building, two years on, two years and two months on, can you point to anything that would stop that from happening again? Like, DPS said there'd be no change to what they do. We know ministers in the government knew. Indeed, we know Minister Dutton's office knew, Minister Reynolds' office knew. There's allegations that the Prime Minister's office knew, but we don't know. Now there's the the Gaitchen's inquiry that hasn't reported, Ms. Dr Kunkel's report which hasn't reported about what happened post this information becoming public about backgrounding. What's to stop this happening to another young woman in this building? Like, what, what has changed? So, so Senator, uh, as um, I think is, uh, is public, right, the Prime Minister uh, has instructed you know, all ministers to ensure uh, that we uh, have briefed and discussed with our staff um, the avenues that are available to them uh, to be able to um, seek assistance, to report matters, uh, to ensure that, uh, that an individual uh, in any such terrible circumstances knows that they have choices available to them. Um, now, what choices an individual chooses to access uh, whether that is an independent counselling service, whether that is talking to their minister or their chief of staff or another staff member. Clearly, they are decisions for uh, an individual, uh, but uh, I have certainly, and I know other ministers have, had those discussions with our staff uh, to, uh, to seek to ensure that, uh, that they are aware of the suite of options that exist, the support that will be provided uh, for them to make whatever choices are appropriate, but certainly where uh, a criminal incident of that nature might have occurred, the support that would be provided for them to proceed uh, with, uh, with reporting that uh, to police. Um, and uh, they are the type of discussions that I'd encourage all members of parliament to have with their staff. Um, now, clearly there are other changes to come in relation to um, broader cultural practices in education and standards that, uh, that Ms Foster's work identifies in relation to providing a further option for staff of an independent complaint process uh, and, uh, and then ultimately uh, the work that Ms Jenkins uh, will do. Uh, and I imagine that, uh, that Commissioner Jenkins will also touch uh, on the questions of, uh, of who it is appropriate uh, to tell and to share information with in these circumstances, um, noting the uh, advice in other reports and circumstances that uh, all support needs to be provided to victims in these cases, but also all respect in relation to the choices they make about how um, matters are handled, and that is the uh, the approach certainly that I have tried to reinforce with my staff and the Prime Minister has expected all ministers to reinforce with, uh, with their staff that uh, uh, there are supports available, uh, they should come forward, they will be supported um, and, uh, and that their choices will be respected. Can I, can I just ask, well this just relates. So the Star Chamber, which you've been chairing for some time, is it changing its processes in terms of um, complaints that might be made against staff, for example, that are in ministerial offices or in, indeed in any parliament, parliamentarian's offices? And I ask that because Commissioner Kershaw downstairs has said that they've received about 40 complaints. So are you looking, has the Star Chamber decided to follow you know, new practices, new procedures in relation to staffing? Um, we've certainly had discussions, as I referenced before, about the type of human resources supports or functions that, that could be provided within government uh, to try to 
provide an additional level of support for um, individuals to access either the type of serious incident dispute resolution that, uh, that Ms Foster's identified, Senator or of Hatt. course the, the type of more, um, more lower level dispute um, resolution that the Department of Finance would continue to I, offer. I think that's good, but are you also looking at, you know, people talk, so if you hear something about a staffer, are you also taking that into account? Um, I think thinking through ways to provide um, uh, um, proactive referral mm -hmm. to wellbeing um, or support services is uh, and uh, and provide and reinforce that advice and um, I guess since uh, since uh, Brittany Higgins's um, uh, incident and uh, and um, and terrible allegations were raised publicly there have been other matters that mm -hmm. have equally come forward and through all of those iterations, it's, uh, it's been a priority in, in my office and through the Department of Finance uh, to seek to make contact with individuals to again reinforce to them the different support services that are available and to try to be as proactive as we can if, if, if in relation hear. to if we hear something or if something is and reported, identifying the options that are available to those individuals. And how do you investigate the alleged perpetrator of an incident? Does the Star Chamber have anything to do with that? Well, you don't. You don't sit no, on anything, is no, what I'm no, it, it's asking. Not, I mean, it's not. It's it's not an investigatory body, and I don't think it would be appropriate for it to be so. Um, okay. But uh, but in terms of taking the responsibility seriously, of ensuring that um, people are empowered to talk to experts and encouraged to talk to experts and aware of where they can go to get that those issues resolved independently is, uh, is, I think, an important function that, frankly, falls upon all of us. Yes, it does. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. The committee will now suspend for lunch and will be back at 1.35. The committee will now recommence after lunch and continue with its inquiry of PMNC still on outcome one. Uh, Senator Chair. Gallagher. Oh, yes, yeah, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Just uh, following up on a few matters from uh, this Please. morning's questioning. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the indulgence. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, I undertook just to, uh, to confirm the membership of the Government Staff Selection Committee. Uh, there was one member who I had omitted to mention earlier, uh, being the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, the other members, as I indicated, are accurate uh, senators. Uh, in relation to Dr Kunkel's uh, review, uh, I have been advised that Dr Kunkel has been finalising his review and briefing the Prime Minister in relation... Sorry. I understand Dr Kunkel has been finalising his review and briefing the Prime Minister in relation to the findings of his review. I'm advised that in the conduct of his review, Dr Kunkel has uh, spoken with staff within the Prime Minister's office, uh, including within the media team. I'm advised that Dr Kunkel has also spoken with uh, journalists uh, and members of the press gallery as part of the conduct uh, of his review. Uh, and I am advised that he has had contact uh, with Ms Brittany Higgins, uh, offering her the opportunity to provide information to that review. I'm further advised that it's the Prime Minister's intention to make uh, that review public. Okay. So, thank you, um, Senator Birmingham, for following uh, up on that. Perhaps a few questions. So finalising his report, but he's already briefing the Prime Minister on the findings. So he has made findings. I believe it is at that stage of, uh, of finalisation and briefing, yes, Senator. Okay. And he has briefed the Prime Minister on um, that? 
briefed or briefing was uh, what does my that understanding was What's the briefing difference? briefing may be still occurring may be ongoing for uh, in terms of uh, in terms of explaining the work that he has undertaken and, uh, and the findings that he's made so has he made a finding that the Prime Minister's media office backgrounded against Ms Higgins in that week following her coming out with her allegations of rape? I'm not aware of what findings have been made yet, Senator. I understand that, uh, that he was still briefing the Prime Minister. Right. So he's made findings. He's briefing the Prime Minister on the findings. And the Prime Minister's intention is to make that public. When? Senator, I'm not sure precisely when, uh, but uh, assuming all documentation is completed to the Prime Minister's satisfaction, then I would imagine, uh, then I imagine it would be shortly. So the Prime Minister currently knows whether members of his media office were backgrounding against Ms Higgins. He knows that answer now, well, based on what you've told us today. Well, well Senator. Uh, he, has, uh, he is being briefed in relation to Dr Kunkel's report. And you specifically said Dr Kunkel has made findings and he's been briefing the Prime Minister, which would lead me to believe that he's made a finding. The only thing he was investigating, as I understand it, was whether members of the Prime Minister's media unit were backgrounding against Ms Higgins. That was what he was asked to do. He's made a finding on that. He's told the Prime Minister and what we're all just meant to wait for the Prime Minister's convenience to let everybody else know well, what that finding was. Senator, as I, as I indicated, the Prime Minister uh, intends to make uh, that report public. But you don't know when he'll make, make it public? I don't know exactly when at this stage, Senator. But he currently knows the finding of the Kunkel inquiry. He's been briefed on it. He has or is being briefed in relation to findings. Like is currently or Well, I don't I don't know exactly what he's doing currently, Senator. But you were briefed in the lunch break, so did Dr. Kunkel brief you in the lunch break? I did speak briefly with Dr. Kunkel. Okay. And he said I've made findings, I've briefed I'm briefing the Prime Minister. Is that what he that's, said to that, you? That's consistent with what I've told the committee, yes. And you didn't ask him what the findings were? He was still in the process of briefing the Prime Minister, Senator. He gave me the commitment that, uh, that the Prime Minister has indicated the report will be made public. But the question, the only question that he was asked to look at was whether members of his media office were backgrounding against Ms Higgins. So it, I'm struggling to understand why you're not being clear about what the Prime Minister knows now. Like from, from what you're, you're talking a little bit cryptically in, in, in some sense, but you've said he's, been, he's made findings and he's briefed the Prime Minister, or briefing the Prime Minister. What else would he be briefing the Prime Minister about if it wasn't about his finding? And what that finding was. The, I feel like I'm the, in a hollow man the, episode the, the, here. The, the conduct of the review, the actions he took as part of uh, that review, <coughs> I would imagine. I, okay. Can you tell me if there have been actions or you're not aware of that? Well, in terms of the actions he took as part of that review and the conduct of the review, I outlined some of them in relation to the fact that I am aware he interviewed members of the Prime Minister's office. I'm aware that he uh, interviewed or had discussions with... Uh, members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. I'm aware that he had uh, communications with Ms Brittany Higgins. Okay. So maybe if we go back to the beginning, does Mr Morrison agree that backgrounding against Ms Higgins and her family would be the wrong thing to do in, in any circumstances? Um, yes, I believe so, Senator. And you would agree, Senator Birmingham, that it would be the wrong thing to do as well? Yes, Senator. Did you ask Dr Kunkel whether he has um, asked Ms Higgins to out the names of journalists that told her that the backgrounding was going on? Uh, my understanding is that Dr Kunkel provided Ms Higgins with an opportunity to provide any information that she had to him that would be helpful in terms of the review that he had been asked to undertake. Um, that is uh, the extension of the opportunity to do so um, that, uh, that he accorded her. 
Um, did you ask him whether he had said without her outing journalists herself that it would be difficult for him to conclude his investigation comprehensively? I did not ask him that. I'm not aware of but he precisely would have presumably how those heard communications us raise that between... this morning. So did he respond to that point? Not, uh, um, not in the short conversation that we had. I think that would be... I think Senator Gallagher put that to you this morning. It would be useful, I think, for Dr Kunkel to respond to that because it's an, it's an account uh, which, absent a reasonable explanation, suggests that the responsibility for finding out if this occurred is pushed back onto Ms Higgins. I'm, I'm happy to take that on notice, Senator. Well, presumably Dr Kunkel or one of the staff in the Prime Minister's office is listening to this. It would be useful. Can you also um, let the committee know whether the Prime Minister was satisfied that, Ms., uh, that Dr Kunkel wasn't involved in any of the um, backgrounding activity? I'll, I'll take that on notice, Senator. OK. I, so you... I, I, I would expect... And the answer to that is yes, the Prime Minister is completely satisfied. So he would have asked Dr Kunkel obviously, before that? Obviously, in asking Dr Kunkel to undertake this work, I would have expected that he would have assured himself okay. that Dr Kunkel, like the Prime Minister, had no knowledge of any such activity being undertaken. Well, we don't know that, Can we? Do we? Can I, I'll, I'll confirm that for you, Thank Senator. You. We don't know that. I mean, Senator, confirm it. we did at the time say that the Prime Minister should just ask his staff did people do this and who, who was doing it and what were they doing? And that was, would have been a relatively quick and easy process to go through. But we're now 62 days later and it seems very difficult to get information out about what is being done. When you say there had, that he has spoken to, uh, he has conducted what, interviews, is it, with the staff within the PMO and within the media team, can you confirm that the three staff that I named earlier were included in that, those interviews? Uh, no, Senator, I can't. Why can't you do that? Senator, uh, uh, Dr Kunkel's um, report, as the Prime Minister's indicated, uh, will be released publicly. Uh, I'm not aware as to whether that report names any individual staff or not. So you've said that he did conduct interviews with the media team. They were part of the discussions he had with Prime Minister or office So is that staff. with every member of the media team was spoken to? I'm not aware of that, Senator. God. Honestly, it's like Seriously. pulling teeth. Um, why are we not able to know 62 days on whether the PMO backgrounded against Ms Higgins' partner. I mean, it seems to be a, a fairly simple question to answer. And it's almost like we're going to such, the government is going to such lengths to complicate and make the process so confidential and observe everybody's right to secrecy, anyone who gets involved, that nobody can say anything. And here we are, like, months on, and we have no idea. We have credible allegations that the PMO's media team were wandering around the press gallery, backgrounding against her partner. That's what was going on, as a way of diminishing her credibility with what she was saying that week. That's what was happening. At the same time the Prime Minister was saying we must listen to victims, members of his office are wandering around the press gallery saying, oh, but did you know about this? And nobody, 62 days later, can say whether it happened or not. And in the meantime, journalists that have come forward to say, yes, it did happen, have withdrawn. Did Mr. Kunk Dr Kunkel say that, that those um, journalists that had approached the PMO had withdrawn and weren't able to participate in the, in the process any longer? So, Senator, there was quite a lot in what, uh, what you said just then. Um, you make the assertion that, uh, that the allegations are credible. Certainly the Prime Minister agreed that there should be an investigation of the allegations, their credibility or otherwise, um, I won't speak to. He's asked for Dr Kunkel to undertake that investigation 
and, uh, and he has committed that the report uh, provided by Dr Kunkel will be made public. Well, whatever uh, version that they agree to make public, I presume. Well, he's committed you know, what I have been told and I'm advised, Senator, is that the report provided by Dr Kunkel will be made public. But you won't tell me who was interviewed. You won't tell me if the journalists have withdrawn. Is that right? That uh, from Dr Kunkel's inquiry, the one, Hi. the one that the Prime Minister mentioned in Question Time, when he said that there had been, an in, you know, a direct approach to his office, saying no. that the backgrounding did occur, and that's what led to him asking Dr Kunkel to be involved. Can you confirm that that journalist has withdrawn? So, Senator, I can confirm, as I have, that Dr Kunkel spoke to members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery as part of his inquiry um, as to uh, which members... Formally? Did he interview to, them? Well... Or did he, he just have a chat in the corridor? Well, um, I'm not aware of exactly where he spoke to them, but he spoke to them as part of the inquiry. So I would imagine that it was um, more than a chat in the corridor, Senator. Um, uh, as to the extent of cooperation from individual journalists, uh, I don't know. Well, it was actually a journalist coming forward that led to the Kunkel inquiry being called or commissioned. So, Presume I'm asking you whether that journalist that was the direct uh, approach and a third party approach to the PMO, whether that journalist remains um, as part of the investigation. Uh, Senator, they're, uh, they're verifying Ms Higgins' version of events. Uh, Senator has said, I'm, I'm not aware of the extent of cooperation by individual members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. I, I, am, I am advised that Dr Kunkel spoke with members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery uh, as part of his inquiry. A very sorry state of affairs, I have to say, this whole business that we've you know, got an alleged rape victim who's been told that she has to out journalists in order for there to be any successful conclusion to this inquiry. But again, no. it falls back on Ms Higgins. I mean, if what Dr Kunkel releases or the Prime Minister releases says there's no way to verify this, we know what the stitch-up's been in early, don't we, really? Well, Sen Sen Senator, they're your assertions. Dr Kunkel, I'm advised, has gone through the process of talking and speaking with staff in the Prime Minister's office, journalists in the Parliamentary Press Gallery, communicating with Ms Higgins in an attempt to work through the question that he was asked by the Prime Minister uh, around these accusations. And the Prime Minister knows what the findings are, but he's going to choose the time when the rest of us, including Ms Higgins, is going to find out about it. Will it be after question time today? Will it be after the sitting period? I mean, it's all about yeah. political management, isn't it? I mean, Sen honestly. Sen Senator and Prime Minister, uh, it's provided a commitment that the report will be publicly released. When did he provide that commitment? Well, through to the conversations you. that I had with the Prime Minister's office during the recent break. Well, he must know. He must have made that with the comfort of knowing what Dr Kunkel's inquiry has found, isn't it? Because you know, well, he's been can, briefed on the findings and all of a sudden it's going to be a public release. You can... You can Make whatever assertions you wish to, Senator. Um, I'm simply trying to deal with the facts as I'm aware of them. Um, if there are, you won't you won't confirm to me for me that Dr. Kunkel has interviewed everyone in the media office, though. Why won't you be able to do that? I'm not aware of every single person that Dr Kunkel has spoken with, Senator Gallagher. I'm happy to take that on notice. And why does the Prime Minister have an office where he doesn't really know what's going on? 
That's the other thing that arises out of this, isn't it? We've got an inquiry into who knew what when about a serious allegations of a serious criminal offence happening in this building, because he can't be guaranteed he knows everything about that. And when backgrounding occurs, or there seemed credible allegations of backgrounding occurred in this building, he he is unable to just ask his chief of staff what's going on. I mean, is this really how the Prime Minister runs his office? That we've got to have two separate inquiries working over 100 days to actually work out what the hell is going on in that office? Senator, I think as I said this morning, um, particularly in relation to uh, the Gaitchen's inquiry, if the Prime Minister just asked the questions and gave an answer, no doubt many would say that was an inadequate process. So he put in place a uh, thorough and independent process there in relation to these uh, allegations that were made. Uh, he asked his Chief of Staff, being the appropriate manager of staff within the Prime Minister's office, uh, to talk to people to get to the bottom of it. Mm. <coughs> but has, if, Mr, if, if the Prime Minister is briefed, has been briefed on the findings by Dr Kunkel, will he be discussing those with Ms Higgins? It would seem to me that would be the first person he should speak to. So I'm not, uh, I'm not aware, Senator, of, uh, of timing of communications uh, between uh, Dr Kunkel and, uh, and Ms Higgins. Uh, no, I'm talking about the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm talking about whether he... If he knows the findings about what went on in his office... Because, again, I know we are talking in terms of... The minute you talk about inquiries and investigations, it sort of diminishes what we were actually talking about, which is a, a young woman with, who alleges she was raped in this building coming... Become, making that public and, within days, having... <laughs> Prime Ministerial staff wandering around the building having a crack at her partner as a way of diminishing her credibility. And 62 days on, we have no idea whether that happened or not. But the Prime Minister does, and he's going to choose when presumably he lets everybody else know. So, so Senator, uh, obviously you asked me this morning to seek some information about the status uh, of, uh, of this inquiry. Mm. Uh, I've done that during the lunch break, um, provided quite a contemporaneous update as, mm. to, uh, as to where it is at. I'm not aware of the sequencing of communications uh, with anybody about the findings of, uh, of that inquiry at this stage. But we know that the Prime Minister has been briefed on the findings and we're just, we and Ms Higgins just have to wait for the Prime Minister's convenience about when that is going to be made uh, public. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite a contemporaneous situation in terms of, uh, of as I understand, um, being briefed about the process and the findings um, and, uh, and the Prime Minister giving a commitment that, uh, that that would be made public. Are there going to be any consequences for any of the staff who have been found to have been doing the backgrounding? As I indicated, Senator, I'm not aware of the findings. OK, but if, if there are findings, will there be consequences? Because so far, the only person who has lost the, their job in this building since these con allegations have been made public is Miss Higgins. She has paid the price. And her family have paid the price. Her partner has paid the price. He's lost a job over it. They've moved town over it. They don't live here anymore because of what they've been through. It seems to me they've paid the price and they continue to be paying the price through partic participation in the various inquiries that were established, which I think both of them could have been handled differently by simply the Prime Minister asking his office what the hell went on and who did what to whom. But it seems to me there hasn't been any other consequences. Senator Reynolds is back. You know, there's, there's no other consequence for what happened. No one has paid a price. And what went on in, here in this building and in the week afterwards when they were backgrounding was dirty. Dirty against a rape uh, victim. Senator, 
Senator, just, just as a statement of fact, and certainly there's obviously one other individual who quite rightly lost a job. I said and since is, the allegations uh, became the subject, public. Uh, well, um, my recollection is that Ms Higgins had, uh, had resigned prior to them being made public, but that's... Um, that's not really okay, well, germane to okay, so that's the, not perpetrator, really germane to the, point the alleged you're making perpetrator so. lost his job for serious misconduct. Ms Higgins has lost her job. Who else has had any consequence for everything that went on after that, from um, being made public um, to not t telling people things to backgrounding in the press gallery? No. A direct attack on Ms Higgins via her partner. He's lost so, his job. So, so, so you're asserting that is as, uh, that is fact. Say, so I don't know the circumstances of that, Senator. I don't uh, have awareness of the findings of the report that Dr. Kunkel uh, has been finalising. Um, yeah, that report will be made public. I can't believe uh, he told you he's made findings and he's briefed them. And what you did not ask what those findings are. Did you just Dr. go, oh, okay, no worries, Dr. Kunkel? We've Dr. Got Kunk some findings. Dr. Kunkel was still in the process of briefing the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has given an assurance that the report will be made public. And that's meant to make it all right, is it? Well, it, it will be made public, Senator. Uh, that is one of the key questions you were asking uh, and points you were making earlier this morning. Well, uh, I give you... You've answered uh, one of them, yeah. I asked about that, but I asked who, whether particular people have been interviewed when it's going to be finished, whether there's going to be consequences. But now you've told us that the Prime Minister does know, I actually think uh, that's shifted things along. Like the fact that he knows and he's not telling is a real problem or should be a real problem. The minute he's in question, out of question time, people should be asking him, what do you know? Because this is the way he stopped, he avoided answering the question from the beginning. I'll kick it off to this inquiry. But now he's been briefed on the findings. Well, what are the findings? Did the Prime Minister's office background against Ms Higgins' partner? How hard is that? And, and, and Senator, I expect that, uh, that that report will be made public relatively quickly. I don't know how many questions the Prime Minister has of Dr Kunkel in terms of, uh, of the approach he's taken of the report and what information he is uh, seeking to understand uh, as he makes it public or who else he needs to speak to before he makes it public, of which, uh, uh, of which you have, uh, have rightly identified one instance where you would expect that might be the case. Um, but, uh, but it is the expectation that it be made public and I would expect relatively soon. What do you mean? Oh, I can't. I can't say exactly when Senator Wong. I don't know exactly when. I just went through the fact that, uh, that there may still have been unresolved questions that the Prime Minister had, that he might have still been seeking answers um, in relation to the conduct of the inquiry, um, and there may still be individuals who need to be informed in relation to its findings. Has any member of the PMO's uh, office been sanctioned or dismissed? I'm not aware of the findings, Senator Gallagher. So. Uh, so Dr Kunkel didn't mention to you whether there had been, you know, I've made findings, I've briefed the Prime Minister and... No. And XX, there have been sanctions. No, nothing. No. And you didn't ask? Or did you prefer not to ask in the... My, se Senator, my understanding is that, uh, that the Prime Minister was still being briefed in relation to the report and its conduct and its findings. Uh, and, um, as I said, there may well still be individuals that needed to be notified in relation to that as well. Um, so uh, yeah, it will be made public. Uh, whether I see it before it's made public or not, uh, I don't know. That will depend upon um, the timing of that and, uh, and, uh, and the process the Prime Minister chooses to apply. Senator Birmingham, in your role as um, Special Minister of State, and Chair of the Staffing Committee, would backgrounding against an alleged rape victim uh, be consistent with the ministerial staff standards or inconsistent, do you think? I would imagine inconsistent, Senator, without having a copy of the standards in front of me to, to go and 
um, and check particular clauses or to identify which clauses it might be inconsistent with. But I would imagine it would be inconsistent. Inconsistent. Okay. Well, again, I can't see why we haven't been able to elicit an answer out of Dr Kunkel or the Prime Minister, frankly, on this matter. 62 days in, like surely. It's just about trying to grind the process to a halt. Uh, and, you know, for Ms Higgins, I have to say, it's added trauma on trauma. And someone needs to take responsibility. And if it didn't happen, come and say it didn't happen. No, the Prime Minister's office did not background against Ms Higgins or her partner. Say it because the absence of saying it makes it look like another cover-up. On the cover-up that's happening with the Gaitchen's inquiry, on the cover-up that has happened about who knew what went for the last two years, you know, and I think, what does it say to people who have been through what Ms Higgins have been through? Mm. Is if this, in this workplace, you know, ostensibly meant to be the leading workplace in the country, if this is the way you are treated, 100 days of one inquiry, 62 days of another inquiry, also subjected to a, subject to a police investigation, what is that going to say to people who might be considering coming forward. I think if it was me, it would be a massive disincentive and the Prime Minister must know that. And he must be prepared to just keep it going indefinitely for as long as his poli political convenience suits him. Well, you know, so that's where we're at now. It is. Senator well, Birmingham, I don't think you would have handled it this way. Well, I don't. Well. Because I think fundamentally you are a decent person who understands about dealing with things properly. I don't no. think that extends to the Prime Minister. I think this is all about politically managing a very difficult situation for him, or in my terms, politically mismanaging no. at the expense of Miss Higgins, because she's paid the price and her partner has paid the price for this. And it's outrageous. And we sit here politely going, OK, no worries, Dr Kunkel, when you're ready. But there are human beings who are paying the price for this. And it seems that this Prime Minister doesn't care about that or care about them. And that is our concern. So, so Senator, um, it's not about me. It's not about anything other than getting to the facts of the matter as far as anybody is able to get to the facts well, of no, the matter. You see, the problem is, and no, Senator Birmingham, you, Senator I don't think anybody Senator watching Wong, this thinks that that's the motivation. Oh. And look, unfortunately, what is it, 90 something days, and we still don't know, you know, what the staff knew and when, 60 something days, apparently Mr. Dr. Kunkel knows, but no one hasn't said whether or not people were backgrounded again, against. You say this is all about getting to the bottom, you know, the facts of the matter. It looks precisely as Senator Gallagher said, that this is about the Prime Minister's political interest, not about Ms. Higgins' interest. Well, Senator Wong, I don't, uh, I don't accept that. I mean, it would okay. you know, talk politics. It might be far preferable if all these matters had been resolved far sooner and we wouldn't be sitting here in estimates talking about them today. Instead, uh, the Prime Minister uh, put a priority uh, on these things being done thoroughly uh, and in the case of the Gaitchen's review, being done independently of his office as well. Well, I don't think anyone thinks, Mr. Ga with respect, that Mr Gaitchen's review is independent. Uh, I mean, we all know Mr Gaitchen's history. We know he says that he is in the head of the Prime Minister and knows what he's thinking ahead of time. We know how close they are. So, you know, again, I, I sort of feel like I don't, I don't want to be polite anymore. You know, like, it's not independent. It's Mr Gaitchen's doing the review. And Dr Kunkel's doing this one. Inside the Prime Minister's office, leading the Prime Minister's office is now investigating the Prime Minister's own staff. He works for the Prime Minister. I don't think the word independent should be anywhere near any of this. And the fact that it has gone on so long 
diminishes its credibility day by day by day. The fact that the Prime Minister knows now what Dr Kunkel's findings are and no one else does also diminishes the credibility of it. Because what are we waiting for? Till the spin doctors can work out how to spin this favourably too? Like, just do so the Senator, right Senator, thing Senator for this Gallagher, woman, Senator, please. Senator Gallagher, we are sort of bordering on um, making speech contributions rather than asking questions to well, it's the minister yeah. at the desk. I've, I, I recognise that, but please Good try and... a few people actually tried to get them to do the right thing, actually. In which case, by all means, ask questions no, well, maybe of you the ministers too. at the table. Like, it, it really... Senator Gallagher. No. Oh, I've finished there. Unless Dr Kunkel has come back with any additional information that we asked earlier. Uh, well, I don't, I don't have a copy of Dr Kunkel's report yet. No, I'm uh, aware of I that, expect, but we did ask a couple of things. I expect it to, uh, to be made public, as, uh, as indicated. Uh, and, Senator, to again make the point, um, and there's been a lot of politicking uh, at different times in different ways uh, through, uh, through these issues as well. We and I have, and I have, well, I have no doubt that, it's, I have no doubt that, that if these things had all been resolved are, in matters of days, you'd have said we it was are a not quick politicking. I would, you know, I would prefer that we had, to, we did not have to ask any of these questions. You might laugh. I would prefer they just dealt with it, because it is not in Ms Higgins' interest to have all of this delayed. De you know, some. <laughs> wow, you, you're laughing because you think it's about politics. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that you would condone this, all of you. It's not I would prefer we didn't have to ask any of these questions. I would prefer not to have to do this. I would prefer that the government just dealt with this properly as they should have. I would prefer we didn't have this issue managed and delayed in the way we have. I would have preferred the minister in question stood up in question time early and had given a proper comprehensive statement. None of those things happened. The next day could have happened. So don't sit there and accuse us and chuckle to yourself, mate, about people paying politics with this. We don't want to have to do this. If Labor senators yeah, don't I have any more for now, I will pass the call to Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, Chair. So I've got some questions. Uh, uh, perhaps um, we'll go to very different topics. The uh, first relates to um, the, the fact that uh, in the UK, there's a Regency Act, 1937. Um, uh, you're looking at me. Uh, this is a matter raised last night, and the, uh, the government uh, office uh, directed I, I, me to you guys. Oh, the so Regency sorry. Act, did you the say? The Regency yes. Act. Right, OK. That, that was um, just a look of hoping that Mr okay. Reid was about to appear, Senator. Okay. <laughs> so there so the, the, there's, exists in the UK a Regency Act, which allows um, uh, certain officials, um, very senior officials, Lord Chancellors, the High, Lord um, Chief Justice and so forth, to, in the event of the incapacitation of the monarch, uh, to uh, appoint a regent. So this is not the... Uh, so in, in circumstances where um, there's no a abdication, simply the incapacitation of the monarch. Um, that that uh, act actually has effect in both uh, Canada and New Zealand, but does not have effect here. So we're approaching a situation where Her Majesty is now 95. There is a possibility that over the next few years, um, there could be some reason for her not to be able to discharge her duties as, as the sovereign here uh, under our constitution. Um, and I know this issue has been raised. It was raised during the Menzies era uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a problem that needs Needed to, needed to be sorted out, and an example of uh, where this could cause a, a difficulty is if we needed to appoint a state governor or indeed uh, change the governor general, um, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, I just want to know if the department has looked at this recently, in light of the events that have taken place in the UK, and indeed, um, you know, respectfully, the age of Her Majesty. Uh, thank you, Senator. John Reid, First Assistant Secretary, Government Division. Um, you'd be aware, of course, Senator, this has been a much, much vexed issue since at least 1937 in terms of its application to the Dominions. Um, the answer to your direct question is no. The Department hasn't looked at it recently. Um, of course, as a practical matter, Senator, 
given that the Governor General can perform all bar one or two vice regal functions, um, it's not something that we would look at urgently, and it's not something we've looked at in the recent past. Well, I can understand during the time of Menzies not looking at it when we had a very uh, young, fit uh, Queen. Uh, I suggest the circumstances have changed slightly. I point out that section 61 of our constitution makes it very clear that, um, that it is the, the Queen um, who, in effect, exercises the executive power through the Governor General. Um, so, so there could be an issue associated with this, and I just wonder whether or not, and, and I'm happy for you to sort of go away and come back and, and, and propose that you are or are not going to do something. I just raise it as, a, as an issue that may need reconsideration, noting the circumstances. Thanks, Senator. I, I'm not sure that there's anything for me to take away. It is something we are aware of. We are aware of the application of the Regency Act. We are aware of how it would fit into the, in the domestic legal situation. Um, but there's not, I don't think there's anything for me to come back to you on at the moment. So you, so you don't believe there's an issue that's, that arises um, in, in, the, in those potential circumstances um, that would not be better off sorted out now rather than at a later date? So as we know New Zealand's sorted it out, we know Canada has sorted it out. So I'd be careful, draw, I, I would be careful, Senator, drawing comparisons with both New Zealand and Canada because mm. the way they sorted it out goes back almost 100 years. Well, no, it's in the, it's in the New Zealand Constitution. I think that's 1984. And that, that's right, Section Senator. Section four of their Constitution, actually. The, and, Senator, I'd be careful not to get into a, a legal <laughs> okay. dispute with you at this point, um, but relating to the entry into force of the Statute of Westminster sure. and when that was in relation to Canada, New Zealand sure. and Australia. So I, I'm probably not in a position to engage with mm. you on the legal ramifications. Suffice to say, Senator, we are aware of the issue and it is something that we have looked at, not in the last six months. When was the last time you looked at that? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. All right. I'll just put it out there. Maybe you should uh, take a look at it. I might now go to Ms. Uh, th thank you very much for that. Um, I'll go to Ms. Um, Foster in relation to uh, a matter that was heard in the um, AAT last week, and I'm not seeking to have that adjudicated here. There was an issue that was uh, that, that arose during the proceedings. These are the proceedings as to whether the thing that you call National Cabinet is a cabinet. Um, uh, and the decision in relation, to is, in, in, that, in relation to that is reserved. And I'm, I'm not trying to point fingers here, I'm just trying to understand how a mistake was made uh, in a, what I think is a pretty important um, issue. Um, on affidavit, one of your senior officials uh, made an error, which was corrected and conceded uh, by council representing the department. Uh, during the proceedings, and it basically was a claim that, uh, and I'll just read from the affidavit of the person involved, on the 27th of August 1942, Prime Minister Curtin announced that a leading member of the opposition, Sir Earl Page, the distinction being he's not a minister, he's a member of the opposition, would be appointed to a, cab to a member of the War Cabinet due to his experience. Now, um, in, contra in, a, in a contrary affidavit, um, where the actual minutes of those cabinet meetings were uh, adduced and put before the AAT, uh, it was shown that that was not the case. My concern is in circumstances where the case could turn on a piece of factual information, particularly in circumstances where the cabinet relies on convention and practice, um, w what the source of that error is and um, how it is that the department retains that historical knowledge that you know, would give um, foundation to the conventions and practices in the event of another court court matter. So, Senator, um, I, I'm not across the detail of the argument. Um, I'm just obviously trying to get some advice. Um, what I'd like to do is actually speak with the officers involved and sure. make sure that I have the, 
the facts of the matter in front sure. of me because I'm being advised that Mr. Berger didn't necessarily um, uh, didn't necessarily name that as an error, and so you've obviously indicated to me that it is. I'd like to get those facts straight before I respond. He, he agreed. He agreed to change the words "appointed as a member of" uh, to being asked to attend. attend. So, uh, quite a distinction between. Yeah, it, it was in the in the circumstances of a case where, for example, the claim is made that the AHPPC is part of the thing that you refer to as National Cabinet. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a group of doctors. Senator, let me get um, some more detail. Yeah, and I, okay, sure. So, the, in some sense, I don't want. I'm not trying to prosecute the the issue here. I just. I'm just trying to understand how you retain that knowledge, um, at, at, well, and maybe that goes to the source of where the where the original statement came from. Uh, have we got the right library uh, inside the department that looks, or inside the cabinet um, secretari secretariat that looks, um, uh, to, to make sure that you can uh, have an accurate reflection or description of those practices and, convention, and, and the convention. Yeah, I understand the question sure. very clearly, Senator. I'll look into it. Sure, thank you. Um, as I said, that's not a persecution in any way, shape or form, just uh, trying to work out um, how practice can be made better. Um, just another short issue. Um, it's been reported in the paper that um, Mr... Um, or, or that that Senator Cormann, former Minister Cormann, was approached by Greensills in relation to providing a, a pay service for public, for, for public servants, for 150,000 public servants, whereby they could potentially take an option to receive their pay at any stage, not, not waiting for the, the, the fortnight or the month to, to, uh, to pass. Um, uh, he was approached by uh, Miss Bishop, former Foreign Minister. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone in your department was approached or whether the Prime Minister was approached by Miss Bishop in relation to that Greensill proposal. Senator, I'm not aware of anything. Obviously, if anyone who's listening to me has information, sure. I'm sure they'll come forward, but I don't believe so. All right, so if we take it on notice, that way you can give Certainly. you the time to, for others to, to come to you on, on that issue. And just finally, there's been a question I've had on notice through the Senate for some time that hasn't been answered. And um, uh, some sense of, uh, you know, I, I don't seek to abuse my position here as a senator, relates to a matter that was before the AAT, uh, Patrick and the Secretary Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, AAT uh, 4964. It was a matter in which um, the department were resisting uh, releasing information under FOI that had been the subject of a Section 37 certificate mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the Attorney General. The AAT found that, um, that the information should be released under FOI and I've, I've asked on a couple of occasions for the costs. I understood on the first instance that uh, invoices hadn't been tendered in relation to that matter but that uh, that matter was handed down last year. So I'm just wondering what the total external legal costs of that matter were. So, Senator, I'm advised that um, the department's still working with the Attorney General, with AGS, to mm -hmm. determine the final costs. I'll seek to get some more information for you about why that's taking the time yeah, it is. It just seems, I think, I think that decision was handed down in November last year. Um, so it seems quite a while. I would have thought invoices would have been tendered. Can you give advice as to whether or not um, at some stage during that, those proceedings, a constitutional issue was raised by the department. It was later abandoned, um, and I'm, I just would like to also know whether um, the government sought advice from external counsel, so someone outside of the AGS, or indeed the Solicitor General. Certainly, Senator, I'll, I'll get that information for you. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Senator Kitching. Um, can I just ask um, in relation to Senator Reynolds um, and uh, her reappointment to Cabinet, um, why was she reappointed to Cabinet given 
the comments she made about Ms Higgins, including the lying cow comment. Senator, Senator Kitching, um, uh, Senator Reynolds um, apologised uh, publicly for those remarks and, uh, and um, settled a matter of proceedings uh, between her and, uh, and Ms Higgins in that regard. The Prime Minister made clear he thought uh, that such remarks were unacceptable, um, but ultimately it was uh, uh, a decision of the Prime Minister in relation to uh, the reappointment of uh, Senator Reynolds and, uh, and her suitability for, the, uh, for uh, service in the Cabinet and the portfolio. So it was sort of unacceptable, but acceptable to be reappointed? No. Um, Prime Minister expected uh, Senator Reynolds to apologise, uh, which she willingly did. Um, is that the only... So uh, the Prime Minister saying those comments were unacceptable, Senator Reynolds apologised. Is that the only sanction that's been applied to Senator Reynolds? Um, uh, I say Senator Reynolds is, uh, as I understand, um, uh, privately settled a, uh, a legal matter with Ms Higgins as well. Um, was there any concern from the Prime Minister in relation to how Senator Reynolds or her office responded to the alleged rape in the days and the weeks immediately after? Um, I, well, the Prime Minister has expressed public concern about, um, about him not having been told. Uh, that said, Senator, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, I think the work that Commissioner Jenkins does and the advice that it provides and the standards it sets will become important in terms of how it is that uh, uh, that um, uh, that uh, individuals um, who um, have been subject to offences or have allegations to make um, uh, are supported and empowered in their decision making, including their decisions around to whom they speak and communicate with. And uh, uh, now part of that empowerment process is, uh, is clearly to provide better supports overall to, uh, to ensure that they receive all the advice uh, possible about the options that are available to them uh, and that the supports that will be available to them uh, whilst they pursue those options. Um, part of that as well goes to ensuring that, uh, that people uh, uh, appreciate that they are working in an environment that has a culture that will be supportive of them, uh, of them pursuing um, any allegations appropriately and fully and raising those with appropriate authorities where relevant. And, uh, and that's uh, at the heart of the type of work that uh, Ms Foster has been pursuing and that Commissioner Jenkins will build upon and that uh, uh, the new support services that are in place try to provide a, a step in relation to achieving that, um, uh, that improved culture and better series of practices to be able to uh, to uh, to um, support it and underpin it. Thank you. As you were speaking, I was thinking that really the only person who's lost something, including the job that she late, you know, later said in an interview that she loved, she's the only person who's really lost anything. She's lost that job. No one else lost their job. So I'm glad that you, you know, better support services are being put into place. But it's a bit late for Ms Higgins, don't you think? Um, as, uh, Are you going to re-employ her? Will the Star Chamber re-employ her? I'm, I'm not aware that, that Ms Higgins wants that, Senator Kitching. Um, uh, certainly, as you've heard, the Prime Minister expressed his sorrow at, uh, at the events and circumstances when he met with her. Um, yeah, I think everybody would wish that, uh, that Ms Higgins had in her first discussions with the police that occurred uh, in the days or weeks after the incident um, felt that uh, she was 
in a position uh, and an environment uh, uh, to be able to proceed at that time with the uh, complaint that she has subsequently worked through with the AFP. Um, and amidst all of the discussions we've had here today about uh, ensuring that culture and practices in this place um, are as good as they possibly can be and set, uh, set a positive example for the nation. And it is important also to acknowledge that, uh, that there is a serious criminal investigation that, uh, that is underway uh, and that, uh, that I'm sure we would all uh, wish has every chance of uh, successfully proceeding as well. You mentioned the defamation action um, that was settled um, <clears throat> and that Senator Reynolds paid an undisclosed sum of money. Were there any, um, and it has been publicly stated by Senator Reynolds that she met the costs of, the, of that litigation or that sort of settlement, it didn't get to litigation, but were there any meetings, anything with government solicitors, um, any meetings where the PMO or perhaps PMC took legal advice in relation to the defamation proceedings brought by Ms Higgins? Were there any costs outlaid other by the government, by, by the Commonwealth, um, other than Mr, perhaps Mr Reid is able to help, but um, were there any other costs met by the Commonwealth in relation to those defamation proceedings? Senator, the department has no role at all in uh, this yeah. matter. And there no, are, there, no there, arrangements? There, there, are, there, there, there were no costs outlaid or incurred in relation to those defamation proceedings by the Commonwealth, to my knowledge, Senator Kitching, no meetings, to my knowledge, in terms of uh, discussions with, uh, uh, with government solicitors or otherwise. I will take it on notice to double check for you, Senator Kitching. I'm answering to the best of my knowledge based on all of the um, information that I've been provided, but I think Senator Reynolds has been yeah. clear that, uh, I mean, that I, she met all of those costs herself. Uh, I ask because obviously some workplaces would indemnify particularly key persons, for example. So I ask, that's why I ask if there was any, um, you know, an outlay of any money on behalf of Senator Reynolds given that it occurred within her work, the defamatory comments. Yep. You're right there, Senator Kitching, and, uh, and, um, and it may have been the case that there may have been an entitlement uh, if uh, somebody had wished to access it in relation to those defamation proceedings. Um, but uh, uh, but um, obviously, Senator Reynolds made the decision to, uh, to fund those proceedings uh, entirely herself. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, Ms Foster, I've got some questions for you about the uh, appointment of Mr Minister Porter to a different role um, in the Morrison government. Um, in March, uh, Mr Morrison told the House of Representatives that he'd sought and received advice from the Solicitor General about the scope of Mr Porter's responsibilities in light of his private defamation action. I think, um, I think that was on the 24th of March. Did the department prepare the request for advice? Uh, no, Senator. So do you know who prepared that request for advice? Did it come from the PMO or...? My assumption would be the Prime Minister's office, Senator, but all I can say with certainty is it was not the department. Is that unusual? No, Senator. Are you, do you know what advice, or have you been told what advice was sought? Senator, um, where the PMO seeks advice on matters relating to the PMO, there is no requirement and nor is it their practice to come through us. But have they provided you or Mr. Reid with a um, with request for advice? A request for advice on when, when they sought advice from the, Solicitor, from the General. Solicitor General, have you been provided with a copy of that request for advice? So, Senator, um, Mr Gaitchen's received a copy of the Solicitor General's advice, therefore we clearly 
that came so you know with what the was, request what for advice. advice was provided? We know what advice was yes. provided um, uh, because, as the Prime Minister indicated publicly, he sought Mr Gaitchen's advice in relation to the statement of ministerial standards. Yes, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but you don't know and Mr Reid doesn't know what, what advice was sought? Well, so, so Senator, that's a, what apart I was, from the knowledge that you gleaned from having seen the That's what I was trying advice. to explain. The, yes. the request was inher inherent in the response, but no, we didn't see the request for advice. As Do you know what the date the advice General. was sought on? From the Solicitor General? Uh, no, Senator, I don't believe so. That's no. not in the advice that you were provided? And you don't know whether the request was made verbally or in writing? I don't know that, Senator. Do you know what information the Prime Minister um, provided to the Solicitor General when seeking that advice? No, Senator. Our engagement, our involvement in this came at the point that we were provided with the Senate Solicitor General's advice for the purpose of Mr Gaitchen's advice. Okay. So, and what date did that advice arrive? Uh, Senator, that was the 25th of March. So the Prime Minister says on the 24th of March, I am considering that advice with my department secretary in terms of the application against the ministerial guidelines. So, Senator, we were aware that we were going to be requested to do it, but we formally got the request on the 25th. Yes, but you, you got the advice on the 25th. The day before that, the Prime Minister claims that he's got the advice and he's considering it. How, 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 do, how do you explain that? Senator, I don't have the Prime Minister's words in front of me. Well, I'm happy to um, provide them. They're in... He says... Um, in response to a question from Mr Albanese, which ends, is the Prime Minister preparing to make his Attorney General a part-time minister or is he preparing to drop him altogether? Mr Morrison says, I am considering that advice with my Department Secretary. Sorry, I should say at the beginning. Mr Albanese says, the Prime Minister has confirmed that he has received advice from the Solicitor General about the Attorney General's portfolio responsibilities. He has also confirmed that he has sought advice from his department in relation to the Attorney General and ministerial standards. Is the Prime Minister preparing to make his Attorney General a part-time minister or is he preparing to drop him altogether? Mr Morrison says at the outset, I am considering that advice with my department secretary in terms of the application against the ministerial guidelines. If the advice didn't arrive till the day after, how is it that he's considering the advice? Um, Senator, I, I would obviously prefer to see all of that in context and to be able to look at that in relation to the information I have, um, uh, rather than speculate on, on how, that could, how that could be. Um, would you be able to I, um, come would, back to us later in the day? I'd, I'm reluctant to give you my little slice of handsight here because it's got all my other questions on either side of it. I can have someone um, pull the handsight for me. Process, Senator. It would. Um, it would. We could I, do it all by circular correspondence. Are you in a position, uh, Senator Birmingham, to resolve that dissonance for us? No, no I'm not the Senator is. Um, uh, I understand you're posing a question on the basis of what you perceive to be uh, an inconsistency between dates of when a statement was made and when advice was received. Um, uh, I don't. I don't. So, have... okay. So you'll come back to us later in the day about this. So the, I will, the... Senator. But I mean, I can imagine a situation where the the Prime Minister is saying he is considering the advice, and that he will do so in consultation with his departmental secretary and those two things have been conflated. But I will have a look at it closely and look at the facts that I've got and come back to you. Yeah, I, I am considering the advice. It's like briefing. I was wondering, as Senator Birmingham was, it was a, I thought it was a term of art briefing. It was either a term of art or he'd rung Mr Kunkel in the middle of his briefing. Um, 
And it turns out it wasn't a term of art. Um, he must have been in the middle of briefing the Prime Minister. Uh, considering advice does seem to, to me to denote that you've got the advice. It's very difficult to consider something before one is provided with it. Certainly, Senator. I'll have a look at the, the, the Hansard and, and the facts I have. So the advice that the Prime Minister claimed that he'd received on the 24th was provided on the 25th. Did it go straight to the Prime Minister or did it come through the department? Uh, so, Senator, um, the Prime Minister, my understanding, had advice from the Solicitor General before that advice, before that date. He provided that to the Secretary on the 25th of March and Mr Gaitchens provided his advice back to the Prime Minister for consideration by the Governance Committee of Cabinet on the 27th of March. So that may, that may um, indeed be how you resolve the question that we are just asking, that is, was the advice provided directly to the Prime Minister? who then provided to Mr Gaitchens, or did it come through the department in the first instance? That's So, Senator, I, I think we're getting confused about the two advices. If we're talking about the Solicitor General's advice, yes, we are. that was provided from memory by letter from the Prime Minister. No, no, when it came to us. So, um, when the, so the Solicitor General's advice was provided to the Prime Minister in his office, it was then provided by the Prime Minister to Mr Gaitchens with a request for Mr Gaitchens to provide advice in relation to the ministerial standards. And so the Prime Minister had the Solicitor General's advice on the date that you're talking about. He received Mr Gaitchens' advice based on the Solicitor General's advice on the question of the application of the ministerial standards on the 27th of March. So before we come to Mr Gaitchens' advice, presumably informed by the Solicitor General's advice. So there's legal advice from the Solicitor General, a political and management overlay from Mr Gaitchens. Oh, no, um, Senator, the, re the request to Mr Gaitchens was the application of the ministerial standards. It's not much difference in my experience with this, um, with this show, but what, what was the advice from the Solicitor General? What did it say? Uh, Senator, I don't have that detail in my head, but I also believe that the advice, um, certainly our advice was provided for the consideration of the Governance Committee of Cabinet, and so I would not be in a position to discuss that. So is that and the claim that the advice about what roles Mr Porter could play is Cabinet in confidence? That's, is that the claim? That so, so, Senator, um, Typically, when we provide advice um, around the ministerial standards or conflicts of interest, it is provided for consideration of the Governance Committee of Cabinet. Well, what ministerial responsibilities could Mr Porter not undertake while he was suing the ABC for defamation? Um, Senator, I think that goes to the content of the advice, which I've just said I'm not in a position to discuss. So is that really the government's position, Minister, that, um, that, that the role of a cabinet minister is constrained in some respects because of the defamation action that they have undertaken, but it's a secret what, what role Mr Minister Porter could no longer play? Uh, well, Senator Reyes, um, legal advice uh, was uh, well. Yes, as, I, I accept a, a, I, as was publicly uh, made clear, and uh, and that advice um, is likely to carry legal privilege with it. Um, the advice also, given the nature of these matters, was uh, was sought as part of the, the processes of the Governance Committee of Cabinet. The Prime Minister sought the advice to um, to assess where any potential for conflicts of interest uh, or perceptions of conflicts of interest may exist. Um, obviously, the Prime Minister uh, subsequently uh, made certain decisions and Mr Minister Porter is no longer the Attorney General. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about around the 24th and 25th of March when a decision was made about what roles Minister Porter could no longer play. Now, I've heard Ms Foster Apparently the legal advice is 
cabinet in confidence, are you really saying the decision based upon the legal advice, that is, the things that Minister Porter would be restrained from doing, that that's also cabinet in confidence? So, Senator, the basis of um the advice from Mr Gaitchens to the Prime Minister was indeed for the consideration of the Government's Cabinet of Committee and therefore his Cabinet in confidence. Everything's a secret with this show when it's not in Mr Morrison's interests. Senator. We said, we said, Senator, the Prime Minister put in place a proper process on this yeah, I, I bet he did. On this matter. Ensured that the process uh, protected himself. He put in place a proper process on this matter and Minister Porter is no longer the Attorney-General following the Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll come to that. that. Um, the what, Prime Minister what, assessed. Senator Ayres, uh, Ms Foster, what role did Mr Gaitchens play in determining Minister Porter's, uh, Mr. Porter's ministerial functions? So, Senator, um, Mr Gaitchens plays no role in determining his um, ministerial appointment. His role is to provide advice to the Prime Minister on the application of the ministerial standards or the statement of ministerial standards. Um, he did that, as I said, on the 27th of March. And on the 29th of March, the Prime Minister announced the proposed changes and said that this fully addresses all of the issues that relate to the advice release received from the Solicitor General, as well as the advice received from the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet regarding the ministerial guidelines. In that period from the 24th through to the 29th, did you have a role as well, Ms Foster? Uh, so, Senator, uh, I and my team assisted um, in the preparation of the advice for Mr Gaitchens to provide to the Prime Minister. Did Mr Gaitchens um, tell the Prime Minister that Mr Porter had to be dumped as Attorney-General? Uh, Senator, that goes to the content of the advice, which I've indicated I'm unable to discuss. It was unsustainable, wasn't it, Minister? Well, Senator, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister, uh, to ensure a precautionary approach was taken, sought advice about um, the potential for conflict of interest or perceptions of conflict of interest to exist. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, in reflecting on all matters, including uh, no doubt that advice, made the decision that, uh, that sees, uh, sees Minister Porter no longer as the Attorney General. So has Mr Morrison sought advice from the Solicitor General before he reappointed Mr Porter to his Cabinet as Minister for Industry? Senator, I'm sure the Prime Minister was cognizant of, uh, of all the advice in relation uh, to these matters um, when he made decisions about the ministerial reshuffle and, uh, and ensuring uh, the avoidance of any potential or perceived conflicts of interest. Ms Foster? Are you aware of whether advice was sought about um, Mr Porter's appointment as Industry Minister? Senator, I'm aware only of the two pieces of advice um, that the Prime Minister provided, which were just two, um, two separate pieces of advice on the same topic um, from is... the Solicitor General, which I've just indicated were provided to us on the 25th of March. And, and they went to his role as then as Attorney General, did they? So, Senator, I'm not in a position to discuss the question or the answer in that advice. So you can't tell me whether it was already contemplated on the 25th that Mr Porter would be appointed as the Industry Minister? No, I can't, Senator. So you can't tell me whether there's advice about Mr Porter's role as Minister for Industry? Has, has, has advice been received about his role as Minister for Industry? Senator, I can tell you the Prime Minister is confident, based on the advice that he sought and received, that the Minister is able to perform his functions in the new portfolio uh, without risk of conflict or undue perceptions of conflict. Well, as Industry Minister can Mr Porter participate in Cabinet discussions about the ABC? Well, Minister, Senator, um, all Ministers uh, need to be mindful in relation to any potential conflicts they have as part of Cabinet discussions. And, uh, and I have no doubt that, uh, that the uh, Industry Minister and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary uh, are mindful in relation to those matters. Well, I'm none the wiser after that. 
can he or can he not participate in cabinet discussions about the ABC? They are his opponent in this very high profile, very expensive legal matter. Can he participate in cabinet discussions about the future of the ABC? Senator, I can assure you that, uh, that as a cabinet minister in uh, terms of such discussions that, uh, that Minister Porter, uh, like all ministers, is managing uh, any potential conflicts or perceptions of conflicts appropriately. So you, you cannot give an assurance here that Minister Porter is not engaged in cabinet discussions about the future of the ABC? I, can, I am assuring you that he is managing any potential conflicts or potential perceptions of conflicts appropriately. Correct to the cabinet, or to the PM, I assume. Mm. Did did that occur? Um, my understanding, Senator, and of course it's disclosed on the public record uh, in this relation to. So, uh, or you can be excused. You can decline to participate. So, which of the options did he? Did he did the first. Like he disclosed his con potential conflict of interest well, in relation to well, the ABC, or not? Well, well, I I wasn't aware that I was being asked about a particular incident. Is well, I'll, I'll come to the particular incident, but, but has so, he disclosed? So, so, as far as I'm aware, Mr Porter has made all appropriate disclosures and obviously his... Um, his uh, Have you made inquiries about that? His, uh, Have you satisfied yourself that that's the case? I, uh, Senator, um, uh, these matters are so much on the public record in terms of his defamation case with the ABC. I'm, fairly confident, but I will double check in terms of the communications that he has had with the Prime Minister, uh, of which uh, clearly uh, there have been some. And did, I'll make um, sure that did, also relates to appropriate sorry, yeah, disclosure. Yeah. I might, um, I think um, I might take a break from this and come back to um, the ABC matter. Senator Wong? If, 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 if we're at an interval, um, uh, I would table for the committee uh, the report from Dr Kunkel that I understand has been tabled in the House of Representatives. Thank you. I wonder what it says. Thank you, uh, Chair. Actually, uh, Senator Birmingham, I have some questions on uh, Dr Kunkel's report, um, which I've had the opportunity to just read. And can I just say, it reads like an exercise in professional smear to me. Firstly, it report, the report amplifies the smears against Ms Higgins' partner by using her own, the content of her own complaint. And secondly, it seems to blame journalists uh, for the backgrounding or for originating the backgrounding. That's what this report well, I don't even want to call it a report. I don't think it is a report. It's an exercise in professional smear. And after being lectured all morning about protections for personal privacy, this was tabled in the House for the first time publicly releasing the smear that was used against Ms Higgins' partner for everyone to see without her permission and without her knowledge. So we will not take lectures from the government on the protection of private information who this morning wouldn't even tell us if people had been interviewed because they were so concerned about protecting staff's privacy. Meanwhile, Mr Shiraz's privacy has been thrown out the window and tabled by the Prime Minister for everyone to see without even being afforded the forewarning that this was coming. And it's exactly as I said it would be. No wonder it's publicly released, because it exonerates the Prime Minister and his office. But if you read the fine print, instead of using the word backgrounding, we have new terms, corridor conversations. Corridor conversations. So there is an acknowledgement in this report that this was going on. But what a surprise. None of it can be held back to the Prime Minister's office. It was the journalists themselves that generated the backgrounding. So, 
Senator. I'm I shocked. S Senator. Or, sh or am I? I? This is what I predicted. But I didn't actually think you would print and table in the parliament the actual smear that was used against Mr Shiraz and put it in a way that has Miss Higgins responsible for that because it uses her complaint. And, and nobody even bothered to tell her. She gets sent an email at quarter past two going, by the way, the Prime Minister's tabled this in the Australian Parliament. And we're to think this is some sort of credible exercise in independent investigation. What a load of rubbish. But again, deeply hurtful to the people that supposedly it was being conducted to protect. You know, the depths this Prime Minister will go to, honestly, just when you think you couldn't go low enough, this gets tabled. Surprise, surprise, found in the negative, nothing to see here. It was your fault and it was your fault. It was never the Prime Minister's responsibility ever. Nothing ever happens or nothing. He is never responsible for anything that happens in his office. But the background did, did happen. We know it happened. Corridor conversations were had. Uh, supposedly it was the journalists asking the PMO questions about Mr Shiraz. And according to this, the Prime Minister's office referred them appropriately to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Do you think anyone believes that? And then a whole paragraph about Mr Shiraz, his previous two employers, raising concerns about his work ethic, essentially. So repeat, repeat the smear, formalise it in a few pages and table it in the Australian Parliament and then expect the whole caravan to move on. Nothing to see here. Prime Minister's clear, did nothing. We've, we've investigated ourselves. The Chief of Staff's investigated at the Prime Minister's office and we found it's everyone else's fault. So there are no consequences, I take it, from this, Senator Birmingham. So, Senator. Uh, Dr Kunkel has, as this report indicates, interviewed senior members of the PMO media team, interviewed members of the parliamentary press gallery. No member of the press gallery has been able to substantiate any first-hand activity of the allegations that have been made. So in terms of the re amplification of the smear against Mr Shiraz, which appears at the top of page three, which has now got parliamentary privilege. And I'll just note, there's a lot of protection of staff. We're not allowed to know if taxpayers are funding their lawyers in relation to the Gaitons review. We weren't allowed to be told who was interviewed, but people are happy to table in the federal parliament, something which goes to Mr Shiraz's last two employers. You think that's so, appropriate? So, so, Senator Wong, I stand to be corrected, but, uh, but uh, I was of the understanding that, uh, that such matters were already on the public record in various uh, uh, publications or online journeys. This so that makes it, it. Well, <laughs> I think, well, I mean, first, I mean, these, first, these, these were the allegations. Well, well uh, so, and there's, uh, there's stuff on the public record about members of the Prime Minister's staff who these, knew. These. But you, 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 they get protection. In fact, they get lawyers that are taxpayer funded. Mr Shiraz gets the Prime Minister taping a letter from his Chief of Staff in the Federal Parliament, subject to prior parliamentary privilege, which makes these assertions. Can you tell me why you think that was appropriate? Well, these, these were the allegations that Dr Kunkel was responding to and looking I, into. Well, th this level of detail. Th did, did you... I, I, I stand to be corrected, but this is a greater level of detail. But my next, so I'm asking you why it's inappropriate, why it's appropriate. I'm also asking you to confirm that Ms Higgins did not give consent or permission for the, her interview to be used in this way. I'll have to take that on notice, Senator Wong. Well, she didn't. It's amazing. You. I can answer that she question on notice. I mean, it's, it's... She wasn't even told this report was coming. 
She got it sent to her after it was tabled in the parliament by Dr Kunkel saying this has just been tabled in the parliament. It just appears that the Prime Minister and others around him are prepared to walk all over an alleged rape victim and her partner in order to protect their reputations. Senator, I don't accept that. Allegations were made. Dr Kunkel has sought <coughs> to ascertain the veracity of those allegations. Nobody has been able to substantiate those allegations in relation well, to the investigation. That's your assertion. I think it's pretty clear from the document all that's happened is yes, the allegations were out there, the discussion was out there, but what the report tries to do, as Senator Gallagher says, is to blame journalists for it. Well, so it's so they raised it magically. So Just Senator independently raised it. Senator, the report seeks to reflect the information that was provided to Dr. Kunkel. Uh, and that information includes what? the fact that there was uh, nobody able to provide well, I'll come to that. first hand experience. Why? why? Well, that's, I, don't, I don't agree with your assertion, and I think a plain reading of the report demonstrates you know, quite, a, quite a studied sleight of hand about how to deal with the fact that these issues were out there. They magically appear because journalists raised them. Um, but I want to come back again to this. Um, can you tell me uh, why it was appropriate to use Ms Higgins' own account in this letter, now tabled, this report now tabled, gaining parliamentary privilege, to amplify and provide further details of the smear against her partner? Sen Senator, they were the allegations that oh. were being investigated as well, a Why was it needed to, to, to go through the, I mean, I don't even want to read it, but it's on there for everyone to see. Assertions about Mr Shiraz, which are uh, supposedly from the discussion with Ms Higgins, been included in this without her, her consent. Can you tell me why that's appropriate? Senator, I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of, the, um, of the consent undertakings that were provided in, well, hang, uh, in hang terms on. of... No, 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 this is not about a contractual point. No. It's about an ethical point. Right? Whether or not there was undertakings or non-undertakings or people... I'm asking you. Prime Minister's asked whether or not his staff background against an alleged rape victim's partner in order, in order... The purpose of it, let's remember, doesn't come out of the ether. The purpose of it was to cast some doubt on her, her activities, on her behaviour in coming forward. So it was, it was quite malicious, we, the way in which it was ostensibly used. You're, now, you're, leave, you're, 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 you're asserting that it Yeah, I am. I am asserting that, because I don't understand why else you'd do it. And I think it was pretty clear. But we, whether or not... Um, there's any contractual or legal undertakings about confidentiality. Leave that aside for the moment. I'm asking you whether you think it's ethical. She, she's speaking to Dr Kunkel. She says this is what happened. He then puts all of that in the report, mm. which is tabled in the parliament without her consent, amplifying the, the smear against her partner. Why is that ethical? So, well, Senator, I've only read the report whilst mm. sitting here. Uh, the decisions yeah, so in relation right. to the content of it uh, were clearly decisions taken by Dr Kungle. Um, Dr Kungle, I think, has sought to reflect uh, the conversations that he had with the different parties to whom he engaged, with whom he engaged. Uh, he sought to reflect what it is that he was being asked to investigate. And, uh, and in doing so, this is... Um, part of those conversations and part of what it is that he was being asked to investigate, right. which, as I said before, I think does already exist on the public record. So um, the report says at page two, members of the PMI media team recall that Mr Shiraz's work issue was raised by certain journalists. So is it really the government's position that just magically journalists in the press gallery raise his previous employment? 
That they have well, nothing to do well, with that. Well, Mr Shiraz And that they did not even know work. who Ms Higgins' partner is. Mr Shiraz did previously work in the Parliamentary Press Gallery, Senators. I think uh, that, is, that is well known. It would not be, uh, I would have thought, of a surprise that members of the Press Gallery uh, would um, know, at least, of his uh, employment um, and that that may be a point of comment within the gallery. These questions have been asked previously, but the report, this, this document, this letter to the PM, uh, does refer to questions being referred to PM and C. So, Senator, to my memory, we had one media query um, to which we responded in our standard way um, to provide no information about individual employees if, if you want more specificity. Which is like we're not going to talk about it, essentially. That's right. That, yeah. they, were, they worked here, but we're not going to talk about it. Sorry, Senator. They worked here, but we're not going to talk about I it. I don't believe we even confirmed that um, oh, right. Mr so Shiraz just, okay. worked so here. So the, 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 I think the assertion response... of his, the description of him as, quote, disgruntled, end quote, doesn't come from PM and C. It certainly doesn't. No. Start. So no. who does it come from? Does it just drop down from the heavens, does it? Sorry, the assertion Senator, he's the, disgruntled. The assertion. Yes, what? this is contained in the in here in this, in this. I don't even want to call it report. No. How did Dr. Cuttle yeah. know that he was disgruntled? I think, uh, I think Senator, that uh, the. paragraph that you are quoting is a paragraph reflecting the allegations that Ms Higgins It's amazing, isn't it? Dr Kunkel. Yeah. It is amazing. So basically it's Ms Higgins is portraying him as disgruntled in the document, is used to portray him as disgruntled, and journalists are the ones who, spread, who, who are backgrounding each other. It's quite a remarkable feat. Senator, I don't Except a characterisation there, but there's no the other way to look at it. Like <laughs> this, Dr. Kunkel has been given an, a job, an exercise in how not to make the PMO responsible for what went on that week, and that's this report here. And the way he's done it is to blame journalists and to take Ms. Higgins' complaint and insert it into this document, knowing it's going to be publicly released, to make her the mouthpiece of the concerns around her partner. Like, it is an extraordinary effort, a, the lowest of the low, but an extraordinary effort in making sure that the Prime Minister is not responsible for anything and that there are no consequences for what happened in this building. Everyone knows the backgrounding was going on. It doesn't making, just come out of the ether. It doesn't just wander down the corridor. It's like it was happening, but Senator, everyone else is responsible. Senator, you're making that assertion. The individual in question was well known That's what this already says. across the parliamentary press gallery. That's not what it says. The individual in question was well known across the parliamentary press gallery, having worked in the parliamentary press gallery alongside members of the parliamentary press gallery. Dr Kunkel spoke to members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery and was not able to find anyone who was able to provide first-hand experience of any Amazing. such activity. Well, they had one, didn't they? That, the, no. By so, the first, that there was an individual who, was, who then withdrew, and it would be interesting to get some answers as to what conversations, if any, occurred between members of the government and the, and the um, journalist concerned prior to that occurring. Uh, but <laughs> uh, it's very careful language, isn't it? No member of the press gallery interviewed in this process recounted or was in a position to substantiate first-hand experience of such activity by the PMO media team. But it does acknowledge one person did come forward but then withdrew. 
be interesting to work out why. It does confirm that there were corridor conversations. It does confirm that there was a passing conversation with a member of the press gallery in which the P it was said the PMO had reflected on Mr Shiraz's work history. And it does confirm, it does assert that the members of the PMO media team recalled that Mr Shiraz's work history was raised by certain journalists. And Senator, this with an individual who was well known across the parliamentary press gallery, having worked as a member of it alongside members of the parliamentary press gallery. It wasn't an investigation into Mr Shiraz, it was an investigation into who was gossiping about Mr Shiraz. And it's turned into a smear against Mr Shiraz. Why wasn't Ms Higgins given a copy of this before it was tabled? Why wasn't Mr Shiraz given the courtesy of any advance warning that this was going to be tabled today? Senator, I believe they were provided, to, or Ms Higgins was provided with information concurrent with its tabling. Um, and when I sat down here... Concurrent? When I sat down here an hour ago... Do you think that's uh, You were enough? asking me why I wasn't telling you what was in this report at the time. And we asked you whether Ms Higgins was going to be advised. So we weren't saying release out to the general public without going through proper process. We were asking when it would be tabled and whether she would be advised. We asked that. She got it after and that after it got tabled. Why? Why was that considered appropriate? Senator, we've spent most of the day asking for these things to be made public. Uh, the government has made this public um, following the conclusion of the work, uh, which has not been able to corroborate the allegations that had been made. Yeah, that does not answer my question about why Ms Higgins was not advised this was happening today and that her and her partner would be included in a report that was going to be tabled in the parliament without any knowledge or forewarning. Why, why was that considered appropriate by the Prime Minister? Unless he was trying to, yet again, politically manage a problem, which he clearly sees Ms Higgins as a political problem to manage. Otherwise, she would have been afforded the same protections that we got lectured about by Ms. Mr Gaitchens, who was so, um, you know, at full speed about protecting everyone's privacy, we weren't even allowed to know who was being interviewed, or how many were being interviewed, not even who was, this morning, and yet this is fair game. Sen Sen Senator, this investigation was undertaken, at least in part, at the request uh, of Ms Higgins. <laughs> because the Prime Minister wouldn't answer a question So you're doing her a favour today? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, the, the out really is... Senator Smith's just reminded me of this. I think the out really is... Um, I don't... In the context of an inquiry, such a finding of negative briefing would be based on hearsay, some second or third hand, and the evidence before me falls well short of the standard that would be needed to arrive at such a finding in conformity with due process. So he's, he's basically saying, yes, there was scuttlebutt, corridor conversations, journalists magically raised it. One journalist does say someone else told her or him that PMO was doing it, but you know, it's all second and third hand, so I can't make a finding. It's pretty good, isn't it? They stay in the shadows. Senator, as Dr Kunkel has clearly laid out, he's not been able to find anyone who can substantiate first-hand activity. Now, he has uh, clearly reinforced expectations of staff uh, as a result uh, of this process. I'd ask, um, have you tabled this letter here? Uh, I, yes, just, as, just before, Senator. Go back to Mr Porter. Okay. 
So I asked you a series of questions, um, Ms Foster and Minister, uh, before that um, last discussion, uh, where you said, in effect, I think both of you said that, that legal advice about the matters that uh, Minister Porter would be required to recuse himself from while he was Attorney General, a cabinet in confidence. The decisions about what he would be required to recuse himself from when he was Attorney General, cabinet in confidence. Whether or not, in fact, there was legal advice about managing his conflicts of interest uh, upon his appointment as, as industry minister, as cabinet in confidence. I, I still don't understand what you said, Minister Birmingham, in response to my question about discussions about the ABC. Can I ask you a more particular question then, as we go from the general to the particular? There was a cabinet meeting on the 17th of May that approved the appointment of, I think it's three, three new board directors for the ABC. Did Mr Porter participate in that cabinet meeting? Uh, my recollection, which I will double check for the record, is that Mr Porter absented himself from that discussion. Can, can you confirm that with us later on in the day? Certainly, Senator. So he's absented himself from that discussion? Yes, Senator. That's my what about cabinet deliberations about federal court and high court matters, including appointments? Um, I will double check in that uh, in that relation, uh, Senator Ayres. I just can't quite recall in terms of. Can he participate in cabinet deliberations about the workplace culture at Parliament House and the support available to building occupants, including ministerial staff? Sorry, Senator Ayres. Can he participate in cabinet deliberations about workplace culture in Parliament House and the protections afforded to ministerial staff? Well. Senator, now, now you're starting to, to run a, a hypothetical there. Um, well, I assume there have been discussions at Cabinet level about these matters. Is Mr Porter able to participate in those discussions? I think at the time, um, in terms of reference and process and so on around the Jenkins review was settled, um, was at the time that, uh, that Mr Porter was on leave. So, um, advice was sought from the Solicitor General on Minister Porter's responsibilities. Why didn't Mr Morrison seek independent advice from the Solicitor General on whether there should be an independent inquiry into the serious allegations of sexual harassment, of sexual assault made against Minister Porter? I think, uh, I think the Prime Minister has addressed uh, those matters uh, clearly, that the appropriate investigatory bodies for such allegations are relevant police services. And that's where, it, that's where it rests, is it? For such allegations, the appropriate skilled and independent investigatory bodies are police services. End of the matter as far as um, the Prime Minister and yourself are concerned. Senator, that, that is the place where such appropriate skilled and independent ability rests for such investigations. There is nothing that the Prime Minister will take responsibility for resolving, is there? Mm. We just heard this uh, last exercise, a thuggish blame the victim exercise. On this matter, Mr Porter's matter, we won't take responsibility for conducting an investigation, we'll leave it to the police, is that right? No. Senator, uh, um, police are the appropriate investigatory body for such matters, and courts are the appropriate vehicle to determine such matters. Is Mr Porter managing his defamation case in his own time? As far as I'm aware, Senator. Have you made inquiries? Just the, you're the Prime Minister's representative here. Have you made inquiries to satisfy yourself that Mr Porter isn't using taxpayers' time to manage this enormous defamation exercise? I'll take that on notice, Senator. Has Mr Morrison authorised any leave for Mr Porter in association with his defamation action? No, I'll take that on notice, Senator. 
You don't know whether he's authorised leave for, mi for Minister Porter? No. Minister Porter had a period of leave. Yes, I'm. Um, uh, that, uh, that but was, since uh, then, that was since the defamation well action, I'm not aware of any other leave that has been authorised. A Commonwealth resource has been used by Mr. Porter in connection with his case, his telephone, his office facilities, his emails, his staff. I'm, uh, as the minister has made clear, he's funding this action um, privately. Uh, that, uh, that I am sure he is managing his resources appropriately. He's funding it privately. That is, uh, that is what I understand has been said. Does that mean he's not. funding it himself? I don't know, Senator. Hmm. Is the Commonwealth meeting any direct costs in association with Mr. Mr Porter's defamation action? No, Senator. But you'll come well, back to sorry, me about... Sorry, aside from... Obviously, the ABC's costs. The statement of ministerial standards requires ministers to comply with an additional obligation to declare interest to the Prime Minister. That's right, isn't it? Yes, Senator. If you're saying additional to, uh, uh, to the expectations on members of parliament and senators in terms of their declarations to the chambers. If a minister was receiving free or discounted legal services, they would need to declare it to the Prime Minister, wouldn't they? Um, Senator, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure what you mean by free or discounted in, uh, in that sense as to well, what you mean, what I mean pro bono is type legal services or... Yes, I mean free, cheaper than usual, or is somebody footing the bill? Three, three, so, or, or, or well, the fourth I, option is that I, he's paying for it all himself. Right. For those first three, there is a requirement, isn't there, for an interest to be declared? Um, I think I'd take it on notice in terms of considering... Um, well, come to Mr in, Minister Porter's in terms of actual in terms circumstances. Of, in terms of considering the implications of, uh, of pro bono legal services, um, that's not an unusual contractual... You can't seriously suggest that a minister receiving free legal services doesn't have an obligation to declare. Well, pro bono or cheaper legal, legal arrangement services. that uh, that um, that may involve uh, payment occurring uh, dependent upon a result of a proceeding uh, is not an unusual uh, commercial arrangement. It's not a gift in uh, in the sense of a gift, there, Senator. It has a uh, those types of services have a uh, have a well, uh, pro bono payment. Pro bono doesn't mean fee is not the same as no, it's not. So it depends on on the nature of so, such arrangements. So You're asking free, me hypothetical questions there. If you if you want an analysis of the different scenarios, I'll take that on notice and do my best to, uh, to see uh, how it might be interpreted. Has, um, has Mr Porter declared any free or discounted legal services to the Prime Minister, either in relation to the allegations of serious sexual assault made against him and or his private defamation action? Uh, unless officials have any uh, record, um, I don't. Not to my knowledge, Senator. And, and would you normally be in a position to know whether those declarations have been made? <laughs> Senator, the normal process is that we would provide um, advice to the Prime Minister on the management of conflicts of interest or, or ministerial standards issues. Um, obviously, we'd need to look at the specifics of any particular so if a declaration had been made within a matter of days, it would be with you to give advice about how the declaration would be dealt with. Is that colloquially a way of describing it? In the usual course of events, Senator. And you're not yeah, aware I, of... I, I imagine if it required advice. If it required advice. Yes, but you would know about it because it, you, you would have been asked about the declaration. So, Senator, I, I'd like to actually talk through with my staff whether there are circumstances where, for example, that... Um, a conflict might be managed directly between the Minister and the Prime Minister, just um, 
let me, me clarify that situation. But, but you're not aware of a declaration having been made. We'll come to the possibility that it could be made without it being... I'm not aware of a declaration aware of being it. made in relation to pro bono or reduced, reduced legal... And it's hard to fees. imagine in this circumstance if a declaration had been made that it would give rise to the sort of circumstances that you're anticipating, you know, that you want to discuss with your staff. I, I just want to make sure, Senator, because these are obviously quite technical issues, um, that I'm providing you with the correct information. OK, and you'll come back to us. I will, Senator. OK. Um, how much time have we got before the break, Chair? About 20 minutes, Senator S. We're due to break at 3.45. I, um, I have a few questions uh, in relation to the Prime Minister's relationship with the Royal Australian Air Force Number 34 Squadron which operates the special purpose aircraft fleet. Is there an officer besides you, Ms Foster, who Ask can... Mr Martin to come to the I table thought it might to be assist. Mr Martin. I could tell from the sorrowful look on his face as he got out of his chair for the first time today. Senator Jared Martin, First Assistant Secretary, Ministerial Support Division. Thanks, Mr. Martin. Uh, who manages the Prime Minister's relationship with 34 Squadron? Is it the Department or the PMO? Uh, for do domestic travel, for international travel, I should say, Senator, the Department is generally the, the point of contact. For domestic travel, it's generally through the Minister for Defence's office. And. Um, has, who in the office manages the relationship? Uh, normally, Senator, that would be um, someone from the, the program team who manages the, depart the, the Prime Minister's um, schedule, who would be in, in touch with either the department or the relevant minister's office. Has the Prime Minister's office or the department provided Number 34 Squadron with any advice about the Prime Minister's preference when he travels, or preferences? Uh, Senator, in relation to international travel, I don't think we have provided any specific guidance to 34 Squadron. What about domestic travel? Has advice been provided by the Prime Minister's office or the Prime Minister or the Department? Nothing through the Department, Senator. Any, anything that you're aware of? No, Senator. Has any advice been provided about the Prime Minister's catering preferences or what should be on board when he travels for domestic or international travel? Senator, I might have to take that on notice, but um, not that I'm particularly aware of. Has advice been provided? Um, are, you, are you seriously suggesting you don't know about catering preferences for, you say you manage international travel? So, Senator, generally speaking, um, what happens is that um, if there's an international flight, the RAF will prepare a menu and they will submit that menu through the department to the Prime Minister's office and we'll reflect any comments back. Has advice been provided about arrival arrangements when the Prime Minister's plane lands at an airport? No, Senator. So that hasn't been provided? Not by the department in any case? No, Senator. So generally speaking with international travel, it's a matter for the host country to make the arrangements for the arrival. Um, and, and, and the department doesn't have any involvement in any domestic arrivals. And you or officers of the department haven't provided advice about domestic no, Senator. arrangements when, uh, for when the Prime Minister lands at an airport. Are you aware of any negative feedback provided by Mr Morrison or his office to 34 Squadron? No, Senator. None about our arrival arrangements for the Prime Minister? Not that I'm aware of, Senator. So can you explain how arrival arrangements are settled? You're saying for, for domestic travel. Are you saying that the department has no role? That's correct. 
It's, it's the Prime Minister's office who determines the arrival arrangements. He's got a team of advances, and it's... Yes, Senator, that's correct. So it would be the team of advances and the Prime Minister's office who would be involved in establishing arrival arrangements for the Prime Minister's aircraft? Generally speaking, yes, Senator. Um, Are you aware of any instances where the Department has done that? Not for domestic travel, Senator. So for domestic travel, it's the Prime Minister's office? Yes, Senator. Are there ever rehearsals, as far as you are aware, for the arrival of the Prime Minister into an airport? Not, not in Australia, Senator, no. You're not aware of whether the Prime Minister employs, whether his advances have been involved in a rehearsal or witnessed a rehearsal at an Australian airport? Not for the Prime Minister's arrival, no, Senator. From time to time we do rehearse uh, arrivals that might uh, be used for a visiting guest of government. But for somebody else arriving? Somebody else arriving. Minister Birmingham, are you aware of... I assume you don't have rehearsals conducted for your arrival at Australian airports. No, no. Are you aware of whether the Prime Minister and his office conduct rehearsals for the Prime Minister's arrival at Australian airports? I frequently arrive at Australian airports about the same time as Senator Wong, uh, and I don't think either of us uh, rehearse yeah, it to bit, ter terribly much. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not, Senator. To the Prime Minister <laughs> Post... let's be clear. Yes. That's right. That's right. The Prime Minister posted a photo to his Instagram account on the 7th of May, which showed him walking down a red carpet off the 34 Squadron aircraft, so down a red carpet with a ceremonial stairway guard made up of... RAF members in ceremonial uniform holding flags and guns on either side of him when he arrived at RAF Williamtown. Um, that's unusual, isn't it? Yes, Senator. Minister Birmingham? A red carpet uh, being rolled out for the Prime Minister? It, um, uh, well, yes, it does. Uh, it's not what I... Um, recall seeing in, uh, in the ordinary course of events. Um, well, it was saying, on the Prime are, Minister's, saying, it was on the Prime Minister's Instagram he, account. That it was um, arriving at a RAF base rather than yeah. normally the Prime Minister most times is, uh, is arriving at civilian uh, airports um, from my experience and observations. It's been reported that Former Prime Minister Turnbull can't recall being greeted with a red carpet on a domestic visit to a Defence Force base. Veterans have said that in their 40 years in the ADF, which he said covered eight Prime Ministers, he had never seen one red carpet for an internal visit to a base. And Neil James of the Australian Defence Association said that it shouldn't, said that it just doesn't happen. Clearly something's changed, hasn't it, Minister? Well, I, I don't. Uh, you're raising um, this picture. It's the first that well, I it was on the heard. Prime Minister's Instagram, so I, it's not, oh, I haven't sure. made it up. I, sure. No, no, no. Um, I'm not if, saying, if, if, saying you've made if it up. Anybody's photoshopped, just, if anybody's I, photoshopped the red carpet in, it's the Prime Minister yeah, himself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 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 Senator Rez, I, I haven't amazing. been following the Prime Minister's Instagram page as, uh, as closely as you have. Um, don't you I like had the red not. Carpet? I had not seen the, the picture until you just waved it around the committee just then. I'm not aware as to whether there was something particular uh, about what was happening at, uh, at RAF Base Williamstown that day uh, or whose decision it, uh, it was in that regard. Are you asking people to believe that the Prime Minister didn't arrange the red carpet for himself? I am pretty... Confident that, See, it's uh, not the only that, time that he I've, didn't. I have another I photo. I don't know the background, Senator. Of, of, of the Prime Minister on, from his Instagram. Senator, uh, see, I don't I have. Like to table these I don't. Documents that you're referring to. I, I, I will shortly. Thank you. Uh, without my scribble over the top of them, I don't Please. follow Instagram. There's young people in my office who follow Instagram. I'm too old for it. But here he is, yeah, walking from his car Senator into a building on, on a red carpet. It's not the only time. What, what's, what's wrong with this bloke? Oh, Senator Ayres, it's, it's, 
It's like fair income. Like it's, who on earth arranges for ceremonial guards, red carpets, ceremonial uniforms? Look, what's going on? So I understand that... Somebody's beaming in, are they? The defence has previously responded to this issue, saying the image shows a ceremonial stairway guard okay. comprising of serving Thanks members so from RAF Base Williamtown. Uh, the spokeswoman for the Department of Defence added that most Air Force bases maintained a red carpet for ceremonial events and VIP arrivals, and the ceremonial stairway guard was standard protocol for the arrival of VIPs, including standard. Prime Ministers. So it's now, now standard under now, this Prime Minister, is no, it? The, no, the Senator Ayres. Um, this was a statement in relation at least to the protocols, it seems, that, uh, that were being applied at RAF Base Williamtown. I don't... So, uh, well, they I haven't can... been provided to any other Prime Minister. They haven't been provided for Prime Minister Turnbull. Or, or, or Abbott, uh, or Rudd, or Gillard. No, no other... Pri I can't imagine Prime Minister Howard having the red carpet rolled and, out for him and, or insisting upon it. And, and, and Senator Ayres, yeah, although, yeah, although I wouldn't say I've travelled with the Prime Minister a lot, uh, I can say that for the flights I have flown with him, it's never occurred on any of those occasions that I've been with him. In February this year at RAF Base Williamtown, the Prime Minister walked into a building to deliver some remarks with Top Gun playing. Were you consulted about uh, the choice of oh, music? Oh, really? <laughs> Mr Martin? <laughs> well, I mean, you can't make it up. Um, and, and it wasn't an accident. In, in the Prime Minister's remarks, he said... He referenced Top Gun not once but twice. He said, we, we walked into Top Gun, the soundtrack, and then everyone who's involved in this project is a Top Gun. What? Did, did the Prime Minister's office or the department play any role in the choice of music? An event that I was unaware required music, but did, did your office play any... The department had no involvement in that event. So what, about the Prime Minister's, what about the Prime Minister's office? Senator, the Senator, Senator, yeah, Senator I'll take it on notice as to, uh, as to um, who arranged the, uh, the staging or music for, uh, for that event. It may well have been the hosts or organisers of the event. Any discussion with the PMI? So the, 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 um, the hosts were RAF. It's a coincidence, is it? Red carpet? Ceremonial guards, guns, soundtrack music. I, I doubt very much that that's the only occasion that Top Gun uh, music has been played on a RAF base, Senator. <laughs> yeah, but he's not a Top Gun, is he? He's not a Top Gun. <laughs> no, but the RAF base, I'm sure, is full, uh, yeah. full of, uh, full of some who are. We're talking about him. Yeah, <laughs> m most, most people who do serious work don't require theme music. Most people don't take themselves so seriously that they require ceremonial guards and red carpets. Oh, but Senate. this bloke is so full of himself no, yeah. Senate, Senator that he requires all of those things. Senator Ayres, I reject it completely. So uh, I want you to uh, make some inquiries about whether or not the Prime Minister's office arranged these things for this event and what consultation there was between the Prime Minister's office and his advances and the unfortunate people at RAF who had to arrange these things for him. Senator, well, well, Senator I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in terms of taking those questions on notice. As I said before, uh, I've seen many, many images of okay. the Prime Minister uh, departing or arriving uh, and, uh, and the vast majority don't entail any of the things that you've just identified. Could I um, go back? Ten minutes? Yes, I'll try. Yes. Thank you. Um, in the extensive time that we've had to peruse the letter from Mr Kunkel to his boss, another paragraph has come to my attention, which is the nature of what the Prime Minister described in the House as a negative finding. Um, this is what Dr Kunkel says. I do not make a finding 
that negative briefing against Mr Shiraz of the sort alleged has taken place. He then goes on to say, such a, they're in here, such a finding would be based on hearsay in some instance, second or third hand. The evidence before me falls, falls well short of the standard that would be needed to arrive at such a finding in conformity with due process. So his words are, it's very careful, isn't it? I do not make a finding that negative briefing against Mr Shiraz of the sort alleged has taken place. So in other words, he doesn't find that the backgrounding didn't happen. He just refu doesn't find that it did. So, so Senator Wong, as, uh, as I said, when we were canvassing these matters earlier, uh, Dr Kunkel did not find individuals who could substantiate uh, with any first-hand experience uh, the allegations that were made and was not able to corroborate those allegations. But he doesn't exonerate he anybody. He doesn't make a finding that it didn't occur, does he? He's very careful not to make such a finding. No. Senator, he's not been able to corroborate it. He has not made a finding that it didn't happen. Oh. He's not Sen exonerated the PMI. Oh, well, well, Senator, most such processes, most such processes either result in a finding of guilt or of not guilty. Now, in that sense, he's not been able to prove a negative that something that is alleged to have occurred did not occur, but he has not found any evidence to substantiate with first-hand accounts or otherwise that what was alleged to have occurred did actually occur. Do you remember what Ms Higgins said in February about the, these, this backgrounding? Sorry, am I aware what Ms Higgins yeah, said do you remember in February? About the backgrounding against her partner. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to, sure. to, to summarise I'll, I'll the words that to could you. be taken I'll put it to you, sure. Sentence. No, that's fair so enough. I'm you've got she said this, she said this, so this is how she's quoted. I knew personally that when I decided to put my name and face to this, there would be repercussions for me. But I think it's unfair if they are starting to try and take this out on, our loved, on loved ones. I think it speaks to the systemic problems of this place. It silences people, and I think it's gross. Yes, Senator Woman. Um, look, it is concerns about allegations of backgrounding that prompted this work to be undertaken. Wow. Are these investigations to be made? Do you know what the message is out of this to people? You better stay silent. I don't. That's, that's the message out of this. Don't, I don't accept that, Senator Wong. No. It's just, because, just because Dr Kunkel has not been able to that's substantiate not, that, And you know claims, that's not all he's done. You know that's not all he's done. Because he has not been able to substantiate the claims, should not in any way impinge upon the fact that what we should all want is for people who have um, faced serious incidents, have serious allegations to make, and to bring them forward. And it is why all of the systems um, to uh, try to better support people and better yeah, but, uh, but <laughs> manage such allegations. But in credible, future serious are allegations are made by a person, and then there are corridor conversations backgrounding of the gallery about the, and then articulated in a document tabled in the, in the chamber, assertions about the quote, grudge, end quote, her partner holds. It's, you can understand why Ms Higgins said what she said in February and those words ring even more true today. Senator Wong, I can understand Indeed, the concerns that Ms Higgins uh, had and feels. Uh, I can only but say that there has not been able to be evidence found to corroborate the allegations made, but that clearly 
there is an expectation. Well, that's not right. Higher, higher that's not right. That, no, no, please applied. stop saying that. That is incorrect. That is not what's said. He's saying I couldn't find first hand. So he set a bar. So it's you know his bar around what, what the standard he is setting around what he regards as evidence has been set high. So when you say there wasn't evidence to corroborate, that's not correct. There wasn't evidence of the sort that Dr Kunkel determined was required. I have a, another question though, and I referred to it in in my first in my opening in this section, which was the Prime Minister used the phrase negative finding. He said that Dr Kunkel had made a negative finding. He didn't actually make a finding. He said, I do not make a finding that negative briefing against Dr Shiraz of the sort of leisure had taken place. So can you tell me what is the quote negative finding, end quote, the Prime Minister refers to? As Dr Kunkel goes on to say in the quote, he said, the evidence before me falls well short of the standard that we've needed to arrive at such a finding in conformity with due process. Yeah, that's not my question. I'll just go back and... Uh, thank you, Mr... Uh, no, 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 This is the question. My chief of staff found in the negative and I table the report. Where, where does the chief of staff find in the negative? So can the Prime Minister, this is the question, can the Prime Minister now finally tell us, did his office seek to undermine Brittany Higgins and her loved ones? Mr Morrison says, thank you, Mr Speaker, my chief of staff found in the negative. Where does he find in the negative in the report? Well, Senator Wong, Dr Kunkel makes clear that he has not been able to positively substantiate the allegations that have been made. Therefore, his findings, in that sense, in terms of the attempt to substantiate those allegations in a credible way, is a negative finding. No, it's not a negative finding. That's not what it says at all. You, you're, you're <laughs> You can assert it is, but it's not a finding. He's saying, I do not make a finding. That's precisely what he's saying. He, he doesn't say there was no yeah. briefing. He says, I can't substantiate on the basis of anything other than second or third hand hearsay or corridor conversations that this occurred. That's not a negative finding. That's a, it's declining to find a positive on the basis that one asserts the evidence is insufficient. That's, that's a different proposition. Anyway, so, I think further on that. Um, yep. It is three That's fine. so we might break now for afternoon tea. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand Senator Smith has the call. Thank you. undertook to come back to Senator Ayres on oh. the issue of conflict, so I can do that after Senator I'm Smith's you finished. Now, if you like, yeah. Yeah. Well, as soon as I put some peanuts in my mouth, <laughs> it's possible, but yes. I'll speak for long enough. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So it was the question of, um, had we been advised yes. of um, an interest, and would we necessarily be? Um, so the short answer is no and no. Yes. Um, so typically at a time when ministers are updating their interests, then that will all come to us and, and the secretary will provide advice back to the prime minister on the management of those interests. But where there are ad hoc uh, things that arise, they won't necessarily come to the department unless the PM is, is seeking advice on that particular issue. But if, in this case, Minister Porter, <coughs> Um, or the Prime Minister had received advice, excuse me, <coughs> um, the, that, that wouldn't be an ad hoc <coughs> declaration. It would be a, <coughs> you know, you should not participate in discussions that so are means, in relation to the ABC, that kind of long-term... What I meant by ad hoc was not at the time when the yes. full list is being updated and it would... It's the prerogative. So you're not aware of any <coughs> permanent declarations of interest in relation to the matters that are raised? Uh, no, and we wouldn't necessarily be so, because it might be that um, the Prime Minister didn't feel a need for advice. Um, they, he, he was satisfied with the arrangements that were being proposed or that his office 
had um, recommended or, or whatever. So the fact that we haven't received it doesn't mean it ha that it hasn't happened. Thanks, Ms Foster. Pleasure. And Chair, if I can also just provide one point of clarification to one of the big issues, but I am advised that the Prime Minister's office was not aware uh, of the Top Gun music uh, intended to be played uh, prior to the music starting to be played at the event. But red carpet, ceremonial guards, guns. I haven't had uh, an answer on uh, on that, Senator Ayres. Um, I, uh, I would again be surprised if they were. Um, sounds like it was from the response defence provided earlier, a decision of the base at the time. It's happened more than once, though. He gets right. it from the bus to the building or from the car to the building these days. Yeah, Senator, that's rubbish and you know it. I've tabled the, um, the pictures that the Prime Minister himself has circulated. Yeah, any of them, uh, any of them yeah, going into a building from yeah. a bus? Yeah, One, of them is, just One of them is going from his car. Sorry, bus was wrong. I know that he wouldn't travel on a bus. Travelling from the Prime Ministerial car, the 25 metres in the building. If, if you take your time to look at the table document, that's exactly what the Prime Minister shared. Oh, I don't think anybody's given me the table document, uh, Senator Ayres. Well, when you do, I look forward to hearing more about it. And, Senator, um, when, if Senator Patrick um, comes back, um, I undertook to follow up some issues relating to the AAT and also to FOI, but I can hold those yeah. so that he can I'm, hear I'm them. On the Regency Act, Ms Foster? No. Um, I, I'm not sure if Senator Patrick will be back this afternoon, but maybe let's just give the call to Senator Smith for now and we can address those matters later if he does. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Birmingham, it's correct, isn't it, that the Prime Minister is responsible for determining the number of additional staff allocated to independent members of Parliament and Senators, is that correct? Um, essentially, yes, Senator. There's a convention of sorts that has existed around that, but yes. Has uh, Mr Craig Kelly been allocated any additional staff since moving to the crossbench? Um, I don't believe so, Senator. I think, uh, I think I made clear on previous occasions that uh, uh, he... Uh, was not being and would not be uh, so allocated, um, noting that, uh, that uh, he was uh, not elected uh, as a member of the crossbench but was elected as a representative of a major party. Did Mr Kelly make any requests of the Prime Minister or his office for additional staff? Uh, I think there may have been, Senator, but I'd have to take details on the nature of those requests on notice. That's not in your brief. There was asked questions like this at the last estimates. Well, then I'll see whether I can find anything. Um, Senator, but uh, I'm just checking. No, I don't think so, Senator, but as I said before, I don't believe there has been any change to the government's position. If you could take on notice whether on any matter. request has been made sure. from Mr Kelly, but you can confirm no additional staff has been provided to Mr Kelly. Uh, I, I am not aware of any change to the government's position there, which was already stated, which was that, uh, that they, they would not be provided. Okay. So is Mr Kelly the only independent member who hasn't been provided with additional staff by the Prime Minister? Uh, um, Yes, look, I, I suspect he is, um, but he is also, to my recollection, the only one in this parliament who has moved from a major party position to a crossbench position. 
so the significance of that would be that he's not really an independent. Well, he was not elected as one by the people at the last election. So he's not considered an independent by the government? Well, I think he, he acts as an independent on the floor of the House of Representatives. That's, uh, that is true. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the distinction between him and other crossbench MPs, um, he made his own decision to move from uh, a position of being a member of a major party uh, to, uh, to the crossbench, and, uh, and he has not yet tested that with the people. Got some questions about state visits. Have we got the right official at the table? We'll just get Mr. Martin back Thank to the you. Table. I think he's in the witness room. Oh, room. no worries. Let's... State visits, did you say, Senator Smith? We've been a bit short on those of late. Well, yeah, that's the point, actually. That's... Yeah. Mr Martin, the PMC portfolio budget statement allocates over $3.8 million for the department to spend on state occasion and official visits in the next financial year. Given the budget assumes borders will be shut until midway through next year, why is so much money being budgeted? Senator, that's based on the, the PM's possible international engagement program. Um, obviously, the, some of that may well end up being virtual, but if it doesn't, um, that money could potentially be spent. So does that allocation have regard to the border closure or does it assume the borders won't be closed? Senator, we haven't made any assumptions about um, border closures in, in um, considering that amount. What overseas trips for the Prime Minister are being considered? Well, Senator, obviously he's, uh, the Prime Minister has announced um, possible travel to New Zealand in the near future. Um, there's a range of other um, possible interactions that the Prime Minister would be considering. Um, there's been some discussion around the G7, but no decisions have been made at this stage. And what state or official visits to Australia are expected? So there's no state uh, visits that have been announced at this point, Senator, but depending on the circumstances, there could be a, a range of visits that could be incoming, which would also be funded out of that particular allocation. Are you able to table a list of international summits and conferences to which the PM has been invited or to which you expect the Prime Minister will be invited by the end of today's hearings? Can you do that for us? Uh, yes, Senator, I'll, I'll endeavour to do that, yes. Um, the budget also estimates that over $3.8 million will be spent on state occasion and official visits up until June this year. Um, given the borders have been shut and the PM has only travelled overseas once in the past year, and I believe that was to Japan for a number of a few days, how was the department able to spend that much money? Well, Senator, that's an administered fund, so we won't be spending all of that. It was allocated in the last budget, but we certainly won't be spending all of that in this financial year. So do you have an update of how much you have spent? Senator... I don't have it right to hand, Senator, but I'm sure I can get that for you very shortly. Could you get that to me by the end of the day with the other materials requested? Certainly can. Thank you. Um, official residences, is that you as well, Mr yes. Martin? Okay. Uh, am I correct in understanding that the part of the department that looks after the Prime Minister's residence is called VIP operations? That's right, Senator. And you're responsible for this area as well? Yes. Okay. Um, has it always been called VIP operations? Uh, no, Senator. It's, that's uh, a renaming of an existing section over the last couple of years to take into account um, the broader range of their duties, including, for example, looking after former Governors General. And the decision to rename it was a departmental one, Senator. Okay. Um, page 25, oh, sorry, page 29 of the PMNC portfolio budget statement says this department will spend more than $11 million on the Prime Minister's houses over five years with 2.221 uh, million budgeted this year, rising to 2.314 million in 2024-25.
How is it that $2 million a year can be spent on just two houses? So, Senator, that covers, as you say, the Lodge and Kirribilli House, and they are heritage proper properties that require um, some level of maintenance to keep them to heritage standards. There are staff that are employed out of those funds, the household staff, um, as well as the general sustenance for the Prime Minister at each property. I mean, the average house price in my state is about $500,000, so $2 million across two houses seems quite significant. Can you tell me how many staff work at each of the Prime Minister's residences? Yes, Senator, there's two household staff employed at Kirribilli House uh, full-time. At the Lodge, there are two full-time staff and one part-time. And what do they do? Uh, one's a house manager, um, the, the others are uh, household attendants, and they perform a range of domestic duties in support of the household. Cleaning, cooking, that sort of thing. Okay. And does PMNC meet all costs related to the houses? Certainly all costs relating to the um, general maintenance, any capital works, although there are none on the horizon, Senator. Um, staffing of the household staff. Um, there are other costs relating to security that um, are borne by other agencies. Which agencies cover security? So the Department of Home Affairs um, looks after the security infrastructure and of course the AFP is responsible for physical security. And are there any costs met by the Department of Finance? Not, no, Senator. Okay, so other than Home Affairs and AFP, PMNC would cover the remainder of the costs? Generally the speaking, residents. yes, Senator. Sorry, when you say generally speak, that is... Um, certainly in terms of the maintenance of the, the properties themselves, the household staff, um, that's our responsibilities. Um, the official establishment's guidelines published by the department provide that when non-dependent family or guests of the Prime Minister stay for long periods, a contribution is sought from the Prime Minister towards accommodation and sustenance. How is the appropriate contribution calculated? Is it calculated on market rent, for instance, or what, what measures used? Senator, there is a formula that's applied um, in the circumstance where there is a family member or or um, non-dependent person staying at the properties for a longer period of time. Um, there's no one currently in that situation. Is it, but how is that formula? Senator, well, I'd have to take that on notice. There, there is a formula for um, establishing how much that um, contribution would be. And that's, a step, that's your department's formula? Yes, Senator. Do you know, broadly speaking, what sort of things it would pertain to? Would it pertain to issues like market rent or...? Um, Senator, I have to refresh myself on exactly how that would be. It's, it's not a formula we need to apply at the moment, or in fact for some years, so I'm not immediately familiar with it. Okay. So there, there are no current arrangements in place that see the Prime Minister make a contribution towards accommodation and sustenance? No, Senator. And that's at all towards, sorry, so beyond the issue of guests? There's no arrangements in place where the Prime Minister is making a contribution to his own accommodation and sustenance in the residences? Uh, there's no formal arrangement for that, Senator, no. Okay. What do the guidelines say about the conduct of party political business at the two residences? That it's not to be conducted there, Senator. On the 29th of November last year, the Prime Minister addressed the New South Wales Liberal Party State Council from the Lodge. Um, this one caught our eye because it was deeply partisan and uh, in my memory I can't recall the Lodge being used in such a partisan way by a Prime Minister. I'm relatively new here but uh, I, looking back can't see an example of this. Would you say this usage would be consistent with the guidelines? Senator, I think the guidelines um, relate specifically to fundraising events. Oh, so my question uh, was about the conduct of party political business and you said that wouldn't be consistent with the guidelines. So, 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 Senator, is, is your question related to the fact that the Prime Minister did a speech via Zoom or something from the Lodge? That he addressed the New South Wales Liberal Party State Council from the Lodge. By, via Zoom or some other remote platform? Yes. Right. So, 
So the guidelines um, Senator generally was specifically say that party political events may be held at the official establishments but are at the party's expense, but the party political fundraising events cannot be held at the official establishments. Okay. And Senator, I think the guidelines are constructed um, on the basis of the event physically being held in the residence rather than the Prime Minister using his residence as a, a location to conduct a, a virtual Mm. But address. in that virtual presentation, um, it wasn't sort of just in the office. He did it in front of a blue Liberal Party banner. In fact, the words Liberal Party of Australia appeared on the banner just above his head whilst he was speaking from the lodge. So would using the banner at the lodge in an occasion like that be acceptable under the guidelines? Yeah, the, gu the guidelines are really silent on the use of, the, of any of the spaces there for a, a Zoom call or, or anything like that. It is as as Foster says, really premised around an event being held there. But a presentation at a political, clearly political event with political party branding in the background from the lodge, would you say that was consistent with the intent of the guidelines? Uh, Senator, I can't really offer you an opinion on that. I mean, the, the guidelines are pretty specific in relation to events being held there, but doesn't really countenance this possibility. How many Liberal Party events has Mr Morrison held at these taxpayer-funded residences? Um, look, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator, but obviously no events in the recent past. If he was to address a Liberal Party conference from, say, the foyer of the department, would you think that was acceptable? Senator, I can't really give you an opinion on that, but... Um... Senator, I don't really think the two are comparable. You're talking about the Prime Minister giving a speech via Zoom from his residence. It is not using the lodge for a party political event. Well, it's his taxpayer-funded residence he and he's branded himself to the nines behind with Liberal Party banners. At, and, Senator, for the purposes of giving a speech, not hosting an event, not using the lodge for party political purposes in that yeah, sense, for the purposes, the purposes of, of him a giving speech. a speech via an online platform. For the purposes of him giving a political speech, including standing in front of blue Liberal banners at the Lodge using his official residence. Can I ask a quick supplementary question? Was the Prime Minister at the Lodge at that time because he was quarantining having returned from overseas? Senator, I can't recall exactly when that um, took If you could place. take that on notice, Certainly. that would be appreciated. Thank you. The question is whether it's appropriate to use a taxpayer-funded residence or building with a Liberal Party banner behind it to address a political conference. If it wouldn't be acceptable within the floor well, of Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, is it acceptable within the Lodge, Mr Birmingham? Well, I've certainly seen plenty of political banners in this building from time to time, Senator. Yeah, but that's... You, you'd complain about that. Sorry? You'd complain about that if there was an event, you know... Pit. There, there, there are quite, there are quite. Yeah, um, there, there wasn't an event. Senator there is a, in relation to what there are a set of guidelines about, about, speech. about the lodge, aren't there, Mr. Martin? Yes. Sir. Because the lodge is regarded as a site of national significance that should be beyond partisan politics. Where you you say that there's um, there's some ambiguity about um, about virtual events being conducted from the lodge, where where. Where does that ambiguity arise in the guidelines? Senator, I'm not sure that they're even countenanced in the guidelines. What the guidelines do say is that party political events may be held at the official establishments, but they're at the party's expense. Yeah, I'm sure, Senator Ayres, that Prime Ministers of all persuasions have used the telephones at the Lodge to conduct party business over the years, to engage in, uh, in phone hookups with their executives or their leadership teams or, uh, or otherwise. The idea this is quite, this is a public event. And this was uh, a, 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 a this was, Liberal this was Party a, This was an online major, speech. Yeah. Bedecked in all of the sort of Liberal Senator Party Reyes. logos, you reckon that's OK? I, I, I reckon you're sounding a bit desperate. I, I want to know whether you think it's OK. Yes. For an online speech, yes. It could be delivered from anywhere. Senator Birmingham. Correct. Mm. Senator Smith, you asked me uh, about the year-to-date expenditure mm. from the State Occasions and Official Visits budget. Uh, the amount is $337,000. Of the budgeted, what was it, $3.8 That's right, Senator. So 330000 
Then you've budgeted three hundred thirty-seven thousand. Three hundred thirty-seven thousand. Okay, but then you've budgeted three point eight million again for next year. Yes, Senator, that's right. So it's administered funding, so it's it's not um, funding that we necessarily expect to spend. Uh, but if all going well, that would be all going well is in the borders being open. Correct. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Chair. Um, I see Mr Grigson up in the back corner. I might need you. Thank you. I'm going to ask about priority vaccinations and vaccine, vaccine assumptions. Um, thank you. How are you, Senator? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, can I ask you, just to confirm, your, so your position is Deputy Secretary, Vaccine Strategy Integration. That's, I've got that right? That's correct. You have? Yep. Um, can you just give a brief, not necessarily a position description, but are you able to give a brief description of, your, of, of the role? So I'm helping in PMNC with its traditional role across uh, uh, complex issues in a coordination sense. So the Health Department re retains all responsibility for the program and for advice around it. But as PMNC often does, we try to make sure that other departments are lining up and, the, and that uh, across the government, there's a whole of government approach to the, to the issue. So other than health, who are the other main departments? Well, there's a number of departments involved. You see Home Affairs involved in, in, is, in issues at the border, you know, ABF, for instance. You see AGD involved in workplace relations issues. So it's those sorts of issues that we keep an eye on as well. And when did you start? Uh, January. January. Um, so I, from January, from when you started to, the, to today, for example, what, what, what have been the main projects or the main sort of agendas you've been working on? So it's, as, well, as well as working on the vaccine rollout, um, I did some work in February on workplace relations with AGD. I did some work with the Australian Signals Directorate on uh, cyber security. I did some work with Health and Services Australia on the IT back end. So it's those sorts mm -hmm. of issues. Okay. Um, how did your, so you would be in the Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's department, you would be the most senior person in relation to the vac, to vaccine strategy, to vaccine, what would you use, vaccine strategy, vaccine integration? Oh, along with my colleague, um, Alison Frame. Okay. Um, so how, how did your work since January, how did that inform the budget? How did that inform the budget? Well, we, we provide advice to the, to the Prime Minister as, as issues from in the vaccine rollout came forward. Uh, 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 a lot of the budget work, you, as you would know, is done by the line agencies. But between Ms Frame and myself, we provided advice as issues came along. Okay. And what's Ms Frame? Is she... What position, what level is she? She's a, a band three, she's a deputy mm. secretary. She uh, oh, looks after okay. social policy. Okay. Um, in the budget, because looking through the budget papers, obviously there's quite a lot about, you know, for example, recovery from the pandemic, et cetera. The budget assumes that a population-wide vaccination program is likely to be in place by the end of 2021. So, can I ask, does that mean that every Australian who wants to be vaccinated will receive two doses by the end of this year? So we're, we're hoping that by the end of the year, every Australian who would like a vaccination has been offered at least one dose. Okay, so not two doses. So, but it would be, it would be January by the time they got a second dose. If it they would didn't. depend on the, the, the vaccine they took. I, yes, that's true too. Um, in the budget papers, there's some forecasts around the vaccination program. When do you, so when do you expect, if you need two doses in a vaccination, when do you expect that those Australians who want a vaccine will have had two doses? At this point, Senator, we're, as I said, we're, we're hoping that by the end of the year we can offer one dose. There's a lot of variables involved in that. We've seen over the past few months uh, changes in the medical advice. We've seen um, 
pressures on supply. So we're, mm. we're trying to match up those who want to have a dose with the doses we have when they're eligible by the end of the year. So let's say someone has most people, so you're saying that the assumption really is that people will have had one dose by the end of, 20, end of calendar 2021. If you have one dose then, are you expecting that the second dose would be um, administered in January, sort of three weeks later? Is that what you're assuming? It'll be uh, done well, sort of by so, the end of summer? So I, I'm a little nervous about the word assumption, only because there's a budget assumption which is different okay, so to our aspiration for yeah. the end of the year. So uh, at this point, uh, as I said, we're hoping to offer each person who would like to be vaccinated a dose by the end of the year. And then it follows that if you have a dose towards the end of the year that requires a second dose, it's in 2022. Okay. So the, where it says in the budget, in the assumption, it says a population-wide vaccination program is likely to be in place by the end of 2021. But that isn't meaning fully, for those people needing two doses of the vaccine, they won't be fully vaccinated by the end of 2021. It would be, I don't know, by the end of summer. So, so of I would say two things to that, Senator. The first is that it's a budget assumption. Yes. So it's an assumption for the purposes of planning the budget up as opposed to a, a policy, for instance. Um, and, and the second is it is one dose. The aspiration okay. is around one dose by the end of the year. Did you want to add anything, Senator Birmingham? Uh, no, uh, no. Um, Mr. Grigson made in particular the first point, which uh, which I was keen to ensure was on the record that, uh, that these are uh, budget assumptions. Um, they're not, in that sense, um, policy decisions or uh, or formal targets. But it's certainly the government's hope, as Mr. Grigson has said, um, that that is in place, and that, so all Australians who want to participate in the vaccine program are in a position to be participating in the vaccine program by the end of the year, by having had, in most cases, you would hope by then both doses, but for some it will still be their first dose. Okay, and going back to the work you've been doing since January, um, are you hoping that that work will actually maybe expedite the vaccination rollout? So if you're doing things such as, you know, the back end of government services or, um, or the other projects you mentioned, or if you can, the work you're doing with defence, are you doing that in the hope that it will expedite? And the assumption in the budget papers won't just be an assumption, it will be an actuality? Well, well certainly I'm hoping that my work assists with... Uh, I hope with, so. <laughs> with a, with and, a, I, and I'm not really suggesting that, I'm no, just asking... With, with a successful rollout, um, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to help with the issues that might come along yeah. and impinge on it. Um, which is why I've talked more broadly than just the rollout itself. So the, the Treasurer has said, the, so I'm quoting here, the assumption is that every Australian who would like to get two shots of the vaccine will be able to do so by the end of the year. Was that based on your, for example, your the work you've been doing? Is that based on a policy and policy work the government's been doing? So it's by, it, so the health the health planning is around that that aspiration as mm. I keep saying that hope to provide a dose by the end of the year um, as the, the, uh, the minister said if we can do two doses we'll do two doses but we're we're looking at offering everybody who wants who would like a vaccination the opportunity to have one at least one dose by the end of the year. Okay. The prime minister has said that vaccine assumptions in the budget and I quote not are not policy settings. If the assumptions are not based on policy, on government policy, what are they based on? Well, the, 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 the assumption is based on advice, around, advice from health on what might be achievable. Um, the, the, I think I mentioned before, one of the great impacts in the first half of the year has been the variability of, of supply mm -hmm. has been changing uh, uh, medical advice. Um, I think one of the things certainly that I've learnt, and I think others have too, is it's very difficult to predict even the near-term future with the pandemic. You see uh, a variance of concern emerging. You see um, data showing improved efficacy of some yeah. vaccines. So you need an assumption in the budget to frame the budget, and that was the assumption that was made. Okay, and have you looked at other countries, 
you know, how vaccine rollouts have occurred in other countries? A, 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 a little. Health has followed that very, very closely, mm. but I have looked a little. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Israel's obviously fully vaccinated, but mm. um, it's a small country, a population in a small mm. area, so it's... And they sort of live with existential threat, so they're probably used mm. to, you know, dealing with that. Um, in the, the... The budget also has an assumption that international borders will start to reopen mid-next year. And I really hope that's the case, or it's, you know, if, if earlier would be better. But are you, is the government also assuming in that that children and well, children and infants? I don't know whether they're necessarily being vaccinated, but children are going to be fully vaccinated with two doses by that time. So there's again, just without repeating it, it's a budget assumption as opposed yeah. to something else. That's the first. But um, I'm wondering if that's based on mainly advice from health. You're saying from the Department of Health. Yes. So are you also going to assume that... So I, I accept it's an assumption, sure. but, you know, where's the planning in your role to ensure that that does happen? Because I'm assuming that it will have to happen mm. if we're going to open borders. So a couple of things there. Um, the Chief Medical Officer was asked about this yesterday. I don't know whether, know whether you saw that. And he said that he hadn't... They hadn't yet come up with all the elements that they would need to consider before giving advice about when it was safe to open the border. Mm. I mean, the PM and other ministers have always talked about only opening the borders when it's safe to do so. So whether the assumption you know, in the budget is based on uh, an, uh, an, an assumption from Paul Kelly that uh, children will be fully vaccinated or not is not yet determined. OK. Um, and when we next have estimates, which might be in October, depending on the government, um, but... Uh, I'd be interested to know the work that you're doing mm -hmm. between now and then mm -hmm. um, in terms of this integration and the strategy around vaccinations and um, perhaps anything you have on borders as well. Sure, be happy to provide tra updates. International then, so travel. Happy to do that. Um, I, th I don't know whether you're the best person to ask, Mr Grigson, but I want to ask about whether the department's organised COVID-19 vaccines for staff. Senator, that will be our, um, our corporate area. I'll ask the relevant officer Lovely. to come to the table. Thank you. Senator, Tom Gilmartin, Chief Operating Officer. Thank Could you. you repeat the question, please? Oh, so what I'm after is, has the department organised vaccines for staff? And if so, I'm going to ask you how many staff. Uh, no, Senator, we have not. So other, than, mm -hmm. other than staff who are planning to travel uh, with, uh, with the uh, Prime Minister. OK, so that's the New Zealand trip that I think Mr Martin talked about? Correct. Yeah, other and than maybe that, G7 yes. in, in the UK? Yes. So how many, is that just a handful of people, is it? Correct, Senator. Um, the number is 29. 29, okay. Um, is, are, are the departments and PMC, I guess, is a good department to ask, is there going to be a rollout for departments, for all of the departments and agencies, a rollout here? They'll get vaccines through work? Kind of like some workplaces do the flu, the flu jab. Senator, I, I'm not aware of any such plans within PMC. Oh. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get vaccinated according to normal Australians. Okay. So just in Canberra, I'm going to ask the, the Minister, but just in Canberra, so no, are the departments going to organise? Because I'm just thinking it's a large cohort of people. Some of the departments have a large number of people and some workplaces, you know, roll out flu vaccines at work. I'm just wondering if the departments are planning on doing, doing something similar with the COVID vaccines just because it might be convenient for people. Senator Kitchen, um, Mr Grigson may have something oh, to, uh, to add there, because I would. I mean, there you. are obvious departments in relation yeah. to defence, for example, who I'm sure have strategies in place for um, for um, serving personnel and, uh, and so forth. And obviously, then you know, foreign affairs uh, would have mm. arrangements that are more active than others as they continue to manage the uh, the to and fro of. Uh, uh, of those representing Australia overseas, but 
That's, that's right, Minister. As a general rule, uh, the public service is encouraging public servants to come forward and be vaccinated in, in keeping with the, the, the general population. Mm -hmm. In certain circumstances, um, foreign affairs and trade is one good example. The Australian Defence Force is another. There has been uh, arrangements made for certain people within those organisations to be vaccinated. There's a, a more general uh, discussion within health around workplace vaccinations in the mm -hmm. future. At this point, the constraining factor is supply. So yes. there's, there's insufficient supply for workplaces to be able to offer that. Um, health hasn't ruled it in or out. It's certainly an option on the table, but it will depend on later supply. Okay. But we, oh, sorry. You shouldn't read into the number of 29, but that's a group of 29 travelling with the Prime Minister. No, no, no. There's I'm a not, significant I number of backup, etc. there. I try not to leap to conclusions. So I didn't, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Um, um, I just want to, just on the quarantine system, um, so Howard Springs, is, has Howard Springs now, is that now called the Northern Territory Centre for Australian Resilience? Is it? That's my colleague, Ms Frame, oh. who will assist. I think she's coming. She, thank you. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Senator. Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy Group. Hi, thank you. Um, is, so is Howard Springs now called the Northern Territory Centre for Australian Resilience? Um, that is one of the terms applied to the capacity there. Who, yes. cho who chose the title? Um, I'll have to take it on notice, Senator, about how long. That, that's a, been a long-standing um, terminology there. I'll take it oh. on notice and I can bring some advice back to you later this evening or so soon. You, do you, but you th do you think that that's pre, actually pre-coronavirus? It was called that pre-coronavirus? The National... The National Centre... NCC the Northern Trauma. Sorry, the Northern Territory Centre for Australian Resilience. I'll need to take that on notice, okay. Senator. Okay. Um, OK, and I'll... I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come the... back to you as soon as I can on right. that. I can find yeah. out very quickly. Thank you for coming to the table, but I've, that's that's oh, all okay. I'm... Yeah, I'm sorry, Red. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I might actually go on to Oztender. Is that sure? And we'll get Mr. Gil Gilmartin back for that. Sorry, who's? We'll who? have Mr. Gilmartin back for that. Um, so I'm going to go through some social policy research um, that was done, and I've, there are some odds tender contracts. So I'll just so just to let you know, so it was a Nouse Group, Quantum Market Research, Chat House Research, Arema Research. Paper Giant, PTYLTD, and Susanna Cowley. And that's, I can give you the um, tender numbers if you want them, but um, can I ask you, um, so one, other, one of the other tenderers is JWS Research, and the Prime Minister, when he was Treasurer, often used JWS Research. It's received a contract worth $28,600 for a month and a half of work. Um, who recommended JWS to be used and, and through the Oz Tender? So, first, I want to confirm with you that it was an Oz, it went through Oz Tender. Um, and who recommended and how was the decision made to use JWS? Let me just check that, Senator. Do you want me to, do you want me to get, read out these so, numbers? So, Senator, I think um, there will be two ways that we'll need to answer your questions. Mr. Gilmartin will be able to answer costs um, and sort of procurement issues. Yes. If you want to go to the question of the, the policy content, if you like, then yes. we'll call that relevant officer to the table. Yes, I think, yes, and I do so want to ask if you want about, to talk about the well, data I want to you... ask really why, because there's quite a lot of them doing, that received um, contracts, all doing social policy research. And I wonder, I mean, because the quantum, it, when you add it up, is quite large. 
So I'm wondering why PM&C firstly um, was doing so much social policy research and I'm wondering if any of the requests essentially originated from the Prime Minister's office. Uh, so, Senator, if you would like to run through again yes. the, the contract, to, we'll make the notion we'll get the right people the here. Numbers? Ms Foster, and do you want me to read out the numbers? The yes. number will help. Yeah, and, and if you give so, us the title as well, we'll be able to so match. JWS Research, CN377-3521. NAUS Group, CN377-3519. Quantum Market Research, CN377-3312. Chat House Research. Sorry, let me just check the number. Um, CN three seven six eight nine seven nine. Arima Research. CN three seven six double eight double seven. Paper Giant PTYLTD. CN. Three seven six three six nine five, and Susanna Cowley, who I presume must be a sole trader, um, CN three double seven three five one four. Senator, um, so your question goes to so the what, the, what the purpose of these contracts was. Yes, but also, so who recommended, for example, who recommended JWS to be used? what services are being provided by JWS, um, who is going to receive a copy of the research. So I'll run, do you want me to run through the contract prices? Um, so Senator, I'll just, um, um, making a general call to my colleagues, can okay. the relevant area um, who's responsible for the JWS contract join us to help yes. answer your questions? And will they also be responsible for the NAUS group? We'll work through them one at a time, Senator. Is, as we identify the right person, we'll deal with them. So we're going to start with Arima, and yes. Mr. Martin's going to talk about oh, thank that. You. Senator, I can answer one, uh, which is the Arima um, so contract that, was, that you mentioned. That was $69,960 for three months. That's right. And what services were they providing? So they provided a stakeholder survey for performance reporting for the department's annual so, report. Sorry, the door just. So it was a stakeholder survey for the department's the purpose of the department's annual performance statement in the annual oh. report for last financial year. Um, for 1920, was it? Yes, Senator. And who? So who received a copy of that? Um, was that the corporate and? Corporate part, corporate division. Came into my division, Ministerial right. Support Division, for the purpose of the preparation of the annual report. Okay. Um, did any, did the copy, so I'm going to ask, so I don't think this will apply to you, but did the Prime Minister's office also receive a copy of it? I don't think they would have, would no, they? because Senator. it's for your annual report. That's right. Um, are you, are you responsible for any of the like Chat House, Quantum Market Research, NAUS Group, Paper Giant, Susanna Cowley? No, Senator. Oh, that's the only one I'm okay. <laughs> Thank aware you. of. Sorry. Okay, so Senator, I think we can move now to um, the um, Paper Giant. Sorry, and I Paper think Giant. Yeah. So Ms. Anton's going to help us with that. Oh, thank you. So they, Paper Giant, received a contract worth $111,425 for market research for just over a month's work. Uh, Senator Deborah Anton, um, Interim National Data Commissioner. The contract period I have is from March to May. Um, okay, so t two months, let's say. Yeah, and for us that was to undertake market re user research and deliver a website blueprint for the communication content and design recommendation. Sorry. Ms. Anton, would you be able to read that a little more slowly? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, 
Uh, it was to undertake user research and deliver a website blueprint for the communication content and design recommendations to inform the Data Commissioner website redevelopment. We, as you'd be aware, we're moving potentially from a policy into design into a regulator. So yes. with that, we were looking for how can we make sure that we are presenting the information correctly. So in, in anticipation of that, we've sought some professional advice to assist us with that work. And was that Ms Cowley? Oh no, that was she was she's a journalist and film producer. So that was is that the only This is Paper Giant. So from my understanding we did a competitive tender. Um, yes. they were the successful applicants and provided the best value for money for the Commonwealth and that's what we're seeking to do with that research. Okay. And um, did the research remain in the department? Um, I had a presentation from them uh, it was, I think it was yesterday. Uh, at the moment, we haven't got a final report, but um, at the moment, I, I would expect that would just be given to us. It's about an administrative redevelopment for a departmental website. Thank so. you. Thank you. Um, where should we go next? Okay, so Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Thank At the moment, Senator, my information is JWS, JWS relates to an organ tissue donation. Sorry, which one was that one? JWS. Right. So I'm just um, seeing if we can find. So it related. Officer. It related to an organ tissue donation organisation. Senator, perhaps um, um, it might be more orderly. If we, we have your list now, we'll find the appropriate officers who yes. understand the contracts and we'll line them up for you. I'll let you know as soon as we've got them lined up. Lovely. So, thank you. So, you're, you're suggesting they, they'll come to the table or do you, want, do you want to take it on notice? I'm suggesting I'll get them to the table, thank but you. it might just take us a little moment I'm to identify the officers for each contract. And so, if you could go on to another line of questioning while we do that, that might be helpful. I, I might just propose, uh, I know we have Senator yeah, Seawood sure. here with a few questions, so if you yes, want to all, have a break and we'll go to Senator Seawood for a bit that's and then come back to that matter, that seems like good. a sensible break in proceedings. Senator Seawood. Thank you. Um, I want to go to the issue around the National COVID Commission Advisory Board, which was disbanded on the 3rd of May. Yes, Senator. Um, can I first ask, when was the decision made to disband um, Senator, the I'm advisory just board? I'm hoping that the relevant officer will join me at the table. Sorry, I can't hear you very well, sorry. I'm just hoping that the relevant officer will join me at the table for this. Thank you. I hope that it was announced on the 3rd of May, I think, Senator. Sorry? I think I, I, I think I have in my notes, I think that it was announced on the 3rd, 3rd of, of May. May. Yes. Yes, I understand that. The decision. I think Mr Duggan will be able to help us. Okay. Thank you. Simon Duggan, Deputy Secretary, Economic and G20 Sherpa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, when was the decision made and why? I'll, like, I'll throw that in at the same time. Why was the decision made to get rid of the, or to um, disband the board? Just give me a moment, Senator. I'll just find the relevant information. Not in my folder, Senator. Can I? Um, a colleague of mine who might be able to help us here, um, which I will ask her to come to the table. 
shortly, okay. who will have the, the relevant information. Um, she's in the, uh, the room, I'm sure. Okay. Um, while we're waiting then, can I yep. ask, was it the PM that made the, that decision or was it recommended by PM and C? Senator, um, obviously um, welcome input from my colleagues as well, but my memory of the process is that we had a series of discussions, um, as we have in fact since the inception of the COVID Commission, about how, how to best focus its work, what stage of our response to COVID were we at and therefore how did we want to use the COVID Commission? So it was very much a sort of problem solving vehicle in the very early days. Um, it moved to a, uh, a sort of a different role um, once, once we had sort of moved past that immediate crisis of you know, trying to ensure supply chains to supermarkets and, and that, those very early days. Um, and my memory is over the course of, of this year, as um, we obviously have been in a very strong position from the health perspective, but also um, seen uh, a significant um, strengthening in economic terms. Um, I believe it was both the department's view and the prime minister's view that um, the COVID commission in the form that we had had it, you know, with a number of commissioners meeting regularly, um, was no longer required in that form. So I do have a series of the questions, but I'll just go where you've gone in terms in the form that you've had it, what does that mean? Have you kept on some of the board members to provide advice? Is there an, a replacement for the board? Uh, no, Senator, I'll again ask um, Mr Duggan or Ms Frame if they can help me with the, any ongoing arrangements. But what I was really reflecting was pretty much since we had established it, it had operated as a group of commissioners who came together regularly, mostly virtually, um, and worked through a series of issues, whether they were, as I said, the initial problem-solving ones or um, uh, moving into the sort of more strategic role. Um, and so keeping a, a, a commission that was functioning in that way was the decision um, that was not keeping it functioning in that way was the decision that was taken. I just have a, a memory that we were, um, for a period of time, retaining access to the services of some of those commissioners. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to check. Yeah, so Senator, there's no, there's no sort of formal arrangement to keep in contact with them. There's no um, sort of standing capacity, if you like, or a Sorry, series no. of... No standing capacity or, or series of uh, structured meetings with the commissioners. But the Prime Minister, on making the announcement about the COVID commission um, no longer being in place, did make reference to the fact that he'd continue to consult particularly um, the chairman of the commission, Mr. Ned Powell, through um, on a more uh, informal basis and similarly with other commissioners um, to the extent that it was helpful going forward and to the extent that they um, were able to lend their time to helping the government. So there's no formal arrangement? You said there's no formal arrangement? There's no formal arrangement. Will that be on a for fee service, that consultation, or will it be a phone call to a mate? Uh, Senator, again, it, it hasn't arisen since the COVID commission um, was was uh, ended. So there hasn't been a circumstance in which we have uh, sought their advice. So at this stage, there there's no sort of standing capacity to take them on board on a fee basis or not. So, so no policy in that regard. So what did the Prime Minister mean then when he said that they'll continue to consult? Um, Senator, it was, it was a reference to continuing to engage business in as we move through the next phases of the response to the COVID pandemic, that he would continue to engage with business generally. But in particular, the, um, he found uh, the commissioners a very helpful source of advice. So to the extent that they had expertise, uh, he's left open the, the prospect of contacting them to seek their advice directly. Would you expect that that would be on a four fee service? I wouldn't expect it would be, Senator, no. So it'll be a phone call? Uh, a Email. meeting. Uh, it would depend on the nature of the advice, I think, Senator. And how will that be accountable to the Australian community? Not that the Commission or the Advisory Board was that much, but 
this will be even more yeah. opaque. I think, Senator, I mean, the Prime Minister has meetings with business people and all, all stakeholders from many different parts of, of the community. I don't think it's any different to that, that existing informal arrangement that exists uh, broadly with his meetings with, with people whose, who's, I guess, input he values. But he specifically referenced that when he talked about disbanding the, well, the board. Yep. Why would he then specifically comment on referring to those particular people? Senator, I, I took it as a reference to just uh, having valued their input and um, continuing to value their input going forward. I didn't take it as being uh, his intent to necessarily establish any kind of formal advisory service from those individuals. Thank you. Um, can we go back to when the decision was made and we've talked about why, but any specific, any more, anything you've got to add about why? Was there a formal evaluation done, for example? Uh, there was no formal evaluation done. Uh, the COVID Commission, in finalising its role, gave um, its reflections to the Prime Minister about uh, the advice that they provided and the experience of providing advice to government, um, but there was no formal uh, review process into the, the role of the NCC. Um, why not? See whether it was value for money, whether you'd do it differently in future, in similar circumstances? Uh, I think the Prime Minister, in, in making the public announcement about the COVID Commission having completed its work, reflected very positively on the input that he'd received. Um, it was advice to government. He valued the advice. So I guess the, his evaluation was that it was a positive interaction. Were the, reflect, uh, were the reflections provided in person, verbally, or were the, was there a written report? Were the reflections articulated in a written report? Uh, my recollection, Senator, is that they were provided through the final meeting of the COVID Commission with the Prime Minister, so they were provided verbally. So no written record of those reflections? I'll, I'll have to take that on notice. Could I can't, can't recall there being a rec written record, but I'll, I'll check, Senator, and get back to you. OK, so can we go back to when the decision was made? Uh, yes. Uh, so on the 3rd of May, the Prime Minister made I know that the announcement. I'm sure he didn't make the decision on the 3rd of May. Yep. Uh, I'll have to take on notice when the decision was made. My recollection is it was not much before the 3rd of May. You're joking. What, day before? Two days before? Oh, Senator, I'll have to take it on notice. Thank you. In terms then of um, going back to reflecting on why uh, the decision was made. Hmm. Did the advisory board agree? Ms Foster, you, you touched on this issue that there was some backwards and forwards. Did, did they recommend or agree that they should wind up? Job done? Uh, I can't, I, having not participated in, I wasn't actually participatory in the, um, in the last meeting of the COVID Commission, so Senator, I don't have any first-hand knowledge of whether or not the Commission has reflected on uh, their continuing engagement or not with the government. Um, so I'll, I can take that on notice, Senator, and find out whether there is anyone who can assist you with that. But generally speaking, Senator, um, the members of the Commission, including the Chair, were always very clear that they wanted to be involved for as long as they felt that they could do something useful. Um, and so... Um, I don't anticipate, as Mr Duggan said, he'll chase that up. I don't anticipate that there was any dissension um, around this decision. Thank you. Can we go to now how much this whole process cost? What was the cost, the total cost, first up, of the NCC, when it was the NCC and then when it was the NCC advisory board? So the total for a start. I have a, a figure that in, for, so for financial year 2020-21, um, expenditure for the Commission was approximately $1.06 million, and that included remuneration both for the Commissioners but also the NCC task force that supported the Commissioners. So this was 2021 up to the 3rd of May, is that 
That's correct. Okay, when the, and the advisory board finished. And then work. how much for 1920? Uh, Senator, I don't have that figure in front of me, so I'll need to take that on notice. So 1.06 million. million. That includes all the remuneration you said, plus the various tenders? Uh, yeah, so that, my understanding is that is the full cost. So remuneration, but also the task force. So they were supported by, um, out of Prime Minister and Cabinet, by a, a team uh, that assisted the commissioners in their work. So that included the commissioners, the task force, travelling? Yeah. So my understanding is that is the full cost, Senator. If that's incorrect, I'll... I'll get you further information. Plus the various um, tenders that were let? Uh, yes. So again, I, my understanding is that is the full cost. Some of the tenders were higher cost than that. Senator, I think it might be best if we if we take that financial data I think you're better. on notice so I that we can better. make sure that what we provide you is, is full and accurate. Because I can't see how it adds up sure, to just so that amount of money let us take given that. the tenders that have been released. Let's take, let us take that on notice and so we'll get the information. Could you provide a breakdown in terms of salaries? Oh, salaries because I'm, I'm just, I'm aware that there was yeah. support provided by the department. Um, salaries, research, consulting, travel. So the total, the and, total cost of the commission. And remuneration for the And remuneration, yes, sorry. Um, yes, Senator, remun we'll, we'll take that on notice. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to get that tonight, but we'll, we'll see what we can find. Okay, that'd be appreciated, thank you. Now, I'd also appreciate all the pieces of work, first off a list of the pieces of work that were done and paid for, and which ones have been released publicly. Certainly, Senator, we'll take that on notice and for you. And is there, in, oh, sorry, I interrupted, I beg your pardon. No, I was just saying we'll take that on notice and get you a full list. And is there an intention to release the work and the tenders that have that were paid for by the public purse? Is there an expectation? Are you intending to release those pieces of work? Again, Senator, I'll look at each individual one and we'll give you an answer. Okay, thank you. Um, as well as whether they will be those pieces of work will Correct. be released. Thank you. Um, have all the contracts that were um, granted and given been fulfilled. So there was, you know, the commission commissioned various bits of work, or the board, I'll say it's better, the board in its various guises commissioned various tenders, uh, contracts, have they all been fulfilled? At Centre again, I'd like to look at the detail um, and give you that answer on notice. Okay, thank you. Uh, including anything commissioned by the task forces. I'm aware that there's the commission in its old guise, the board and the task forces. Any of that work and whether they've all been... Certainly, fulfilled. Senator. If not, what happens? Yep. Um, I've asked that one. Can I go then to what some of the... Um, some of the contracts and some of the expenditure was for. In terms of the temporary personnel services that were um, paid for and articulated as EA to the NCCC Chair Labour Hire Services, what did that involve? Uh, so, Senator, um, the executive assistant for the chair, so you recall that um, Mr. Power was essentially full time mm. um, on this. Uh, his executive assistant was hired through a labour hire company, and so that figure relates to. I don't have obviously the figure you've got in front of me, but but uh, I believe that relates to the 
hiring of her services as an executive assistant. Okay, so that's to June 2021. The, the as I understand it, the contract <clears throat> was from March 2020 to June 2021. Is that correct? Uh, so, Senator, my memory is that we set up the, the various contracts to run through to June, mm. um, just as a convenient end point. Um, but it would be my expectation, of course, that um, when Mr Power uh, services ceased, so too did payments under the contract. And they finished on the 3rd of May, is that correct? Um, I'll confirm that for you, but that would be my expectation. OK, thank you. It's the same with the relatable recruiting. They had also had a contract for EA to the NCC Chair, Labor Hire Services. So all up, the two contracts <coughs> are about $200,000. And, and so, Senator, what I'll look at is um, my, my guess is that that's the full extent of the contract. Um, what I should be able to, to find for you is what was actually expended under that contract and when the, when the, the services ceased. And, why, and could you also then explain why there's one and then a second one for a lesser amount, I will acknowledge, um, but they still both of them add up to $200,000. So Senator. were they both expended and how did EA services add up to $200,000? We'll, we'll absolutely look at that for you. Thank you. Um, what was the creative design and editorial services? What did that contract do? Um, Senator, I'm putting out a general call to see if any of my staff have detail of that contract. Perhaps you could also, with all the, um, the consulting, explain not only the expenditure, but what each of them did, because not all of them produced, I've already asked about in terms of the concrete pieces of work that were yes. done, um, but also what some of the other, what all of the contracts that were leased, that were released. Um, what was what was delivered for What them? was delivered. Certainly, Senator. Okay, thank you. And for how long? Um, has there been an assessment of the value for taxpayers' funds expended here? Which I still think is going to add up to more than $1.06 million. Uh, not to my knowledge, Senator. Um, again, I'll, I'll take on notice to see if there's been an evaluation that I'm not aware of. Okay. But, if but, but, but I think, Senator, that goes to some of the comments Mr Duggan was reflecting previously in relation to the value of the input of the Commission um, through an unprecedented time of uh, crisis, through the first recession the country faced in 30 years, uh, and, uh, and the ability um, uh, of the government to be able to draw on uh, the knowledge, advice, skills, experience uh, of the commissioners and do so in a, in a uh, regular and reliable way. Mm. And all they came up with was, let's build a gas pipeline and a gas plant. No, oh, Senator, uh, I think the breadth in of terms discussions of the big had picture, by the... In terms of the big picture... The breadth of discussions had, uh, had uh, you know, with the Commission uh, would have been much wider than that, Senator. That's one of the major reports, isn't it, and findings? Senator, what else? Senator, oh, and Senator, I understand Senator, the logistics. Senator. I've heard about the supply chain. It's what are the other big picture pieces that were delivered? Senator, I can, I can help you with that. Um, so there was some input, and part of the issue here, Senator, is a lot of this input was provided directly to the ministers, who the accountable minister for the portfolio. So, for example, the Commission um, did quite a body of work um, in advising, at the time, um, Minister Andrews around the advanced manufacturing strategy. Um, so there was uh, quite a lot of uh, work that, that went into that particular, particular report. Um, Commissioner Jane Holton provided a lot of expert advice around the health aspects of um, and the interrelationship between the health aspects and the broader aspects of, of the COVID crisis. Um, we received quite um, extensive input from um, Mr Bao Hong on the, the small business aspects of this, in particular um, 
issues relating to some of the industrial relations and broader challenges that that the small business sector were facing. So that information publicly available, so people could critique it and provide. Feedback? A lot of this, a lot of this was provided either directly to the prime minister through meetings, or it was provided um, directly to the accountable cabinet minister for the formulation of policy that was subject, subject then to a cabinet so decision. Where was the contest of ideas then? in terms of this was a hand-picked board by the Prime Minister and the government providing advice direct to them. What about all the people that weren't hand-picked and that had other ideas? Where was the contest of ideas? So Senator, None of this was public. So, Senator, the, um, the COVID Commission was one source of advice to the government and, as for example, in the formulation of the advanced manufacturing strategy, one piece, one input for Minister Andrews at the time in terms of her advice to the Cabinet on the content of that advanced manufacturing strategy, but it was by no means the only input. So, um, like, like all advice, it was contested on the way through and By the, the relevant minister By was whom? able to assess. Where in the public sphere was it contested? Was that was the advice made publicly available? Uh, on, for that particular piece of work, uh, no, Senator. The public, the advice was not made because it was made in the context of informing the minister in terms of the policy that she put, she recommended to the cabinet. So it was an input to a cabinet process. Was any process. research done for the production of that advice? Uh, the Commission did extensive research of its own and extensive consultation um, with industry. Was there a report to go into publicly? That was that report publicly available? My recollection is that report is not publicly available, no. Senator. So again, not publicly contestable. Well, so, so, Senator, the, the process of, uh, of government decision making, policy advice, and so on, indeed involves element of contestability across different uh, government agencies and departments who, uh, who um, provide their analysis, their comments as part of the cabinet decision making processes. Who was, who was consulted in terms of the small business? You said that the board undertook extensive consultation. Who was? Uh, so the board, one of the, the reasons why individual commissioners um, were selected for the board was their networks within the, their areas of expertise. So I mentioned Mr Bauhung. He, one of the things that he was able to bring the, to the commission and its advice was his extensive network with other small business people. So he reflected not only on his own experiences but the experience of others with whom he, he networked with. So the expecta expectation was that when there were particular lines of inquiry that the Commission were providing advice on, that they would use the period um, between that piece of work being, if you like, uh, identified for the Commission to do and then coming back with their advice. They would go out and use their networks and what they would provide then back in would be the balanced view uh, of the Commissioner and the, the inputs that they'd received. Again, all done not publicly but behind closed doors. Uh, I think, as I said, Senator, I mean, it's one input amongst many inputs, and as the Minister said, um, there is a lot of contestability then between that input being provided and the final government policy, including within government, but also Ministers will take advice from a variety of sources. This was simply one source. Thank you. Can I ask, was the Board consulted around the vaccine rollout? Um, Senator, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because I, I didn't actually attend any of the board meetings, so I'll need to take that one on notice. Does Miss Foster know? Sorry, I did ask. I, I know that she's so doing. I was trying to something for yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, so I did ask a question when you weren't present. So I'm, um, I'll just ask it again. Was the board consulted over the vaccine rollout? Senator, I'm afraid I can't answer. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the kind of day-to-day um, -day direction of what the board was doing, but we can, it looks like Ms Frame might be able to help us. Yes, thanks, Senator. I can just, it wasn't the board that um, I consulted with on the vaccine rollout, but in their capacity as the NCC board, but uh, Mr Grigson and myself did have discussions with uh, Jane Holton and Nev Power to talk about the vaccine rollout, um, just to share issues, uh, get their insights. But it wasn't in their capacity as NCC board members, but it was in their capacity as 
people who had um, expertise to share on these issues. And, uh, I'm aware of Ms Holton's um, extensive involvement in health, obviously, but yes. what's Mr Power's expertise in health? Oh, no, it was not in health. It was not, it was not in health. Uh, Mr Power was providing, he was just sharing um, feedback, essentially, that he was receiving from business about business groups, about what they were looking for in terms of clarity from the government about vaccine requirements. This was in very early stages when decisions had not been made, but he was providing insight from his liaison with the business community. And what was business saying? Oh, it was a range of feedback, Senator. Some, some businesses saying, you know, we're comfortable, we, we think we've got all the information we need. Other businesses saying we'd like more information and we'd like more clarity about that. So it, it, was, it was really mixed it feedback, was, but it was, that was the nature of those discussions. Okay. They weren't saying this is what we'd like the rollout to look like, is that what you're oh, saying? Oh, no, 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 Senator. Okay. So no. this was how it would fit into their business arrangements? It was about what the government might be able to do to assist business in terms of their ability to inform employees um, and to assure employees about what the government was contemplating with regard to the vaccine rollout. And uh, the attorney at the time was also convening discussions with unions and other business groups as well. So there were a range of um, consultations occurring at that time in preparation for the vaccine rollout. Okay. So the broader bottom line is there was a series of consultations, but the broader board was not asked for an opinion on not that I'm aware of, Senator. I never attended a board meeting. Okay. I'm not aware of any could, discussions there. Could, could perhaps you take it on notice? We will if, do, Senator. If either the board offered advice, any, regardless of whether they were asked or were they asked certainly for advice. Certainly. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Seawitz. Back to you, Senator Kitching. Um, just to see, can we go back to the Austender contracts? Or? Um, Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. We're just um, no, it's lining up. My, my understanding is you don't want to just know the cost and the, the tender no, process. I you want to know. understand the, yes, what it was I about. Do. And so yeah. people Shall I have been preparing to... more technically. I've just asked them to go back and actually go to the question that you want answered. I see movement at the station. OK, so... Thank you, Martin, Senator. Thank you. Um, three double, uh, contract 377-3312, Quantum Panel. That was so yeah, thank you, I found it. That was social services. Uh, it was a panel arrangement, and it was uh, looking at social policy research. The amount was 31,000. 900, 31,900. Correct. And if you required any more information, uh, you Alison could talk to Alison Frame. Ms. Frame. Sorry. So it was quantum market research, and it was an Oz tender um, contract. And I, I'm just trying to understand. It was a month-long contract for 31,900 dollars for social policy research. I'm just wondering what it was. I don't have any information on that, Senator. Senator I will have to come back to you. Can we go to another line of questioning? Sorry, yes, we we're just can. not cracking this one for you. We'll have another go. Thank you. And it's okay. Oh, Senator, I, I have been given some information Great. that pertains to that one. Thank you. Um, it was instigated by the BETA team. Uh, which are the behavioural insights team within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. They're a business unit within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, they're part of my social policy group. Um, so the information I have from, this re from the project is that it was to gather initial insights into how to design and implement a silica warning label to protect workers from silicosis, a lung disease caused by inhaling dust from engineered stone and it involved 20 online interviews with workers who handle engineered stone. Uh, the interviews have been completed and a report of findings is currently being drafted and will be sent to the Department of Health when completed. And they were selected through an open tender panel arrangement managed by the Department of Social Services. 
Okay. But on the on the, the agency on the on the contract notice is PMC. So were it's, you doing it for health? No, sorry, when I said managed by, I think the panel was set up by the Department of Social Services and PM&C selected them through the open tender panel arrangement. Right, okay. Okay. Do you have anything on Chat House? Chat House, I do. So that Senator? was social policy research for $22,880. $22, and what, what did that do? That's, that's correct, Senator. That's also a, some research conducted by the BETA team in Prime Minister and Cabinet. It was to better understand the attitudes, experiences and behaviours to navigating training and study options by young people aged 16 to 25. Um, it was undertaken in partnership with the department, uh, with DESI. Uh, they involved two online focus groups and 10 one-on-one -on -one interviews with 16 to 25-year-olds. This research has also been completed and the research findings have been provided to DESI. And again, Chathouse was selected from a competitive limited tender process. Mm. Um, where there's um, a component where there's online interviews, which I think was in quantum market research, this had two online focus groups and then there was a report being written or analysis being done of that, those focus groups, for example. Do you get a breakdown of in the case of chat house research for nearly 20 just under 23,000 do you get a breakdown in that $23,000 of you know where the value is the value really in the analysis is the online focus groups do you get a breakdown of the different elements of the service being provided I don't get that breakdown, Senator, but I'll take it on notice. Um, I haven't seen either yeah, of these I'm pieces just, of I'm research. Yes. It's quite customary for BETA to undertake these projects and provide reports to commissioning departments, and uh, they don't get um, considered by right. me unless okay. it's something that is directly relevant or they're seeking my view on. So I haven't seen them, but I can take that on notice and get you some information on Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the last one is just Suzanne, is Su I shouldn't say just, is Suzanne Cowley. Um, oh, sorry, a NAUS group. So, I Mr. think Dutton can take you through um, 3519 and 3312. Great, thank you. Great. So, Thanks. Senator, uh, so we have engaged NAUS to undertake an evaluation of the effectiveness of our deregulation task force and the regulator performance. So, is this NAUS? Is this NAUS group? It is NAUS group. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, the contract commenced on the 8th of December and will conclude on the 31st of May. So 8th of December to the, to the so sort of six months. Yes, that's correct. And so what we what we were asking them to do is to develop an evaluation strategy and a program logic, and then conduct the evaluation. Okay, and that was three hundred and twenty nine thousand. Uh, I have in my notes three hundred and fifty thousand, inclusive of GST. So that would be yeah. that would line up. Yes. Okay, and. Can you give me any more detail on, do you have any breakdowns of the 350? Uh, Senator, I don't have that in front of me, no. I'll, I can take that on notice if that's helpful. Yep, that's okay. And, and we'll come to Suzanne Cowley, but if, the, do you, does PM&C regularly do these, these pieces of research for other departments? Is that how it works? I'm, so, for yeah. example, in the one that we were discussing, Ms. Frame, is it better that PM&C does it, or is it better that social services does it, or do you do it together? Uh, the two that I um, outlined, Senator, are BETA, the behavioural economics team. So they're leading a behavioural economics project. So they work with the commissioning department, DESI or health, in the case of the silicosis. And the department says, we want to ascertain more information about this group. We want to understand what kind of messages would be most effective, what gets through. It, it's with that very specific behavioural insights lens. So um, BETA then work with the commissioning department to, they would undertake a um, Analysis. competitive tender oh, process so or select from a panel, whatever was appropriate. I gave you an example of, of each where there was a limited tender process and another where they used an existing panel to find a provider. So in essence, Senator, BETA represents a capability that can be drawn on by other government departments. Um, and that's essentially the work that 
and, and they do that in, in collaboration with others. And are they keeping a, almost like a corporate memory in the sense, you know, we had this research done that might impact over here in something some other department's doing? I mean, is that what it's yeah. essentially, is it sort of a department that's collating, in a, in a way, keeping information and being a centre for that kind of research? Is that? It, it's real specialty is the, is the skills that it brings to the task. So the skills in behavioural um, insights. The, um, people used to often refer to it as, as, as nudge, um, as, how to, as nudge, how to change people's behaviours. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, Ms Foster. I just wanted to add to that, Senator, that this research that they undertake, and they're fairly small quantums because they're just one input yeah. to the um, work that they produce for the commissioning department, and they might also do some aspects of experimental design and trials of different approaches and provide a report to a department. So these, these things are often a one... Um, they, they might conduct some interviews as part of a study into a particular policy area in order to provide a department with some insights as to what policy approaches might be most effective. So the, there's the contract winner um, or the contractor is providing, so it might do the focus groups, but BETA is also providing an overlay, a valuable overlay. Would yes. you say that? Yes, Senator, yes, okay. I would. Thank you. Um, and so I think um, Mr Duggan has another. Susanna Cowley. Uh, no. Senator, I was just going to add to, to Ms Rames' answer. Yes. So the, the contracts that uh, I refer to with, with the NOWS group, uh, one of them is with the deregulation task force. Right. So that's a task force housed within PMNC, so it's for the purpose of conducting an evaluation of that task force's work. The other one is with respect to a regulator performance function, and so we have within PMNC accountability for regulatory policy issues within government. And so it was directly to inform uh, both an evaluation of our regulatory policy function, but also the second contract is around assisting us with uh, a effectively a, a stakeholder and change management engagement strategy, because part of what we're aiming to do there is to assist regulators to lift to, to the highest standards of regulatory performance. And so a big part of this is how we engage broadly with the regulatory community. So we've asked NAUS to help us with, okay. with that endeavour. And you'll f it'll finish next Monday? So we, we've got two contracts. The one I, the dates I referred to um, with respect to, um, I think it is 37735199. Yes. That's the one that concludes on the 31st of May. The other one, um, which is with respect to the deregulation task force and the evaluation that is going on there, that runs from the 22nd of January uh, this year to the 30th of June next year. Okay. And so Susan I think we've now done everything but Susanna. I think that Cowley, yes. is that right? Yes, it is. Thank <laughs> yes. you. I knew we'd get there in the end. <laughs> And thank you for organising that. Hi, Senator. David Pullen, Assistant Secretary, Infrastructure, oh. Transport and Regional. So your question around... Yes, Susanna. So, Susanna Cowley. Yes. So that was $38,390 for 10 days' work? Uh, correct, Senator. It was to produce uh, four by three minute video case studies, exemplifying good practice soil health management in four land management scenarios. Uh, to support the uh, Soil Organic Carbon Forum on the 22nd of April, as well as to support future field days, conferences and talks as part of the Soil Advocates role, Senator. Thank okay. you. So that, was that just being done for PMNC or was there another department involved? That was being done for the Soils Advocate, Senator. For the soil Soils Advocate. Sure. Whose role, Senator, is to advocate on behalf of the government on healthy soil? <laughs> Thank you very much. I've resisted it all, all for the last 48 hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Foster. Um, I might move on to uh, Ms. Adamson's um, finishing and her and her replacement. So I'm not sure. Yes, Senator. Um, 
So, Senator Payne announced that Ms Adamson would complete her term on the 25th of June this year. Ms Adamson's contract was till for another month later than that. That's correct? Oh, okay. That's my memory, Senator. Yes, it was till the middle of the year. Why, did, why is she going a month earlier? Was that by mutual agreement or why is she going earlier than her contract? I think, Senator, it was related to taking up her new appointment. I don't think that's till October. So I'm advised she is completing her contract, but the last four weeks she will be on leave. Very sensible. Um, I'm going to ask this, but I don't think you'll, you'll answer it. Um, is there, has there been a decision made about who will, who will replace Miss Adamson? Um, not to my knowledge, Senator. Right. But Section 58 of the Public Service Act outlines the manner in which secretaries are appointed. Um, has Mr Gagins consulted with Mr Walcott about a possible appointment? Um, not at this stage, Senator. When do you think he'll do that? Uh, Senator, that, I'm sure that will be done in time to um, ensure uh, a replacement for Ms Adamson. OK. So potentially in the next four weeks sometime? Uh, potentially, yes, Senator. Um, has Mr Gagins consulted with Senator Payne and Mr Tian? I don't believe so, Senator. Because they're part of the consult the committee. Um, Senator, it's not a, a committee as such. I think the Public Service Act is framed in terms of the secretary consulting. Yes, with. a consultative, yes. Yeah. Um, when do you think that will have to happen in the next four weeks as well? Uh, indeed it will, Senator, although of course there's always the option for acting arrangements in secretary's yeah. roles. So. It's not, um, it's not the case that the department could not continue to function very effectively um, if, if that were not in place um, by that time. But I have no um, insight into the Prime Minister's intent about the timing of filling that role. OK. Um, that's all on that. Uh, I might move to the Cabinet Delivery Committee's of national cabinet ministerial meetings, National COVID Commission, if that helps sure. in with people coming to the table. So we're starting with, with, with the cabinet delivery committees. So I mean the policy implementation the committee, committee. service delivery and coordination committees. Okay, so the so these are cabinet subcommittees. Yes. Senator? Yes. Um, so depending on where the questioning goes, yes. they are we may committees be, of the Cabinet. We may be Thank limited you. in our Thank capacity you. to answer. But. Thank you. Um, how many times is a... I'll wait for... Hi. Sorry, Senator. Go ahead. Thanks, Ms McGregor. Um, how many times has the Policy Implementation Committee met? And also, how does that differ from the Service Delivery and Coordination Committee? Um, Leonie McGregor, First Assistant Secretary, Cabinet Division. Senator, I'll have to take on notice exactly how many times the committee has met. Um, and My other question, so how does it differ from the existing Service Delivery and Implementation Committee? Oh, they have two quite different... Can you um, explain that? Remits in general, I can explain. The Policy Implementation Committee has been established in order to, um, as its name suggests, <laughs> uh, track implementation very specifically. Um, the SDCC Committee meets separately and really considers um, issues around communication of policy implementation, so quite different remits. And um, is it communicating internally and externally? usually externally. I think there are a series of published guidelines yeah, around the I'm SDCC as looking well. Looking at your terms of reference, so the terms of reference for the PIC? Yep. Policy Implementation Committee? Yes. Yep. Um, is established as a standing cabinet committee to provide regular strategic oversight of implementation of the government's policy agenda budget and election commitments. The committee's objectives are to 
monitor delivery of the government's agenda, develop and analyse metrics to assess whether policies are being implemented in a timely, effective and efficient manner, ensure cross-portfolio integration and consistency of approach on the government's policy agenda, identify major risks to policy delivery and report regularly to the Cabinet. Who are the members of that committee? Uh, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Health and Aged Care, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services, and the Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and Cabinet as an observer. Okay. Um, and then the SDCC Senator um, considers implementation of the government's key priorities, including joined up service delivery and communications. And the members of that committee are... I think I've got an updated version here of that. You go for it. Yep, so the SDCC, we've got Minister for Employment, Workforce Skills, Small and Family Business, Minister for the Environment, Attorney General, Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister for Defence Personnel, Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs and the Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Okay. Um, so in so Budget Paper 1... Yeah. It looks like Ms Le McGregor has a more updated list. Yes, I'm just sorry, going to correct sorry. the membership of the PIC for you. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm just tracking that one down. The Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, the Treasurer, Minister for Finance, Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister for the Environment, Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. Thank you. Um, so in, in budget paper one, it talks about you know the government's goals, including you know recovery from the pandemic. In the beginning bit of BP one, how does the so with with the pick, is it so when those maybe this is to, to use um, Senator Birmingham, um, so that those so that committee would look at those. So when the budget being written, um, you would look at those the goals in for the budget, and that committee would then deliver, ensure that, that policy, those policies, or that policies went to those goals of the, of, that are out, outlined in BP1? Not, not quite as you're putting it, Because I'm there, wondering Senator, if, if, um, goal, if goals change of a the, government, how does that committee, does that committee just update those and continue on? So, so um, type of role you're talking through is probably more a function of the Expenditure Review Committee in the framing of the budget and ensuring that budget decisions align with uh, policy objectives and priorities uh, of the government in terms of making those decisions. The policy Implementation Committee um, is, uh, is a function more aligned to tracking the implementation of those decisions um, and, uh, and monitoring the effectiveness of that implementation, the meeting of benchmarks and, and, um, and KPIs against them type considerations. Obviously, it varies wildly depending on the type mm. of decision you're talking about. Um, and, uh, 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 and how changing circumstances might be impacting upon some of those decisions that have already been taken and are meant to be being delivered uh, across government. Okay, and that committee also looks at election election commitments as well. I think um, that's what Ms. Foster it, 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 it would um, in uh, in the sense of election commitments as part of government policy um, actions that have been activated. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I remember the similar role when I worked in the Victorian Treasurer's office. Um, in the Service Delivery and Coordination Committee, is that all? So that's communicating out decisions of government. Is that basically right? Oh, well, yeah. That's kind of the well, description, sort of. I think oh, I, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but I think yeah. that's. Essentially, what yeah. Ms. Foster said. Considers the best way to communicate to 
the community around government priorities? Around and government priorities. Well, and, and, and ensuring a coordination of, of communication. Yeah. Um, so, and would that include the roles that the PIC has? So we would communicate that as well, what that committee... So, for example, an election commitment, it, would it... Would the SDCC also be communicating those out? Um, I, think, uh, I think sort of it's, in, it's probably in, it depends, uh, Senator. I think um, um, the fact that a policy is an election commitment wouldn't really change I mean, sort of whether it mm. um, was something that necessitated SDCC consideration or necessarily pick consideration, although sort of big type processes might pick it up a little bit more. Okay. Um, Ms McGregor, I think you're ta you've taken on notice how many times the picks yeah. met. So I just note that the Prime Minister announced on the 30th of October that it would, and I quote, track implementation of government initiatives across all portfolios to ensure they are delivering outcomes for Australians. So would your, I mean, would it meet once a month? How often do you think because you're, Senator Birmingham, you're, you're on both of these. So um, how often do you think it needs to change? Oh, you're, sorry, you're not on the, you're not on the, no, not not on the other, you're on the It's about, on you're the on the cabinet peak. committee that I'm not. But. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it does meet reasonably regularly, okay. Senator, yeah. Okay. Um, could I move on to, Ms Foster, you were missed and your notes had to be looked at. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Could I ask about national cabinets cabinet status? Um, is it is the Prime Minister's position that it is a committee of the cabinet? Yes. Yes. So it attracts FOI and other ex the exemptions under the Freedom of Information. That's correct, Senator. Legislation. Okay. Um, is it a cabinet committee in its own right? or is it a subcommittee of a cabinet committee? It, it's established as um, a cabinet policy committee, so as a COPC. Is that the cabinet office policy That's committee? That's right, yes. And it's a subcommittee, it's a subcommittee of the cabinet office policy committee? Well, so it's established as that type of a committee. The so, type? So, so the COPC is, we would characterise that as a particular type of committee and that is um, how the National Cabinet has been established. Thanks. OK, I see. The Cabinet Office Policy Committee is just a real... It's one, is there one... Who are the members of that? So it will change depending on what the particular committee has been set up to consider. So the Cabinet Office Policy Committee, my understanding is it's a one-person committee, the Prime Minister. Well, it... It's a committee, uh, all cabinet committees are uh, established by the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister determines the membership um, and he does that in the same way with the Cabinet Office Policy Committee. It's just that the membership remains fluid because though that committee is set up to consider particular topics, issues, um, you know, matters of national significance. And so the membership is established essentially on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the, on the on the issue being considered by that committee. So can you give me an example of what the Cabinet Office Policy Committee might consider from time to time? I'm um, just trying to think off the top of my head. I mean, the National Cabinet has really been the main, <laughs> um, the main type, the main committee established there. Um, We've had so others. Senator, without, without, um, clearly going into details to say this happened or that happened, yes. mm. if there were an issue which required some um, deep consideration um, by pulling together the right group of ministers yeah. to consider it, mm. for example, if there were, we were at a particular point of consideration about drought. aged care or drought or yes. any big topic, then a uh, COPSI could be formed to consider that that issue. Okay, so there, there's a Cabinet Office Policy Committee and National Cabinet is the same type of committee 
formulating membership dependent well, on the issue at, at Well, no, I mean, it was formed, Senator, with a, a determined membership because the, um, if you like, the remit of that group is, is clear. It's to bring together the um, First Ministers. So, but it is a similar type of committee to the, to the Cabinet Office Policy Committee. Is that what you... Yes, it's been, it's been established as a Cabinet Office Policy Committee. So if you think of it as you've got Cabinet Office Policy Committee, those can be established dependent on, as Ms Foster referred to, sort of issues that may need, um, you know, significant attention or consideration. Um, and a National Cabinet has been established as that type of a committee, so as it's looking at you know, a major issue. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, do the Premiers know that essentially their committee is a Cabinet Office Policy Committee? Yes, they do. And have, have, any, have any of the Premiers commented on that? So, Senator, the, the Premiers, as a Premiers and Chief Ministers as a group, agreed that um, they wished to be constituted um, as a committee of cabinet. Mm. I'm not sure that the finer points of exactly what kind of committee are important to them, but the principle of being established as a committee of cabinet um, was okay. one that they agree, agreed um, jointly. Okay. But it is sort of a similar committee. It is a cabinet office policy committee. Yes, I would yes. characterise it as okay. that. Um, could I ask, who's providing instructions to the Council representing the Commonwealth in Senator Patrick's AAT matter? Um, I'll just get Mr Reid back to the table oh, for that, Thanks, Senator. Mr Reid. Is that the end of your questions around sort of um, cabinet issues? I'm afraid not. <laughs> That's fine. We'll keep Ms, uh, Ms. <laughs> McGregor close by. Well. Yep. John's up there. Do you want to hear that? No, he's fine. Mr. Sorry, Reed. Senator, could you re repeat the question? Um, who's re who's instru providing instructions to the Council representing the Commonwealth in Senator Patrick's AAT matter? Contesting um, the, the Cabinet status or, or you know, the discussion around that um, of the National Cabinet. So PMC is, Senator? And um, if I go to the org chart, will you be able to tell me which section? It's, it's government division, so that's my division. Are you are you providing instruction? Uh, yes, Senator. Well, the matters, the judgment's reserved, so yes. we, we were though. You were providing instruction. So that's you and is that Mr. Rush, as well? Uh, no, the branch that's run it is, is the legal policy branch. Okay. So that's. Ms. Gartman. Ms. Gartman. Ms. Gartman. Okay. Um, can I ask what the what's the cost so far to the Commonwealth? In uh, Senator, I don't know that I have them. Um, Are you instructing senior counsel and a junior? Yes. Or two? Uh, senior counsel, Mr. Berger, QC, has been engaged on and that one. One junior, two. Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that on notice. I think. It was Mr. Berger supported by an AGS solicitor. Okay. No junior counsel. Okay. Um, so you'll take on notice the cost to the Commonwealth. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, are you confident that it will be upheld? Uh, Senator, the government's okay. confident of the arguments it's made. Okay. Um, has the department received or issued? Any instructions to draft amendments to the FOI Act to make it clear that, that exemptions that apply to Cabinet apply to the National Cabinet? Uh, Senator, we've been considering a range of options there. Um, I'd have to take on notice what instructions or otherwise might have been issued. Um, what are the options you're looking at? Well, in terms of legislative solutions as well. And what as are the they? What are the legislative solutions that you are looking at? Senator, that would probably go to advice that we've provided um, either to the Prime Minister or to other, other ministers. I'd just have to take that on notice. 
Um, thank you. When did you start considering legislative options around this matter, around this case? Uh, Senator... Um, Sorry, around the issues that this case presents. Around so, National Cabinet mm. and Cabinet protections. Uh, it would have been last year, Senator. What, can you give me a month? I'd have to take it on notice, Senator. Um, in terms of the legislative options you were looking at, who initiated that, you know, that process? Senator, I'm not sure there's a, a, a process per se um, in terms of where ideas may have originated. Um, I suspect within the department we've been talking about possible paths. What I'm, what I'm really asking you is, did this, did Senator Patrick's case um, inspire the department to look at legislative solutions to this matter? Because obviously Parliament is supreme in our system, so if Parliament enacts some legislation, it won't matter what the AAT decides. So are you looking at, were, were, you, were these legislative solutions being looked at because Senator Patrick initiated this action? Senator, I'd have to look at the timing of different pieces of work that were going on. Mm. I, I just need to take that on notice in terms of when different pieces were started, and I'm not 100% sure of the date of uh, the initiation of Senator Patrick's action. And you'll take on notice who, who initiated that, you know, who, who had the thought? Certainly, Senator. The, the discussions around National Cabinet's uh, operation as a Cabinet structure uh, with the standards and protections of a Cabinet structure certainly go back at least mm. to May last year. Uh, the Prime Minister was... Yes. ..and Premiers were asked about, to, but, about that. Yes, and I guess really if Senator Patrick wanted... To, let's say Senator Patrick wanted to um, discover some documents and then was told that National Cabinet was, you know, had the exemptions for cabinet applied to national cabinet. He then initiates his legal matter, his legal action, and then someone thinks, well, actually, we've got a legislative solution, and we won't have to really worry about the AAT's decision. You see, that's yeah, what I'm really I, asking. I, I, I see what you're saying, Mr. Yeah. Reid's obviously undertaking to have a look in terms of timelines or otherwise, but. Uh, um, the intent has certainly been consistent um, mm. from the establishment. Mr Reid, have you been involved in discussions that um, links possible FO amendments to FOI legislation um, with Senator Patrick's action in the AAT? Senator, I've, I've definitely had discussions around legislative amendment, I, I couldn't recall whether they were linked to Senator Patrick's action. As Senator Birmingham says, the, um, the intent around National Cabinet as a committee of Cabinet has been clear, um, but I'm not sure that I could say that any of those discussions were linked to Senator Patrick's litigation. Okay. Maybe the timing will give it some indication around Certainly, that. Senator. Um, On the 17th of March this year, Mr Morrison wrote to Mr Albanese in connection with the FOI Act and the Jenkins Review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplace, workplaces. Mr Morrison responded that the Parliament will, and I quote, the Parliament will consider relevant Council of Australian Government legislation that makes amendments to the FOI Act. What is the Council of Australian Government legislation that makes amendments to the FOI Act? Sorry. I'm, I'm happy to read Mr Morrison's... So the, the issue, and Mr Reid will correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, 
the COAG legislation um, needs to be updated to reflect the change from COAG to National Cabinet. I think that was the trigger for changes to the COAG Act. So, so and when was that? So when was the, the updating of the COAG legislation, is it? That, that has been underway for a, a little while, I think. Since um, certainly since the second half of 2020, 20. Senator. Mm. Um, and it hasn't been, has anything been drafted? Have amendments been drafted? Or whatever you need to, is it amendments to the Act, is it, to, that you're drafting? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking around. We have a, um, a team that, that looks after intergovernmental relations um, and they may have a little more, bit more detail about the timing, um, timing of that. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a sort of consequential action mm. as a result of the changes that were made, well, in fact, the disestablishment of but COAG. The COAG, it didn't have a, co a cabinet FOI exemption, did it? I don't believe so, Senator. The COAG wasn't established so. as an um, element of Cabinet. And there was no FOI exemption. That's my understanding, but I stand up uh, happy to be correct. That, that's right, Senator. Yeah, there's, except, no, there's no specific except exemption. Except, Senator, of course, um, within the FOI Act, there is an exemption around damage to Commonwealth, Commonwealth state, state relations. relations. And so um, if, for example, uh, a, say, a state had provided a document mm. um, that it yeah, believed would harm its relationship with the Commonwealth if it were released, or vice versa, then um, either party might seek to apply that FOI ex exemption. Yes. So if the COAG legislation didn't have an FOI exemption, but National Cabinet, Sorry. You, the Commonwealth is arguing, does. So, sorry, Senator, I'm not sure there's, when you refer to COAG legislation. Well, the, oh, well, I should really say the Council of Australian Government legislation. Well, Senator, I'm, what I can say is the FOI Act did not have a specific exemption for the Council of Australian Governments, but as Ms Foster says, there's an exemption in relation to state, Commonwealth state relations. And is... Um, um, the legislation uh, that you're referring to as COAG legislation is effectively, as I understand it, consequential legislation which would amend references to the Council of Australian Governments and ministerial councils that exist in a range of pieces of legislation. So yes. it's not actually so, yes. COAG. It's not a COAG. Yeah, sorry, my, there's, there's, my... no, there's no single COAG legislation. Yeah, no, sorry, no, that was my mistake. The, it's it... the Council of Australian Government legislation. No, it's, Senator, that was my misspeaking, sorry, as I was saying, and I thought that doesn't sound right. It's references to COAG in legislation. And which, which act is it in? It's in many acts, many acts my understanding. Yes. A number of different pieces um, of legislation. What do you propose the bill to, is going to do? The amendments you're going to make? The, the amendments to the to, references to COAG? Yes. Um, Senator, we're trying to get the experts into the into the room for you, but um, my understanding is it's to um, change the legislation to reflect that COAG doesn't uh, exist and it's as a COAG cabinet. anymore, and that it has been essentially replaced by national cabinet. And does it give an FOA exemption specifically for so, national cabinet? So. Um, if, if we think about it as a kind of replacement action, yes. then, then there would be no additional FOI protections as, as a result of those legislative changes. But you can see if the Council of Australian Government or COAG didn't have an FOI exemption, but National Cabinet, and National Cabinet is effectively replacing COAG, uh, then one did not have a FOI exemption and one the Commonwealth argues does. So, Senator, I think we're conflating two, the AAT. conflating two issues. Um, one is essentially an, an administrative action to clean up legislation, to remove references to a body that doesn't exist anymore. There is a separate issue around 
the fact that National Cabinet was established as a committee of cabinet and therefore attracts right, the okay. FOI things. They're two separate issues. So there won't, so there will be no amendment to any legislation. Well, you, the Commonwealth would consider that there was no need for a specific FOI exemption to apply to National Cabinet because the argument is that in fact it is a committee of cabinet and therefore is does attract an FOI exemption. So, Senator, that is the, the um, Commonwealth's position and that's, as you know, at the heart of um, the case which is currently before the AAT, which, of course, we yes. can't comment on because the decision's withheld. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr Reid. I might move on to ministerial meetings now. Um, the federation.gov.au website lists a series of ministers' meetings. Are these meetings replacing the former COAG councils and ministerial fora? Have I got that right? Is that, hap is that what's happening? Yeah, there are a range of um, reform committees. Are those the ones that you're referring to, Senator? Sort of yes. national, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Reid, before, before Mr. Reid goes out the door, <laughs> could I just Not so nearly much. escaped? <laughs> you nearly quick. escaped. <laughs> He's only going to be in the waiting room. So. Yeah. <laughs> Could I just ask you, so the COAG, the, I'm going to call it the COAG bill, what if the amendments that you're making to the Council of Australian Government legislation. Or to legislation that includes references to, to, to COAG. COAG. Yes, thank you. Um, that, will, that is not going to make clear that National Cabinet attracts the FOI Cabinet exemption. It's not going to explicitly. So it, um, Mr Reid and I aren't actually the ones leading on these changes. Um, I've just established that um, the relevant officer isn't here, so I'm afraid we're going to have to take, take that on notice. Um, but my understanding is that this project was initiated not in the context of the second issue yes. around cabinet confidentiality, but was rather, as I said, an administrative process to clean up legislation. So it's, it's the amendments will only be of an administrative nature. They won't be, so, for example, adding... So, Senator, that's the bit I'm going to have to take on notice okay. because I don't have yeah. the person who's no, no, actually that's... responsible for the drafting with me. I don't believe you do. Um, So, so I, I just need, we, we need to get the yeah. expert advice. No, 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 Sorry, Senator. Yes. Senator Birmingham, did you wish no, to? I, I was simply just confirming my recollection that there, there isn't actually a bill before right. Parliament or anything at this, uh, this point in time, I don't believe, Senator. So um, yeah, there are processes for any legislation to go through in terms of signing off on its policy intent and so forth. OK. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reid. Um, run. So I think we're up to the. <laughs> <laughs> yes, run. Um, Stay I think, if you like. <laughs> I think we're up to the. Um, the ministers' meetings are replacing the COAG meetings in the ministerial fora that were occurring. And there's a list of meetings described as, and I quote, time limited and when needed. These meetings are convened for a maximum of 12 months to deliver on specific priorities before disbanding. Yes. What does it mean to say these meetings are disbanding? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think it means what it says. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that they'll be convened for a limited time and then they'll be disbanded once the issue that they're convened to consider um, has been considered. So they're not intended to be ongoing standing committees, but they're actually intended to deliver on particular matters or issues um, at the time. So, Senator, if I can give some context to that, I think if you, if you um, go back to the replacement of COAG by this new structure, um, I think there was a sense that um, there had been a plethora of COAG bodies that were perhaps started for very good reasons and continued. And so in designing a new system, we were wanting to ensure 
that we didn't repeat the problems of the past and that we therefore made sure that when we established something, it was for a particular purpose to deliver something um, and when that thing had been delivered or if that purpose was no longer a high priority that should be engaging the First Ministers, um, then it didn't, it didn't go on past its yes. useful life. That's very efficient and good, I think. It's much more um, eloquent than my description. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> much more eloquent than yes. my description. <laughs> um, so one of the Minister's meetings in the time-limited list is the meetings, meeting of Attorneys General. Is that, so there's a 12 month time period. Is that going, is that meeting, that will also disband after 12 months? That's, or, that's the intention, is that they're considering specific issues and then they, then, and then they would disband. Um, so they might, I don't know, I'm thinking, so they might um, look at particular law reform or something. That's right. Yep. But won't they have, but then will they be re, Convened again for an, the for next something twelve else. months, or 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 for some or for an additional issue, so they can always be reconvened. That that's that's my understanding. But we might need to take that on notice just to mm. check. There's also Senator, of course. Um, uh, I think the PM has been clear that if groups of ministers wish to meet together to prosecute business that they think is important to do cross-jurisdictionally, then of course they should do that. Mm. This is about which bodies are, um, form part of this architecture. And so should the Attorneys General believe that they had an agenda that they wish to meet regularly on and prosecute um, of their own volition, they, they would of course do that. Yeah. But this meeting, well in fact when I look at, you know, there's health, environment, Sorry, sorry. When there's time limited and when needed, so there's agriculture, attorneys general, community services, but the regular and ongoing meetings are meetings like health, mm. environment. That's right, etc. But wouldn't the attorneys general be needing to meet much? They would need to have regular and ongoing meetings, but they're in the time limited meetings. So, Senator, it really is a question of um, uh, did First Ministers consider that they needed a focus on issues involving Attorneys General on an ongoing basis? Um, as I said, the Attorneys General can meet together at any time. And that would still be a COAG or a... National, National Cabinet. Cap or fe <laughs> federal Relations. Federal Relations, federal relations meeting. Right. Yes. So if they chose to meet outside this architecture, it would not be part of the architecture. Yes. But for the moment, they're meeting um, on a time-limited basis That's within right. and the architecture. That's right. And it may be that in future, um, the Prime Minister and First Ministers consider again the architecture and make a decision to do something different so the intention is that it remains responsive to um, you know major policy issues state and territory and commonwealth issues as they emerge over time so it's not just stuck there um, you know kind of you know ongoing but but is revisited looked at and is a f more flexible arrangement than perhaps coag was so the agriculture ministers are in time limited, in the time limited category. Mm. How many occasions have they met? And that will also disband. The agriculture ministers meeting will also disband after the 12 month period. That, that's Un the unless an active decision is taken to continue it within yes. this framework. Yeah. And the Northern Development meeting of ministers will also disband after 12 months? With the same caveat, Senator that um, either there could be a decision by First Ministers to continue it, or they could decide to continue outside the architecture, or they could say, our job together for the time being is done, and we'll reconvene at a point in the future. Yeah. And the, the intent, Senator, really is to be action-oriented in yeah. that sense, that uh, uh, if there is a purpose to get something done for uh, ministers across the Federation in a particular portfolio area to be coming together, then excellent. Um, but the standing committee structure that 
you know, sees the focus at the end of next meeting being on when the next meeting will be and uh, and committing to the next meeting even if uh, if it is a series of standing reports that are provided is you know, not seen as uh, in all areas or in these areas as being where first ministers you know, want their ministers to be spending time they want them to be focused on delivering outcomes and actions and uh, and so um, keeping keeping a attention if you like there in relation to the committee structures that they are intended to come together when there's things to be done and to be making those decisions to get those things done. Are you saying people work better with a deadline? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Maybe may, may a little of that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Why does nothing ever get done? Uh, well, is it, is, is I, 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 well I, 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 Senator, as I think um, in the conversation we've been having about COAG, it's uh, COAG probably been the... Um, but of many discussions for a long time, not all of them fair, I would say, mm. but, uh, um, but uh, uh, there was perhaps a sense that you know, a process had overtaken an outcomes approach in relation to COAG operations at times. And so, so now we've got a first, slogan, but so sure first, so first ministers in, uh, in making the decision to shift to the national cabinet structure believe that uh, I think that you know, they have found a more effective vehicle for direct communications between themselves and from that also wanting to drive a more effective vehicle for how their ministers across the Federation engage with one another. It'd be awfully good if it get behind a vaccine rollout, but I'll leave it at the kitchen, I'm sorry. Could you just give us some one moment? That looks like exciting news, Claire. Whatever it is. Chair, I might just take us to dinner if that's okay. Um, the um, could I have Mr. Martin back to the um, table? Is he there, there? You are. Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Thanks, Ms. McGregor. So I want to ask some questions about uh, freedom of information uh, application number 2021, uh, which relates to the Prime Minister's Office Cabinet wall. If you across that, Mr Martin, I'll give you a moment to, to come to it. Thank you. Um, what, what is the PMO cabinet wall? Where, where is it located? Senator, can you just give me the number of the um, FOI decision again? Yes, of course. Uh, 2021 uh, slash 04. So, Senator, this is a backdrop that's used for virtual meetings, virtual international engagements? Um, the FOI relates to the selection of a new blue pattern for the Prime Minister's banner in the Cabinet Room for government engagements. That's right, isn't it? That's right, Senator. I see the early colour schemes email, on, email, which I think is on the 26th of August, is the traditional dark blue. Yes. Now, later, on the same day, 
Um, an email arrives at 3.36 p.m. directing that the options are to be generated in a, in a mid-tone blue. Do you see that? Three fifty six, I'm sorry, on the um, on the twenty sixth of August. Senator, I'm just scrolling through the FOI decision. I'm not seeing the It's on for me, it's from in my It's on about page eleven, I think. So document one was an email around 3.15 p.m. Yep, so, uh, and then... Document two is another email. Now this is document two. If you go, so the first um, email there is on Friday the 28th of August. And then the 26th of August at 4.09. Uh, and then at, on the 26th of August at 3.56. Oh, yes, Senator, I've got that. It's from Creative Services, whoever they are. And it, it says all options to be generated in a mid-tone blue. That's right, isn't it? That's right, Senator. Who's, who's this email exchange between? So Creative Services Senator, I can tell you, is a part of the communications branch. Um, that's the in the area department. That's in the in the department, that's the area that's responsible for graphic design. Um, essentially, they were doing the design work on on the possible banners. Mm. They've exchanged an email with um, someone who has been deleted as irrelevant by the look of things. Um, but it looks like. It may have been with our protocol and international visits area who are responsible for delivering these virtual engagements. Before uh, seeing this FOI, I hadn't heard of a mid-tone blue, but I'm artistically challenged. I guess we'll come to that later. Um, can you tell me who, um, or can someone in communications tell me who suggested that all banner options be generated in a mid-tone blue? So, Senator, I understand that um, there were various different shades of blue that were experimented with. Mm. And the mid-tone blue was the one after consultation with our IT area, who are responsible for delivering the uh, IT around the events, that that was the colour that worked best technically. Worked best technically. It wasn't someone from the Prime Minister's office who initially suggested mid-tone blue to, to your staff? No, Senator, it wasn't. Their sign-off was needed on the banner, wasn't it? Um, Senator, we certainly, yes, would have consulted with the Prime Minister's office, absolutely. Well, it's a bit more than consulted. I think um, through here it says the next steps from our side. So this is uh, document one in the second email. Next steps from our side would be gain PMO's sign-off. Yes, Senator. And, and Senator, I think we'd expect to do that when we were preparing something for the PM's use. So can, can you, over the break, Mr Martin, check and come back to me about whether or not, in fact, it was suggested Senator, to I can your confirm staff? That for you now. It was not suggested by the PM's office. Um, I remember this process well, and um, it was a series of a series of colours that were selected. You'll be aware that the colour scheme in the cabinet room is mm. a sort of burnt ochre orange colour. And that was not working very well with our technical people in terms of the background. It was uh, not providing a suitable backdrop for um, use for virtual meetings. So we looked at a, a comparison with a number of other 
nations that were doing similar virtual meetings. We consulted with our technical people and blue was the colour that was chosen on the basis that it provided the best contrast. Yes, well hopefully some examples of mid-tone blue were provided. Yes, and <coughs> It does um, pop up awfully regularly as Liberal Party colours, doesn't it? The LNP campaign bus. But um, I think uh, famously empty toured Queensland in the last election. Well, that's, um, that's, that, that's not really a question. There's uh, Mr Morrison, the coalition launch, helpfully the slogan the Liberal Party's set out there. Probably mid the Australian flag, Senator Ayres. Does it have a... None of those does it, does it have a, relevant does, to the officials at the table. No, that's right. That's right. So why... Yeah. Has such an effort gone into making sure that the tone for the Prime Minister's cabinet wall matches exactly? So think, there's uh, an enormous I, I, effort in here. Got, you know, you just have to. It doesn't take much imagination to read through this and see that an enormous effort has gone into making sure that the colour, branding colour, matches precisely the Liberal Party's own branding. Oh, why is, why is I'll, that? I'll let Mr Martin speak to it, Senator, but, uh, but um, uh, I am quite confident that no enormous effort has gone into matching, as you say. Mr Martin has already addressed the fact that the suggestion well, the examples did not that come. Were, the, the examples that were provided by the staff were, in fact, to, in order to just nail down this colour down precisely, were all Liberal Party branding examples. And Mr Martin has gone through the fact that uh, these were not suggestions from the PMO what? and that they were based on advice about well, I'm even more concerned presentation if, online. If, if staff in the department are making this suggestion. What, what was your... Uh, earlier on you said that somebody in IT proposed that this shade of... What does it sort of warm the computer screen up less? Or what, 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 what on earth... So we looked, Senator, a range of um, design options. Um, the original colours looked at included a pastel blue, a darker blue and various grey colours. The advice from our technical and IT staff indicated that the very pale colours were not compatible with skin tones and weren't optimal for colour balancing of the webcam used for the virtual meetings. The mid-tone blue was chosen to ensure that the dark blue of the Australian flag stands out against the background. That's what I said. So, after the break, I'd like to see exactly what it was the IT department say. I mean, it's a strong contrast, isn't it, with the provision of all the Liberal Party branding in the, in the discussion about how this was going to be set up. And Chair, perhaps also, if you chose the blue carpet for the ministerial wing of Parliament House, I think there might be a Liberal conspiracy there as well. Mm. Mm. Well, it's just in the... It's, it's very clear in the sequence of emails. When, 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 when another colour blue was chosen, they, they dragged back to mid-tone blue. It was red carpet. Um, there was no, to be no deviation from, uh, from Liberal Party branding for uh, the direction that was given to staff. I'm just trying to understand whether you say it wasn't from the Prime Minister's office. Well, why on earth is Prime Minister and Cabinet assisting with a partisan branding exercise. Well, Senator, the colour was chosen for the reasons I've outlined for a technical purpose. Um, I'm confident there's no other information to show you, otherwise it would have turned up in this FOI request. Okay. Can a photo of all the final ba uh, banners produced be provided? Uh, yes, Senator, I'm sure we can take that on notice. Maybe we could bring can one up and set it up behind you for the next, uh, <laughs> next session. Can you tell me... Um, can you tell me what the total cost for the development and production of the banners has been? Well, Senator, they were developed in-house in terms of the design, so there'd be no cost for that, but for the printing of them there was a cost, and I'll, I'll get that for you. And how many times have uh, banners or other promotional material like these been commissioned under Mr Morrison? Can you tell me that? Senator, there's two banners. 
that have been used for virtual meetings. Um, and is the Prime Minister's office always consulted on promotional material like this? Senator, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterise these as promotional material. They're banners for international engagements. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank Ms. you very Ms. much, Senator, Senator Esp. Senator, Senator Kitchen asked earlier about the budgets as they relate to state visits and, uh, and those no, sorts of events. I, I think that was Senator Smith. Well, Senator mm. Smith, was it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I would, uh, I mean, essentially, these would have been used for the types of events that would otherwise have been occasions where the Prime Minister either would have travelled to them or we would have hosted mm. people. Senator, can I just read the answers into the record for Senator Patrick's questions so that we can yes. fulfil oh, our yes. obligation? Yes, you may. So he had Senator three Foster, questions. Um, Why Senator was there a delay in finalising legal costs in the AAT matter? Um, uh, we are still finalising some of the invoices with AGS, so we're debating um, the invoices with them. Um, secondly, um, was external counsel advice sought? in relation to the arguments that the Commonwealth dropped in the course of the AAT matter. Um, Senator Patrick referred those to those as constitutional matters. I'm not sure that we would characterise them in that way, but the answer to the question is no. We did not um, seek external counsel advice. And the third was in relation to the National Cabinet's evidence tendered last week in the AAT. Um, the Commonwealth's evidence was based on an authoritative text, the third edition of Australian Participatory Government, um, 1961. That advice was prepared for us by AGS. Um, in fact, um, Mr Dawling, who provided the alternative um, advice, went back to the um, original sources that went into that text, and there was indeed an error in the text. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, um, the department not keeping um, appropriate records, I don't believe that was the case. It was just that the authoritative text that we used, or that AGS used to provide us with advice, um, had uh, a slight error of fact in it. Thank you, Ms Foster. Ms Frame. Um, so yes, uh, Senator Kitching, I have a response for you from oh, an earlier you. question you asked me as well that I just wanted to provide to you. I said I would get back to you on the Howard Springs yes. facility. Um, I've confirmed, um, contacted the Department of Health who managed that contract, that on 18th September last year, the Northern Territory Chief Minister wrote to the Prime Minister proposing to expand the quarantine capacity at the Howard Springs quarantine facility in response to our um, request to them and describing it as the Northern Territory Centre for National Resilience. And on 19 October, when the National Partnership Agreement was struck between the Commonwealth and the NT Government, it was called the Centre for National Resilience, and that term is available on the Federal Financial Relations website. Did the Northern Territory Government suggest a colour scheme for it at all? Sorry. <laughs> and Mr Barton has a 30-second correction. Yes. Uh, just, uh, in answer to your question, Senator Ayres, yes. um, the total cost was $7,592 in relation to the production of the banners. Uh, I can also, um, in answer to Senator Smith's question earlier, the formula that's been used by the department for longer term guests at the official establishments has been based on the market value of room rent and is adjusted annually in accordance with CPI. Um, Senator Chandler, you asked um, whether the Prime Minister was in quarantine during the um, period that he made that Zoom call and the answer mm -hmm. is yes, he was. I thought it would be. And Senator Kitching, just confirming um, you asked me about the Orima contract and I think I said it was last financial year. It was in fact this financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Martin. The committee will now suspend for dinner uh, and we will reconvene at 8.05. Of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, Senator Wong, you Thank have the you. call. Uh, Senator Birmingham, do you agree quarantine is a federal responsibility, don't you? Uh, well, Senator, um, uh, in terms of your no doubt, you'll move to quote the Constitution. Uh, yes, uh, uh, of course. Um, how and where quarantine arrangements are actually applied uh, can then uh, can then differ. Sorry, arrangements. 
terms of how and where the delivery of quarantine <laughs> is applied can differ. All oh, right. So federal government can be responsible, but others deliver it. Is that is that the line? Uh, well, Senator, that uh, on the presumption that uh, that you're not about to ask me about the you know, quarantine arrangements of uh, of uh, other of animals coming to the country or something, but that you're moving down the COVID pathway, uh, that indeed is the type of arrangement that was structured and agreed between National Cabinet uh, early on in the pandemic. I mean, it's central to keeping Australians safe in the pandemic, isn't it, a strong quarantine system? Uh, well, the border closure decisions are absolutely central, and then, uh, then quarantine in terms of facilitating in a safe way uh, the arrival of uh, numbers into Australia, yes. You'd agree, wouldn't you, that uh, uh, as if as the economy uh, um, opens up, as borders border arrangements are relaxed over time, which uh, is contemplated in your budget, um, that a safe, a strong national quarantine system is central and critical to ensuring Australians stay safe. Correct. Well, it, uh, that. Um I mean, yes, I agree that in the context of uh, border closures, COVID restrictions and the like, then a strong national quarantine system uh, is important um, in terms of the hypotheticals of how those borders might open up. Um, that obviously depends on the nature of uh, border opening. Um, you know, there are you know, the only border opening decision taken to date uh, relates to New Zealand, which, sure. uh, which doesn't entail uh, the need for quarantine. It's also critical to enabling Australians to return and enabling Australian families who are separated to be reunited, isn't it? Uh, quarantine system, a safe, strong national quarantine system. Quarantine, uh, quarantine is, uh, is, in the current circumstances, the enabler of those who are overseas to be able to return. Um, now, you don't mention quarantine in the budget overview, do you? The summary of the main announcements of the budget. Uh, not offhand, Senator. No. There's a lot of boasting about the vaccine rollout, but no mention of quarantine. Put my glasses on so I can see oh. what your face looks like. I don't recall it being mentioned in the overview, no, Senator. Hmm. Interesting. It's Commonwealth responsibility. It's so central to. Yeah, how are we managing the pandemic and dealing with it? But it just disappears from the budget overview. Plot on vaccines. Vaccines are, uh, are uh, reflected in terms of you know, significant decisions that, uh, that applied within the budget. Yeah, no decisions on quarantine in the budget. So it didn't have to be in the overview. Is that the answer? Well, Senator, there are some ongoing expenses, uh, particularly related to, uh, to Howard Springs, uh, that, uh, that have uh, a budget bottom line impact. OK, the... Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Prime Minister... Um, did a press conference on the, I think it's the 7th of May, and he talked about um, the Victorian and Queensland quarantine proposals. I wanted to ask, has the department received the Toowoomba Wellcamp Airport proposal from the Queensland Government? Senator Alison Frame, um, Deputy Secretary of Social Policy. Um, the Department received a preliminary proposal from the Queensland Government in, uh, it's earlier this year, I think it was January. late January, yes, that's right. We haven't received any further information other than that. Why do you describe it as preliminary? Uh, because it was a high level document, Senator, that had a lot of um, a lot of photos of a, what a facility might look like. So it sounds I, like a, something Scott Morrison would love. He loves photos. Not a lot of detail, but likes the photos. Let, let's, let's, uh, Ms. Sounds Frame, exactly uh, up his alley. Let's let Ms Frame finish the question, finish answering your question, Senator. Um, so it was, it was a high-level document, Senator, that just 
was effectively providing to us information that had been submitted to the Queensland Government from the Wagner Corporation. Did you do anything with that? Yes, we did. What Senator. did you do with it? Uh, so we, um, there has been an exchange of letters and we have also met, um, I have been in some of these meetings as have some other officials um, from Prime Minister and Cabinet and other departments. We've had four meetings with Queensland officials about their proposal and it, it directly emanated from the proposal in terms of us seeking more information about what exactly was the nature of the proposal? What was what would be the Queensland government's role in any proposal? What does that mean? In that, as I said to you, it was effectively a forwarding of the proposal from the Wagner Corporation. No, well, why are you? Why are you? <laughs> what is the focus of the meetings? Is the focus of the meetings can this fly? Or is the focus of the meetings trying to work out what Queensland will do with it? Well, they're. they're inextricably connected, Senator, well, in what's, that... What's been... What do you mean? In that, can this fly necessitates a discussion of how might this work. OK. When was the last meeting? What, um, well, tell me the dates of the meetings. You said you've had four. We've had four meetings. They were in January and February, Senator. So nothing since? Uh, no. We... No, there hasn't been a, dis not? a discussion since then because there have been requests made of the Queensland Government, uh, most recently in a letter that was actually uh, was signed by me as the Deputy Secretary to the Deputy Director General on the 22nd of February. Could you table that letter, please? Um, I don't have it with me tonight, Senator, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Can someone get it? Um, potentially, yeah, we can follow up on yeah. that, Senator. Yes, that's fine. Is that, and you said there'd been a number of exchanges of letters. The Queensland Premier, if you I can look at my notes here, Senator, and confirm, the Queensland Premier wrote to the PM in late January. The Queensland Government wrote, so my counterpart wrote to me on the 12th of February. I responded on the 22nd of February. And then the Queensland Premier wrote to the Prime Minister on the 4th of March. Has anyone responded to the 4th of March letter? Uh, no, Senator, because the where the Commonwealth has set out clearly in those previous correspondences what threshold information is required to proceed with further consideration of the proposal, and that additional information has not been received from the Queensland Government. So we're happy to reconvene those meetings when you, some... You, so has it been rejected? Ah, uh, no, Senator, not well, at this what stage. What are the things that you're telling them they have to do? What, what, what's the current handball, Ms Frame, given that everything on this seems to be handballed to the states? Um, the, the threshold requirements as set out in the letter from me on the 22nd of February. Um, fundamentally, Senator, the, the biggest one was an undertaking from the Queensland Government that any investment from the Commonwealth, if we were to partner in a quarantine facility, would constitute additional quarantine capacity. So would not be swapping out existing quarantine capacity that exists, but would, um, so would realise the Commonwealth's investment with an increase in quarantine capacity. Well, is there no benefit in, given how much criticism, including from the AMA, there has been, and, from, uh, and the observations of Ms Holton, is there no benefit from um, some of the Medi Hotel places going to a, another facility that is safer? I mean, um, it your, has, your, your, your point about additionality effectively precludes that. It's one of the fundamental why are you precluding, requests. Why are you precluding moving people out of Medi Hotels as a precondition? Medi Hotel Senate? No, just as I said, the. No, no, no. It, you understand my point. The current capacity, quarantine capacity, yes. in most states and territories is primarily in hotel accommodation. Yes, that's right. Senator. Correct. And that yes. has been highly criticised, including by some in government, uh, as um, uh, unsustainable uh, for the long term. Now, you, I don't want to get into an argument right now about how safe the system is. That's a different discussion. But there have been a number of criticisms, frankly, a number of outbreaks which have been associated with many hotel um, breaches, for want of a better term. So I'm asking, why is the Commonwealth's position? You have to maintain your Medi Hotel numbers before we even invest in an additional facility. Why, why isn't it a reasonable proposition to say we want to move people out of town? Uh, 
Well, Senator, well, Senator, 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 I think that does go to, and, uh, and your framing the questions to me initially, um, you know, worked on the premise of helping to achieve pathways for more people back home, reuniting with families and the like. And so you know, it is a core principle that, uh, that we want to see that if we're investing more in relation to quarantine facilities, that it is going to help in relation to addressing some of those issues. So I'm making a different point. We think you should have done this a lot earlier. We think you should be taking a lot more responsibility. We think you should be uh, ha should be ha have been dealing with quarantine for a, a year now in a in a way that reflects the national imperative. But let, let's leave that political argument aside for some uh, for, for the moment. I'm making a different point to Ms. Frame, which is if you if you demand additionality as a as a prerequisite for Commonwealth investment, what you are effectively saying to the state is any policy position that you may wish to take to try and shift people out of Medi Hotel into what is seen as safe accommodation, safer accommodation in terms of the community, we're going to preclude that because it has to be additional. Senator, I understand the point that you're making, Senator Wong. However, the point, How many? the point we've made is that we think additionality is an important principle, that yep. the Medi Hotel system has overwhelmingly worked in a safe way. Tell, tell, ask the people in Melbourne. Don't, or you know, South Australia, where, who, who, where, the, where it appears that there has been... Anyway, let's, yeah, let, no, I don't, no, let's no, not... Right. There, there, there don't are, even there, make there that statement because it's contested, there, 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 all right? There, there, so let's yeah, not get into sure. it. If we don't want to have to be there, here no, really there. late... Let's just leave the political argument about the, the efficacy of the Medi Hotel system. I won't talk about what the AMA has said, like doctors have said about your system. If you stop making political assertions, I'm, making, I'm asking a different point. But can I move on? We're not going to agree on this. How many places would have been provided under this proposal? Um, Ms. Frame? I will confirm, uh, Senator, but I, uh, I understand it was up to 1,000. So an additional 1,000. Or a substitute. Or a substitute. Okay, thank you, Minister. Yes. And at this stage, it's on ice, as it were, because you've written back to them, and nothing further. They've written to you, and nobody's done anything further since the fourth of March. Um, there, we have um, also in regular discussions with officials, like we talk regularly about a whole range of things. Um, affirmed that we're waiting on additional information. Um, it also includes information on a costing request as well, Senator. So there, there is, look, there's a range of things that are set out in the letter that I have agreed to table that alongside the commitment around additional quarantine um, capacity also says that we need to know how much money is being sought from the Commonwealth and how the Queensland Government's undertaking about operating the facility that Commonwealth points out there is no air traffic control tower at the airport that is... Well, you're really constant. working hard to make this work, aren't you? No, no. We, you we, really we, are, aren't you? The, I mean, we're at the end of May and, and you know, I, I can tell you from this side of the table, a year, over a year after the borders closed, something for which the federal government has constitutional responsibility, and it's always computer says no. I think you'll find, Senator, when you computer read the letter... Computer says no. That the letter actually sets out some really constructive responses to that and seeks a, a response from the Queensland Government on some proposed responses with that and also states, acknowledges... It? It's always the state's fault. Senator it's never your Wong. fault. No. Never the well, Commonwealth's fault. This is answering fault. the question. Well, uh, she's not, actually. She's just spruiking her position. Well, she's not answering a question. I, I think we're past whatever the question was from yeah. the interjections. Mm -hmm. um, how many people are working on this proposal? Currently, Senator. Yes. Uh, well, as I said, there hasn't been, there have not been discussions in the dates that I've outlined to you. There haven't been recent discussions. Yeah, so no one's currently working on it. In the, um, the same people who are currently working on contemplation of a proposal we've received from the Victorian government. I'll come back um, to that. I'm, would I'm asking about this. Is anyone in Commonwealth in the Commonwealth government currently working on the Toowoomba proposal? There is nothing, no new information that has been provided to Why us. Why can't you answer the question? So the answer is no. No one is at the moment. Why can't you no answer one is that, at the Ms. Frame? That, Thank you. Correct. Thank you. That's correct, Senator. Now, I've asked you there the meetings. I think you've said four meetings. Was that right? Uh, that's correct. 
So the National Cabinet Statement of the 5th of February, the de reference to the bespoke facility at Toowoomba, is this particular facility that we've been discussing. Then, sorry, the National The Cabinet. National Cabinet Statement on the 5th of February refers to the Commonwealth and the Queensland Government work on, working on further defining the, the proposal for a bespoke facility in Toowoomba. Yep. Yes, Senator, right. that we is are talking correct. about the we same proposal. We are talking proposal. about yes. the WellCamp proposal. Okay. We are, yes. So, in the 18th of May, the Prime Minister was raising some questions about this, or I'll just come back, in an interview with, I think, ABC Brisbane, Mr. Austin. Um, So it went on the front foot. They won't tell us how much it costs. They won't tell, tell us whether they're going to run the facility. They won't tell us whether it's additional to bring many Australians home. And these are the things we've been asking for. Uh, has anyone actually, other than your letter of the 22nd, have you, has anyone actually worked with Queensland on answering those questions? They are the, those questions were the focus of our discussions in those meetings that I referenced, so Senator. Right. Premier Palaszczuk said that the Prime Minister, quote, he does have a lot of detail and his department may not be briefing him about the extent of the communication that's been happening between the departments. What is it that you're not briefing the Prime Minister? There's nothing we're not, um, there's nothing additional that has been provided by the Queensland Government that we haven't conveyed, Senator. Have you provided briefs to the Prime Minister on this issue? And if so, how many? Uh, we have provided a copy of the proposal received. I'd, I'd need to check, Senator, I think it might have also gone direct to the Prime Minister's office. Um, then we have updated members of the Prime Minister's staff about discussions. I, I have I asked you, please answer my question. I'd, I'd, have I, you provided advice to the Prime Minister, a written brief, you know, for noting, for advice, for action, the things ministers get? Have you provided any advice in writing to the Prime Minister in relation to this proposal? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just thinking through, Senator. I think in the response that we drafted for the Prime Minister, there may have been a brief at the front, but I will have to take that on notice. So at most, once. That's a written brief. You, you asked me quite a specific question, I did ask Senator, you a specific about question. a written brief on the proposal. Yes. We have had uh, more frequent discussions with members of the Prime Minister. Well, apparently he doesn't know what his staff do anyway, because we've had to have Mr Gaitchens and Mr Kunkel do a whole range of investigations. So the, the, the old Westminster system that, you know, uh, the Minister is supposed to, is inferred to have the knowledge that staff do, obviously doesn't apply. So I'm asking you this, I'm asking you the question about the Prime Minister's briefing. And as I understand the status of your evidence, at the highest, there has been one brief to the Prime Minister associated with the letter from you to the department, is that right? Uh, and, and, and as you've heard, a copy of the entire proposal, Senator Wall. Sure, well that's, but and it's advice on it. Further that's to, um, National Cabinet briefings, Senator, there's always regular updates provided on discussions. So there would be written briefings um, with National Cabinet papers that do provide updates on any discussions officials okay. have had, any issues that okay. the Prime Minister might need to be aware so of. So your evidence has been briefed twice, which is the first time in relation to your letter of the 22nd of February, but you'll confirm that on notice, correct? Well, yes, the whether there was a brief attached to the letter. Yeah. And the second time as part of his briefing notes for prepare for National Cabinet on the 5th of February? Oh, no, National Cabinet would be more frequent than that, Senator. Every time there's a National Cabinet meeting, but we the only, the, the notes. only note I have, and I might be wrong, is that this was discussed on the 5th of February. If, would you brief on something that wasn't on the agenda? We would brief on something that may be raised by a First okay. Minister, yes. Well, I, I'm asking you, how often has the Prime Minister been briefed about this proposal? And Every time there was a National Cabinet meeting, we would provide an update in a brief to the Prime Minister about any issue that we consider he might need to be updated that, on. Okay, that is a general... <laughs> but no, no Senator, hang on, no, I Senator, I this, I don't, don't, don't. Okay. I, let me ask another question. You are giving me a systemic answer. If you need to take it on notice, I don't mind. I want to know how many times this department has briefed the Prime Minister in writing about this proposal. 
Do you want to take it on notice? I can take it on notice. Okay, because at this and stage, it's... the answer is once in relation to the letter, and in addition, there are meeting notes or meeting briefs prepared for him for National Cabinet, which may have included this point. Which definitely did include this point, Senator. They would, I'll have to take it on notice because there will be quite a few. I will okay. bring that number back to you on notice. Um, are they going to, has the department considered, given consideration, I think you referenced this about whether or not it'd be possible to have flights to land at the airport? Yes, that's right, Senator. And what did you say about that? Or what do you say about that? That uh, we've had discussions, including with um, the Commonwealth Department of Infrastructure um, and Queensland officials on the phone at the same time. So PM&C convenes those discussions with relevant officials from the Commonwealth. And we have just had discussions about uh, what would need to be, um, what we would need to do in order to have flights directed to Wellcamp Airport, which currently only operates as a freight airport, as you'd be aware. Toowoomba Wellcamp Airport does not regularly, or, or as, as I understand it at all, actually take passenger services. It just takes freight services. But you know, but planes do land there. <laughs> Planes do land there, but they are freight planes. Senator, sure. there's no. Sure, we're, we're in, a, in a pandemic, though. It's not like it's, a, it's an airport that's not used at all. It's not currently used for passenger there's, craft. There are quite significant issues, Senator Might, that infrastructure See, colleagues could computer update. Computer says no. There's it's no, up, it's no, just. No, no, I just no, it is to the to, to, to many people who are stranded overseas, and I'm not going to take you through the chronology, but you close the borders in March. And the, the extent to which this government has sought not to be the ones responsible for first repatriation flights, resisting that till it became unviable for them not to, has sought to divest itself or share or spread responsibility for quarantine, uh, in, even in the face of advice from medical advisers and Ms Holton. And now, the, frankly, the computer says no approach to this proposal really astounds me. And I think it astounds a lot of Australians. Why you, why you so resist taking responsibility for these? Senator, things? I don't. Sorry. Oh, Minister. yeah. Well, you Senator, don't have to defend it, you know. Sen Senator, and if you let Ms. Frame actually finish an answer when she's uh, mm -hmm. when she's providing it, she's talking through indeed legitimate issues with the proposal, the extended proposal that exists um, now. There's, there's, you're asking the questions. Those questions go to what are the issues. In this case, you were asking about the issues of passenger flight operations. That's what Ms Frame was trying to talk about at the time that you interrupted her. Um, no, she's just giving me another no, list. No, Senator, I, as for an airport, and, and my infrastructure colleagues will have more detail on this, and that is why they have been on the line with Queensland officials. For an airport to move from carrying freight only to passenger services sure. requires fire services, sure, a flight control yes, tower, yes, or, or insurance issues for airlines that land there without it. They are not insignificant issues. No, and, and nor are the 40,000 people who are stranded them. overseas, no. and nor are the people in India who are currently stuck there. Uh, a year after, we started saying you've got to bring these people home. And months after you sat here, including at the COVID committee, saying, oh, we can't tell you how long it will be before people get home. Or when he said be home by Christmas, he actually only met those people, not the others. And now we have Australians dying. So yes, I agree, there was a lot to do. But perhaps it should have been done. Perhaps there should have been the political will to do it. Have you received... Oh, is the Prime Minister made an assertion? Oh, I did want to ask this. Has the VIP aircraft, have VIP aircraft ever landed at Wellcam Airport before? I don't know, Senator. I'd need to take that on notice. I would presume not, but I would need to take that on when notice. When the Prime Minister asserted on the 17th of May that Toowoomba did, wasn't near a hospital, can you tell me what he meant? Because I, I thought there was a regional hospital in Toowoomba. Um, I need to check on that, Senator. I understand that part of the proposal was from the Queensland Government and it wasn't in the written proposal, but in our discussions, was that they would still look to take COVID positive people to Brisbane, um, which is about 130 kilometres away. But um, I can get you more detail on that. That there was some 
some nuance there about whether people who actually were COVID positive would be treated closer by or actually taken to Brisbane. Um, current, current policy of the Queensland Government is to move all COVID positive people from a hotel to a hospital. That is how all COVID positives are treated. Yeah. What did the oh. Prime Minister also dismissed this proposal as simply being an idea quote that you can just put it in the desert somewhere. Is that based on advice you've given him? That's not anything we've provided, Senator. No. Okay, can we refer now to the issue the uh, proposal you raised earlier, which was the Victorian government's plans for a uh, understand a purpose built quarantine hub in Melbourne's north? Um, have you assessed the viability of this proposal? Uh, we are currently assessing the viability of this right. proposal. When did Senator? you receive it? Um, I'll get the date. I might actually call uh, sure. the Acting First Assistant Secretary, Senator. She is working very um, assiduously on this proposal and will be able to provide you with more detail about all the meetings and discussions. Nicole Spencer, Assistant First Assistant. Spencer. Assistant. Acting First Assistant Secretary, COVID Task Force. Did you want me to repeat the question? Uh, meetings with Victoria on the Victoria proposal. So Did I ask that? I thought I asked about the viability, but it's late. I might have forgotten. Have you done an assessment of the viability of this proposal? We, we have done an, an initial assessment of the viability of the proposal. And sorry, I think I might have asked when you first received it. Um, the same day that the proposal was um, announced by the um, Victorian Premier, Acting Premier. Which date is that? Um, Twenty ninth of April, Senator. Okay. So not very long ago. Not very long ago, Senator. Uh, and where where are you at? Can you just give me a status of assessment, of meetings, discussions? So over the last um, week, Senator, we've had a number of meetings with Victorian officials. Um, they have come to Canberra to meet with us um, at a senior level from Department of Premier and Cabinet um, and a number of colleagues from across Victoria. We have had meetings with them um, jointly with Department of Finance, the Infrastructure Project and Financing Agency, Department okay. of Defence, Department okay. of Agriculture. So can Agriculture. you on notice, I think Ms Frame on notice was just going to confirm the four meetings I think she said. She was going to check that, so maybe that can be done notice. Can you just give me a list on notice of these meetings, dates and attendees, is that all right? Yes, Senator. Thank you. Uh, how many places would be provided under this proposal? Uh, the initial proposal from Victoria identifies, um, and it does vary, Senator, because there's actually two sites identified in the Victorian proposal. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a range of between 500 to 3,000 places. One site is 500, and the other is the two and a uh, half? It, dep or? it depends upon staging um, for the particular sites. Oh, okay. No, I just wondered if it was just... Okay. So between 500 to 3,000. Correct, Senator. And you, how many people in your team are working on this proposal? Senator, um, we draw on resources across both Prime Minister and Cabinet and the Commonwealth. Um, so there are teams- The Commonwealth? So the rest of the government? Sorry, the Australian Public Service Senator. I just asked how many in your team. Um, so in my team working on this, well, it's not people working directly from my team. We have people working from the health team and also from the infrastructure team. Sorry, okay. How many officers in PMNC are working on this proposal currently? Um, I would say, Senator, there are three to four people that are working okay. on it Okay, and currently. then is there, are there additional um, resources from other parts of the public sector? Yes, Senator. Right. So the three to four is PMNC staff? Correct. And then you've got other departments? And so how many staff from other departments are working on this proposal? Um, Senator, if I just think through the number of meetings that we've had, there have probably been um, between 12 to 20 people okay. from across APS agencies. Thank you. Uh, do we have any estimated costs? Um, Senator, there are some estimates of costs in the Victorian proposal. They vary depending upon the particular site that would be identified. 
Can you give me the range? You've given me 500 to 3,000 places, so presumably there's an analogous cost so, scale. Senator, we don't yet have um, a cost per unit. Um, I believe it may have been received today from cost Victoria. Cost per minute. So, so, in terms of each place, um, we don't have how much it would be per place. So, some of the variabilities that come into the cost, Senator, are around the access to the land, and it depends upon the particular land that would be used. You don't have an envelope? Uh, Senator, there, there, is, there is a range, and we are currently in negotiations with Victoria. Okay, I'm not, I will ask you what proposed Commonwealth contribution is. You may say we can't tell you that right now for whatever reason and tell me why. But I'm actually not asking that yet. I'm asking for the whole facility, do we have a range of potential costs? So there are operating costs um, by Victoria. Establishment cost. Or whatever, however you're, whatever, however, howsoever described. Again, Senator, it does vary depending upon the actual site and the scale that is then chosen. Can't you just give me lowest to highest? Uh, it is potentially quite a broad range, Senator, as you heard, you're talking yeah, between 500 yeah, and 3,000 With all places. of those caveats, you're, I'm just trying to get a sense. You're, you're talking two sites that have different ownership arrangements in, the, in place across the two sites. Um, and. Uh, and then beyond that, you're talking a function so, of negotiations as well. That, okay, that okay. Puts a, a so layer so of with all of those caveats, it. and at this stage, I haven't yet asked you about your no. your how much you would be willing to put in, which is the. It, I'm just asking you about what the range is. Why don't you just give me the range, Senator? I am just trying to find it in okay. my, my my notes because, as I said, it does vary. We have gone through a range of spreadsheets with Victorian officials. Um, it, and as I said, it does vary depending upon the actual site and the design and the infrastructure needs. Do you, what do you want to do? Okay. Senator, would you like me to take it on notice? No, no, I would prefer you didn't take it on notice because then you know I might have to wait for a very long time. But do you want me to go to something else while you work yes, it please, out? Yes, please, Senator. Okay. Um, Uh, are you able to answer addition, uh, any other questions about Victoria, Ms. Fram? Would you like me to move to a different topic and then come back to Victoria? Sorry, Senator, what was the topic area? Returning Whilst Australians? your colleague is trying to ascertain the range yep. that she can give me and getting some advice to the Minister about that, I'm asking, can I ask you other questions about Victoria? Would you prefer me to do a different topic and come back to so, Victoria? We'll see, we'll see, we'll see, Senator Wong, <laughs> if I can provide possibly some assistance. Now, Ms Spencer may tell me there's, there's updates from discussions, but I understand the initial proposal purely from Victoria, and so it's their costings, not Commonwealth costings sure. or assessments, uh, put the range of between 200 and 700 million dollars. 200 and 700. 200 to 700 million, which is, this is establishment or whatever you call, however you're describing it, costs, not operating costs. That's right. Okay. And at this stage, um, and did they give an indication of likely operating costs? Uh, I'm not okay, sure. Okay, that's fine. That's and at this stage, you can you can tell me this is the process of negotiation. What would the federal government's contribution be? Uh, well, that would be process for negotiation. I think the uh, I think the Victorian Sorry. government, when they uh, publicly announced it, uh, suggested the Commonwealth would pay 100 per cent of the establishment costs. Sorry. I think when the Victorian government publicly announced it, they indicated at that stage they were looking for the Commonwealth to contribute 100 per cent of the establishment costs. Um, establishment, I should say. Uh, is there a, any, where in the budget papers, is there any government commitment? Is there a measure for new funding commitments for quarantine facilities anywhere in the budget? Um, uh, Senator, not, uh, not as a decision in, uh, in the budget. Uh, you'd be aware that uh, that we are continuing to run an elevated contingency reserve as a result of, uh, of the COVID situation. Mm. Uh, is the department proceeding on the basis that additionality 
is a hard line, a hard position as the Commonwealth's negotiating position? Um, it's one of the no, um, I understand that. Highly, it's not highly desirable criteria, Senator. Yes. Highly desirable. I, I wasn't asking about the others, but that the current is the current position negotiating position of the Commonwealth, or is it it has to be additional, or it would be highly desirable that it is additional? In, in, in the current circumstances, Senator Wong, the, the expectation would be that it should be additional. All of it. So it no should. capacity to get people out of hotels in the middle of the city. The expectation, Senator Wong, is that these investments are being made. We would like to see and expect them to achieve additional capability. He's pretty attached to hotel quarantine, isn't he? Well, Senator, Senator Wong, you've more than anybody asked questions about creating additional capacity, yeah, but and this is a government means of trying is, to create but this that is additional not capacity. binary. And government so rarely is. Yes, we want more. We think you should have done this earlier. We were calling for this a very long time ago, right? But you also have a situation where hotel quarantine has, has, was not intended to be sustained for this long and for this many people. And we are going to have to have people quarantining for a very long time in order to keep Australians safe. We have already had problems with hotel quarantine. Now, you may say hardly any, I would say more, but whatever. I mean, no system is 100% perfect. You can understand why the community and state governments are saying, we want to reduce the risk as well as increase capacity. So why is the Commonwealth so attached to hotel quarantine that it's demanding 100% additionality? Senator, there's, there's a few things in your statement there. You have pointed to longer term questions uh, and they're fair questions in relation to considering a facility like this given the scale of investment uh, that would be made and whether it has longer term purposes and obviously in that longer term sense uh, you wouldn't be anticipating an additionality equation being an overlay forever and a day but in the current environment in the government you know, maintains um, a priority on seeking to support facility for returning Australians and other priority cohorts. And so and we are not wanting to was see... This, was this after you threatened to throw people into jail? They're coming home. No, Senator Wong. Those decisions around India were taken as part of the decisions to keep Australia safe. Yes, I understand that. But, you know, to come in here and tell me, oh, we really care about all the standards given the history of this government. You know, who well, fought, who fought, resisted in these Senate estimates hearings and in the COVID committee. Stepping up on quarantine, stepping up on repatriation flights. Anyway, how long do you think quarantine is going to be required? Would you say 12, 24, 36 months, longer? Senator Wong, I wouldn't want to try to put an estimate on that. Well, it's not going to no longer be required in a year, is it? I mean, you, your, no. your own bud... I mean, no. the world is not going to have... be sufficiently vaccinated and have sufficiently confronted this for us to not have quarantine in two or three years. You'd accept that, wouldn't you? No. Senator Wong, I'm not drawing those sorts of conclusions. You know, decisions around border reopenings and to whom they right. apply and in what circumstances uh, are decisions that we will take based on the health no, advice no, no, that's, that, and the that's evidence not the question. The that's not the question. The, the question is, how long do you believe, or how long are you, are you planning that quarantine, will continue, quarantine places will continue to be required? Senator, we, we see a continued need for quarantine sure. in the foreseeable future, but Correct. how long that is, Senator Wong, sure. okay. foreseeable is, is, future. is Let's not use something words. that uh, that um, that I feel a credible assessment can be placed on, particularly uh, okay, at this time. Okay. And questions you could ask health officials in terms of their assessment. Uh, I'm of just those pointing out the context in which the failure to step up is occurring. Um, the 7th of May, the Prime Minister asked, would you consider another federally run quarantine facility? And the Prime Minister said that is not a recommendation at the, mo at the moment. 
Is this an answer based on the department's advice? So when was that? The 7th of November, did you say? 7th of May, the Prime Minister was asked, would you consider another federally run quarantine facility? Prime Minister, that is not a recommendation at the moment. Whose advice is that based on, if anybody's? Is that based on your advice, Ms Frame? Um, I'm not aware that we provided that advice, Senator. As okay. I said, we we're providing consistent advice about our very active, active contemplation of alternative quarantine. My question about advice in relation to the Queensland proposal, um, can I ask the same question at Lee? Has the Prime Minister been briefed on the Victorian proposal? Yes, he has, Senator. When was he briefed on that? So he's been briefed um, a number of times, an initial brief um, uh, probably uh, uh, one week ago. Okay. Um, so not long after receiving the proposal. Um, and then a more detailed briefing um, in the last few days. Thank you. So why has, it been, why has there been more attention to briefing on the Victorian than the Queensland? Senator, it is a much more detailed proposal. There is a lot more information to us, for us to work with. Um, that's not to, stay, to say that other proposals couldn't become more fulsome, but the, the Victorian one is a very fulsome proposal and we've been closely working closely if with Senator Victoria. Keneally was here, she'd tell you off for the use of the word fulsome. I won't. Apologies, Senator. No, I don't care. <laughs> I think I've misused it as well. Um, but she's particular. <laughs> um, have you provided advice to the PM at any point on expanding quarantine beyond Howard Springs, other than in relation to these two proposals? Uh, no, Senator, I believe we've been responding to okay. proposals. So, so, okay. Senator, can I, that I understand there was information provided last year when um, different facilities were actively contemplated at the, at the onset of the pandemic and defence facilities and other facilities, there was advice provided to the Prime Minister about their unsuitability for quarantine. And I think that's been referenced again in recent months. So we, we're constantly assessing whether there's any change in the landscape. Um, no, no, hang on. <laughs> no. Ms Frame, I don't know why you make these assertions that really the Minister should be making. I mean, there isn't constant assessment. Well, actually, actually no, Senator, I'm actually involved in it. There has no, no, been but because look, we've can, had discussion. No, no. Yeah, I mean, the reality is it's very passive. Nobody is saying, you know what, as a federal government, we're going to take some response if you quarantine. I want you to go out and find, work with the states, look at Holton's report and actually work out how we can land this. That's not what's happening. Senator, you're, 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 I mean, I, I think it, you know, you're assessing what Victoria's put to you, you've written a letter to Queensland and you haven't done anything since, and nobody's gone out and tried to work out how well we actually do this. Anyway, I, I, and I also always recall that the word constant, because it's, it's not possible for you to be constantly doing it. You're but in here it, talking it to has me, been, it's not constant. It has been it's done again, constant. though, Senator. It has been done again, like quite recently, okay. the Victorian government asked us to look at it again, and we did that. So have you, I have been involved in that. It has actually occurred. OK, well, you can tell me then, when do you think the 36,000 who are currently listed, so we all know that there are more Australians overseas than are on the list as wanting to come home. How, when will they be home now, Ms Frey? Uh, as you recall, Senator, at yeah, last time I'm not to able to... I just can't no, you provide can't. a time frame. You can't. But we uh, continue to work with DFAT around repatriation no. flights, around quarantine capability. But the places. And the number on the list also shifts, as you know, but we... What? I love the way you, 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 you tell people that as if that's some revelation. I mean, of course it shifts. People are overseas and people are increasingly becoming desperate. So people who were not on the list will now come on the list. And as long as the pandemic continues to worsen, in certain countries, on certain continents, you are likely to get a list that will keep having people added to it. I mean, that's not a surprise. Uh, actually, Senator, prior to the India um, pandemic, well, you know, the increase in QED. India, it was actually going down. QED. No, that, that was my point. That's my it shifts. point. It shifts. Yeah, well, of course we're it will shift. We're like agreeing, that is, that is hardly, we're agreeing. It's hard, but it's not an excuse. So you need to assume it in the planning. 
So again, nobody can tell me, you won't tell me, minister won't tell me, no one in this government will tell me because you don't like targets when actually all those Australians who are overseas, the current 36,000, for example, are likely to get home. Is that right? Senator, as you've, as you've heard before and understand, there are uncertainties around that. And so, no, it is not possible to put a firm date on that. So let, let's just do the current 36,000, Ms Frame. So leaving aside the sort of Archimedes point, when do you think, what's your best estimation of how long it will take to get the current 36,000 home? Senator, I'm not able to provide. No, nobody wants to be held a, accountable a for any of this, do they? Nobody wants to be held accountable for anything. No, of there are just so many variables, as you have acknowledged. You know, caps go up and down, the list goes up and down. I just am not able to provide you an estimate. I'm sorry. Have you been um, asked by the government for any advice as to what would be required to get the 36,000 home? Uh, I have been, no, Senator. I have been asked by the government to expedite all efforts to get as many Australians home as possible, but I have not been asked for an estimate of the time frame for and that. And so writing to, Vic, to Queensland a couple of months ago and leaving it with them is expediting all efforts, is it? It was setting out, Senator, what would be required for those conversations out there in, to Out there in, you know, in the community, most people wouldn't regard that as expediting. If a case, but they, would, they would use a different word for it. Okay. Um, there was an NT proposal as well on the 17th of May. The Prime Minister spoke about that. Yes, that's, that is currently being considered, Senator. That was the Alice Springs proposal. Is that that's the one you're referring to? Sorry. Just... Um... Can you, uh, sorry, I have to do a good night call. Sorry, I have to do a good night phone call. You do? Yes. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. That's okay. You can uh, surrender the call. Can I, I do that for five minutes? Is you that can, right? yes. you can. I think Senator O'Sullivan actually had a quick question. I do. I might um, give the call to him. Can I please, uh, just give me one moment. Just... Checking the name of uh, Mr. Bo uh, Reed, sorry, Mr. Reed. Are you able to? Uh, this is completely unrelated to quarantining and uh, COVID. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reid. I understand that you have some knowledge uh, of the uh, on the the way that we've dealt with the the death of the uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, that, that's right, uh, Senator. Uh, some, um, my colleague Jared Martin has other knowledge as well. Okay. But between the two of us, we have something approximating a complete knowledge. Well, I've actually been contacted by a constituent of mine. Uh, in Western Australia that would, uh, was intrigued by the significance of the, uh, the historical significance, uh, the rationale behind the number of rounds fired uh, at the gun salute here at Parliament House. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. There is a very, th this, this issue did come up when, the, when we were commemorating the passing of the Prince. Um, and the issue was somewhat vexed. Uh, we in Australia were following the example set by London and the palace uh, in firing uh, a 41 gun salute. The reason for a 41 gun salute, Senator, is that we had a 21 gun salute followed by a 20 gun salute. Um, the 21 gun salute, Senator, um, was because it was a royal salute and I'm happy to wax lyrical on the history of why 21 guns for a, for a royal salute. And a 20 gun salute was fired because in London, the firing took place from a royal park, which was the Tower of London. Uh, so 
In London, there were 41 guns fired, and in Australia, there were 41 guns fired. Um, I'm happy, Senator, to provide more detail. Well, uh, about why 20 in about why 20 in the park, for yeah, instance, um, Senator. The, please. The, the 20 guns fired from a royal park are to answer, <coughs> Senator. The 21 guns fired as a royal salute. Um, so when a, historically, when a royal park heard a royal salute of 21 guns, the royal park would fire a round in return for each one. But the royal salute always got the last laugh. I see. So there was always one between each firing, but not in response to the final one. So if you count them up, Senator, there's 20 gaps in between the 21 salutes, uh, and you end up with 20 guns fired from a royal park. Senator, the firing from the Tower of London should in fact have been a 62-gun salute, um, because the Tower of London should have fired an extra 21, because whenever there's a royal firing from the Tower of London, London always insists on firing an extra 21 for the people of London. Um, which goes back to historical differences between the Mayor of London and Westminster. Uh, but in this case, the palace decided that 62 was probably going to be overkill, and they fired 42 on 41 only. Wow. I mean, how long does that take? <laughs> the firing? Yeah. They were at 10 second intervals, Senator. So your maths is probably... Wow, OK. And, uh, and, and so here in, in Canberra and Parliament, were, they, were the, the two different salutes, were they... In different locations? Or no, they, they ran the on. Same? They ran on it. Effectively, became a single 41-gun salute. Okay. Um, they ran on one, one to another, which would be the same way that, that it happened around the United Kingdom as well. Oh, very good. Well, uh, Ben would be very happy to hear about this uh, in uh, in the suburb of Applecross. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Wong is back in the room. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, was... I had a good chat while you. Uh, so I gather uh, we were asking about the Northern Territory proposal, uh, and I think which the Prime Minister referenced on the 17th of May. So uh, when was that proposal received? Um, Senator, are you able to provide more information about what it was? For the, was it from the Northern Territory government? The Prime Minister said on the 17th of May that the government was working on a proposal from the Northern Territory Government at, I'm sorry, I may not have this, is it Bladen? Bladen. Yeah. Bladen. Bladen, right. Yes, Senator. Outside of Darwin, which has been in the works for some time, and I'm asking when did you receive the proposal? I'll take, I, it was very recently, Senator. I will get the exact date and come well, back to you Well, on the 17th of May, he said it had been around for some time. I know it was, it was more recent than that, like prior to the 17th of May, obviously, but it's quite recent. I will get you the exact dates. So it wasn't now. in the works for some time? Uh, not that involved us, Senator. OK. OK, so are you able to tell me about the viability of this proposal? Who's no, as, as I said, as, and as Ms Spencer clarified, Senator, we didn't had not received that one not long before the Prime Minister referenced it. I think maybe it could be the proponents or people who were working on it had done work. We are well, no, looking the at Prime Minister wouldn't be talking about their work, has it? No, he might have been a, a given advice from Chief Minister Gunner Why that there was another... That? No, no, I, honestly... Why are you doing that? You don't need to, like, hypothesise about it. You answer what you know. I, I told you, Senator, I'm getting you the date about when exactly we received it. Yeah, OK. And Why don't you do that on note? It, I mean, if you, if you... And now. We're going to do that now. It's OK. And the assessment of viability, have you undertaken that? Not yet. No, we have not. OK. Seen it. Do you can tell me any pla how many places? Uh, no, Senator. Can I how many people that? in the department currently working on the proposal? No, Senator. Uh, how, and what meetings? Have you had any meetings as yet with um, the proponents? No, Senator. And just to clarify, the, the department received um, correspondence from the Northern Territory Farmers Association regarding Bladen Point. We haven't received a formal proposal that sets out what a Bladen Point quarantine facility would be. So there is a proposal that exists around Bladen Point, um, but we have not seen the detail on that. Well, can someone explain to me why the Prime Minister referred to it as having been in the works for some time? Well, Senator, I'll take that on notice in terms of giving a precise answer for you. Um, okay. I can, uh, can only, in terms of my limited knowledge, assume that it is a reflection of um, what others have been working on uh, 
outside of the Commonwealth Government in terms of well, who's concept the others? or proposal. It might be the NT Government, uh, as, uh, as you heard, or it may be um, I'm unaware of the ownership arrangements of that site. Or the, like. well, the, the farmers who, who tend to... Well, the farmers don't build quarantine facilities, do, do they, though? Governments. But the... a, a, anyway, I've, I've taken it on notice as to where the genesis for that statement comes from, given the proposal okay, itself. OK, this is what he actually said. Sorry, it wasn't received. highlighted, so I just had to find out the different part was highlighted. We've had come... We, we, anyway, he says this is what he says. I want to know the basis on it. We'll be, doing, we'll be working closely with states and territories on innovative ways to keep the borders safe, but at the same time address some of... Sorry, Senator, we're pulling up the correspondence with the, the one we referred to from the farmers. Yep, so but I'm farmers. about to, because he doesn't talk about, let, let me just read this to you. We will be working closely with states and territories on innovative ways to keep the borders safe, but at the same time address some of these other needs that are there and to specifically answer your question in relation to states, just like we've had proposals come forward from South Australia when it comes to international students, and we've been already doing those, or Northern Territory in terms of bringing in horticultural workers and things like that, we're already working on them with a proposal they have around Bladen, which has been in the works for some time. And we are getting the date for you, Senator, for that correspondence. Well, he says you've been working on it with them. It's not, he doesn't say others have been working on it. We have, we're already working on them with the proposal they have around Bladen. I have you take, been asked to do any work? I, I will take it on notice, Senator. I have not done any work on Bladen. Thank I you. will find out whether other officials have and been involved in work on that. And as at the 24th... Sorry, let me just see. The 17th of May, so it's a doorstop yeah, with right. the PM, Mr Taylor and, Ms, uh, um, and the member for Bonner. Is that right? As at that point, was anyone in government working on Bladen, as the Prime Minister said, as at the 17th of May? Okay. So, um, been taken on notice yep, in terms of checking that, for I other was, officials. I was it, is, it is given the quote you've now provided, Senator Wong, and the reference to seasonal workers and labour, it is entirely possible agriculture were playing sure. a role in that regard. I just want to know if the Prime Minister was telling the truth, and if so, who was working on it? Because yep. Ms Frame wasn't working on it. So someone else, so, so presumably, so, so, so why don't you take it on, on notice? notice? Yep, OK. Let's move on from this. So I just want to go through a quick chronology. of uh, what's occurred since March of 2020. March, 18th of March, DFAT travel advice for the entire world raised to do not travel. 27th of March, uh, and that, that came into effect as at the 20th of March. So effectively, Australia's borders closed on the 20th of March, 2020. That's that's correct, isn't it? That sounds yes. right, Senator. Yep. 27th of March, National Cabinet uh, agreed to um, how quarantine arrangements for incoming travellers would be managed. Um, at this stage, I don't believe that decision is made public and it doesn't grant exclusive responsibility for quarantine measures to the states, but it does go through some involvement of implementation of state and territory governments. The Prime Minister introduces the cap on international arrivals on the 13th of July. By that time, we have seen 
Many other countries acting quickly to bring their citizens home, the United Kingdom performed um, 186 charter flights for 1.3 million nationals. Germany chartered 260 flights, 260,000 citizens, and as that, at that stage, there was still no coordinated plan here in Australia for repatriation flights with corresponding safe federal quarantine. Sorry. Senator, I think an important point in terms of the comparison you're making yep. there. Uh, relates to the safety equation of managing COVID and returning. So we didn't have to numbers. bring people home. Is that because we were safer? Is that the logic of that answer? No, we were uh, establishing with the states quarantine arrangements that meant there were limits on the numbers that could be facilitated okay. safely through Australia. We saw caps fluctuate in the following mon months. The number of standard Australians uh, um, with DFAT, registered with DFAT, continued to rise. I remember this one. I remember the Prime Minister saying definitively he had tasked the Foreign Affairs Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Defence Minister, the Home, and the Home Affairs Minister, this is on the 21st of August, to bring forward measures to him and the Treasurer to see how they could better support Australians overseas. We've never actually seen what those measures are, but it was good to get through the press conference. No, Senator, there have been measures no, 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 in no, terms no. of supporting Australians no, no. overseas. <laughs> you're giving them loans. Fund. Yeah, you're giving them loans. Not but the, he, he announced that he was tasking the three ministers to bring forward these proposals and he came up with loans. They're not all loans, Senator. Eighteenth September, he promised to get all stranded at home by Christmas. But the number of stranded Australians overseas at Christmas of that year was in fact higher than the number as at the date of the promise, 26,000 versus 40,000. Uh, committees in the Senate were consistently told by departments that the single limiting factor to bring Australians home was not flights but was quarantine places. Right, correct. Despite this, it's not till the 16th of October the federal that the federal government talks to the Northern Territory government about expanding Howard Springs to accommodate more returned travellers. So this is seven months after the borders close. Holton reviews prevented, presented on the 23rd of October, which outlined options for the government to safely expand quarantine options, none of which have been acted upon except for Howard Springs. That's correct, isn't it? Well, Senator. Howard Springs has been no. acted on. The Holton Review outlined options to safely expand quarantine. The only one that's been acted upon is the Howard Springs option. The Howard Springs option is the viable option to be able to expand. It is the only one that you've acted on. We then have the Christmas deadline coming and going. We have 40,000 Australians stranded and separated from their families. In some parts of the world, the pandemic is accelerating, including obviously close to home in Papua New Guinea. And then there's India. And, and let's remember for some of this period, so the, the, the history I've spoken of, the example of other countries repatriating citizens that we did not engage in at that scale, nor as early, in India, there is a domestic lockdown for a period, a very substantial period of post the pandemic. Yeah. Last year and then this year, and I, I can't recall off the top of my head uh, how long it is for, but what I do know is I received many emails from Australians stranded in India who were not only bemoaning or <coughs> Um, upset about the lack of repatriation flights. As you might recall, some of the Indian diaspora community actually arranged their own repatriation flights because the government wasn't doing it. But these Australians couldn't even get to where the flights were because there was a domestic lockdown. And now we have a prolonged and devastating wave of cases in India. I don't know what, what the death toll is now, 200,000 plus. <coughs> And it is now the country with the largest number of stranded Australians and you still have no coordinated plan to bring anybody home. Senator, we've outlined plans around the resumption of services which have begun from India to help repatriate people and India is amongst those 
facilitated flights uh, being given a clear priority. I mean, you've got Mr Morrison has not taken responsibility for quarantine. He's chosen not to expand quarantine options beyond, the, beyond Howard Springs. And the number of Australians stranded in India and separated from their families has continued to rise since border cl borders closed. Senator. That's correct, isn't it? The, uh, I don't have the registered numbers to hand. 36,000. You were talking India specifically. Sorry. In the question. Ten thousand was eleven thousand um, at the moment. Is that right, Ms. Frank? Uh, I have to get the most recent number from Could you, DFAT, Senator. Surely you have that. It, it's as you say. It's between ten and eleven. I think there was even a, uh, the number today, which has come down slightly because of the very recent flight arrival from New Delhi. But I will get you the most recent number, Senator. It's almost like the definition of meeting, well, it's, it's, it is the definition of leaving people behind. Senator, large numbers of Australians have returned, including large numbers through quarantine facilities and arrangements. Um, the facilitated flights, particularly prioritising India, prioritising um, uh, Howard Springs for those higher risk um, cohorts uh, are actions the government continues to take. We wish that there were a simple way to just clear the list. That's not the case. No, no though, nobody's Senator suggesting Wong. it's simple. But I, I, not I, the don't, case, don't you Senator reckon Wong. actually making we, sure you dealt the, with quarantine and repatriation earlier might have reduced the number of people who now are in increasingly perilous situation in India? Well, quarantine capabilities have a range of limiting factors. It's not just where a site exists or that a site exists. It's May 2021. Staff and other factors. I mean, this, what, what is so frustrating for people, apart from the fact that, you know, people have lost loved ones and people have loved ones at risk, is that all of this is foreseeable. Right, the borders close in March, other countries recognised the risk and tried to basically engaged uh, in a whole range of uh, strategies to try and return people home. I remember saying at the time, the longer we wait, the more perilous people's situations will be. And the government has has simply refused to step up and take responsibility on those key things which would make a difference. Of course, I accept this is an enormously difficult situation. Well, I don't understand why we're here in May and we still don't have the expanded safe national quarantine which we all know uh, is a required to ensure that people can come home. Senator, and we've tried to avoid having yeah. the debate. Okay, let's just... it now. We have a significant national quarantine capability. All right, okay. That has you been tell that to safely. the... Okay. Can I ask... So I can... If you don't have these to hand, Ms Frame, I'll ask them at DFAT or you can take it on notice, but I just wanted to get an update on the numbers. I had 11,000 um, still registered as stranded, that is, in India wanting to come home. Um, I was, I had the last numbers as at 7th of May that we had were 173 unaccompanied minors. I now can't recall the number that were vulnerable in the, out of the 11,000 cohort. Do you have updated numbers? I, I do, Senator. Um, Could you? The, the latest numbers from DFAT as at today. Yep. Um, 11,152 registered, mm -hmm. 1,039 <coughs> vulnerable, and um, 20,216 returned. Sorry, I asked about unaccompanied minors. Unaccompanied minors, I don't have that number, I'm sorry. Why, why don't people collect that? Uh, I'm DFAT, not, I'm just, DFAT do collect that. Well, Senator, no, they I didn't know until that. we asked, actually. So I, I can get you the updated number. I'm just trying to work out if, how many of the 173 as at a couple of weeks ago have come home. I'll have to take that on yep. notice, Senator. Uh, was the Prime Minister and Cabinet consulted in on or have prior knowledge of the decision by the Minister for Health and Aged Care to utilise the Biosecurity Act to ban Australian citizens from coming home on the 30th of April? Senator, you 
question. It's going to elements of cabinet processes and decision making there. It was a decision of government. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't actually asking me. I just wondered if they knew if, or were they consulted on it? So I can answer I, that. I, oh, sorry, you were asking the department. Yes, sorry. it was Prime Minister I, I, and I Cabinet. Heard it as, sorry, I no. heard it was the Prime Minister no, and no, the no, Cabinet No, 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 no. Did the department, was the department of Prime Minister and Cabinet consulted on or have prior knowledge of the decision by the Minister of Health and Aged Care to invoke the Act to ban Australian citizens on the 30th of April? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, on the 30th of April, on the morning of the 30th of April, right. we became aware as, as officials in PM&C that the Minister for Health was considering that um, and had indeed asked the CMO for advice on that. So we were aware, and I, have, I was in a meeting with Professor Kelly and Professors Kelly and Murphy, uh, where they um, also relayed that. So when and how did the department first become aware of the minister's intention? Uh, probably, as I said, it was that morning. Sorry, so I shouldn't have, I should have, so how did you become aware? Um, I think it was a phone call from, it was either Professor Kelly or someone in the health department advising us that the Minister for Health was considering this determination and had sought advice from the Health Department on that. Did you provide any advice? We did not provide advice, Senator. It's a, it's a determination made by the Minister for Health. But obviously, I mean, I think it's been made public by the government this was a decision of Cabinet. So in that context, did you provide any advice? Uh, we provided advice. Um, so. As I said, Senator, we're aware that this, the CMO had been asked for the advice by the Minister for Health, and then we were um, providing advice to the Prime Minister in a briefing, a pre-briefing for the National Cabinet that day. So that, that same day was the day we became aware of it. The, the day was we were... Did, it, did you advise about the consequences for Australians stranded in India? Uh, Senator, though, the... Material, well, the briefing was in the context of a briefing for the Prime Minister for National Cabinet. Senator Wong, before you ask the next question, I have just realised we're overdue oh, for our tea break. Sorry. Um, how much longer do you have to go on this line? I'm happy to have a break. Okay. Now I'll try and work out if I can. No, I won't finish it quickly. Great. In India, um, the yep. India bit. Yep. We, in that case, we will break now for. Yep. Uh, 11 Tea. minutes. And yes, we will recommence at 9.30 Excellent. Uh, if everyone's happy with that. Thank you. Committee suspense. Veen and Senator Wong has the call. Okay. Um, the Minister, Minister Hunt put out a press release outlining, outlining the decision he'd made and the punishments for not complying with the determination. Uh, were you, was the department consulted on the draft of the release? No, Senator. Was the Prime Minister's office consulted on the release? I have to take that on notice, Senator. This was raised in briefings of the opposition, so I suggest you <laughs> make sure that that is made clear. Okay, well, that's... That that will now form part of the uh, part of the question taken Involving on Involving Minister Senator. Hunt's office. Um, uh, the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, the Prime Minister said, because obviously that the the fact that um, Australians returning home potentially would face. Punishment, which included jail time and or, and or um, fines, obviously became an issue of some controversy, um, including inside the coalition, but also certainly from the opposition, but more importantly, the, the Indian diaspora and members of the community. The Prime Minister said in a radio interview that the, the punishments for failure to comply were not, quote, accentuated by himself, Mr Hunt or anyone else. It was picked up uh, on in the media and they've highlighted it. It is the case, isn't it, that the penalties for non-compliance, including jail, were clearly stated in Minister Hunt's press release. Um, yes, Senator, I believe it is the case. 
Had the Prime Minister not read the press release when he did the interview on the 6th of May and made that comment? I don't know, Senator. Mm -hmm. um, now, can I just go back to the unaccompanied minors? The COVID, at the COVID committee, I think Senator Keneally asked some questions as to how many unaccompanied minors remain stranded and tra or trapped in India. Um, was PMNC aware of that number prior to the hearing on the 7th of May? Uh, I was not, Senator. I will take it on notice as to whether anyone else was. Um, I can also uh, explain that it's not a number we regularly receive. So and to, up to that point, we regularly receive numbers from DFAT on their program, on how many are registered, on vulnerables. I find it pretty extraordinary no one asked the question until we did. I mean, you're responsible for coordinating whole of government efforts to bring Australians home. Why did no one ever ask the question as to how many kids there are? I, I don't know, Senator. I, it was not a number that I was aware of. Before the question was asked by Senator Keneally in the COVID committee, did the Prime Minister or his office know how many children were trapped in India? How many Australian children? I don't know, Senator. I have to take that on notice. You'd never briefed them about it, had you? We provided very regular updates on vulnerable Australians. They are a subset of that vulnerable number. Could you answer the question? That, but that's, that's the answer, Senator. Well, is you know, did you ever brief them on the number of unaccompanied minors? No, Senator. As, as, as explained, I was not aware of that number till that... Um, and they never asked you? No, Senator. Did people not regard this as a priority? Uh, I was regularly asked about vulnerable Australian Senator and that number and to provide oh, no, I just updates on what we were I doing. Think, I think what the evidence closes is that no one in Prime Minister and Cabinet or in the Prime Minister's office actually has to ask the question as to how many of the vulnerable Australian stranded were, were children until it was asked in the Senate committee. Is that right? I, it may have been asked somewhere, Senator. I can take it on notice and find out if there was any discussion about it. Nothing that I had convened, as, as I've talked to you mm -hmm. in the past about the IDC, that I convened. Now that the Prime Minister does know, has he tasked you with bringing these Australians home? At DFAT are responsible for that program, Senator, and they are um, continuing to work on that repatriating pro re repatriation program, as you're aware. Has the Prime Minister asked you, the Department, to work with DFAT to bring these stranded Australian children home? Senator, the vulnerable cohort is a priority. As you've heard, children who, when it comes to their likely travel status, are unaccompanied. These are children who are overwhelmingly with family sure. in country. Um, it was the uh, same issue in Wuhan. When we did, when the repatriation yes. site was run, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, yeah, but right. I, and there I, had to be exemptions so, given at that stage yeah. to enable certain Correct. Um, gu yeah, guardians of yeah. and flight I'm asking, purposes. We now know there are 173 Australian kids in India. I am asking if they are, right. if it is government policy first to prioritise them. I'm asking whether the Prime Minister has asked the public service through his department to prioritise bringing these children, finding a way to bring these children home safely. No, the, the vulnerable cohort as a whole remains a priority. DFAT, I am aware, Senator, and, uh, and obviously we'll have a chance to ask them more next week, have been trying to work in some of these instances on a case-by-case -case basis of the, the, the accompanying individual and how they are going to facilitate the transit of minors with an accompanying individual who may then, um, who may, would not otherwise so meet entry requirements to Australia. I'm just asking if he's asked Australia. you to prioritise them. Has he asked for advice about this? Has he asked that this be a priority? That's what I'm asking. I think the answer from what you're saying is, no, the priority is the whole of the cohort. But vulnerable cohort remains a priority. But so he children, has, but children... He, but, but Sorry. questions about the children as part of that cohort have been asked and I am aware um, from, I'm aware that DFAT are working 
on individual cases to try to help facilitate those as part of the vulnerable right. cohort being... But is it the case, as I understand your evidence, Ms Frame, that, that you have not been asked by the Prime Minister or his office for advice as to how to prioritise bringing home these Australian children? This is a matter DFAT is dealing with on the basis of the whole cohort. I'm not sure about the second part, Senator. I can say I haven't been asked, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister would ask the Foreign Minister or DFAT directly. Prime Minister and Cabinet are not responsible for the program, as okay. you know, of returning Australia. Has the Prime Minister asked the Foreign Minister to prioritise I, I don't know. Children? I'm asking that. I know, I know. You don't need to answer questions okay, which are certainly for the Minister. I, I wasn't sure who you were directing your question well, to. Well, it's I'm about sorry. the ministerial discussion. Has he Sorry. asked the Foreign Minister for, to prioritise the children coming home? Uh, Senator, I don't know what he has specifically asked the, the Foreign Minister. As I said before, well, I am aware uh, that... As DFAT at tonight, can you take on notice whether as at... What are we at? 9... So to clarify, Senator... Has Warren, the Foreign no, Minister been so, asked... So, so can I clarify what you mean by prioritise? Has you he saying, asked for advice as to how we get the children home? Senator, that is... Uh, Please don't play word no, games. No, no, there no, are 173 no. kids there. I'm just trying to work I, out you, if anyone in government is actually looking at, has made a decision that this is a priority so, or not. If not, then explain so, so, why. So Secondly, working out if they are a priority, how we bring them home. It's pretty simple. So we've consistently highlighted the fact that priority exists in relation to the vulnerable cohort. Is your question... Is, has he asked for prioritisation of the children within that vulnerable cohort ahead of others in the vulnerable cohort? Or well, has he asked for any advice specifically about how those children are to be to, are to come home? So I don't want no, to play I, word well, games. Look, well, it's, well, no, Senator so, Birmingham, so, so, please, so, can, we, can we deal with... Sen Sen Senator Wong... You know, I, all I, I'm trying to understand... I am trying to deal with it and... I'm just trying to understand... Once that no one in government has focused on the 173, and, and, right? The 173 the, is now public. What's happened as a result? Has anything happened? So, DFAT are working on what is essentially a case by case management for them. There's not a single solution that, uh, that uh, deals with um, children who are with family, uh, usually. Okay, in India, okay, but whose family are not eligible to travel yep. with them. You've got to set up the arrangements to deal with that case by case. And they are working, I'm aware, on individual cases as part of that vulnerable cohort, which is the priority. Has the Prime Minister sought... Let's do it this way. Has the Prime Minister sought any advice from the Department or from the Foreign Minister and DFAT on what would be required to bring those children home? Has the, has the Prime Minister given any direction as to whether or not the children should be prioritised? Do you want to take those two things on notice? No, I'll take okay. them on notice. Um, a number of meetings were... There, were uh, there was obviously a lot of distress in the Indian diaspora community about the ban, about the situation that relative people found themselves in or found their, you know, the, their relatives were we're in, um, obviously distressed because many people have lost someone through this um, wave, um, and then distressed, frankly, about the messaging around people going to jail. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this. I understand that the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, and the Foreign Minister had online meetings with members, representatives from the Indian diaspora, and I'm asking what, if any, involvement Prime Minister and Cabinet had in um, setting up, preparing, facilitating any of those meetings? I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. I'm not aware of any involvement of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Ms Foster? No, Senator. So we'll take it on notice in case I'm missing something. Sure. Yet. I'm moving to another topic, Senator Birmingham. Um, 
Secretary Pizzullo, in his April Anzac Day message, which remains on the Home Affairs website, spoke about the drums of war and sending off yet again our warriors to fight the nation's wars. This message was also published as an opinion piece in the Australian on the 27th of April. I'm asking about when uh, the department first became aware that the Secretary of Home Affairs had published this message. Deputy Secretary, National Security and International Policy. Uh, we became aware of it on the day it was published, Senator. Was anyone in the department consulted or advised of the message prior to its publication? No, we weren't. Ms Miller, does the department agree with Secretary Bazula's assertion that the, quote, drums of war are beating? <laughs> Senator... Um, it's not funny, it wasn't a joke. Senator, I think the Prime Minister has made it very clear. No, no, I, no. I've asked you, does the department agree with the Secretary's words? The drums of war are beating. I, You're not the see, department. I'm see, asking see, the department. Well, I don't think the department can have an opinion on... Well, he does. Well, he is... <laughs> He is the secretary uh, okay, of a department, well, uh, correct, and obviously he can be asked about the statement he has made. Maybe are there words it. you've ever used, Ms Miller, in a public forum? Have you ever talked about the drums of war beating in relation to the current situation? Senator, I don't propose to comment on secretary I didn't ask you to comment. Why not? I, I ha no, I haven't made those, said Thank those you. words. They're not words you would use. I haven't used them, though. No. When was the Prime Minister aware of Secretary Pizzullo's message? I'm not aware Senator Wong will take that on notice. Was anyone in the PMO consulted prior to its publication on the website? I'll take it on notice, Senator, not to my knowledge, though. Was anyone aware that before it was published in the Australian from the PMI? Again, I'll take it on notice, Senator. And if yes, yet yeah, when and who was consulted? Well, I'll ask you, does the Prime Minister agree with Secretary Basula's assertion that the drums of war are beating? Uh, well, I think the Prime Minister uh, has provided in his own words uh, his view in relation to uh, the strategic challenges in the region. Does he agree with the assertion the drums of war are beating? Mm, Senator Wong, as I said, I think the Prime Minister has responded uh, to questions uh, of that nature using his own words. Uh, I don't have a transcript of what the Prime Minister said in relation to that, but uh, they're not words that I've heard the Prime Minister use in terms of his assessment uh, of yeah. those strategic challenges. Did PMNC, did anyone from PMNC provide any feedback about the message after its publication to Secretary Buzzolo or, any, or to anyone at Home Affairs? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Why not? You think it's fine, do you? Senator, I'm not going to offer an opinion on Secretary Buzzolo's comments. All right, but uh, I'm glad you've written that down. Made. You keep no. saying that, uh, Ms Buzzolo, mm -hmm. but I'm actually asking something different. Did you or anyone in the department provide any feedback to him after he wrote it and made it public? I did not, Senator. I'm not aware if anyone else did. Th th those were matters for Sec Secretary Pizzullo. He made his comments. You don't, you don't think not... you're, uh, you're the most senior international policy person in the Prime Minister's department. You are a senior official. You've agreed they're not words you would use. What, do, don't you think it would be worth providing some feedback? Or can he just say whatever he likes and nobody tells him? It's pretty... Is that what happens? He can just say whatever he likes. Nobody no. says anything. No, no Senator. I'm sure that's not the case. Well, who said something other than me? <laughs> Did anyone say anything to him after it? 
I'm not aware, Senator. I'll take it on notice for you. Thank you. Did, so you didn't provide any feedback. Did anyone from PMC provide any feedback? Senator, not to my knowledge. Okay. The one um, uncertainty in my mind is whether or not Mr Gaitchens did. Sure, and we, we can are, take well, that on notice. Well, that, could, that could be a long process of finding that out, but good luck with that. Um, can you take on notice whether the Prime Minister or the PMO provided any feedback? Sure, Senator. Now, there's been a, some conflicting reports about the process of publication. Minister Andrews said on the 27th of April, quote, well, the Secretary did send his speech through to me, so I did read it clearly in advance. Um, the Prime Minister would, but then the Prime Minister was asked if the Secretary's message was authorised by the Minister in an interview with Mr Mitchell. He was asked whether or not is it correct what the head of the Home of Home Affairs had to say about the drums for beating were in fact authorised by the Minister? Prime Minister, no, that's not the case. Uh, and then yesterday, Mr Pozzullo said his staff had sent the message, this is the, in which the comments were made, to Home Affairs Minister shortly before its publication on the Department's website on the 25th of April. So, I'm trying to understand how the Prime Minister's statement can be true. She did read it beforehand. He then says, no, it wasn't authorised. So is he drawing a distinction between reading it and authorising it? I'm just trying, I would like you to square the circle or to reconcile, as George Brandis, because I think I said square the circle once he said, told me to, you mean reconcile. But I'm trying to reconcile those two statements. Can you explain oh, what he meant? Well, Senator Wong, um, Taking the statements as you've presented them at, uh, at face value, uh, I think you have also provided uh, yourself the likely explanation for that, uh, that it was, uh, by the sounds of it, provided shortly before publication, Senator and Minister Andrews read it, um, uh, was that an approval process? Um, it doesn't sound like well, it, it sounds like no it was provided. No one is really, I don't hold a hose, mate. It's always I don't hold a hose, mate. Isn't it? You, you're the minister. Your secretary provides you with something in that, those terms, and the prime minister gets out of the problem by saying oh, I wasn't actually authorised, because reading it as the minister and not raising some concern about what is being said isn't authorising it. All right. Well, can you take on notice? How, what the Prime Minister meant when he said no, that it was not authorised, given Minister Andrews clearly said that she had read it before it went out. If you're asking, I can take it on. Thank you. So vetting public messages by departmental secretaries, there's no process for that? Senator, if you mean, is there a broader process across the board? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary Pazula says he had no idea that his message would be published as an op-ed, so it just magically goes from the website into the Australian opinion pages. Could you tell me, as any member of the government, any member of the Prime Minister's staff? or any other government staff member uh, involved in discussing the message with the Australian for the purposes of having it printed as an opinion piece? Well, I'll take that on notice yep. as far as it extends to, to the Prime Minister's staff, Senator Wong. Well, they're all his staff, technically. So I am asking whether any member of the government staff was involved in having it published. Ministerial staff? Yes. Okay, Senator Wong, we'll do our best. Thank you. Um, do you know how it was published without permission? If Mr Puzzolo is right, he wasn't aware it was going into the Australian? I do not, Senator Wong. Has anyone asked? Um, I'll take it on notice. Um, on the 11th of May, the member for Dawson put in place a Facebook post, post which states, war is coming with a picture of the flag of the PRC. Is anyone in the department aware of this post? Mm 
Senator Rod Brazier, First Assistant Secretary, International Division. You saying we'll be aware of it uh, before? No, it was I didn't. I didn't. Are you aware of it now? I've seen media reports okay. uh, of it. Were you, was anyone in the department consulted prior to its publication? Not to my knowledge. Was the PMO consulted prior to its publication? No. I'd be surprised, yeah, Senator right Wong, but uh, I, 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 I think Do that's highly unlikely, but I, uh, yeah. I will correct the record if... Right. Do you agree with the assertion, war is coming, Senator Wong? No. no, Senator Wong, the, uh, the assertion creates a, a certain inevitability uh, in, uh, in the way that statement is made, um, and, uh, and I certainly do not think that there is an inevitability, and there are certainly challenges uh, that I know you appreciate and, uh, and others appreciate uh, in the strategic context uh, of our region, but, uh, but no, I don't accept right. the inevitability assume, of that sorry. statement. I assume that that is the Prime Minister's view as well? I, uh, I would imagine that is shared by the Prime okay. Minister. Senator Can you explain to me, has the, has the Prime Minister said anything about this Facebook post? Not, not to my knowledge. Um, to, to the member or to anyone, to the party room, to anyone that you're aware uh, of? Um, I, I may have missed the media reports that official was reflected, but your reference to the Facebook post is, uh, is the first I've noticed of it, Senator Wong. Do so, you understand that um, the Prime Minister's silence might be taken by some to be agreement when a member of his own government puts out something that clear, war is coming? It... Uh, I would think in the context of, uh, of the member for Dawson that, uh, that it would not ordinarily be taken as, uh, as such. Oh, well. Uh, now, the member for Canning had a recent fundraising email also reported in the media on the 21st of May where he said that the nation needed to be ready to defend our way of life and that the biggest challenge right now comes from authoritarian states threatening our sovereignty and security and then asked for money. Um, does, was the email authorised by the PMO? Or was, it, was the PMO aware the email would be sent? I wouldn't expect so. Senator. Do you think it's appropriate for a government minister to drum up national security concerns for domestic political fundraising purposes? Um, Senator, and I, again, without seeing the email itself, um, obviously members uh, seek support for their re-election on the basis of, uh, of government policy settings. As policy settings uh, um, exist across all spheres of government, be they economic, security, social or otherwise, um, but, uh, uh, but certainly I would discourage members from, uh, from uh, activities that exacerbate security uh, concerns um, and may particularly do so in, uh, in a combination of a political context with those security concerns. Well, why can't the Prime Minister say what you just said? Senator, you just asked me a question about that particular well, issue. Well, okay. So, so we've had a departmental secretary publish a message talking about the drums of war beating. We've had a, a government member with a Facebook post saying war is coming. We've got the member for Canning, who's also a front bencher, you know, uh, drumming up national security concerns for domestic political fundraising purposes, and the prime minister says nothing. Doesn't refute it. Doesn't rebuke them. Doesn't indicate that that's you know, they're not his views. Senator, the Prime Minister, I know for sure in relation to Secretary Pizzullo's comments, uh, was asked, and as I said, the Prime Minister used his own words to describe the challenges that he sees. Very quickly, you might want to take this on notice. Um, 
I'm sure this will be asked in finance and or treasury, but the vaccine, sorry, the border assumption, which is contained in budget paper one. So mid and outbound international travel expected to remain low through mid to, to mid 2022, after which gradual recovery in international tourism is assumed to occur. So essentially it assumes large border, borders remain largely closed until mid 2022. I'm just wondering, does that assumption reflect a decision of government? And if so, when was it made? No, Senator, I think, uh, I think many of us are on the record as indicating that it is a budget assumption. And no, that, you said that about vaccines, this is about borders. I, 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 I recall saying that okay. myself in the budget locked up on the day and in numerous occasions otherwise. So there is no decision of government that the budget assumption is based on? No, it's, uh, it's an assumption yeah. around the gradual reopening yeah, yeah. to inform no, budgeting. No, no, my, my, question, my question was quite mm. specific. Yes. There's no, no, no government no, decision no, on which no, the budget it's assumption, assumption is based. assumption in yes. the budget, not, a, not right. yet a decision of government. Um, and this may be need to be taken on notice, and probably was a question for Ms Frame, actually. But since the, the initial decision to close the borders on the 20th of March, I'm actually asking how many decisions have been made to continue that closure? It's probably a legal question, and whether a chronology can be, can be provided. Well, I, I am not actually clear, to be honest, the, the legal basis of the different ways in which we have essentially prevented the borders, prevented people from coming, because the Biosecurity Act was only specifically used for the purposes of criminalising making an offence to come back for India, but we had effective border closures, which were put in place, I assume, by other mechanisms, landing slots or some other... Um, 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 mechanisms prior to that. But I, I actually, what I'm trying to understand is from the 20th of March 2020, which is when the DFAT do not travel for the whole world advice uh, was provided, there have been obviously a series of decisions which must have been the legal basis on which the borders were effectively closed. And I'd like to understand what they were and when they were made and on what basis. Um, yes, Senator, it is um, an instrument under the Biosecurity Act right. that affects that closure. Um, there have been extensions of that right. every okay. three months. Right. Can you give me a chronology of that? Um, I you will can need... do it on notice. Yeah, I can is take that it on okay? notice. Can, can, can I ask, though, well, um, just to confirm then in relation to India, was that the first time, though, the Act had been used in that way? It was not the first ban, um, Senator. It was the first ban on inward flights from a particular country that had been listed as a hot on the red list. As but you know. how did we then, what was the nature of the decisions prior to that? There were, if I can just explain, Senator, there were other bans that had been, yeah, yeah. so as well as the three month border closure, the extension. And, and, yeah, but let, let's just focus on that. I, right, I, look, okay. Professor Murphy, sorry, Professor Kelly explained the way in which it had been used previously, but obviously this, as his own advice indicates, it was the first time this had been used against Australian citizens. So there was some about PPE yes. and other things like that. I'm actually interested in how we affected border closures, though, without utilising that provision in the Biosecurity Act previously, prior to that time. Prior to the India Correct. flight ban, it, it, it was a reinstigation of the three-month ban on international arrivals yep. unless otherwise exempted. Okay, so essentially, okay. I thought it was. So, so essentially, we, we said we are now banning arrivals, and we did that over the government did that on a rolling basis post March 20 each three months. Correct? Correct, Senator, and each time it requires updated advice. Sure, sure. Yep. I understand. Yeah, no, yep. he, he explained that to us. Yep. But on this occasion, uh, the government went further and actually effectively proscribed with criminal sanction the return of Australian citizens. So, so, so I think Senator Wong, correct me. So the same, the same powers under the Biosecurity Act are abused on each occasion to yeah, make a... Yeah, but not a, against Australian citizens. A, it was very it's, clear it's, it's, in it's this advice. To yeah. make a determination or yeah. a declaration and those powers come with automatic provisions in relation to what the penalties for breaching that declaration are. Yes, in relation to India, it related to a cohort 
uh, in, namely encompassing Australian citizens that has not been captured by the ordinary three-month update of the rest of the Biosecurity Act. Well, no, that's not right. right. They're not, it's not that they're not captured. No. It's an additional level of compliance. No. That's not correct as I understand oh, okay. it, Minister. Sorry, Senator. Okay, well, look, let's not... Do you want to give me the chronology, perhaps, with, which include which what the decisions are? Certainly we can do and, that. And I'll come back to that another time, if we ever do that. Um, so, so, sorry, Senator Wong. I mean, there are some parts of the biosecurity determinations that do capture Australians, such as yeah, yeah, relates yeah, to the that. cruise ship yeah, industry yeah, 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 and so that. on, yeah, well, but, but not in terms of entry into yeah, Australia. Yeah, understood. OK. Um, yeah. I have now questions about QAnon. Surely it's not as frame. No, I'm leaving. This might be one Somebody thinks. Senator Keneally asked at the last estimates whether or not the Prime Minister had received a briefing on the dangers presented by the QAnon conspiracy cult by either PMNC or another agency and to provide the dates of briefings. Now, that was question number 1377 from the last round. Ms Foster, can you tell me why that no answer has been provided? Uh, Senator, I'm just going to see if Mr Cahoon can give me a status on that question. That question, uh, Senator Lachlan Cahoon, First Assistant Secretary, National Security Division. Um, my recollection is that that uh, answer has not yet been concluded. Oh, but no kidding. Why, so, why hasn't it been completed? Let me check, Senator. If you want. The advice I have here is just that uh, the answer is yet to be yet to be finalised. <laughs> oh, have you provided a draft answer to the PMI? Uh, I have, there is no draft answer in my division, Senator. Well, why haven't you done it? Sorry, I, as in the draft, I've cleared a draft that has left my division. You have cleared a draft? Yes. So it's gone from you to the PMO? Yes. When did that happen? Oh, sorry, well, it's left me to the central area. So, so is it your fault, Ms Foster? Um, Come Senator, on, guys. Look, you know what's probably happened, because you're so sensitive. You've drafted it, it's gone to the PMO. Can you just tell me the date that happened? Sure, we'll try Thank and get you. that for you, Senator. Well, can I sit here and wait for it? This is all on a, this is all on computer somewhere. I know. Yeah, I and, used to get... and Senator, that's exactly what I said. Um, that was a signal. Oh, for that was the a signal. Central area to please central area central control. Try when and was find it for me what the status of that call okay. is. Okay. Well, have you provided any briefing about Q and not, not to my knowledge, Senator, but it wouldn't come from my area, the, the, which is why I'm looking at Mr there Cahoon. Have, uh, there have been no briefings from PMNC, which is the same as my answer to you last time, Senator. But at that time, Senator, just for clarity, I did point out that, as you would understand from your history, no. intelligence matters are often provided to ministerial officers without the department knowing. Are you aware of a report by, is it SUFAN, is that how one says it, Centre, which finds that the QAnon conspiracy theory has been weaponised by Russian, Chinese and Iranian actors seeking to promote disinformation and radicalisation? Yes, I am, broadly. I've basically read that headline. Do you disagree with those conclusions? I haven't read the analysis in detail. Okay. I'm not an intelligence analyst. Um, the New York Police Department has described QAnon as a broad conspiracy movement with anti-Semitic underpinnings that falsely alleges, based on purportedly classified intelligence, that, uh, that an elite cabal of pedophiles led by Democrats is plotting to harm children and undermine President Trump. Do you disagree with that assessment? I, again, as we, I, you may recall, Senator, last no, time we spoke I've about this. I've done a lot since then. I don't um, remember I'll, all of it. I'll, let me refresh. Um, no, you don't need to. Okay. 
Just, just tell me if you agree or not. Um, I just think it, associating QAnon like that is like associating QAnon with ISIS. There's a very big distinction. QAnon is a very broad-based, loose movement. Lots of people say that they're believers in QAnon. So to draw any you know, single conclusion, I think, is enormously difficult. It's not like saying this is a member of ISIS or the Antipodean resistance. Well, um, this is a question for you, Senator Birmingham. I understand that a um, media outlet, Crikey, has sent Mr Morrison some questions about QAnon that his media office has refused to answer. The questions relate to whether or not the Prime Minister had anything to say about comments by his friend and QAnon proponent, a Mr Tim Stewart, describing the day of the Capitol Hill attack as one of the greatest days on earth. Um, Crikey also asked the PMO what measures, if any, were in place to prevent Mr Stewart having access to confidential information about the Prime Minister. What are the answers to those questions? Well, um, Senator Wong, in terms of if you want to pose those questions, I'll happily take them on notice for you in terms of a response uh, being provided. What, why has it, there been no answer to those questions? Senator, you're asking for comment. Sorry, you're saying Crikey has asked for comment. Well, I'm advised. I can only go on what I'm told. Yeah. Now, if you want to pose those questions seeking comment from the Prime Minister uh, or his office, then I can take that on notice for you. If you want to pose the questions of, of me, I can. Well, I can't really reflect on the second one because I don't know the individual concerned. Well, he's been spoken about before. No, I've Mr. seen Stewart. some of the media coverage. Yes. Well, I've asked questions here about him. Predating, predating me, I think, Senator. Uh, possibly. So uh, this is also a question for you, Senator Birmingham. Given that there is credible analysis uh, that QAnon conspiracy theories are being weaponised by actors such as Russia, China and Iran, would you say, do you agree that um, a friend of Mr Morrison's who adheres to these theories is a possible vector for foreign interference? Senator, I am not aware of the nature of the relationship. Uh, so, in that sense, you know, it's to some extent uh, a hypothetical, but I can certainly assure you that the Prime Minister takes uh, his security obligations seriously and is alert to all threats uh, that uh, that uh, security agencies briefing on. Well, why is our question on QAnon not answered by the PM? PM? So I, refuses to answer. Sorry. Well, so far, if if the advice to me is correct, refuses to, you know, the PMO refusing to respond to Crikey. There's been no response no. to Senator Keneally's question on notice. Well, what is the Prime Minister so sensitive about? It sounds from the information that Mr. Cahoon just provided that, that the answer is. Sitting clear in the PMO. In, well, but the answer itself sounds like it's reasonably clear in terms of has this department provided briefing and... Well, then like why won't they the sign off on not. it? No? So to the um, question on notice draft was provided to PMO on the 29th of April. I'm sorry, I was just sent a photo of the Prime Minister with the gentleman in question. I don't think I can table it off the 
iPad. Sorry, what were you saying? Could you, you gave me a date, I think. I did, Senator. Um, so Mr Cahoon indicated that he had cleared the draft response to the question on notice, and I was just advising you that it was provided to the PMO on the 29th of April. Hmm, 29th of April. So been there a month. What's the problem, Senator Birmingham? Why don't they want to sign it off? Senator Wong, I'm not aware in terms of the sign off process for that question, but uh, uh, I'll try to uh, ensure it is, uh, it is progressed for you, Senator. I think, as, uh, as we've heard, it sounds like Mr Cohen has, has provided the answer to the committee now. OK. Well, not OK, but <clears throat> you can provide on notice. Um, and I'm sorry, have you been asked before about Ms. Mr Stewart's wife being employed at the residence? So, Senator, that's not a question for Mr Cahoon. I'd ask Mr Martin. Have you, the, not to, has the department been asked? We have been asked in Senate estimates. Have? Yes. Yes, I thought so. Might even have been by me. I, I'm not key, I mean, people's employment arrangements are matter for them, but I actually am just asking, given the advice that's on the public record, the assessment about Q and on whether or not there's been any security assessment of the relevant staff member. And so, Senator, I think our advice before, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr Martin, is that um, the employee met all relevant security checks for employment. And has that been revisited? Senator, the person was required to get a security clearance and they did. Right. So the, the assessments that I read out, and you know, you didn't like the New York Police Department assessment, but it's there on the public record. The Sufin Centre um, assessment is there on the public record, and in particular, references the potential for this to be uh, these conspiracy theories to be used by state actors who seek to promote disinformation and radicalisation. And has that, have those facts been considered in relation to this particular employee? So, Senator, that's not an assessment that um, PM&C is involved in. Um, obviously, the security assessment is done by an agency with the appropriate skills and experience and mandate to do that. How long has, but I assume there's only been the one security clearance. Yes, sir. Okay, while you're here, Mr. Martin, now, do you remember refusing to tell me if Mr. Houston was on the list of people that the PM wanted to? attend potential attend the state dinner at the White House with Pre President Trump and you told me any matters relating to consideration of the guest list for a state dinner would be a matter that might impact on international relations and you refuse to answer. So then on the 3rd of March, so this is the question you give me in October, Mr. The Prime Minister says when he's asked by Mr Fordham, did you in seek an invitation to the White House State Dinner for Brian Houston? And he says, on that occasion, we put forward a number of names that included Brian. So how come you can't answer because it might impact on international relations, but the Prime Minister can? Does his answer impact on international relations? Senator, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Well, you didn't want to answer the question, so you gave a reason. Then he answers the question, so does it not apply to him? Can't offer you an opinion on that, Senator. Oh, so. <laughs> see, see. Come on. See, how how see, is it possible, see, 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 how is it possible that, so, that you can say in here, I'm not going to answer because it might affect international relations, but he's happy to answer. So does, does his answer affect our relationship with the United States? Is that the assessment of the department? So, Senator, my memory of that sequence was that um, Mr Martin asked our colleagues in International Division for their advice on whether or not there would be any sensitivity with 
uh, releasing that information, and so Mr Martin was acting on that advice. Right, but clearly the Prime Minister doesn't act on that advice, does he, because he put it in the public record? Well, the, pro the Prime Minister obviously made an assessment it's that it wasn't of sensitive Oh, nature. so he can just decide it wasn't. So it can be censored for the purposes of making sure officials don't disclose this invitation uh, in estimates, but not sensitive when he works out he can't keep holding out on it. Well, if, uh, Seriously. It's Ms. Foster it's indicated. Ms. Foster indicated that, uh, that it either is or Mr. it isn't. That Mr. Martin was of a mind to check or ascertain. Prime Minister was able to make that decision. What does it say, Mr. Bur Senator Birmingham, about the PM standards that he tries to invite someone from the White House who's reportedly still under investigation for failing to report alleged child sex abuse to police? Senator Wong, I don't, uh, I don't have details around um, those allegations and the status of them. Are you aware that the Prime Minister, I think last month at a public event, Reference, reference Mr Houston saying, you, Brian, just pay you honour, mate. Um, no, Senator, I'm not aware of that quote. So, no one can explain to me how it is that the Prime Minister invites a bloke with that, who has, still has those questions to answer, is still under investigation. On my advice, I might be wrong, but that's what I'm advised. Hides the fact that he asked for him to be invited to the White House, then when it gets too hot, decides that he can disclose that. Well, so the advice didn't change. It's not like, so if Mr Martin's defence is, he asked, I don't know. It was Mr Hayhurst at the time. Oh, uh, Mr Hayhurst, would this be something appropriate for me to say? He's given advice that no, it's not might impact upon international relations. So he then refuses to answer us in estimate saying that, and the Prime Minister simply decides to answer it. There's no change in the advice. He just decided it was politically better for him to answer it than not anymore. Well, Senator Wong, uh, I think um, Prime Ministers in general have a certain prerogative in terms of being able to make a judgment of answering such matters that may not always be extended to officials. Senator Wong, do you have much more no. on, on this particular no. topic or in general? In general. In general. I know, don't say it's a I, I, I just thought I was fortuitously... Uh, no, no, I, 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 tried, I told my colleague I would try to finish by 10. Okay. I'm 20 minutes late. I have some Thank questions. You. He does. So yeah, I, I just have five, a yeah. very short five-ish minute block um, okay. regarding the enterprise agreement negotiations that PMC undertook recently. Sure, we'll ask our Chief Operating Officer to come to the table. Thank you, Ms Foster. Oh, sorry, just, just while I've got Mr Martin at the table, mm -hmm. I think you undertook to Senator Smith earlier on in the day, Mr Martin, to um, table a list of international summits and conferences to which the Prime Minister has been invited to which he expects the Prime Minister will be invited by the end of today's hearing. Are you in a position to table that? Look, I didn't undertake that, Senator. We're still working on that with our colleagues in the International Division. So we'll see how we go. Thank you. Can you just ask one question? I'm advised there are 68 quons still sitting the, with the PMO from additional estimates since March 2021 and 176 from all estimate rounds since both supplementary budget estimates in 2017-2018. Can I get you to, I'd like you to give an undertaking, but can they please be tabled? I'll raise, uh, I'll raise the issue. Yeah, Senator that's a lot. Sitting I'm, in the office, I'll, so not. I'll, I'll raise the issue, Senator Wong. Thank I, you. I, I don't have the aggregate stats to know just how many have well, been it's processed. From, it's from my, my, my staff member, Anton. He, he would have got the number right, I think. No, no, I'm not challenging the number. I'm just noting that uh, there would also be an aggregate number that have been uh, processed. This is a bit like the strain of the strain. And probably much larger than, uh, than uh, the residual. Sorry. You go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Mr Gilmartin, what was the outcome of the recent ballot uh, of staff through your enterprise negotiations? Senator Tom Gilmartin, Chief Operating Officer, PMNC, Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, we had a vote in favour of 89%. 89%. And what was the turnout for that ballot? 67%, uh, Senator. That's a regular number of turnout that you'd expect for a EA ballot? Um, two thirds, over two thirds, Senator. Yes, I think that's a good number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it more or less than the last time you went through this process? I'd need to take that in notice, um, Senator. I don't know the answer. Okay. And the offer that was made um, as part of that process, was that in line with the government wages policy? I understand that policy specifies that um, there's a link between wage rises with the wage price index? It was, Senator, yes. Um, and, uh, I mean, you, you may not um, n know the answer to this, but anecdotally, um, through conversations with staff, did it appear, I mean, that 67% that number would certainly suggest that they were happy with what was offered, but were the staff receptive to the offer that was made and the process that the department undertook to consult? Yes, it was well accepted by the, the staff, Senator. Um, mm -hmm. the, the wage price index was 1.7%, mm -hmm. and that yeah, staff accepted that pretty well. Mm -hmm. And what was the response from the unions to that offer? Um, yeah. We had a number, quite a number of meetings, I think about seven. Um, union members um, and the union attended some of those, and uh, they certainly didn't work against that vote. They didn't work against no, that vote? No, they didn't. They, they were quite um, silent, I think, is, is the word I would use to describe. Okay. They, they didn't, I, we did not notice that they actively worked against it or, or strongly encouraged a no vote. Okay. Wonderful. That's all I had for you, Mr Gilmartin. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming up. Uh, Senator Ayres, okay. are you going to take us home? Indeed. Uh, I have uh, some questions for uh, Mr Larson. A narrow range of questions. Mr Larson, you've been sitting there quietly all day to make sure everybody gets a go. Quiet well, and patient. That's what he's known for. <sighs> Senator, James Larson, Climate Coordinator. Thanks, Mr. Larson. Could you outline your role um, for us briefly, given the, t given the time? So I am uh, a Deputy Secretary on Socomet and Effect on Transfer from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, uh, occupying the position of Climate Coordinator in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. So you're not an ongoing employee of the Department of Prime Minister I'm and not, Cabinet? I'm an ongoing employee of the Commonwealth, uh, but I'm with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, for the course of this year, yes. For the course of this year, so the Correct. appointment ends at the end of 2021? Correct. What about your Assistant Secretary, Ms uh, Poulston? Uh, she is also with me for the same period of time. She uh -huh. is, uh, on succumb she's on transfer from, uh, uh, from DISA. Um, so is the role linked to the Glasgow? Climate change conference, is it? Uh, yes, it is. It's li well. It's linked to the suite of uh, engagements uh, that will involve leaders so over the course of this year, but which yep. will end with COP26. Yes. How many staff report to you? I have a. At the moment, I have uh, two staff who report to me, uh, but it varies between uh, uh, two and four. It's a. It's a very small unit. It is a very small unit. Yes. Um, the April uh, summit, uh, can you tell me how many world leaders the summit committed to net zero by 2050? At the April summit, I think uh, most of the, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but uh, most of the commitments in relation to net zero by 2050 had been made, uh, uh, for the participants at that summit had been made before that summit. You can't tell me how many? Uh, I can. My best understanding on the information I have before me, uh, Senator, is that uh, some 122 countries have made net zero by 2050 announcements. Uh, the vast bulk of those would have been before the, the Biden summit. And indeed, at that summit, uh, the Biden administration 
reiterated the same comment, the same commitment, didn't it? Yes, it did. In contrast, uh, Mr Morrison didn't, but he did say, Mr President, I assume he wasn't referring to the United States President because he'd left by the time Mr Morrison made his uh, ill-fated speech. He said, Mr President, in the United States you have the Silicon Valley. Here in Australia we are creating our own hydrogen valleys. Do you recall that? I do, Senator, yes. Did you have a hand in writing that speech? I was, of course, involved in providing briefing in relation to the speech, yes, Senator. Well, you might be able to tell me, where, where are these Australian hydrogen valleys? As you may be aware, Senator, the uh, Prime Minister recently announced uh, the development of a hydrogen project uh, in uh, the Hunter Valley, hydrogen-related project in the Hunter Valley. Uh, you may also be aware that there are hydrogen projects in the La Trobe Valley, uh, recently announced. Uh, you may also so be announced, are they built? They're in the process of being uh, developed, yes. In the process of being developed? Yes. Hi not, not, not hydrogen valleys, like Silicon Valley. You asked me... You asked where, me where, where, where on earth did this expression come from? I, I don't know, uh, Senator. Yeah, uh, I bet. Thank you. So I had one follow-up. Yes. Sorry, my apologies. I'm actually on QAnon. I neglected to ask Mr. Good. Good. Martin, which is, is he coming back? He's probably in the car park. He's there. That's <laughs> no, okay. He's probably in the car park. He's just should, in the should Mr. Larson stay put, or is he? I didn't no, have thank you, Mr. Larson. Larson. I'm done. Thank you. So I might have um, misunderstood the facts um, on one aspect of our question, my questioning, which is the reference to Mr Stewart's wife. Mm -hmm. um, is, does this person remain employed at the PM's, one of the PM's residences or not? So, Senator, that would go to the, some private information relating to that. Individual. Well, I'm just asking if they're still on staff. No. Senator, um, we're, what we're debating is whether or not um, revealing information about someone's employment status would be an unreasonable intrusion and I'd just like to consider whether there's... Sure, an look, I mean, it's... I don't think... Well, it was on the public record she was employed. I, I can't recall how that occurred. So I'm actually just asking, is that still the case or not? And, and so that we're not trying to be difficult. Yeah, right, so you want to, what do you want to do? Whether or not there is an intrusion into her privacy in in answering that question, and we'd obviously need to consult yeah, the uh, Senator Wong, I, I don't know how what you, I think, rightly assert has been on the public record came to be on the public record. Oh, or, I can't remember. Or what the standards in relation sure. to those appointments and public I mean, it information is, of them have been. I'm not sure. It's it is an unusual... I mean, I... I I don't actually even know the person's name, to be honest with you. Um, but it isn't unusual for these estimates committees to have questions about whether someone is employed at a, you know, at a particular residence or in a particular department, etc. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's think an unreasonable I mean, question. I think that that's what I'm trying to do. Employment questions generally would relate yeah, to. But you can ask would relate usually, Sorry. Senator Wong, to, to senior staff and other... I, I'm happy for us to take it on notice. That's I'm not trying to resist in that regard. Um, we, we, my understanding of what I've seen in the media previously, you know, this would certainly not be described as a senior position and is not something that ordinarily departments would run commentary Well, that's on. not true. I mean, look, let's be honest. I can remember Senator Ronaldson, I can remember... 
I can remember your side coming and asking many, many questions about who was working for Kevin Rudd. So my questions are frankly much less intrusive. And, Senator, we're simply asking for sure. no, leave got, to take you're, it on, you're entitled to do that. on notice so yep, that we can sit up with that. It is or well, how you might wish to answer it or not. Okay. Sorry, thank you. I, I want to ask some questions about the uh, Naval Shipbuilding uh, Expert Advisory Panel. Sure, we'll just get some officials from National Security thank back you. to the table. Confirm that Professor Winter remains an advisor to the Prime Minister on naval shipbuilding. Uh, yes, Senator, I can. Thank you. Um, I think last estimates. I don't think it was me. In any case, we discussed um, Mr. Winter's role in remuneration. Vice Admiral Hilarides, who appears, I think, in the Foreign Affairs, Defence, and Trade estimates said that, uh, or, and in finance, said that Professor Winter had told him that he was taking a step back. It was also revealed in the hearing for this committee that Professor Winter was appointed as a special advisor to the Prime Minister. His remuneration, I think, remains rem roughly the same, one and a half million dollars over three years, and I think there was some discussion of the Oz tender notice. Um, in the March additional estimate, Senator Wong asked for a copy of the contract, which has not yet been tabled. Can you explain why that hasn't been provided? Senator, I'm advised by our Chief Operating Officer that it's commercial inconfidence. Well, is that a basis for refusing to provide it? I, I don't... My limited time here, I don't recall that being an accepted basis for not providing material to the committee when it's been requested. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm commercially confidential material often will, uh, will not be provided. Now, I think in this relation, in this regard, the 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 value of the contract and those elements well, we know have that. all been made public. Yep. Correct, Thank you. <clears throat> so the basis is uh, the basis that you're refusing to respond to Senator Wong's request is you assert it's commercial in confidence the contract. That's my advice from from our chief operating officer. That's yes. correct. That's correct. Alongside sir. you yep, now. There you are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's not a reasonable basis to refuse to provide it. Um, well, Senator, is it, uh, uh, it often is. Now, I'm not aware of the commercial nature of, uh, of the contract, um, but that's it. Are there, other competing, are, there, are there other competing professors around the world trying to provide the same? So what on earth, how, how can this possibly be commercial in confidence? Well, I understand you want to keep it a secret, but what? On, on what well, basis is it commercial look, it was, it was, it was, Senator Ayers, I mean, again, the engagement with Professor Winter, the contract value of Professor Winter, I mean, these are public terms. Um, I think we went last time to the inclusive nature of some of the costs as well, if my memory is correct. Um, uh, now. Well, I want you, it's late, Senator Birmingham, I want you to take on notice uh, whether or not that is a reasonable basis or a proper basis for refusing to provide a document. Um, and I, I want um, a, a reconsideration of that 
proposition. It's not. It, there's no public interest immunity claim. There's no pro properly bought claim. Just an assertion of commercial and confidence. I don't think is sufficient. Take another look, Senator. Last estimates the committee heard that the shipbuilding expert advisory panel no longer reports directly to the defence minister, but to one of these cabinet subcommittees, the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee, which is itself a subcommittee of the National Security Committee. What, what date was that governance committee created? The question, just to refresh, yes. um, <clears throat> in case you didn't hear it, was what date was the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee created? It was created during the government's consideration of naval uh, enterprise governance arrangements in November last year. It, when last year? November last year. You'll come back to me with a precise date on uh, notice? I'm, I may be able to. Yeah. Senator, yeah, we can take that on notice, the precise date, but it was definitely November last year. Has the subcommittee held meetings um, or received submissions? Yes. H how, many, how many meetings? Two. Two. Two, when were they? To get my timeline, so just one moment. So two since November. How often does the subcommittee meet? Uh, my, I think, Senator, the answer is quarterly or as needed, but I'll just need to check that. I may have to take it on notice. And are you in a position to tell me when the next scheduled meeting is? I don't think we ordinarily comment on, on the, the dates of cabinet, cabinet meetings, meetings yeah. Senator Ayres. Has the, yeah, some, sometimes they're in press releases. It was um, clarified last estimates that reporting to the subcommittee was by way of a cabinet memorandum. Has, has the subcommittee received any cabinet, cabinet memoranda from the NSEAP? Sorry, Senator Ayres, could you just repeat the question? So has the subcommittee right. received any cabinet memorandums from the National Previously, Shipbuilding? Previously, they, they advised that the way they provided advice was by way of a cabinet memorandum. That's the evidence that you're referring to, correct? Mm. So he's just asking, has that happened? Advice. Senator, without, this may answer your question, but yes. just to clarify that the arrangements are roughly similar in that advice from the NSEAP is provided under cover of a cabinet memorandum. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, you said that, just so, so have, has, has the subcommittee received any of those since its inception in November? Well, I'm not asking I'm, for. I'm, I'm just looking for guidance from right. my cabinet colleagues about. Well, that's not unreasonable to ask. I mean, we're not asking. We've had evidence, including in defence estimates and here, about the way in which this will work and the advice that's being provided, how the advice will be transmitted. Um, I appreciate, we appreciate the cabinet and confidence point. We haven't asked the content of it. We're just asking whether or not remember, that advice has been provided since the inception of this arrangement in, was it November last year? Correct, the, the governance arrangements were arranged to Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, November. just, can we not go through that again? Because I've, I've dealt yeah. with that, he's um, dealt with My that. understanding is, just checking my timeline, I'll take it on notice, but my understanding is not to date. And I do know that there was there, not there was a, to date. Not to date, because there was time involved in forming the okay. actual EAP under its current form. Okay, so I, I don't want details of the submissions, but I want to know whether there were any cabinet memorandums from the NSEAP on future submarines, Collins class, life of type extension, um, or future figure or future frigates. Can you tell me that on notice? And has the government received sure. a report? You can certainly take it on, on notice, Senator. But You're asking for another level of detail so hang in on. terms of the, the, con, the, the nature but did of I the misunderstand? Topic. Sorry, did I misunderstand the officers? Sorry, I haven't got my glasses on. Mr Cahoon. Mr Cahoon. Um, did I misunderstand your answer? Was your answer to Senator Ayres that no memorandum That's has right. at all has been provided by the panel? panel? Is that what they're yes, called? Um, since its inception. That's my understanding. Okay. Yes. So that really answers his question. Nothing. Correct. Yeah. You're going to come back to me on notice and check. 
I will double check and everything. Yes. But, but according to my timeline, I've re reviewed it now, and according to my timeline, they've not provided a report today. Uh, okay. Has, has the government received a report, even an interim report, of the capability enhancement review? Uh, that's a question best directed to the Department of Defence, Senator. They don't report to PMNC, but I'm not aware of hasn't, an interim report or any other report. Them. Okay, that's all I have on that subject. I have one more matter uh, for Ms Foster. Uh, <laughs> Ms Foster. Um, there was a report, in the Saturday paper on the 1st of May, an article written by Ms Middleton about the government's review of the National Australia Day Council. I think there were questions in estimates yesterday um, on this matter. Um, the, the review of the, um, of the National Australia Day Council, is there a media statement about the review? Can you provide that to us? Um, Senator, I'll ask Mr Rush to answer the questions Certainly. because I am a member of the board of the I council. I have some questions about that in a moment, but yes, the, thank you. I separate that role from the department doing sure. the administration. Mr Rush. Senator, um, am I right? Your question was whether the, whether the Did department... the government announce the review or is there a media statement about the review? No, there is not, Senator. What, why is that? Uh, it's uh, an internal review of the composition of the board of the National Australia Day Council. It's, um, it, it's, not, it, it's not the sort of review that I would have expected uh, would warrant uh, a media statement. It was a secret review? It's not secret, no. It's been conducted by Ms Beauchamp, that's correct? Uh, Glenis Beecham, um, former secretary, um, has been engaged by the department to conduct the review, that's correct. And, and how much has she been paid to undertake that review? Um, the original contract uh, was for uh, approximately $24,200. However, uh, the task has taken longer than we had expected and uh, we anticipate that the, the costs will be slightly higher than that, than that original estimate. Is there an Austender contract notice? I believe it is registered on Austender, but I'd have to confirm that and take it on notice for you, Senator. Uh, when did that review commence? Sure. Um, so, Senator Miss Beecham uh, was engaged on the 13th of April. 2021, um, and the contract commenced on the 19th of April. And when will it conclude? Uh, we had expected it to conclude at the end of April. Um, Ms Beecham requested an extension. Um, I'm aware, as at the 17th of May, that there were some outstanding questions asked by Ms Beecham of uh, the National Australia Day Council organisation, just for some details to uh, help her to finalise her, uh, her report. Um, so I would expect it to be completed by the end of May. Can you uh, table at the committee's... The end of May. Yes. Hopefully earlier. Can you uh, table the uh, review's terms of reference? Uh, the best description of the um, objective of the review is, uh, uh, was in a, a letter from uh, the Minister, Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr Morton, um, to the chair of the board of the National Australia Day Council and copied to uh, all of the other directors of the organisation. Um, that, that effectively contains the, what, what might so be can, in terms of reference to the review. Um, I don't have a copy of the letter with me, but I'd, I'd be happy to, to what, take on notice. What does it say, the terms of reference are? Uh, I don't have the letter in front of me. Um, so, so you can't tell me what the review is for? I can certainly give you a summary of the intention of the review. Um, it was intended to inform the government's consideration of future appointments to the board uh, by getting some independent expert advice on the expertise, backgrounds and governance mechanisms necessary to support the board to continue to lead and build on the successful work that's been undertaken by the National Australia Day Council for Australia Day in 2020 hang on, and 2021. Hang on. Sorry, I apologise for jumping in. That's not terms of reference. I mean, oh, we want the terms of reference, not a letter that we want to do this, but the, the ref terms of reference would scope the inquiry. Do, um, do, were they prepared? 
as I said, there, there, are no, there is no document called terms of reference. There is uh, a contract between the department and Ms Beecham, uh, which includes uh, objectives, uh, a, a, a scoping document. Okay. Well, can um, you table that, please? I can certainly take the, a notice. If, if there are parts of it document. which you say you want to keep, there's a reasonable PII claim. Obviously, we can have an argument about redaction, but if it goes to scoping of what the task is. I expect most, if not all, of that document is, is able to be tabled. I'm, I'm not imagining that there is anything we would seek to redact. Is there anybody here on your team who can provide us with the Austindan number? I, I don't think so. Not, not this evening, sure. Senator, but I can certainly... Um, Surely uh, that's available on your system. Somebody there will have it. We'll chase that for you, Senator. Yesterday, the council told us it didn't have any input into the terms of reference. You say there are no terms of reference, just a scoping document and a letter, but why was there no input from the council? Uh, the, uh, the project was one, uh, the, the, the relationship between the department and the minister um, includes uh, advice and support for uh, the appointment process. Um, the review is focused on the composition of the board and, um, and future appointments to the board and how, they, how the board might uh, be better composed into the future. Um, that, that's Does not that something imply that, some criticism of the composition of the board? Uh, no, the intention, of the, the intention of the review, the Minister's intention in, in, um, in proceeding with the review was about uh, supporting uh, the National Australia Day Council to continue to successfully lead its work. Ms Foster, you're a member of the council, that's right, isn't it? That's correct, Senator. Um, and do you hold that position by virtue of your role in the department? I do, Senator. So you represent Prime Minister and Cabinet on the board? Uh, Senator, I guess um, there are... The, my government division staff, um, from a administrative point of view, look after the National Australia Day Council as a portfolio agency. Um, I'm a member of the board, as you say, as part of my role, but I don't represent PMNC's interests. I, Do you I, report back to PMNC about no, the board's Senator, activities? No, I, Senator, I act as a, a director of the board in the best interests of the organisation. So you participate in decision making about the Australian of the Year Awards? Yes, Senator. And what I do you think is wrong with the way that the Council selects the Australian of the Year? Senator, I don't think there is anything wrong with the way the Council selects the Australian of the Year. Why, why are we having a review? So, Senator, I think, um, as Mr Rush described, I understand that the Minister Morton has written about, a letter that's precipitated it, but what's the so rationale The review for? is about um, whether the, the board has the right composition of skills and experience to take it forward. Control? There's been some fairly significant, um, uh, help me with the words here, Mr Rush, but increases to the organisation's role in the last couple of years. So um, if I think about the difference when I joined the board Nearly, nearly four years ago, when its primary focus was on the selection of Australian of the Year, um, there's now a very significant um, campaign that runs around um, in the lead up to Australia Day promoting um, the, a narrative around reflect Reflect, respect, respect celebrate. celebrate. Um, and uh, there was also last year a fairly significant, for a small organisation, um, grants program to assist councils and, so, and so, local So where did this view emerge that there needed to be a review? Where's that, where's that view come I, from? I think in, in addition to the... the, um, who's, uh, the who's, whose idea was the review? It uh, came about through discussion uh, between the department and the minister. Um, so and when you say the department, between PMNC and the minister being Minister Morton? Correct. Um, and just and to, so to did that. he express a view to the department that there ought to be a review? 
Well, those discussions went to the responsibilities that the organisation had accrued over the last couple of years. Um, and when, when did those discussions begin? Uh, following Australia Day 2021. So following, um, following the appointment, the announcement of Ms Tame as the Australian of the Year? Yes, but what prompted them in, in, in particular... It's awfully close was, to what... Um, uh, well, so, written so, in so, the, sorry, um, sorry, can we, can, we article, let, can we let Mr Rush finish what he was saying? Certainly, there? Mr Rush. Um, so in late March, uh, uh, two of the board members indicated that they didn't wish to continue uh, and be reappointed. Um, their terms concluded at the end of that month. Um, that those, the, the existence of those two vacancies in, in fairly rapid succession prompted a discussion between the minister and the department uh, about the composition of the board. Um, uh, the reflections in, those, in that discussion went to um, the facts that Ms Foster has described, that in the last two years uh, the organisation has had to extend itself to uh, deliver a significant communications campaign and then um, in the last year uh, uh, a significant um, set of, of grants for um, Australia Day activities, which, uh, was, uh, um, uh, which, which may require some adjustments to the composition of the board going forward. Were you in those discussions? Yes, Senator. Did Mr Morton or anyone on, on in his office ever raise any concerns about Ms Thames? No, Com Senator, not at all. Has anyone from government ever raised such concerns with you? Not to my knowledge, Senator. What about with you, Ms Foster? I was going to say to the contrary, um, uh, the minister had indicated to me um, that he thought Ms Thames was a, um, an excellent recipient. So the Saturday and, paper and, and, story. And Senator Ayres, can, can I just add, um, Mr Morton and I have had passing discussions about the review in the Australia Day Council um, and I want to reinforce precisely what has been said by officials there. Uh, Mr Morton has always been consistent in what he has put to me, that this review relates to the capability mix um, on the Australia Day Council and to ensuring its effective operation and success and has uh, in none of his discussions with me ever suggested that there was any relationship to the selection of the Australian of the Year process. Well, well, government sources have said to Ms Middleton that Brendan Murphy would have been a safer choice. <laughs> That's true. Well, I don't know who those That's government sources are, but... No. Uh, uh, but Senator Ayres... Uh, but that's I a view can, within government say, from some. It might be somebody's view, but I can say emphatically that in terms of this work, any conversation I've had uh, with Mr Morton hasn't, well, even, hasn't even discussed the selection process around the Australian of the Year at all about this, and it doesn't sound like it's featured in well, any of the other discussions. Well, Senator Birmingham acknowledges that it's a view of some. Well, of, some well, of, of somebody and you, uh, on the basis of Ms Middleton's of reporting. Are you aware of that view within government? I was, was not often. Senator until I saw the reporting and it's not something that's ever... Um, uh, I've, I've had no direct... Because uh, it would be a pretty terrible thing if it turned out to be true that following Ms Thames' appointment the next message the board gets is a review of its composition. To ensure safer choices. Senator, um, th there is, there has been no connection whatever between those two things. In, and, your, and I, in, your, in your mind? In yeah, my but you mind, can't speak to the Minister's motivation. In any discussion? No, no, I, no you can't had, speak to the Minister's I, motivation. I, 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 I am confident from the Minister's motivations, as he's expressed to me, and by the sounds of it, as he's expressed to officials, that the motivations are firmly and squarely about the successful operation of the Australia Day Council, the successful composition of its board, and particularly fulfilling its responsibilities in relation to... So do you to know who made the safer choice comment? I, I can't say that I read the Saturday paper uh, all that often, Senator Wong, so Senator is quoting Ms Middleton's is that a, anonymous that's source. Been expressed is by anyone I've in your party room? And, and is the, that a view? And the been... only time I've heard such a view, and it was from an unattributed source. Is there any... Uh, it, has that view been expressed at any point in your party room? 
I do not believe so, Senator. And my colleagues are shaking their heads too. Can I just um, th thank you for that? Just, just finally, uh, we did um, traverse a few minutes ago um, the question of Mr Winter's contract being provided. One of my colleagues has sent me odges on this question. It is very clear. Um, it says, the Senate has made it clear in its resolution of 30 October 2003 that a claim on this ground must be based on a specified potential harm to commercial interests and in relation to information held by government, it must be raised by a minister. It goes on. It says, commercially con confidential matters are likely to be limited in scope and the onus is on the person claiming confidentiality to argue the case for it. Um, so I want to see set out Minister, what the basis for a uh, commercial and confidence claim could possibly be. Sure, Senator. Well, I've, I've indicated we will take another look at that and, uh, and respond well, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, I just have one clarification yes. from Ms Frame. Um, Senator, when she said that there were no passenger flights into Wellcam Airport, she meant no international passenger flights. So there are some limited domestic passenger flights, in my understanding, and I just wanted to correct that evidence tonight. Thank you, Thank you. Ms Foster. That concludes the committee's examination of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. The committee will resume tomorrow to examine the finance portfolio. I would like to thank the Minister and officers who have given evidence to the committee today. I would also like to thank Hansard and Broadcasting for their assistance. I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee adjourned. Thank you very much. Tim, just yeah. last man standing.